Chapter 1181 Chance Encounter The cave under the waterfall was a mess after the war. The ground was covered with rubble that fell after the huge body of the three-headed sea snake collided. A deafening sound came from the waterfall outside the cave. Zerdak's right arm was stabbed with ice picks by the three-headed sea snake and was bloody and bloody. At this time, the only way to stop the bleeding was to simply stop the bleeding. After treatment with the holy light technique. That's it. Bandage. This time, almost all members of the team were injured. Samira's right shoulder clavicle was cut open by the ice pick of the three-headed sea snake. If she hadn't dodged in time, the ice pick could have almost hit her entire right shoulder. Broken. The full black iron heavy armor worn by the two-headed ogre Gulitum also has several very obvious dents. However, because the ogre has ice armor, the ice pick did not cause any substantial damage to him. It was Gulitum's amazing fighting power in this battle. And his good brother Nauhar fought head-on against the two heads of the three-headed sea snake, which sealed the victory for the team. But the ogre was sitting aside at the moment. He was a little exhausted from exhaustion, silently devouring the food in his backpack. Fortunately, Gary Decker was wearing heavy armor with a magic pattern structure. When he was pushed against the rock wall by the three-headed sea snake, it was only the magic pattern structure that exploded a layer of magic shield. Carrie Decker was the least injured in this battle. And it was the large lead bullet sprayed from the shotgun in her hand that smashed the neck of the three-headed sea snake after it was decapitated. And she helped the team at the last moment, killing the three-headed sea snake in one fell swoop. Bart also leaned against the ogre Gulidum with all his strength. After Andrew lost his fighting power, he almost relied on Bart's big sword to complete the kill at the last moment. Andrew lay flat on the boulder with a pale face. He was bitten by a three-headed sea snake on his right leg. Not only were three thigh tendons severed, but even the bones were injured, although they were not completely broken. According to what Cernak's Eye of Truth observed, fine cracks appeared on the entire leg bone, which could not withstand too much impact. Cernak squatted beside him and said, while helping him check his injuries, The bones are not broken. I will suture the broken tendons in your leg later. You cannot move this leg until it is completely healed. Otherwise, if these tendons are broken again, it will be difficult for me to reattach them. After saying that, Serdak took out the toolbox from the magic waste bag and started to take out some sewing tools. Andrew put his elbows on the boulder and tried to sit up. He smiled a little reluctantly and said to Seldak, Boss, I actually feel okay. This injury is not as serious as you said. Soldak held Andrew's shoulders, shook his head and said, your injury requires you to return to the fortress to rest for half a month. Andrew pointed to the wound on his thigh that was healing quickly and said to Soldak, Boss, look at it. It's healing very quickly. The powerful recovery abilities of hegemonic body and blessed body, coupled with the powerful healing power of holy light, made Andrew's wound show signs of creeping healing. Sirdak still shook his head and said, This is the resilience brought by blessing, but it will not repair the toughness of the bones in a short period of time. In addition, after the tendons heal, they also need to recover for a period of time. Otherwise, they will tear apart. After a second tear, it won't be easy to reattach it. You don't want to become a cripple in the future. Do you? Serdak used holy light to treat Andrew from time to time. And only then did Andrew give up his intention to continue hunting. Samira and Gary Decker roughly cleaned the battlefield in this cave full of water pools. But they did not find the weapons or magic pattern structures of the dead adventurers. Or even the bones can't find anything like that. Soldak immediately decided to stop the Death Ridge hunting operation, and the team prepared to return to the Blue Bridge Fortress. Boss, although we gave up the third hunting point, we should at least take a look. Even if we don't go hunting, we always need first-hand treatment from the Demon Lord over there. Andrew was a little unwilling. Lying on the stretcher, he said to Soldak, seeing Soldak's hesitation. Andrew immediately added, even if you just take a look, at least you can prepare more for the next hunt. Serdak also knew that of course, this team could not stop hunting just two demon lords. This hunting operation must continue at least until enough unidentified black magic crystals are accumulated to buy at least two sets of second level magic pattern structures. In addition, this kind of unidentified black magic crystal can be used by nobles to gain merit and be promoted to a title. Naturally, no amount is too much. If Serdak's count status wants to continue to rise, he must achieve excellence on the battlefield. Merit. Otherwise the only way is to use unidentified black magic crystals to accumulate merit. Serdak scratched his head and saw that the rest of the team was in good condition. The current hunting location was not too far from the third hunting location. 
and it was only more than a day's journey at most. He hesitated for a moment, then nodded and said, Then go over and take a look. As soon as there is a danger signal, we will retreat immediately. Bart now understands that Serdak is not afraid of the H. L. Mantis is in the valley at all. So the only ones who can really threaten this patrol team in Death Ridge are those demon lords who are suppressed everywhere. Demon warriors patrolling the mountains. Considering that almost all the demon warriors have withdrawn to the south of Death Ridge, they should not be active in Death Ridge on a large scale at this time. The two-headed ogre Gulatum carried Andrew, who was unable to walk. On his back, the patrol team climbed over the mountain ridge. After dealing with some H, L. Mantises, they continued towards the third hunting point. Without Andrew to clear the way in front, Samira naturally wanted to be at the front of the team to explore the road, which made the team much more stable. According to the map of Death Ridge given to him by Old Heyman, the team had entered Death Ridge for a week and had reached the edge of the hinterland of Death Ridge. Obvious H, L plants began to appear in this area. Many plants only had vines and spikes, and few grew green leaves. Some small-scale monsters in the H, L world have also begun to increase in number. The monsters that can survive in the H, L world, regardless of their ability, all have this superb camouflage ability. There are many small monsters lurking among the rocks. They look exactly like the rocks on the mountain and are difficult to distinguish. However, they seem to be able to feel the strength of the team. When they saw the team approaching, they hit on the top of the rock, in a canyon less than 10 kilometers away from the third hunting point. Serdak was resting next to a bush. Samira was responsible for exploring the surrounding situation. So she stood on a boulder on the top of a mountain and looked around. Overlook. There was no movement a moment ago. But when she looked towards the southwest area, she seemed to have discovered something. And she kept making some gestures to the team. Serdak could only understand the general meaning. What Samira was pointing to was that in the valley on the other side of the southwest direction, someone was found fighting with the demon warriors. Before Serdak could ask with a gesture, Samira jumped several times and returned to the temporary rest camp from the big rock on the top of the mountain. Chapter 1182 Fierce Battle Samira ran down the mountain ridge with light steps and said to Soldak, In the valley opposite, a group of demon warriors are fighting a group of tribal orcs. Those orc warriors are the ones being hunted. If we want to eat this team of demon warriors, we need to plan carefully and see if we can defeat the demon warriors. The clan warriors set up an ambush on their way back to the ground. Serdak asked with a serious face. How many are they? Samira replied casually. About twelve demon warriors. What about the wolf orcs? Serdak asked. Samira said casually. There should be two or three left. They were chased all the way by the demon warriors. When I ran down, they were almost dead. Serdak immediately stood up, put on his helmet, and ordered the two-headed ogre, Bart, and Gary Decker. Let's save them. Samira looked at Soldak in surprise, held his arm with one hand, and said, Boss, there is no need for us to save those orcs who are bound to die. They are not from the Empire. And there are only five of us here. If we rush up to fight these demon warriors from the front, we will suffer a lot. Serdak patted Samira's arm and said with a serious face, They are always our allies. And they also saved me when I was in danger. After saying that, he quickly ran towards the mountain ridge. The hillside was a bit steep, and it seemed very difficult for Serdak to climb up. There are no roads on this mountain ridge, and one needs to pass between huge rocks and bushes. Probably only an agile archer like Samira can move freely on such complex terrain. Samira stood there blankly, looking at the back of Serdak struggling to climb. She had clearly meant to remind her just now, but was given a lukewarm comment by Serdak, and she stood there with some anger. The two-headed ogre came over, patted Samira's shoulder with his big, thick hands, and said angrily, Samira, I support Dak in this matter. With that said, he strode toward Serdak and chased after him. Bart didn't speak, but just followed Soldak silently. He checked the big sword on his back, tried to adjust his mentality, and thought about how to open up the situation in the upcoming battle. After all, there were many people on the other side. Andrew was lying on a stretcher with a campfire next to him. Every battle would make him excited, probably because he had the soul of a berserker. His mind would be much clearer than usual during battles. He blinked at Samira, pointed at his chest and said, I am a native of the Nanai tribe. You are an abandoned half-elf. And Gulitam is also a wandering ogre. We have no right to dislike others. Even if he is an orc, follow quickly and help the Leah rescue them. 
Samira stood there and glared at Andrew coldly. What she needed was not this kind of rational explanation, but a step. Even if Soldak ordered her at this time, she would be able to follow him happily. Gary Decker was carrying a double-barreled shotgun. When he saw that Samira did not follow, he stopped and turned around, strode forward, grabbed the somewhat stubborn half-elf archer's wrist, and whispered, Follow me quickly. I think the boss and the others need our help. Gary Decker shook his long black hair, turned to the Nanai indigenous warriors and said with a smile, Andrew, before we come back, take care of yourself. Don't let those H. Elmantises eat you as a delicious meal while we are away. Don't worry. I'm not without any fighting power. I'm just too lazy to move. Andrew responded cheerfully. Serdak ran to the top of the mountain with difficulty and happened to see that the battle in the opposite valley was coming to an end. More than a dozen demon warriors had achieved a complete victory, and several wolf riders fell in a pool of blood. Although the demon warriors paid a high price to defeat these wolf riders, they were the victorious party. At this time, a group of demon warriors were holding square war blades in their hands, and with a victor's attitude, they finished off the seriously injured wolf knights, who were not dead. By the way, they also beheaded the fighting frost wolves beside them. Not far from the hillside, a giant frost wolf nearly three meters long pounced on a demon warrior, biting his throat with a bloody mouth. When it raised its mouth, the demon warrior the demon warrior's head had been tilted to the other side, and the purple blood in his body continued to flow out. When other demon warriors discovered what was happening here, for demon warriors immediately roared in unison and chased after them. The frost wolf did not flee immediately, but jumped to the side of a wolf knight who fell on the ground. It bit the wolf knight's chest belt with its sharp teeth and dragged his heavy body towards the mountain. Walk towards the boulder. The wolf knight had a bloody wound on his chest, and red blood flowed all over the ground. He looked like he was dying, but the frost wolf still didn't give up and wanted to drag him out of the battlefield. Even though the demon warriors were catching up step by step, they refused to escape alone. It dragged the wolf knight behind the boulder, and then blocked him in front of him with its huge body. Facing the demon warriors flying up with wings spread, it let out a low roar and refused to leave while guarding the dying wolf knight. This kind of perseverance on the battlefield is particularly admirable. Serdak and Gulitem looked at each other. Without any communication, Gulitem knew what Serdak was thinking. He suddenly stepped onto a boulder, his tall body wearing a black armor, on top of the mountain, extraordinarily eye-catching. The ogre let out a war cry, and then rushed down the hillside with the big club in his hand looking like a rumbling steam train. Serdak did a rough check and found that, including the one lying in a pool of blood, there were indeed only twelve demon warriors in the valley. Now four of them were chasing the giant frost wolf, and the remaining seven were heading towards the two-headed ogre. The three of Serdak rushed down the hillside in one breath. The ogre Gulitem stepped on the path of flames, and his dark armor was covered with a thick layer of frost. Although now Huar held a fireball in his hand, he did not throw it out. When these demon warriors came forward, they almost all opened their flesh wings behind them. The flesh wings of these demon warriors were still very small and could not sustain their flight for a long time. But they could allow them to move their bodies while running. Become more nimble. Gulidma rushed to a demon warrior first, raised the big stick in his hand, and smashed it on the head. At the same time, the fireball in Nahuar's hand was thrown in the face of the demon warrior. At this moment, the two-headed ogre's body was covered with black totem patterns and even the flame dog's life magic pattern on his neck lit up. An ancestor shadow emerged from behind the ogre, become one with the two-headed ogre's body. The big stick slammed into the square war blade with a loud bang, and countless sparks shot out between the war blade and the big stick. The demon warrior was also hit with all his strength by the two-headed ogre, and his body fell backwards, hitting a demon warrior who happened to catch up from behind. The other two demon warriors wanted to take the opportunity to attack the two-headed ogre from both sides but they were stopped by Serdak, who came from behind with a shield. The square blade clanked on Verda's shield, and there was an explosion of light. Rays of silver light emitted, and the shield of blessing and the sacred shield gave the shield two more layers of magical protection. Only by breaking through the magical protective layer can the foundation of this shield be damaged. In such an urgent situation, Serdak still assumed the fighting posture of a warrior. The broad sword in his hand was hidden behind the shield, like a poisonous snake ready to attack. As long as the demon warrior on the opposite side dared to show any flaws, the sword would stab out without hesitation, opening a wound on the demon warrior's chest. Bart, 
who followed closely, held a big sword in both hands and took the opportunity to chop off the head of the injured demon warrior. The two of them cooperated very well. And Bard was very good at seizing the gaps in the battle to attack. But at this time, the demon warriors behind him had already caught up. And the square blade steadily blocked his companion's sword, allowing Bard's killing blow to return in vain. The three freshmen of Serdak rushed into the battlefield and immediately killed the demon warriors here in a hurry. But these demon warriors are a group of veterans who have experienced hundreds of battles. They saw that their opponent was stronger and they could not handle it alone. So they waited for their companions to come up. Then seven people attacked the three of Serdak at the same time, with more people attacking and fewer people fighting. Serdak's side suddenly became in danger and it was difficult to control the situation. Two square war blades slashed at Serdak's shield at the same time. The holy shield exploded and the holy light finally dissipated. Serdak was shaken by the huge force and his entire right arm lost consciousness. He couldn't help but take a step back, gritted his teeth and swung his broadsword to block the square war blade that was cutting off his head. Next to him, Bart was holding a double-edged sword and struggled to deal with the two demon warriors. He was forced to retreat by the fierce attack methods of the demon warriors. The ice armor on the ogre Gulitum was also chopped into half by the demon warriors. But it was easier on his side. The big stick in his hand smashed the demon warriors back frequently. Seeing that this side was involved in a fierce battle, the other four ogre warriors wanted to kill the frost wolf quickly and reinforce that side after the battle was over. Just when a demon warrior raised his war blade and wanted to chop off the head of the white frost wolf, an arrow filled with lightning breath emitted countless arcs and accurately inserted into the demon warrior who raised his war blade. Warrior. An electric pillar as thick as a bucket came down with a click. And the arcs of electricity in the air were like electric snakes scurrying around. The demon warrior's body suddenly emitted a burning aroma. And his whole body burst into flames. At this time, the demon warrior realized that there were archers around him. And looked in the direction of the arrow with a horrified expression. The half-elf archer jumped off the boulder and frequently fired sharp arrows towards the battlefield immediately dominating the situation on the battlefield. The demon warriors were preparing to kill the frost wolf. One of them held down the frost wolf and then separated two demon warriors to face Amira and Gary Decker on the hillside. Gary Decker was wearing heavy armor, holding a shotgun with both hands and fired a shot at the oncoming demon warriors. The firing pin was nailed to the center of the magic pattern array behind the shotgun and the array immediately exploded with a burst of fire. There was a huge magical aura and with a roar, Countless large lead bullets flew out, and the demon warriors who rushed forward were immediately covered with scattered tiny wounds. Gilly raised the shotgun in his hand, and a huge copper sh l slipped out of the barrel. The demon warrior, who was bruised all over his body, rushed forward again. Gilly jumped up on the spot and hit the demon warrior with a knee in midair. She was wearing extremely strong heavy armor, and there were specially designed impact angles on her knees, which pressed against the lower abdomen of the demon warrior and immediately knocked him backwards. The war blade in the hand of another demon warrior struck from the other side. Gary Decker ducked sideways, only to have a strand of his hair swept down by the demon warrior's war blade, followed by Samira's series of arrows. The demon warrior had a bad premonition and rolled on the ground twice while dodging, just barely able to dodge Samira's three consecutive shots. At this time, a delicate magic pattern appeared on Samira's right arm. Gary Decker discovered that every time the magic pattern burst out with a magical glow, Samira could shoot two arrows at once. And when another magic pattern on her body lit up, Samira seemed to be able to turn into a wisp of blue. Smoke. Every movement is uncertain. Gary Decker took out a sealed magic breaking bullet from his waist. This kind of ammunition is carefully crafted by dwarf craftsmen. The bullet SH. L not only contains a magic pattern array, but also contains magic crystal fragments with increased power. One is worth almost a gold coin. She folded the shotgun, loaded it with two expensive magic-breaking bullets, and raised the shotgun to aim at the oncoming demon warriors without fear. In fact, Carrie Decker also played a bit of psychological warfare here. Her first shot was often a large lead bullet with mediocre power. This would make the demon warriors mistakenly think that the shotgun in Carrie's hand was also powerful. That's all. Although there were numerous wounds on his body, they were not fatal. When Jelly raised his shotgun again, the demon warriors were not so afraid. They were more willing to suffer some injuries and completely eliminate their opponents. The demon warrior waved the square war blade in his hand, raised it high, and slashed it down at Jolly, who was raising his gun. Boom! 
the magic breaking bullet emits a ball of silver light. And even the bullet is coated with a layer of thorium. It flies from the side of the war blade accurately and hits the demon warrior between the eyebrows. The silver bullet exploded suddenly. And the demon warrior's head was shattered in half. Samira had already shot several arrows at this time. And another demon warrior had no less than ten arrows stuck in his thigh and abdomen. Even if he flapped his fleshy wings, he couldn't keep up with Samira's pace. The demon warriors who were waiting for Jilly to deal with him rushed over to reinforce him. And once again used a magic breaking bullet to hit the demon warrior on the back of his neck. Three demon warriors were killed in a row here. And the ogre finally smashed one demon warrior to death with a big stick. With Samira and Jelly supporting from the outside. The demon warriors here immediately collapsed. Situation. Seeing that the chance of victory was slim. The demon warriors did not want to get involved too much and wanted to send signals to other companions. Then the black demonic energy ignited in their bodies. And the wings behind them suddenly became extremely huge. They stimulated the last potential of their bodies. Spread their wings and flew into the sky. He left the battlefield in a blink of an eye. Chapter 1183 Return to the Fortress Samira and Jelly worked together to kill three demon warriors. On the other hand, on the side of Serdak and Gulitam. Although they successfully contained most of the demon warriors, they only gained the body of one demon warrior. Gulitam squatted beside the corpses of these demon warriors and complained to Serdak. If I could have an epic weapon in my hand, my performance this time would be no worse than Samira's. It's not that I didn't give it to you. It's just that you don't like it. Samira sat aside and mocked with a sneer. You mean that giant war scythe? I am an ogre. How could I use that kind of long-handled weapon? What I need is a bone crusher or a big stick like the judge, Gulitam said with some indignation. Serdak ignored the bickering between the two men and walked straight towards the giant frost wolf covered in blood. The frost wolf stared at the battlefield quietly and hostily, licking the wounds on its body with its tongue from time to time, and licking the blood off its snow-white fur. Behind it is the dying orc warrior. At this time, it is almost difficult for him to breathe. His strong vitality makes him linger here, quietly waiting for death to come. Death is not a terrible thing for an orc warrior. Being able to die on the battlefield was more like an honor. He barely opened his eyes and looked at the dark clouds above his head. Unfortunately, this was not the prairie of his hometown. Every time I take a breath, there will be a very strong tearing feeling in my lungs. He felt a little suffocated, but his alveoli were full of blood and he couldn't take in much air. He shrugged his nose, hoping to feel a hint of the wind from his hometown in the air. He heard that every orc warrior who died with honor could feel the guidance of the soul of his ancestors, which could lead them to the holy mountain together. He was also somewhat reluctant to leave this world. If he died, Bonita might not be able to live alone. She was still so young. She shouldn't have died like this. Through Bonita's soft hair, he saw a human knight walking in front of him with a warm smile on his face. Bonita bared her sharp teeth at Serdak and let out a threatening growl from her throat, warning him that if he dares to go further, he will bite him. The mane on his neck is standing upright, and he looks more majestic than the prairie lion. Of course, for the frost wolf, the prairie lion is like a younger brother. It knew that it was this group of people who saved it, but it still didn't want to let these strangers get close. Serdak slowly squatted down, stretched out a hand, put it on its forehead, and cast a holy light spell. Bonita noticed that the wounds on her claws began to heal quickly. She whimpered and turned back to lick the blood-stained face of the orc warrior. I know. Let me see if he can be saved. But I have to step aside a little. Serdak said slowly. Serdak didn't expect that this wolf could actually understand the imperial language. It nimbly jumped forward and vacated its position. It did not leave. But carefully watched Serdak's every move. Serdak checked the injuries of the seriously injured wolf knight and asked him. Do you understand imperial language? I saw the wolf knight making a gurgling sound in his throat and his eyes moving slightly. Serdak knew that he should be able to understand the imperial language and then said to him, You are lucky to have met me. This injury can still be cured. Bart carried a giant sword and patrolled the battlefield, dragging all the corpses of the wolf knights together. He found a total of seven corpses nearby and almost every corpse had a frost wolf corpse next to it. It could be seen that these brave soldiers almost always fight to the last moment. And those frost wolves also gave up the opportunity to live alone and die together with their partners. These wolf knights are wearing tough leather armor. But these equipment are obviously too shabby for the imperial knights. Even the full cover black iron armor in the heavy armored infantry regiment is better than the leather armor of the wolf knights. However, the swords in their hands are better. 
I don't know what materials are added to them. They are very sharp and well made. It's so simple. There's not even a forehead protector. Just a leather wrapped grip on the handle. Bart looked down upon these weapons. So he placed them next to the wolf knights and their wolf companions. On the other hand, he showed no mercy to the corpses of the four demon warriors. He chopped off their heads and put them into cloth bags. Their corpses were also dragged together by Bart. And they were poured with a small pot of kerosene and burned on the spot. Gulitam picked up a square war blade and dug a big hole next to these wolf knights. Since he couldn't take them away, he would bury them here. In fact, Gulitam really wanted to taste the frost wolf meat. But considering that this was probably considered a great disrespect to the warriors on the battlefield, he kept this idea in his heart. He is an ogre willing to reason. Seeing that Serdak began to treat the wolf orc, and also took out an extremely luxurious demon warrior head to sacrifice. Gulitam guessed that this wolf orc could still be saved, thinking that there was a patient lying on a stretcher on the other side of the mountain. No matter how strong he was, it was not convenient for him to carry two wounded people at once. Gulitam's eyes glanced around the battlefield, and his eyes immediately lit up when he saw the cart with two wooden wheels. Bart was squatting there checking the inventory on the cart, and Gulitam also walked over to see if the cart had any value that could be reused. Bart took out a dagger and cut a slit in the sack on the cart. He opened some slits and looked inside, only to find that these sacks actually contained some bone sickles of H. L. Mantises. He cut open several more bags. Not surprisingly, there are also some Hell Mantis materials inside. It seemed that they had encountered an orc hunting team. But this team was a little unlucky. During the process of hunting the H. L. Mantis, they happened to meet these demon warriors. And they were obviously no match for these demon warriors was hunted down until the whole army was destroyed. Bart immediately realized that there should be demon scouts in this death ridge. But they were lucky enough not to encounter them before. Samira had already climbed to the top of the mountain to take precautions. Gary also ran back to the mountain to check on Andrew. It would be extremely dangerous to leave him alone on the other side of the valley for too long. Although Gulitam was not a qualified carpenter, his purpose was very clear. He only needed the cart to be able to be pulled and to be large enough for two people to lie down on it. As for those goods, they can be put into Serdak's magic pocket. It's a pity that these two wounded people can't be packed in. Otherwise, even repairing the wooden cart would be unnecessary. Seeing Gulitam actively pushing the repaired flatbed truck to his side, Serdak and Gulitam worked together to lift the comatose wolf orc onto the flatbed truck. After hearing Bart's analysis report, Serdak also believed that the further inside, the easier it would be to encounter the demon army's scout team. Now there were two wounded in the team which greatly affected the team's mobility. Therefore, despite Andrew's strong protests, he made a decisive decision to lead the team back to Blue Bridge Fortress. In order to leave as soon as possible, Serdak even gave up his plan to rest for one night at the temporary camp on the opposite side of the mountain. Samira was still exploring the way in front. Gulitam was pushing the two-wheeled flatbed truck in the middle of the team. Andrew and the unconscious wolf orc were lying side by side. The frost wolf had been following the flatbed truck silently. Next to, Serdak and Bart were at the back of the team, and the team hurriedly left the valley. Just half a day after Serdak and the others left this valley, a demon army numbering 50 people rushed here in a hurry. In the dusk, they saw a pile of unburnt headless corpses of demon warriors piled on the ground. A group of demons quickly investigated the surroundings, and it didn't take long to find the grave where the wolf knight was buried. A group of demon warriors roared in unison although the journey back to Blue Bridge Fortress went smoothly. Due to the two wounded men on the flatbed, the team took ten days to complete the journey that originally only took one week. When we saw the Blue Bridge Fortress from a distance, everyone's hearts finally dropped. When Serdak appeared at the gate of the fortress, he saw two people lying on the flatbed truck pulled by the ogre Gulitam. The guards on duty in the fortress quickly opened the gate of the fortress and welcomed them into the fortress. Then everyone knew that in fact only Andrew was slightly injured. The other injured person was a wolf knight picked up by Suldak on the way. He also brought back a frost wolf that was stronger than the ancient Bolai horse. Old Hyman also made an exception and came to the bridge below the fortress from the logistics team. Chapter 1184 Old Hayman's Deal The construct knights and swordsmen in the fortress were very enthusiastic about the return of the Serdak team. Everyone knew that having such a paladin in the fortress would bring many benefits. Andrew has a bold personality and often competes with others in public arenas. He often gets into grudges with others. But he also has many friends. At this time, a group of people ran up and carried Andrew back to the room in a hurry. 
seeing that his entire thigh was wrapped in a hemostatic bandage. They curiously asked him how he was injured. Andrew didn't hide anything, and told the story of the team's battle to hunt down the three-headed sea snake. Everyone couldn't help but exclaimed when they heard that Andrew actually went to hunt down the H. L. Lord, who was guarding under the Death Ridge Falls. Someone else said, Andrew, your captain is so brave. You actually dare to challenge the suppressed Warcraft Lords in Death Ridge. A swordsman who knew very well about Death Ridge followed everyone to carry the stretcher. When talking about this topic, he said, That's right. We also heard that there are many powerful Lords who were exiled from the H. L. World over Death Ridge. And some people have organized hunting groups. But you also know what the situation is over there. The mountains are full of H. L. Mantises. Every night. Just to deal with these H. L. Mantises requires a lot of energy. And this is not the most difficult. The most difficult thing is that the number of people in the hunting team is small. And they cannot defeat these H. L. Lords. Once the number of people in the hunting team exceeds 10 or 3 level experts in the team will be detected by the magic eyes in the center of Death Ridge. And there may be a demon army waiting there. Andrew didn't expect that there were so many stories about Death Ridge. Another constructed swordsman took the opportunity to ask. And why did you rescue an orc? Andrew laughed and said. I picked him up on the way. The boss saw that he was about to die. So he brought him back. When talking about such a light topic, everyone seemed more enthusiastic. Another swordsman said. I heard that orcs don't take baths very often in their lives. Whenever they sweat, they have a fishy and salty smell. Andrew, have you ever smelled it after lying all this way with him? Andrew responded unceremoniously. You won't know if you come over and try it later. But you must be careful about the frost wolf next to him. That guy doesn't have a very good temper. He is the only one left alive in their team of warriors. Please have some sympathy. Gary Decker said from the side to the noisy swordsman. A construct knight who was following the team took the opportunity to come up to him. Narrowed his slender eyes and asked Callie. Callie Decker. This time your team entered Death Ridge for hunting. Did you gain anything extra? Gioli stopped, turned to the Construct Knight, and asked with a smile, Bruno, what do you want to know? The Construct Knight quickly stopped and responded with some embarrassment. No, I was just asking. After that, he hurriedly left. A group of swordsmen carried Andrew back to the dormitory, while the ogre took the wolf orc and the frost wolf back to his dormitory. Only his temporarily converted warehouse dormitory had enough space to accommodate one person and one wolf. Samira returned to her dormitory with a cold expression. She usually spoke very little and hardly communicated with outsiders. Moreover, her personal strength was recognized as strong in the Blue Bridge Fortress. No one dared to get close to her and talk to her. She made small talk. But when Bart came back, he was surrounded by members of his team. The team members asked about Bart's hunting life these days. This time the team entered Death Ridge for hunting. And Bart finally learned some of Serdak's little secrets. For example, those blessings of gods are not free for Serdak. Although it is not a trouble. Serdak needs to pay tribute to the god he believes in. Bart feels that this is a bit like the god of commerce. It is said that every time believers of the god of commerce pray to the god of commerce. What they need to pay is an equal exchange. So he can accept sacrifices to gain strength. Moreover. The power obtained is also the power that can be bestowed by the light god's one. Whether it is the blessing shield or the holy shield. They all carry a strong sacred aura. However, it was obvious that Soldak did not want this matter to be made public. He was always in the tent when he prayed and offered sacrifices. So Bart also kept silent about this matter. In addition, besides Serdak, there is a female magician who often appears out of nowhere. She will only appear in critical moments. But usually she cannot feel any breath at all. Bart has experienced several battles with demons on the battlefield. And is extremely familiar with the aura of demon warriors. The female magician obviously has a demonic aura about her, but she seems to be Serdak's helper. Not only that, there are no fleshy wings behind her like a demon warrior. It is said that the wings of demon warriors are the source of their power, but this magician does not have wings. Now that he has joined Serdak's hunting team, Bart can only bury these doubts in his heart, just exchanging some combat experiences with the members of his team. The swordsman discovered that. As Bart said, a combat team purely composed of a single type of arms is not as powerful as a mixed unit. Not all arms can be like constructed knights. The more they are, the stronger their combat power will be. Serdak brought the captured Warcraft materials to Old Haman's logistics team room. Even if some Warcraft materials are stored in the demon sealing box, they cannot be stored for too long. 
Once the magic and spirituality attached to it disappear, the Warcraft materials will become less valuable. Serdak moved out the magic ceiling boxes one by one and placed them in the room. Serdak placed some materials on the counter and asked Old Heyman to appraise the value. Old Heyman looked at the items on the counter with some surprise and said to Soldak, You have harvested so many trophies this time. There has not been such an outstanding hunting team in Blue Bridge Fortress for a long time. Serdak chuckled and said, Maybe you are lucky this time. You don't know how stupid the Crypt Lord was when we were hunting that Crypt Lord. When he saw us entering the cave, he actually killed himself hidden in a swamp. He took out a piece of parchment and drew the topography of the cave on it, as well as the crystal stones and chains, pointing to the mire pool in the center of the cave. He said, Then we dropped some explosives into the mire pool, and when we exited the cave, the burrower was directly blown out of the cave by us, and we killed it with almost no effort. Old Heyman thought that Serdak would use some unknown killing move, but he didn't expect that he would just use some explosives similar to fire scale bombs. At this time, I can only sigh and sigh. I have to say that sometimes luck is also a kind of strength. Then, while Old Heyman was rummaging through the bits and pieces of the Crypt Lord's leather, he said to Soldak angrily, Who skinned you? Have you ever learned the art of skinning? Pointing to the fragments, he continued, How can a complete piece of leather be cut into so many leather fragments? Do you know how much the difference in value is? It is possible that this complete piece of leather can be sold for the price of ten magic crystals. But these fragments are piled up together. We can't sell a single magic crystal. Serdak asked awkwardly. So much difference? Old Heyman nodded matter-of-factly and said. Of course. What we value in second and third level Warcraft leather is its good magic guiding properties and anti-magic properties. But the most precious thing about this high-grade Warcraft leather is the potential magic channels contained in the leather. The better the leather, the more valuable it is. The more severe the fragmentation, the more severely damaged these magic passages will be. Serdak had no intention of talking about the magic pattern of life. So he could only promise. I will try my best to peel off some intact leather from now on. In addition to the Crypt Lord, Serdak also harvested the three-headed sea serpent lord. During the battle, Three of its heads were severed. And these sea snake heads have been preserved. As for the six heads that grew immediately afterwards, they all quickly turned into blood when the three-headed sea snake died completely. The three extremely ferocious sea snake heads were obviously a waste if used as sacrifices. I don't know how many collectors of these ferocious beast heads would be willing to make them into specimens and hang them on their walls. Therefore, Serdak planned to sell these three sea snake heads in order to maintain their own value. Even the unidentified black magic crystals were stored inside. Although it is also the Lord of H. L. This three-headed sea snake is much more valuable than the Crypt Lord. Old Heyman observed the three heads carefully, while nagging, and then added, Its leather is also more valuable. In fact, although Serdak found two very precious life magic patterns on the body of the three-headed sea snake, it was a pity that during the battle, because the life magic pattern was on the shoulders and neck of the three-headed sea snake, it was difficult to kill him. The sea snake process destroyed these two life magic patterns. So Soldak instead peeled off an extremely complete sea snake skin. Old Heyman looked at the sea snake skin with some astonishment and said, Look, isn't this peeled very good? I will peel it like this in the future. Sea snake skin has excellent magic conductivity and is one of the materials used by magisters to make high-level magic robes. This is very valuable. Old Heyman muttered, then he comprehensively identified the other magical materials of the three-headed sea snake. Seeing that Soldak took out another piece of bird leather covered with red feathers, he asked in even more surprise, Duck, what is this? I don't remember that there is a colorful tailed dragon eagle in Death Ridge. Serdak touched his nose and replied, Well, I have had this dragon eagle skin for a while. It was given to me by a friend. I have no sales channels. So it has been stored in my magic waste bag. Now that I need some high-grade leather to exchange for unidentified magic crystals, I don't plan to keep them. Old Heyman quickly took out a magnifying glass from the drawer and carefully inspected the quality of the fur. He was even more gentle when touching it with his hands. He cautiously moved toward the dragon eagle leather and said to Serdak, This thing is very rare, and it belongs to Iroha. Do you know how much this kind of leather goods is sought after by the imperial aristocracy? Seeing Soldak's confused look, he stopped talking nonsense to him and said directly, These will definitely fetch a good price. Then he took another look at the age, El Mantis corpses piled up like a hill, and said with some hesitation, As for the proliferation of bone sickles recently, 
These stocks are expected to be sold for a long time. Serdak quickly added, If someone is willing to cover it all, I can give him some discounts. Old Heyman nodded with satisfaction and said, Okay, I just like to make deals with smart people. Then Old Heyman and Soldak repacked these Warcraft materials into the magic sealing box. And then told Soldak, Two lords died in Death Ridge in a row. It is estimated that the demon clan will be nervous for a while. It is not suitable for hunting recently. I suggest you wait for a month before talking. In fact, even if Old Heyman didn't say it, Soldak also wanted Andrew to recuperate for a month. And he also had to be on duty at Blue Bridge Fortress. Even if he was close to Commander Adolphus, he couldn't abuse this friendship. You should work hard to do what you should do. Serdak said calmly. New. No. Seeing that Soldak had listened to what he said, Old Heyman nodded with satisfaction. Although there was a rest sign outside the door of the logistics team, there were still people knocking on the door and asking, Tuck, tuck, tuck. Can I come in? The voice was very sweet. And you knew it was Gary Decker without having to guess. Old Heyman walked slowly to the door and opened the door while Soldak moved all the magic sealing boxes into the warehouse behind. Please come in, Old Heyman said to Gary Decker. It can be seen that the relationship between Carrie Decker and Old Heyman is very good. She has such a cheerful personality, which allows her to have good social relations in the Blue Bridge Fortress. Old Heyman stepped aside from the door, invited her into the house, and asked casually, Carrie Decker, why don't you rest? Old Heyman, has the goods I asked you to order for me last time arrived? Gary Decker asked as he walked into the room. Old Heyman cleared the items on the counter and replied, Of course, I have always been very honest. After saying that, he took out a magic sealing box. It could be seen that the box was very heavy, and it made a heavy sound when it fell on the counter. Opening the magic sealing box, it was filled with large copper shotgun bullets. Not only were these shotgun bullets engraved with magic runes, but magic crystal fragments could also be seen on the bottom of the bullets. This was the first time that Serdak had seen such magic bullets. Seeing that Serdak was fascinated, Gary Decker took out the wooden boxes arranged in the magic sealing box. Each box contained 20 bullets. Neat and delicate. These are definitely carefully crafted by the Musketeer Dwarf Workshop. Gary Decker introduced. These magic bullets must be very expensive. Right. Serdak asked. Fortunately, I am their old customer. So I have a certain discount. Gary Decker said with a smile. It converted into gold coins. Each magic bullet costs about one gold coin. Chapter 1185 Encounter with Benna The image of Gary Decker spraying gold coins from the muzzle of his shotgun immediately appeared in Soldak's mind. Then Gary Decker picked up a magic bullet, looked at the magic pattern on it and the crystal fragments at the bottom, and smiled proudly. The beautiful face was like a blooming black rose. The bullet whirled between her fingers. It turns out that the bullets needed for your shotgun are so expensive. Serdak sighed. Gary Decker raised his lips slightly, took out the rune shotgun, tried to load the shotgun bullets into the barrel, and then said, It's not like I have to shoot such expensive bullets every time. If so, I'm afraid I would have gone bankrupt a long time ago. Now it's my stockpile. These magic breaking bullets will only be used when the situation is most dangerous. He took out a shotgun bullet with a snowflake logo engraved on the copper SH. LN introduced. These ice bombs are for those who need to escape or escape. Then he took out flame pattern bullets and arrow pattern bullets and introduced them one by one. Also, these are explosive bombs and these are penetrating bombs. There are many types of bullets you can buy here, but I usually like to use this one. It's good quality and cheap. Gary Decker pushed a large lead bullet in front of Soldak and said. Soldak picked up a large lead bullet and looked at the gun sand that was almost piled like soybeans inside. Then he looked at the double-barreled shotgun with a barrel of one meter long. Gary Decker took out the shotgun and placed it on the counter table and took the initiative to demonstrate the loading process for Serdak. Serdak carefully observed the magic patterns engraved on the barrel. The most exquisite part of this rune shotgun was the exquisite magic pattern array on the tail firing pin. These finely carved rune circles are spread across every corner of the shotgun. Is this the manufacturing process of dwarves? Serdak asked. Gary Decker nodded and said, the current imperial industry cannot make such a good shotgun. The dwarves in the western part of the New Siakis Mountains control some goblin factories. Almost all of these shotguns are from goblin factories. Made. After checking the shotgun bullets, Gary Decker left the logistics team. Serdak then said, Old Heyman, I have one more thing to ask you. Old Heyman asked cheerfully, 
Whatever happened? You might as well tell me. Cernak took out the epic weapon. The Great War Scythe. From his magic belt pouch. The dark golden texture gave this weapon an extremely gorgeous appearance. Placed it on old Heyman's counter. Old Hyman wiped his eyes. Stretched out his hand to touch the runes engraved on it. And asked with some emotion. Is this an epic weapon? Serdak nodded and said. I fought against the demon army in the Ganbu Plain. And met a shadow demon king. At that time. He divided his body into six parts. Hit it in the belly of the H, L dog. And passed through the demon's body. The door enters the dry cloth plain. Probably it was a coincidence. In the end. I killed the shadow demon. That's when I got this weapon. Now I am going to sell it in the market of Chaos Fortress. Of course. I can also exchange it for an epic stick weapon of the same quality. One-handed axe and knight sword are also acceptable. But I hope the quality can be higher. Serdak told the old man Hyman said. Old Hyman nodded and said. This type of long-handled weapon should be very popular among the knights. But after all. It is an epic weapon. So I am afraid it is not that easy to get rid of smoothly. Aphrodite has left the Belan Plain. But Serdak has no plans to meet Lut and Makuso City for the time being. So Aphrodite's trip is officially over. And she will buy a ticket to return ferry tickets to Alensa. Temporarily living in the Circle Hotel in Benna City. Aphrodite stood on the north balcony and looked at the small townhouse across the north street of the hotel. A new family has moved into the house opposite. The hostess has set up a dining table on the terrace. And a group of adults are chatting around the table while eating. Serdak walked from the room to the terrace and stood side by side with Aphrodite. The two of them stood in front of the railing and watched the magic caravans passing by on North Street. Hey, Aphrodite, is there any place you particularly want to go? Serdak glanced at the succubus in the night. She was wearing a magic robe. Her long hair was pulled up high, and she even had a pair of tortoiseshell L glasses on her nose. Her whole person looked intellectually beautiful. She now looks like a magic scholar. But unfortunately, there is no magic badge on her chest. Aphrodite pushed up her glasses on the bridge of her nose and said with a smile, Imperial Capital and Hayinsi are both available. But that will have to wait until you have time. I don't dare to rush to these two places alone. I heard that there are still Royal Griffith Knights patrolling around the Imperial City of Imperial Capital. Do you think they would allow a succubus to roam the streets of the Imperial Capital? Saldak thought about it. After all, a big city is destined to be a place where strong people gather. I thought it would be safer to summon her there when I had the chance to go there. So I said, Well, I'll wait until I have the chance to go there. Whenever I go to a beautiful place, I will temporarily summon you there. Aphrodite rolled her eyes helplessly, sighed and said, So I guess I'd better go back and guard your volcano territory. Serdak grabbed the guardrail of the balcony with both hands, pushed Aphrodite with his shoulder, and asked, By the way, I remember you told me that if I went to the big battlefield, you wouldn't help me deal with those fellow demons. Why did you change your mind later? Aphrodite gave Serdak a strange look and said, No, I have been avoiding your fight with them. But I don't want you to die easily. After all, we have a symbiosis contract. Right? Although I will avoid you fighting with them. I don't mind if you hunt down those exiled H, L lords. The fact that they can be sent here shows that they have done some unforgivable things in the demon clan. And because they signed they cannot be executed after certain contracts. So they can only be exiled here on the battlefield. I have no burden in my heart to help you kill them. After hearing Aphrodite's explanation, Serdak finally understood and said, So that's how it is. Then Serdak accompanied Aphrodite to have a sumptuous dinner in the restaurant on the first floor of the hotel. The waiters at the hotel were deeply impressed by Serdak and knew that he was a generous and gentlemanly nobleman. When I saw it, I was very attentive to help him choose a seat, handed him the menu, and recommended tonight's special dishes. Serdak felt that it would be better for him to keep a low profile when he secretly appeared in Benna City. So he chose a quiet corner near the window. As dishes were served one after another, Aphrodite was often watching Serdak eat alone. Outside the window is the inner courtyard of the Circle Hotel. It is already early November, and the first snow has fallen in Benna City. After the snow in the entire courtyard was cleared, a barrier was built next to the low wall of the inner corridor. Snow wall. At night, Pillar lamps are also lit in the inner courtyard. A gorgeous magic caravan stopped at the door of the hotel. After the car door was opened, an elegant aristocratic man stepped out of the car. Soldak saw the emblem of the Christie family on the carriage carriage at a glance. It was precisely because he saw the familiar family emblem that Serdak decided to take another look. 
The nobleman seemed familiar, but he didn't seem to have any dealings with him. When Serdak was slightly startled, two noble ladies stepped out of the carriage. When they stepped out of the carriage, they looked a little sloppy, as if they had drunk some wine. They did not go into the restaurant, but went directly to the second floor of the hotel from the special stairs next to the restaurant. After his figure disappeared, Soldak patted his forehead and remembered that he seemed to be Darcy Christie's husband. No wonder he felt familiar when he saw him. But he couldn't remember it. Speaking of it, he had only met him once. Just fate. It is impossible for the Christie family not to buy a mansion in Benna City. But now, he has brought two ladies to stay in this hotel. It seems that there is something wrong. Aphrodite followed Soldak's gaze and looked out the window. Just in time to see the Christie family's magic caravan slowly leaving. What are you looking at? Have you met someone you know? Aphrodite asked curiously. An acquaintance, so to speak. Soldak smiled faintly. He wasn't very familiar with him, but he was somewhat familiar with his wife. You smiling woman? Aphrodite asked with some disgust. Soldak shook his head and said nothing. He knew that he was not qualified to judge Dars's husband. Suddenly, the dinner seemed to be boring. Serdak wiped the corners of his mouth with a napkin and said, I'm full. It's getting late. It's time for me to go back. I wish you a good dream tonight. Aphrodite held up a fork with a mutton chop on it and looked at Soldak in astonishment, wondering why he suddenly wanted to leave. Serdak raised his wine glass to each other, and the two drank the sweet wine in one gulp. Serdak stood up, and Aphrodite could only stand up with him. In fact, she actually wanted to eat more. This dinner still tasted okay for Aphrodite. The waiter eagerly handed over a bill. Soldak took out seven silver coins and handed them to the waiter, then turned and left the restaurant. After sending Aphrodite back to the room, Serdak also returned to the Blue Bridge Fortress on the battlefield through the Void Gate. At this time, the wolf orc knight lying in Gilladon's room also woke up from his coma. He opened his eyes and saw the dome ceiling made of gray stone. He opened his mouth to make a sound, but found that his throat was a little dry and he couldn't make any sound. He wanted to move, but his whole body ached. At this time, Bonita's whimper woke him up from his confusion. He remembered his previous battle. He and his companions were chopped down to the ground by demon warriors almost at the same time. So maybe he was dead now. How can I still feel the pain in my body when I am an H? L. The wolf orc knight turned his head and saw Bonita's huge head approaching. And her warm and wet tongue kept licking his face. Chapter 1186 Dividends The two-headed ogre Gulitum walked into the room carrying a huge wooden tray, which was almost full of barbecued meat and baked wheat cakes. This is the dinner he brought back for the giant frost wolf. During the recent period, this frost wolf has been keeping close to the wolf orc knight almost every step of the way. When he is sleepy, he will squint his eyes and sleep for a while. As long as there is any noise, it can make it wake up immediately. Gulitum saw that the wolf orc knight had opened his eyes. And then he said in surprise, Hey, you're awake. After saying that, he put the dinner plate aside, walked quickly out of the dormitory door, leaned out from the railing of the outer corridor, and shouted upstairs, Toldak, that orc is awake. You have to get off. Want to take a look? The ogre had a loud voice, and he shouted from downstairs, and everyone on the east side of the Blue Bridge Fortress heard his shout. Serdak just walked out of the void gate at this time, and heard Gulitum calling from downstairs. Serdak quickly opened the door and walked out, quickly walked down the stairs, and came to Gulitum, outside the room. Dak, you came just in time for the orc to wake up. The ogre shouted to Serdak. Serdak walked into the room and saw the wolf orc lying flat on a bed. His body was still wrapped in bandages like a mummy, but he was awake at the moment. He had been unconscious all the way from Death Ridge to now. Gulitum only fed him some broth along the way, but the broth couldn't support his nutritional needs at all, and he lost a lot of weight during this period. When he came to the side of the orc, the frost wolf actually stepped back and made room for Serdak. The wolf orc looked at Serdak carefully and said in imperial language that was not very fluent. Thank you guys for saving me. Gulitum smiled heartily and said, Fortunately, you know some imperial language. None of us understand orc language very well. Serdak sat down next to the wolf orcs and said casually, When I found you in an unknown valley in Death Ridge, all your companions were already dead. At that time, you, your companion, tried your best to block the demons. When the soldiers attacked, our people arrived just in time to save you. You need to rest well now. You can leave at any time after you recover from your injuries. 
Am I the only one alive? There was endless disappointment in the eyes of the wolf orc. Serdak nodded. The wolf orc was lying flat on the bed. And the look of despair in his eyes made Serdak slightly startled. Serdak told Gulitam. Feed him something to eat later. Gulitam nodded repeatedly. Brought over the huge dinner plate placed aside. And said proudly to Serdak. Don't worry. I'm ready. Serdak nodded and checked the current injuries of the wolf orcs. The orcs' physique was obviously much stronger than that of the Imperial people. And their recovery power was several times that of the Imperial people. The injuries on his body healed very quickly. Seeing that the wolf orc was fine, Serdak left Gulitam's room. He then ran to Commander Adolphus' office to report on his itinerary these days, and the information on his exploration of the neutral zone. Commander Adolphus had already heard from Deans and Musta that Serdak's patrol team returned to Blue Bridge Fortress safely. Seeing that his right arm was still bandaged, he asked, Injured? Well, I got scratched during the battle, and it's almost healed, Serdak said and moved his arms. Seeing this, Commander Adolphus nodded slightly and said, Since we are back safely, let's take a three-day break. Your team will be on patrol the day after tomorrow. Yes, Commander. Serdak performed a military salute and placed a wooden box in front of Commander Adolphus' desk, which contained the head of a three-headed sea serpent. When I went out this time, I happened to meet a three-headed sea snake. The Lord of Hell. This is a gift I brought back to you. Serdak said respectfully. Commander Adolphus was a little surprised. Unexpectedly, Serdak actually prepared a gift for him. This time, Commander Adolphus had tacitly approved the fact that the Serdak patrol team left the fortress to hunt the Hell Lord in Death Ridge. So whether or not this gift was given had no impact on the matter. Deans and Musta, who were standing aside, saw the ferocious snake head inside the wooden box. Their eyes filled with envy. Serdak didn't stay too long in Commander Adolphus' office. He saw the commander nodded slightly and left. After Serdak left, Deans and Musta gathered around the wooden box and carefully examined the sea snake head inside. Deans said enviously, I didn't expect Serdak to be so powerful. I really brought the three-headed sea snake back from Death Ridge. Musta also took the opportunity to say, Uncle, can you talk to Soldak again? When he goes to Death Ridge next time, we also want to join his hunting team. Commander Adolphus rubbed his forehead helplessly and sighed before saying, I gave you a chance, but you couldn't seize it. Now you know it's too late to regret it. Five days later, Soldak led a patrol team to return from a patrol mission in the mountains on the east side. He saw the four-wheeled carriage used by Old Haman to carry goods parked next to the stables below the fortress. It seems that Old Haman has returned from the Chaos Fortress. Serdak immediately dismounted and threw the reins to Samira, who was following behind. Since the Serdak team returned to Blue Bridge Fortress, Bard has returned to his own patrol team and led his team of constructed swordsmen to perform missions. Serdak's team is actually missing two members. And Andrew is also lying in bed, recovering from his injuries. So their team actually only has four people at the moment. Under the instruction of Commander Adolphus, Bart also tried to ask Serdak if his patrol team wanted to add two more members. But Serdak prevaricated him by saying C and N. Carrie Decker carried a shotgun on his back and stepped out with his two long legs. His heavy iron boots made a crunching sound when he stepped on the masonry ground of the fortress. She followed Serdak. And after dismounting, she took off her helmet with a cold black iron mask and held it in her arms. Gary Decker will become Serdak's follower at this time and follow him around. Samira led the three horses straight into the stables. The half-elf archer didn't like walking around in the fortress. After she handed the horses to the grooms in the stables, she would return to the room to rest. The first thing the ogre did when he returned to the fortress was to have a big meal in the cafeteria. And he also wanted to return to the room as soon as possible to check on the wolf orc knight. Soldak came to the public area on the third floor of Blue Bridge Fortress and saw many people surrounding the door of the logistics team, queuing up to receive items. Only Gary Decker lined up quietly at the back of the team. When everyone saw Soldak walking in, they all gave way to their seats. Soldak didn't want such a privilege. And besides, he had a lot of things to do. Once he walked in first, the people behind him didn't know how long they would have to wait. So he took Gary Decker to sit in the pub opposite for a while. When the bartender saw Soldak sitting in front of the bar, he poured him a large glass of ale without asking, and then pushed over a plate of salted peanuts. Gary Decker motioned to the bartender for a similar cup. How was your day? The bartender asked Soldak. This time the demon army retreated completely. We walked around the mountains on the east side and found no trace of the demon warriors. Serdak took a sip first 
and then added some ice cubes to it. Gary Dicker sat silently, looking around with his lips pursed. Some construct knights from the Ababa province took the opportunity to come over and say H, lo to Gary Dicker. And the front of the bar in the tavern was instantly filled with people. Finally, when there were no knights waiting in line to redeem supplies at the door of Old Haman, Soldak drank the last sip of ale in the cup, waved to the bartender, and walked into the logistics team's room with Gary Decker. Old Haman was doing calculations in the account book with his glasses on. He looked up and saw Soldak, moved his glasses down the bridge of his nose, and then said, I thought you wouldn't come today. Serdak smiled and moved closer to the counter. Old Haman first placed a cloth bag on the counter. The rope at the mouth of the bag was opened, and it was filled with unidentified magic crystals. 248 in total. This includes the total harvest after selling three-headed sea snake skin, dragon eagle feathers, crypt lord high-grade leather, and other warcraft materials. After saying that, he pushed a list to Sir. In front of Dak, he added, The detailed prices of all the supplies are on the list. You can check them when you have the opportunity in the future. You can also go to the market to find out the market price, Old Haman said proudly. Apparently, Senior Heyman sold three pieces of high-quality leather for a good price. However, on the battlefield, these high-grade Warcraft leathers can be regarded as hard currency. And there is a market in the Chaos Fortress. After all, those second-order and above magic pattern structures are made of these high-grade leathers. Serdak immediately poured the bag of unidentified black magic crystals on the table. This time, there were six people in Serdak's team. So Serdak decisively divided these unidentified black magic crystals into six parts, each containing 40 magic crystals. He put the remaining eight magic crystals into his pocket and told Jilly. Decker said, The remaining eight magic crystals will be used as funds for the team's hunting activities for the time being. In the future, all consumables needed for hunting will be reimbursed internally by the team. Gary Decker had rose like red lips and looked at Soldak in disbelief. She didn't expect that she could get so much in one outing if she could get such a gain in another outing. Then the money she earned would be enough to buy a set of elementary magic pattern structures. What made her feel even more considerate was that the consumables needed for hunting could be reimbursed, which meant that those expensive magic-breaking bullets in the future did not need to be paid for out-of-pocket. At this moment, Gary Decker wanted to hug Solda. K. Kiss him wildly on the face a few times. Old Heyman also looked surprised and said, You are really a generous captain! Serdak laughed and said, that's why I will strictly limit the members of the team. If there are more people, open more mouths. I'm afraid there won't be much sharing by then. Old Heyman said to Soldek again. This time, I will hang the information about your long-handled epic weapon on the black market trading bulletin board. I believe it will not take long for buyers to see it. Wait for the next trading day. Let's go see what's suitable. However, I have a suggestion. Old Heyman said. Please tell me. Soldek raised his head and looked at Old Heyman. I estimate that those who want to buy this epic weapon may not be able to exchange it for epic weapons of the same level, especially your specific epic weapons. Even if they have the type of epic weapon you need, it may not be very special. We need this giant war scythe, Old Heyman said slowly. I think you can actually mark a price slightly higher than the market price and trade unidentified black magic crystals. These black magic crystals are always hard currency on the battlefield. It will be easy to buy them back when you find a suitable weapon. When Soldak heard what old Haman said, he felt that Haman was right. So he nodded in agreement. The two then discussed how many magic crystals this epic weapon could sell for. Serdak looked at the sky strike bow in Samira's hand and felt that the price of this type of epic weapon should be around 1,200 magic crystals. Old Haman shook his head after hearing this and directly changed the magic crystal into an unidentified black magic crystal, which meant that the price doubled. If you can, come with me to the Chaos Fortress in two weeks. I guess someone will take a fancy to that giant war scythe. Okay, I just want to take a look at the black market. Serdak readily agreed. The climate of the battlefield remains unchanged all year round. During the day, it is so hot that you would like to lie down in the shade without wearing anything. At night, it will rain and freeze, forming a thick layer of ice. At this time, the city of Alanza had already been closed by heavy snow. The nobles in the city had stocked up on acorns early, and the rich gathered in front of the fireplace to play cards, eat and drink. The poor will also hide at home at this time, and the whole family will huddle together to keep warm, since they do not need to work. They can change their three meals a day into two meals, if they are worried about insufficient physical reserves, 
they can also turn one of their meals into thin. The winter in the desolate land is extremely cold this year. But since most of the residents have moved to Wall Village, this winter is not too difficult. Even families with insufficient winter savings can get good subsidies as long as they are willing to clear snow and ice in the village. Patrol at night. Guard sheep pens. Etc. After people have eaten enough and are dressed warmly, they occasionally raise their heads and see the exquisite villas in the mountain call that are almost as high as the fifth level dam of the reservoir. They will also think of the man who just came back from the battlefield and led the whole village to live a happy life. The man of life, Serdek. I heard that he has enjoyed great success recently. He not only married a beautiful daughter of a marquis as his wife, but is also managing a city as big as Alensa. He will never return to Wall Village again. Chapter 1187 Prophet's Industry This is the third time Soldak has come to the Chaos Fortress. And now, he has a clearer understanding of the fortress. Old Haman brought Soldak to the Fortress of Chaos. After they entered the city this time, the carriage zigzagged in the narrow alleys before arriving at a small hotel. In the hotel, except for the proprietress, there were only a groom and a maid. This family-style hotel only had three rooms. Old Haman drove the carriage into the yard, and occupied two of the rooms with Soldak. The yard is very small. And the house is also a three-story attic. But the first floor only has the living room, kitchen, utility room, and servant's room. There are only three guest rooms on the second floor. In addition to the terrace that takes up half of the area on the third floor, only the attic has been decorated as the master room. Although the landlady looked delicate, she already had some crow's feet at the corners of her eyes. And her figure was a bit too plump. She and Old Haman must be very familiar with each other. They prepared two rooms for him without much communication. A family-style hotel like this is responsible for two meals a day. If necessary, they can also provide some simple meals at noon. The dinner was prepared with mogan fish soup and grilled deep-water giant crocodile neck meat. Serdak did not expect to be able to eat precious Warcraft ingredients here. After dinner, Old Haman took Soldak out to participate in black market transactions. This time the two of them did not drive the carriage, but walked through the messy alleys for a long time. Soldak even suspected that old Haman took him through the entire residential area of the fortress. Just follow me later. Don't ask. And don't look around. Old Haman warned Soldak. Soldak nodded, indicating that he understood. It wasn't until he came to the door of a house deep in an alley that old Haman knocked on the door. The large cold iron door did not open, but the small window above the iron door was opened revealing a face covered with scars. Old Haman handed over a badge, and the man stretched out his hand to grab it, and then immediately retracted his arm into the door. After a while, the door was opened a small crack, and Old Haman squeezed in with Soldak. After taking back the badge from the scarred man, Old Haman walked into the house without saying a word. He actually led Soldak across the living room. There were actually people chatting in the living room. The two of them. The old man sat in front of the fireplace, with a thick blanket on his knees. Without saying a word, Old Haman walked to the back door of the house and opened the back door. There was actually a simple portal on the wall inside. Serdak's usual temporary portals cost dozens of magic crystals to pass through each time. Old Haman didn't even speak and walked into the portal. Serdak followed closely behind. The scenery in front of me suddenly changed. It turned out to be a magnificent hall. There were many lights in the hall, but it was pitch black outside the windows and each window had a soft gauze curtain. This hall looks very spacious inside. At a rough glance, it should be a long and narrow building 100 meters long and 20 meters wide. Above the head is a vaulted ceiling, with a crystal magic chandelier hanging down every 10 meters. The hall was covered with a thick red carpet, but the red carpet was covered with long tables, and many goods were placed directly on these long tables. There was bound to be someone guarding the table with the items on it. Serdak took a quick look and found that the table was filled with very precious items, from magic materials to magic potions, from Warcraft leather to magic pattern structures. At least half of the items were things Serdak had never seen before. Soldak and Old Hyman came down from a high platform. Obviously Old Hyman is a frequent visitor here. Someone greeted him just after he came down from the high platform. You old guy! What good stuff do you have this time? I heard that you brought a dragon eagle to the last trade fair. Do you have the path of an elf merchant? Hey, do you understand the rules? Buyers don't ask where the goods come from. And buyers don't ask where the goods go. Old Haman said lazily, and then led Soldek inside. Old Haman, Old Haman, wait a minute. I just want to know if there is more. The man quickly followed up 
and asked Old Heyman, but his way was blocked by two guards guarding the wall of the hall. Obviously, this kind of unreasonable entanglement is not allowed in this trading hall. Seeing the man retreating helplessly, Soldak felt that this underground trading market really had some systems. Judging from the layout in the hall, it looked a bit like some trade fairs in later generations. Soldak walked a few steps quickly to follow Old Heyman, and the two passed in front of a row of booths made of magic patterns. Serdak asked in a low voice, Old Heyman, we came here after passing through the temporary teleportation circle. So, no matter whether the transaction is successful or not, do we have to pay a teleportation fee? Old Heyman stopped, glanced at Soldak, and asked, did you get ripped off too many times by the people from the Astrologers' Union when you were at Benna? And you have a shadow in your heart? Ah? Soldak didn't understand what the old Haman meant. Old Haman sneered and said, Although the cost of this kind of temporary teleportation array is not low, the price is definitely not as outrageous as you think. It usually ranges from one to several magic crystals. The reason why the teleportation fee of the Astrologers' Guild is so high the price is set so high simply because they set the price high and it has nothing to do with the transmission cost. Serdak was a little dumbfounded. He didn't expect that the teleportation hall of the Green Empire was also a monopoly industry. Old Heyman took Soldak to a notice board. This one was on the wall at one end of the hall. The notice board was 20 meters long and 2 meters high. It was filled with all kinds of information. Many people were interested in it. Stand in front of the notice board and look at the information. Old Heyman came to the far left and pointed to a message on the notice board. Serdak then saw some information about the epic weapon, the Great War Scythe, written on it, followed by the transaction method, which required an exchange for a stick-like epic weapon of the same quality. This information was actually marked with nine exclamation points. Old Heyman pointed to the check mark behind another transaction information and introduced to Soldak. Did you see it? If it's a matching number, it proves that there are buyers who meet this requirement waiting. Each matching number means there is a buyer waiting. There are three check marks after that information, which means that three buyers will compete for it. If there is an exclamation mark on it, it means there are buyers waiting who do not meet the information requirements. That means they cannot give you what you want, but they still try to contact you and buy the goods. Lao Hai Man continued. Serdak did not expect that this giant war scythe would be so popular. Old Heyman patted Soldak on the shoulder and whispered to him, Let's go. I will take you to change the transaction information. In addition, you can also stroll around here to see if there is anything you need. Old Hyman took Soldak to a suspended platform on the second floor of the hall, from which he could overlook the trading status of the entire hall. Old Hyman told some information to a magician wearing a magic robe. The magician quickly recorded it, and then told Old Hyman that it was okay. The magic clerks here are very busy. There are many people waiting to register transaction information, and many people are applying to cancel transaction information after the transaction is completed. While Old Heyman went to deal with other things, Soldak wandered in the hall. As Old Heyman introduced, almost all the high-end magic items in this hall were high-end. This time, he mainly wanted to see the price of the second-order magic pattern structure. As soon as he arrived at the area filled with various magic pattern structures, Serdak saw at a glance the set of Eisenhard magic pattern structures given to him by Marquis Luther. Serdak walked up curiously and took a look. When this set of magic pattern structure is put on the wooden figure and placed on the table of the long table, the entire set of magic pattern structure still looks brand new. Even if it is old, it has been refurbished. That set of magic pattern structure seems to be no different from the one I am wearing. Even certain details and patterns are the same. Then he curiously looked at the price sign, which clearly stated 440 unidentified black magic crystals. Based on the current exchange rate, it would take nearly 900 magic crystals to buy such a price. A set of second-level demonic equipment is really not that expensive. Because Old Heyman had discussed the price of this type of second-order magic pattern structure with Serdak before. He was not that surprised. However, the sword and shield suit was obviously not suitable for Andrew. Let alone Samira. So Serdak had no desire to buy it. On the contrary, in a row of magic robe stalls, Serdak saw a very well-designed gray-white magic robe with stone patterns. A great mage in front of the stall was introducing this magic robe to the people around him. Soldak then came closer. I heard the great mage say proudly, This sea snakeskin magic robe is the top magic robe that a second-level archmage can equip. After wearing it, not only the magic power will be enhanced, but the casting speed will also be much faster. 
almost all first level magic can be guaranteed to be cast instantly. In addition, this robe is carefully made from the skin of a three-headed sea snake. It has strong magic resistance. Whether it is the four elements of water, fire, wind, earth, or the dark element curse element, it has strong resistance. Master Horus Harry, how much does your sea snake skin magic robe cost? Someone in the crowd couldn't help but ask. The black magic crystal is currently priced at 150 and has not yet been identified. Archmage Horus said with great interest. A group of people shouted. There are many magicians among these people. And they are obviously secretly discussing it in private. It can be seen that many people are tempted. Serdak stood behind the crowd and was a little dumbfounded. Because he saw that the material of the three sea snake skin magic robes was clearly his own three-headed sea snake skin. He did not expect that in just seven days. He would turn into three magic robes. I remember that according to the sales prize details given by Old Hyman, the entire sea snake skin was sold for only 80 unidentified black magic crystals. Moreover, three robes were made from this skin in one go. And the value instantly increased by more than five times. Some, I really don't know how much money these inscription masters and high-level tailors make from it. Chapter 1188 Underground Market Old Heyman emerged from the crowd. He modified the transaction information posted on the notice board on the second floor platform. When he saw Suldak standing in the crowd, he walked quickly towards this side. Archmage Horus saw Old Heyman at a glance. He quickly put down the sea snake skin magic robe in his hand, quickly separated the crowd, stopped Old Heyman, and said to Old Heyman with a smile, Old Heyman, your three-headed sea snake skin is simply a lucky skin. Do you know that I originally cut out three parts of the base material for the magic robe? and thought about trying to make three sea snake skin magic robes. Although I drew the success rate of this second level magic pattern array is a little low. But if one of the three can be made successfully, I will definitely make a profit. But now you see, I actually succeeded in making it three times in a row. Ha ha. This is really lucky sea snake skin. Archmage Horus came close to Old Haman, put one hand on his rickety body, and said happily, when Old Haman saw Suldak standing aside, his face darkened, and he asked bravely, That's why you kept the price of that sea snake skin so low. Archmage Horus Harry quickly pointed at Old Haman's forehead and said with a smile, Hey, you're going too far. The purchase price I gave is not low. You know the price I gave is a little higher than the market price. But this sea snake skin is really beautiful. Lucky. Ha uh ha. -huh. As he spoke, Archmage Horus smiled proudly again, obviously in a very good mood. Old Haman patted Archmage Horus on the back and said to him, Come on! Horus, let me introduce you to a friend. Hearing what Old Haman said, Archmage Horus quickly stopped smiling and turned his head as Old Haman looked over. Old Haman waved to Serdak, who was outside the crowd. And Serdak squeezed through the crowd and stood in front of Archmage Horus. Old Haman introduced Master Horus. This is Serdak, a second-level strongman who came to the battlefield from the Bena province. A friendly smile appeared on Archmage Horus's face. But that smile was somewhat commercial. Like a businessman facing his customers. Old Haman then said to Soldak, This is Archmage Horus Harry. A magic tailor who specializes in making magic robes. Your sea snake skin was sold to him. But this this guy got some bad luck and made three sea snake skin magic robes in a row. And then he succeeded. In order to avoid Soldak's misunderstanding, he had to say something more. When Archmage Horus heard what Old Haman said, he realized that the young man in front of him was actually a very powerful demon hunter. Those who can come to the battlefield are basically second-level experts. But among so many second-level powerhouses, not many of them have the courage to go to Death Ridge to hunt down some of the lords who were exiled here by the demons. You got that sea snake skin. The magic power contained in the leather has almost not been lost. It must have been hunted recently. Archmage Horus patted Serdak's shoulder affectionately and said, Saldak nodded and said calmly, Yes, just over half a month ago. Archmage Horus smiled and praised Old Haman. The province of Bena is really full of talents. I am Horus Harry. In the future, if you have this kind of Warcraft leather suitable for high-level magic robes, you can come at any time. If Chaos Fortress comes to me, my purchase price will always be the most reasonable on the market. Old Haman waved his hand impatiently and said, Okay, if we have this kind of leather in the future, we will come to you. Dak and I have other things to do. And we don't have time to listen to your nagging. You'd better go to your stall and take care of it. Archmage Horus said angrily. Old Haman, you are the most boring person. 
Just as he was about to turn around and answer the stall, Sernak took the opportunity to say, Archmage Horus, if you say so, I really have some magic leather ready to be sold. I will visit you again later. Archmage Horus's eyes lit up, and he immediately stared at Soldak expectantly. Okay, I will stay here tonight, and we will talk later. After saying that, he turned around and left. At this time, Old Heyman stared at Soldak in surprise and asked, You actually still have some inventory on hand. Sardak smiled honestly and explained, I got it from the hunt in the Belen Plain, but the leather was not peeled off from the Warcraft Lord. I estimate that those Warcraft should only be at level 4. Sardak was thinking of the hides of the ghostly patterned Ant Queens, apart from taking out a little bit and giving them to Lance and his friends. Most of the remaining Queen Ant hides were still stored in the magic ceiling box because even there is no such high in magic market in Bena City, and he doesn't have time to go to the auction house. So these leathers have always been sealed in the magic box. After hearing what Soldak said, Old Heyman suddenly lost interest. Old Heyman patted Soldak on the back and said to him, Oh, let's not talk about the leather. Some people have already taken a liking to your epic battle scythe. They are some of the people who left exclamation marks on the notice board. When they saw this message, they want to trade with unidentified magic crystals. Now after I changed the information, I came to us directly through the underground market management. I hope to talk to us in person. The buyers are now in this hall and hope to have an interview. Serdak didn't expect that this giant war scythe would be so popular. Since neither Andrew nor Ghoul Item wanted to use this kind of weapon, he wouldn't be able to use it either. If he sold it earlier, he could buy something else. After thinking about it this way, I decided to meet those buyers. Soldak wanted to hear Old Heyman's opinion. So he asked him, Old Heyman, what do you think? Let's go. This kind of deal must be seen after all. Heyman Sr. said to Soldak. Sardak followed Old Heyman to the second floor of the underground trading hall. The high platform here was built in a circle against the wall. The central area is where the market manager works. Sardak is here. At that time, I also saw a group of people registering transaction item information with the market manager. The lively scene below the hall feels like a vegetable hall in a farmer's market. There are also some negotiation-style conference tables and chairs around the high platform on the second floor. There are already some people around the table trading items. Soldak discovered that the managers of this underground market were not actually involved in the transactions. They only provided some security for buyers and sellers. Old Heyman took Soldak and followed a trading officer to a vacant long square table and said to Old Heyman, For this interview, you need to bring out the trading items, and we will be responsible for the transaction. The item is safe within the market limits during the period before it is sold. Serdak didn't say anything more and directly pulled the wooden crate out of the magic waste bag. His cold ripper crashed into a long and narrow wooden box. The entire dark golden weapon was wrapped in a thick layer of linen. It didn't look as gorgeous as the packaging of the low-end magic weapons in the weapon store. The underground market trader's eyes froze for a moment. And then, he saw Serdak tearing off the linen wrapped around the weapon. Suddenly, a strong black demonic energy emanated from the giant battle scythe and wrapped around the entire giant battle scythe, making people feel very uncomfortable. The sharp edge looked like a willow leaf slightly bent to one side. The entire long handle is nearly three meters long. The dark golden handle is engraved with complex magic patterns. And a black magic crystal is inlaid at the end. The trading officer stepped forward to check it out briefly, then nodded slightly. Then he asked two guards wearing structural armor to guard the side. And the trader left in a hurry. Not long after, when the trading officer returned, six people followed him. There were four nobles among them. They were wearing exquisite noble attires. The two in front seemed polite, but they had no communication. The two people walking in the middle were whispering as they walked, seemingly discussing something. The two knights at the back were wearing gorgeous second-level magic pattern structures, and they had the smell of a battlefield. The trader led them to the square table and asked them to sit down opposite Suldek and Old Heyman. He did not introduce the identities of the two parties and only said, They are planning to buy the epic weapon Giant War Scythe. We have verified the purchasing power of the six buyers. And now several of them can try this epic weapon. But no damage is allowed. Hearing what the trader said, the nobleman sitting on the far right was a little reserved, then took out a pair of white gloves from his arms and put them on his hands, then carefully dragged the Giant War Scythe and placed it on the before. While they were appraising this giant war scythe, Old Heyman introduced it to Soldak in a low voice. Duck, have you seen those four guys in noble attire? They are actually merchants in the Chaos Fortress. 
they often come to the underground market to buy some goods and then sell them in the stores they opened in the fortress. The one on the far right is called Derek Downey. He runs a weapons store called Giant. I heard that he has some friendship with the Bronzebeard Dwarves and can often come up with some sophisticated weapons made by dwarf craftsmen. The guy sitting next to him is named Bernard Moltz. This guy is a warmonger. He specializes in buying some trophies on the battlefield and selling them in stores. This guy is the commander of the fortress on the battlefield. The two people in the middle are called Hiram and Edmund. They are the leaders of the Arnold family in the Chaos Fortress. Their family is also an old family that deals in magic weapons. These guys all run weapon stores. I guess there should be other epic weapons in their weapon stores. But if you want to buy them, the price will definitely not be cheap. So if you want to exchange for other epic weapons, you have to break through them. As for those two knights, not all of them are buyers. The person who is interested in this epic weapon should be just one of them. Why do you say that? Old Heyman narrowed his eyes and said, Because I know those two guys. And one of them will definitely not be able to take out a thousand magic crystals in his pocket. Uh, okay. Serdak immediately closed his mouth. After all six buyers had inspected the giant war scythe, the trader said, If anyone is not interested in this epic weapon, you can leave. The six people looked at each other and had no intention of leaving. Now please tell the seller how much you want to trade. You have the right to decide to sell this epic weapon to any one of them. The market trading officer continued. Serdak and Old Heyman looked at each other. And seeing Old Heyman nodding, Serdak said, For this epic weapon, we expect to sell it for 1,200 unidentified pieces. Magic crystal. Of course, if you have other epic weapons of the same quality and material, such as Bone Crusher or Judger, I am very willing to exchange them equally. Or it can be two butchers' eyes. The latter sentence was said by Old Heyman. As a classic epic weapon, the butcher's eye has been imitated by almost countless dwarf craftsmen. And Andrew now has an imitation in his hands. Of course, these epic weapons are not the only ones. They are just more precious. The butcher's eye is very popular among the dwarves. So it exists in a large number of people. It is used in everything. And once it is too much, it is worthless. That's why Old Heyman said that only two epic weapons, Butcher's Eyes, could be exchanged for this giant battle scythe. Derek, the owner of the weapon store who still wears white gloves on his hands. Dowdy gave Old Hyman a hard look and said, Old Hyman, I'm 70% certain that your words are specifically aimed at me. Old Heyman chuckled and said without fear of the occasion, Then I officially announce that the last sentence will be removed. We only need bone fragments or a verdict. Derek, Dowdy immediately turned cold and stopped talking. Old Heyman, you also know that we don't have anything to gain from such a flat exchange. I think it's better to buy it with unidentified black magic crystals. Although the price of 1,200 magic crystals is a bit high. It is a handful after all. The long handle is rare in the market. So our firm is still willing to continue the negotiation. Bernard Moltz, whom Old Heyman called a warmonger, said with a smile. Old Heyman, you also know that I am different from them. I bought this epic weapon purely to improve its combat power. I can barely get rid of 1,200 unidentified black magic crystals. I hope you can sell it to me. The construct knight sitting on the far left said sincerely. Old Heyman just shrugged his shoulders and made a helpless gesture, indicating that he was helpless. Serdak did not expect that the high price he had negotiated with Old Heyman would be accepted by these people. Obviously the price should be low. The market trading officer coughed at this time, and then said, If the seller has not made a preferred choice, then if you still want to buy, you must increase the purchase price. Only then did Serdak understand this trading model. If only one person buys, the formal transaction may have begun now. But if four companies compete, then the transaction becomes a directional auction. Chapter 1189 Underground Market 2 No one of these buyers have ugly faces. They seem to want to buy, but don't want to spend more. At this time, no one was even willing to speak first. Everyone was silent. Derek, the owner of the trading company, coughed and said, Otherwise, if the three of us jointly purchase it, we will jointly own this epic weapon. Before Derek, the owner of the trading firm, finished speaking, Hiram and Edmund of the Arnold family looked at each other, and then said, We, the Arnold family, are willing to buy it for 1,250 magic crystals. Obviously, they don't want to participate in this joint land purchase model. I am willing to pay for 1,300 unidentified magic crystals. The construct knight's eyes darkened, and he gritted his teeth and added a price. 
looking at his face. He knew that that should be his limit. Serdak was even a little tempted, thinking that since it had exceeded his psychological expectations, it would actually be good to sell it to a knight who needed to use it. But before he could speak, Old Haman secretly poked him in the ribs. Soldak shut up immediately. 1,350 magic crystals. Warmonger Bernard Moltz lowered his head and said, 1,000 for 100 unidentified magic crystals. Derek, the owner of the trading company, said with a helpless expression and increased the price. Then the warmonger Bernard Moltz lowered his head and raised his hands to express his resignation. The warmonger brothers Bernard Moltz also gave up. Seeing that they all gave up, the two construct knights also raised their hands and gave up without hesitation. In this way, Serdak's cool ripper giant battle scythe was sold to Derek Dowie, the owner of the master weapon store, for a high price of 1,400 magic crystals. Now that the transaction has been successful, others left the square table early. During the transaction, Derek Doughty stared at Old Heyman coldly and said, It's really uncomfortable to trade with people like you. The market trading officer counted the unidentified magic crystals and received the transaction tax for 10 additional unidentified magic crystals from Derek Doughty. Then he handed the unidentified magic crystals to Soldek and handed the giant battle scythe to Derek Doughty. Only then did Old Heyman speak to Derek Doughty. I hope we don't have the chance to cooperate next time. Although the two of them didn't glare at each other, there was a hint of anger in their eyes. After Derek Doughty got the epic weapon, he checked it again, and then looked at Soldak carefully before hurriedly going downstairs and leaving. Old Heyman leaned on the chair and was not in a hurry to leave. He whispered to Soldak, Do you know why I stopped you just now? I didn't let you sell to Bates. Oh, it's the Construct Knight who made the bid, Serdak immediately said, because you know there will be a higher price next. Now the money bag has been put into his magic pocket. No, although I know that Derek Dowdy has a lower price in mind, I am not stopping you because of this. After all, that thing belongs to you and you have absolute control. Old Heyman shook his head, smiled and explained to Soldek. I just wanted to remind you that the Bates Knight is actually with Derek Dowdy. The Bates Knight can't afford that much money at all. He just wants to play a bitter card and replace Derek Dowdy. I bought this epic weapon at the lowest price. But the other knight who wanted to buy this weapon didn't even make an offer. Serdak didn't expect that the truth would be like this. Let's go. While we still have some time. Don't you want to see those second level or higher magic pattern structures? Old Heyman patted Soldak on the shoulder and said. I'll take you to the booth selling high-end magic patterns to have a look. Soldak quickly stood up and agreed. Okay. Afterwards. Serdak followed Old Heyman to the exhibition area filled with some magic pattern structures. According to Old Heyman's introduction, Serdak understood. As long as he looked at the exhibitions under these magic pattern structures. Cards. You can learn the specific information of these magic pattern structures. There are more than 20 such booths in the hall. Almost all concentrated in one area. Serdak saw a full covered magic pattern suit on a high platform. The entire magic pattern structure was plated with a thick layer of thorium and the patterns engraved on it were like the exquisite patterns on the stone wall. Relief. This set of magic patterns is almost the most complete set of magic patterns. And the additional magic attributes of the set are also the best. The bidding price actually reached 780 unidentified black magic crystals, which is far higher. The price of other second-level magic pattern structures. Although Serdak is a little tempted by this set of Shigong magic patterns, especially the second-level top-notch sword and shield set. But in the end, he resisted his impulse and set his sights on the other two magic pattern structures. Berserker's script construct and Dala's script construct. Probably due to the low ratio of warriors to archers on the battlefield of the Green Empire. The attributes of these two sets of magic pattern structures are obviously very good, but they are reduced to ordinary second level magic pattern structures. Among them, the price tag for the Vidala magic pattern construct is only 400 unidentified magic crystals. So after some negotiations with Old Heyman, Soldak decisively bought these two sets of magic pattern structures for 800 unidentified magic crystals. Unfortunately, there are no large-sized magic pattern structures suitable for Gurlitum to wear in the market. It seems that if you want Gurlitum to wear this type of second-level magic pattern structure, the only way is to customize it. In addition, Serdak also saw a higher-end third-level magic pattern structure on the black market. The quality of that magic pattern suit has been upgraded to another level. In his eyes, the magic runes engraved on it seemed to be it formed an infinite distortion of space. And magic elements flowed freely on the surface of the magic pattern structure. 
according to the introduction of the Archmage in front of the booth. This type of third-level magic pattern construction is not impossible for the second-level powerhouses to wear, but it requires the powerhouse to have sufficient carrying capacity and massive carrying capacity. And this type of high-level construction the power cannot be fully exerted. Moreover, the price is extremely high. The set of Huaning's Majesty on the booth sold for 2,700 unidentified magic crystals. This price value is ridiculously high. You must know that being promoted to Earl in the Green Empire does not seem to require so many unidentified magic crystals. Serdak also saw blocks of thorium and kryptonite in this underground market, as well as herbs such as sunflower and nightmare grass that were extremely scarce in the market. Just when the transaction in the underground market was about to end, Suldak and Old Haman returned to the booth of Archmage Horus. At this time, Archmage Horus had successfully sold two magic robes of sea snake skin. He happily directed the two magic assistants to clean up the stall. The hall of the underground market became a little chaotic, and many people were leading one after another. Seeing Serdak and Old Hyman returning, Archmage Horus greeted them warmly. He pulled Serdak aside and said, I thought you were gone. What good leather do you have? Show it to me quickly. Archmage Horus said impatiently. Serdak pulled out a magic sealing box from his magic pocket. Now Old Haman was used to the fact that Serdak's bag was full of magic sealing boxes. Opening the magic sealing box, you saw a piece of soft leather that was one meter square and had irregular edges. Archmage Horus also added, I don't need all kinds of leather. The leather I want must be suitable for making magic robes. When Suldak unfolded the leather, Archmage Horus was speechless. He stroked the sparse thorns on the leather, and as the magic power in his hand slowly poured into it, the leather was filled with a dazzling magical glow. This is the kind of leather made from spiritual monsters. It has such excellent magic guiding properties. But why is this leather only so big? Archmage Horus first showed a look of joy on his face, then frowned and said. Then he took another look into the demon sealing box, picked out a piece of leather, and asked Soldak with a puzzled look on his face. Such a good piece of leather. But it's cut like the one from the Crypt Lord. Sardak said helplessly. It's a bit fragmented. Hey, I said since you can hunt such good monster materials, a real skinning master can do it? Do you know how much this will cost? Archmage Horus looked at these ghost pattern and queen magic skins with a heartbroken look on his face and said. Sardak could only nod his head and said. I will try my best to keep them intact next time. This kind of leather is indeed what I need. Come on. Let's find a quiet place to sit and evaluate the price of these leathers. After speaking, Archmage Horus waved to his two assistants and asked them to stay here to pack their things, while he hurriedly left the underground trading market with Suldak and Old Haman. Chapter 1190, The Orc Who Wants Revenge You can find such a quiet tavern in the Chaos Fortress, or it can also be called a restaurant. In short, it can provide most of the wines. Of course, it can also make some simple meals and fried foods. The food here basically, they are all World of Warcraft ingredients and they look quite fresh. The environment in the tavern is not bad. Located on the roof of a commercial building in the market, this should be a place frequented by Archmage Horus. It was already early in the morning when Archmage Horus brought Old Haman and Soldek here. Although the Chaos Fortress has not yet completely quieted down, most shops have already closed. Only two muddy wall lamps were still lit at the entrance of this tavern. The lights seemed to be swaying constantly in the breeze, illuminating the plaque on the roof of the tavern. The room is not big with only two diners and a magician sitting at the bar tasting wine. The reason why most of the guests are kept away is not because the chef's skills are not good, nor is the wine here mixed with a lot of ice water, nor is the price so high that everyone cannot accept it, but because this is a hotel only for magicians. It's an open place, and it's located right on the roof of the business building, so it's not too eye-catching. When Horace pushed open the door and walked in, the bartender in front of the bar immediately smiled faintly and asked, you came a little late today. Business is good? Of course. My business is good every trading day. Archmage Horus said unceremoniously. Since the business is so good, let's take more care of the store's business. What do you want to eat today? The bartender quickly took out three crystal glasses, wiped them quickly, then put some ice cubes in them and filled them with some more. Ching Shui pushed it in front of the three people. The stewed fish and tomato sauce is for three people. Before that, give us some wild wine. Archmage Horus said casually. The three of them did not sit in front of the bar, but chose to sit in the corner of the tavern. The bartender placed a magic lamp on the table, but Archmage Horus placed it on the windowsill. He waved his fingers gently 
and recited a string of spells quickly in his mouth. A little light shone from his fingertips. It rose up and floated quietly above the head of the three-person dining table. Glimmer illumination is just a very simple lighting magic. Most magic apprentices will learn this very practical daily life spell. But Archmage Horus's glimmer illumination is something special. The light emitted was in a cone shape, covering only this small dining table, allowing the three people next to the table to have enough light. The other parts of the tavern were not affected by this light at all, and were still silent in the original atmosphere of the tavern. My laboratory is too messy. The environment here is not bad and quiet enough, Archmage Horus explained. Old Haman smiled slightly, said nothing, and turned to look at Suldak. Serdak placed the demon sealing box at his feet, then took out a piece of soft leather from the ghost patterned Ant Queen and spread it on the table. The leather, which was about one meter square and had extremely irregular edges, was actually soft and smooth. It's like satin, and it's covered with a layer of oily luster. Leather that's as smooth as water is indeed rare. However, there were a few very abrupt red hard thorns growing on it. Serdak did not peel them off from the leather in order to ensure the integrity of the leather. This is a piece of leather from the abdomen of the ghostly patterned Ant Queen. It is the softest piece of leather on her body, Soldak said to Archmage Horus. Archmage Horus stroked the soft leather on the table with his hands. The magic power flowing from his fingertips was like water being sucked into a sponge, spreading quickly and forming a unique cloud on the leather. Pattern? These cloud patterns are not the magic patterns of life, but are just the manifestation of the path of mana flowing in the leather. Archmage Horus sighed in admiration before saying, Go strike Queen Ant. I have heard of this kind of monster. But it looks like your Queen Ant must have just grown up. I guess even the insect wings haven't fallen off yet. That kind of young Queen is a very rare spiritual monster. So its leather has good magic conductivity, making it an excellent material for making magic robes. Apart from the lower level of the monster, which lowers the quality of the leather, there are almost no shortcomings. He paused and then said to Soldek. The only thing that makes me dissatisfied is that your piece of leather is too fragmented. I prefer complete leather to fragmented leather. Because fragmented leather will limit our imagination. Seeing the looks in the eyes of old Haman and Soldek, Archmage Horus laughed at himself and said, You must think that I am just a magic tailor. As long as I have enough cloth and leather, I can cut out magic robes. In fact, I prefer to call myself a designer. I prefer to design functional clothing with magical properties based on the specific properties of leather. Taking the topic a bit far, Archmage Horus coughed lightly and said, Well, although this kind of ghost pattern queen ant leather is very rare, its level is indeed a bit low. After all, it is only a level 4 monster, and the upper limit of the power that the leather can carry is only so much. This kind of leather can only pay you one unidentified magic crystal per square foot. This piece should be 10 square feet in size, and worth 10 unidentified magic crystals. When saying these words, Archmage Horus stared at Suldak. Old Haman, who was sitting next to Suldak, coughed lightly and reminded, Horus, you should know that we won't just ask your family. Archmage Horus quickly raised his hand and said, Okay, okay, I get it. Pay three unidentified magic crystals for every two square feet. If it is less than two square feet, it will be calculated as one square foot and I will not buy those pieces whose actual usable area is less than two square feet. Leather. Serdak glanced at old Haman and saw that he had his head lowered without any eye contact. After thinking for a moment, he agreed to Archmage Horus. Make a deal. Serdak reached out and gave Archmage Horus a high five. Then he began to take out the ghost pattern queen and leather stored in the magic ceiling box one by one. The current transaction price far exceeded Suldak's psychological expectations for these ghost pattern queen ant leathers and the transaction was well guaranteed. So Suldak readily agreed. Archmage Horus saw arrow marks and traces of lightning burns on the leather. He frowned but said nothing. When hunting monsters, there will inevitably be some traces of battle. Fortunately, this kind of leather is only very obvious on the long and narrow strips of leather, which are obviously the eyes of the ghost striped Ant Queen. As the pieces of leather were placed on the table, Archmage Horus discovered that the amount of leather owned by Serdak was somewhat beyond imagination. It seemed that the large magic ceiling box was filled with such high-grade leather. The truth is exactly what Archmage Horus thought. This whole box is almost made of high-grade leather from the ghost pattern Ant Queen. Even though the leather is very fragmentary, the cut shapes seem to be exactly the same. Archmage Horus was also a smart man. He followed the edge shapes of the leather and worked backwards to piece together the rough pieces of the ghost patterned Ant Queen's leather. 
he found that almost all the leather was missing the part on top of the ghost patterned Ant Queen's head. However, Archmage Horus did not ask. The three of them sat in front of the small table and measured almost all the leather. The total amount was about more than 400 square feet. And the total price was 635 unidentified black magic crystals. Archmage Horus took out a money bag with gold threads, smiled and said to Soldak, Did you guess my turnover on this trading day? So you specially prepared these leathers? Serdak was startled for a moment. And then he understood what Archmage Horus meant and said with a smile, Isn't there only 635 unidentified magic crystals in your wallet? Archmage Horus took out 15 unidentified black magic crystals from the money bag, then threw the money bag to Soldak and said, Now this money bag belongs to you. The magic sealing box and the contents inside the ghost pattern queen ant leather belongs to me. If there are any good goods in the future, you can ask old Haman to come to me. Or you can wait for me here. Archmage Horus pointed to the tavern. After the transaction was completed, the bartender took the opportunity to serve three glasses of fluorescent wine. The three of them raised their glasses and drank the wild wine in one gulp. The bartender then served three more simple meals. Although it was a simple meal, the piece of fish on the plate exuded a faint water element and looked like it should be a piece of Warcraft ingredient. Serdak knew that this simple meal must be valuable. Although there was a fishy smell that could not be concealed from the sea, he still ate it all in his stomach. When he opened the door of the tavern and walked out, the sky in the Chaos Fortress was completely bright. The three of them separated at the door of the tavern. Soldak followed Old Haman back to the hotel. After resting in the hotel for a whole morning, Old Haman drove the four-wheeled truck back to the Blue Bridge Fortress. Andrew's injuries are almost healed. In the past few days when Soldak went to the Chaos Fortress, Andrew almost always led the team out on patrol missions. The new second-level magic pattern structure was quickly worn on Andrew and Samira. The two original sets of Demon Snake Fong and Earth Shield were repackaged into the Demon Sealing Box. The biggest feature of this Berserker magic pattern structure is that it can overload the set's magic pattern array in a short period of time, allowing Andrew to instantly burst into super combat power. This is very compatible with his Berserker soul. Let Andrew burst out with great fighting power. When the suit was overloaded, red flames appeared all over Andrew's body. Serdak held the shield and stepped onto the ring to compete with Andrew. Every time Andrew activated the power of the suit, Serdak could only hold the shield and be passively beaten, without even a chance to fight back. After Samira got the second level magic pattern construct, she didn't even try out what capabilities the construct had. The two-headed ogre did not feel too envious that Andrew and Samira had new magic pattern armors. He hoped that Serdak could take out some unidentified magic crystals and go to the fortress restaurant, eat some high-end ingredients. Nearly a month passed like this day by day, and the injuries on the wolf orc knight gradually healed. However, he stayed in the room almost all day long, curled up against the wall, and rarely interacted with other people except for the frost wolf and the ogre. If it weren't for Gulitem bringing two large plates of food back to his room every day, the people in the fortress would almost forget that there was a wolf orc living in the fortress. Seeing that the wolf orc knight was getting more and more depressed day by day and his body was losing weight, the two-headed ogre secretly told Serdak the situation. When Serdak heard the news, he happened to return from Wall Village. Aphrodite had already arrived at Wall Village. Serdak took the opportunity to run back to visit old Sheila and little Peter, and then had an in-death exchange with Natasha all night long before leaving the Void Gate. Returned to Blue Bridge Fortress. Gulitem told Serdak about the current status of the Wolf Orc Knights. Serdak pondered for a moment, and then came to his room with Gulitem. Serdak pushed open the door of the room and let the light shine into the room. The Wolf Orc was sitting on the ground in the corner of the room, and the Frost Wolf curled up and leaned against him. One person and one wolf looked up at Soldak almost at the same time. Serdak walked into the room and pushed open the window on the north side of the room, letting the wind from the valley blow into the room and driving away the turbid air in the room. The room suddenly became much brighter. Serdak sat down in front of the wolf knight, and Gulitem also piled food in front of Frost Wolf Bonita. Although this female wolf was very strong and huge, she was very docile. When Gulitem handed him a plate of cold barbecue, she whimpered softly. Serdak first performed a physical examination on the wolf orc, and then said to him, Well, it seems that the body is almost healed. You should go out for more walks. Although you can't bask in the sun, you can breathe. Fresh air also has many benefits for the body. The wolf orc was not happy about his physical recovery. He turned to look at Serdak, with no sparkle in his eyes. Serdak asked him, 
Are you still feeling sad that all your companions died in battle? The wolf orc turned his head in embarrassment. Serdak reached out and patted him on the shoulder. The frost wolf just swept its tail and continued to chew on the T-bone roast beef. Soldak continued to say to the wolf orc knight. Actually, this has nothing to do with you. If we hadn't arrived in time, you would have died with him. The wolf orc looked at Serdak and said in a jerky tone. I will always keep this in mind. Serdak smiled heartily and continued. You can actually regard your current situation as a new life, since it is the blessing of the beast god that allows you to survive. You should cherish your current life. Perhaps it is the hope of the beast god. You can avenge these companions. So now you bear the blood feud of those companions. And you can only hunt those demon warriors if you survive well. Right. Revenge? The wolf orc warrior repeated. There was finally some sparkle in his eyes. Followed by deep hatred. He let out a loud roar and said loudly to the frost wolf. Yes, Bonita, I want revenge. But this time he spoke in orc language. And Serdak didn't understand what he was saying at all. Instead, the frost wolf let out a low howl. And the sound echoed throughout the valley. Chapter 1191 Return The blood-red killing light gradually emitted from the eyes of the wolf orc knight. Hatred may have sprouted in his heart. But it also gave him an urgent desire to live. He stood up from the ground and looked out the window at the coniferous valley his back straight at this moment. At this time, Serdak proposed again. Otherwise, just stay. I invite you to join my battle team. You can follow my team until you complete your revenge. You see, we entered Death Ridge to hunt the demon lords that the demons had exiled there. And we have successfully hunted two demon lords. Nothing is more convincing than a dazzling performance. The wolf orc's eyes clearly had some thoughts. But he still did not agree immediately. But I am an orc the wolf orc said angrily. His pronunciation is not standard, but it can be heard clearly. At this time, the two-headed ogre, who was sitting aside and watching for a swolf bonita eating, turned his head and laughed loudly. What's wrong with the orcs? I'm still an ogre. The ogre Gulitum pointed at the half-elf archer Samira, who came in from outside and said loudly, Half of her is an elf, and we don't dislike her at all. You are an orc with pure blood, and we are all the same. When Samira heard the two-headed ogre say this about herself, her eyes narrowed with a hint of cold murderous intent, causing her good brother Nailwear, who was carefully sizing up the half-elf archer, to quickly cover Gulitum. With his big mouth, he said flatteringly to Samira, Samira, you know that Gulitum likes to talk nonsense when he is excited. Then he solemnly warned Gulitum, You can shut up now. Our team itself is like this, with partners from different races. If you don't want to return to the orc tribe just yet, you might as well join us for adventure. Serdak took the opportunity to extend a more formal invitation. The wolf orc lowered his head and chatted a few words with the frost wolf in orc language. Then turned around and said to Soldak, Well, Bonita and I are willing to join you. The giant frost wolf also howled. At night, the wolf orc Tygo participated in the night watch of the Serdak team for the first time. He and the frost wolf were responsible for guarding the watchtower at midnight. For the first time, the wolf orcs put on the exquisite full-covered black iron armor. But around his waist was the kind of gauntletless sword used by the orcs. He did not wear a helmet and stood majestically on the sentry tower. The armor is a bit too heavy. But this is nothing to the orcs, who are full of physical strength. The only thing that worried him was that the armor's trousers were a little too hard. Human war horses at saddles. But the orcs didn't have them at all when they rode frost wolves. Tago was a little worried that such hard trousers would wear out. The fur on Nita's back but on the first night of duty, out of respect for the human captain, he put it on without hesitation. It felt like an iron can. During dinner, Andrew gave him two whetstones. This was the best gift he had ever received. And there were actually two thick and thin stones. He stood on the watchtower and let Bonita stare at the dark night. Mountains. In this dark night, Bonita's eyesight is better than his. And she can also distinguish the scent of demons from the night wind. Tago stood on the sentry post and began to polish his obsidian sword. The sword was tough enough, but it was not sharp enough. He didn't have such a good whetstone before. While polishing the sword, he asked the frost wolf next to him in orc language, Bonita, what do you think of this place? The frost wolf howled. Ow! Tiger, the wolf orc, said in surprise. Do you want to stay too? Well, in that case, let's stay. Frost wolf let out a long howl again. Ouch! Tiger was even more confused and said, You want me to call him captain? Oh, okay. Ouch. 
in fact. Serdak didn't know that it was precisely because of the conversation during the night watch that Serdak had a wolf orc knight and a frost wolf in his patrol team. It seems that the knights and swordsmen in Blue Bridge Fortress are still waiting for the expansion of the Serdak patrol team. At least six members must be included to become a complete combat team. Almost everyone in the fortress knew what Deans and Mistania had missed. However, after waiting for a long time, it was discovered that the Serdak team had no intention of recruiting members. Now it was discovered that there was an additional wolf orc in the patrol team. So just when everyone thought that the team was still missing at least one member, Soldak suddenly announced that the sixth member of the team was actually a frost wolf. Just when everyone in the fortress was thinking, what is the difference between a frost wolf and a black scale horse? The Serdak patrol team, which had recovered from their injuries, actually embarked on the journey again. This time Bart failed to return to the Serdak team. It is said that during this hunting trip, Serdak turned his attention from the demon lord to the demon warriors, who often appeared in Death Ridge. They hoped to hunt more demon warriors. This time, the Serdak team entered Death Ridge for 20 days, and finally withdrew from Death Ridge when all members were injured. The first person to discover their team was a patrol in Yalu Fortress. If those knights hadn't seen the flag of Blue Bridge Fortress fluttering in the wind in front of the team, they would have thought they were a group of mummy zombie fighting teams. Yes, almost everyone was injured this time. So much so that everyone had to wear a hemostatic bandage. If Serdak hadn't possessed enough heads of demon warriors to maintain the hegemonic body and blessed body of all members of the team, no one knows that they would have been able to escape alive in this death ridge. What made them so embarrassed was A.H. L. Mantis Lord. When this lord began to realize that the number of mantises in the northern part of Death Ridge had been reduced, he led a group of men to the northern mountains. Finally it found an opportunity when Serdak ambushed a three-headed H. L. Dog King. Although Serdak successfully hunted the H. L. Dog King, he was completely defeated by the Mantis Lord. The hunt lasted seven days in this valley. If Aphrodite hadn't appeared in time and used hypnosis to successfully attack the Hell Mantis Lord, Serdak and others might have become human snacks for the Hell Mantis Lord. However, this kind of effort naturally yielded huge rewards. And in the end, he also harvested the giant mantis. The entire Serdak team returned to Blue Bridge Fortress again. Although almost everyone was injured, they had become the star team of Blue Bridge Fortress. Even many second-level Green Empire experts in other fortresses know the brilliant record of Serdak's team in Blue Bridge Fortress and Death Ridge. During this period, Serdak killed one after another in Death Ridge. Seventeen demon lords were exiled here. Just from selling the monster materials from these demon lords, Serdak harvested more than 2,000 unidentified magic crystals. In addition, since the relationship between the Serdak team and the H. L. Mantises has completely formed, the number of H. L. Mantises hunted by the team has exceeded a thousand in just four months. And some demon scout teams have also been targeted and assassinated. The Demon Legion south of Death Ridge actually did not dare to let the Demon Scout team leave the detection range of the Demon Eye. Basically, there are Demon Scout teams only wherever you look. But now that the Demon Eyes have already noticed it, the existence of the Demon Scout team is not that significant. It is for this reason that the Demon Army had to deploy two more giant magic eyes in Death Ridge. Now the entire mountainous area in the middle of Death Ridge has been covered by the magic eyes standing on the mountain peaks without blind spots. The Green Empire was still a powerful force in the Demon Clan. It was now very difficult to sneak into the southern part of Area 7 from Death Ridge. As a result, those who are most directly affected are the shady intelligence dealers who exist between the Empire and the Demons. Affected by the Magic Eye, although their private transactions became more secretive, they were discovered one after another. For Serdak, his six-month service period on the battlefield soon ended. Serdak, Andrew, Gulitum and Samira can return to the Green Empire. And the next time, they come to the battlefield will be at least two years later. I was thinking about how to say goodbye to the Wolf, Orcs Tiger, and Gary Decker in the last few days. But I didn't expect that Gary Decker was also packing his luggage and preparing to follow the Serdak team. Return to Bena Province. Wolf Rider Tago and his wife Bonita are also planning to live in the Bena Province for a period of time. They are just waiting to come back when Serdak enters the big battlefield for the second time. After all, even if they stay, they will have nothing to do. Today's Death Ridge is under the crazy attack of Serdak's hunting team. Even those H. L. Mantises in the mountain are eager to grow two more pairs of wings. Those demon warriors will not leave the surveillance of the demon eyes. In this situation, hunting those demon warriors is seeking death. 
so just when Saldak euphemistically expressed that his team was about to leave the battlefield. Gary Decker and Wolf Rider Tago happily agreed to Saldak's invitation and prepared to go to Bennett together. Skip it and take a look. Serdak was also a little confused at this time. And he had just said casually to their invitation. Before leaving, Commander Adolphus also gave Saldak a letter and asked him to deliver it to his nephew, Marquis Fred Dunstan. On the fourth day of April, Old Heyman drove the Serdak team to the Chaos Fortress in a four-wheel carriage. Serdak led everyone up the high steps to the King Kong Gate again, and submitted a pass to the gatekeeper of the King Kong Gate, allowing him to return to the Green Empire. The team successfully passed through the King Kong Gate. Chapter 1192 Relatives Walking out of the 100-meter Hybridrod Gate is like walking through a long space-time tunnel. As the team walked through it, they could see countless patterns of planes spliced together on the twisted space walls and even some pictures of the star field. This gave Serdak a clearer and more direct understanding of the planes. Each plane is an independent world. Compared with main planes like Roland Continent, those small planes are difficult to reach the current heights of Roland Continent in terms of the level of civilization and the power of the strong. When the legendary powerhouses of the fourth rank mastered the ability to travel through the star field, these small planes were discovered one by one in the vast sea of stars. The strong men left spatial coordinates on these planes and then brought these coordinates back to the families in Roland Continent, or directly to the auction house. Families with information about the plane spread the seeds of civilization through the portals. To put it bluntly, it is an invasion of immigrants. This invasion is not only in terms of land, resources, population and race, but also includes culture and beliefs. The imperial people taught the indigenous people to drink coffee, then asked them to grow coffee beans, taught them to eat steak, and then developed animal husbandry, and use large tracts of land to raise cattle and sheep. However, this kind of invasion is much gentler than the demons, who destroy everything wherever they enter. Serdak had not experienced any of this when he entered the Vidra Gate, but when he left the battlefield and passed through the Vidra Gate, it seemed like a gift of knowledge. In this passage hundreds of meters long, the team people have finally seen the division of levels in the world. When everyone walked out of the King Kong Gate, they still appeared on the floating island in the clouds, in the sea of clouds not far away. You can vaguely see the silver city where angels live. Countless towers and dazzling domes stand in the sea of clouds. Serdak walked out of the King Kong Gate and led everyone down the hundred meter long steps. There were many people on the steps. And they all looked like they were preparing to enter the big battlefield. Or they were second level warriors who came out of the big battlefield like Serdak. At the bottom of the steps, he found a gatekeeper who had received them. That was when an old man who couldn't tell how old he was looked at Soldak with a faint smile on his face. Let me see this warrior who came from the Green Empire. It seems that you are on the battlefield. My performance is pretty good, and I will have two years of leave in the next two years. After two years, I will continue to serve in the battlefield for half a year. The gatekeeper reached out and patted Serdak on the shoulder. The coercion displayed on his body made Serdak breathe heavily. I will arrive on time, Serdak said cautiously. The gatekeeper nodded and handed a pass to the big battlefield directly to Serdak then turned around and led them towards a portal. There were actually some other second-level powerhouses standing at the portal, standing at the back. When the second-level expert saw Serdak and his party approaching, he smiled very friendly and asked very cordially, Are you also from the Empire? Serdak nodded and said, Green Empire's been a province. Serdak! When the second-ranked knight saw what Serdak said so formally, he immediately stood up straight and said to Serdak, Durba province! Zelino Bechi! Are you together? Zelino looked at the tall ogre standing behind Soldak and asked in surprise. Yes, they are all fighting partners in my team. Serdak nodded. I really envy you that the whole team can advance and retreat on the battlefield together. Zelino said. Then Zelino saw two ladies in the team. He blinked at Soldak with some surprise. To be honest, it was rare to see a strong female second level warrior in the battlefield. Especially when two of them appeared at the same time. They all looked pretty good especially the long-legged heavily armored knight. Very few ladies would choose such a career. Before Zelino could say anything more surprising, a frost wolf and a wolf orc emerged from behind the two ladies. It's not that Zelino has never seen orcs before. He even fought side by side with a group of orc warriors on the battlefield. However, he didn't expect that there would be orcs returning to the Green Empire via the portal. And he was accompanied by a snow-white head of giant frost wolves. Even though he was a construct knight, and owned a very good war horse. When he saw such a huge frost wolf, he still couldn't help but want to own one. 
Is this also a member of your team? Zelino's face was full of surprise. Yeah, Serdak agreed, pointed in front, and reminded Zelino. It's your turn, Zelino said with some envy. Your combat team must be great. If you have a chance to go to Durva, you can come to the Bechi family to find me. After saying that, he waved his hand, walked into the portal and disappeared. Serdak still has to wait outside. This teleportation gate can connect to the teleportation halls in the central cities of various provinces in the Green Empire. However, since the coordinate points of each teleportation hall are not exactly the same, the teleportation master needs to adjust the teleportation hall according to the location of each teleportation hall. The coordinates of the transmission can be changed at any time according to the needs of the powerful person. Serdak didn't expect such an operation to happen. And all teleportation here is free. It seems very easy to go out from the King Kong Gate. But to get here, you need to use a battlefield pass. You can also use this pass as a team teleportation scroll. However, Serdak found out that if we return to the battlefield together next time, it seems that having only such a teleportation pass is not enough. And another one is necessary. The waiting time for everyone in front of the portal was not long. And it didn't take long for everyone to enter the portal again. As the scenery in front of him changed slightly, Soldak appeared in the teleportation hall of Benis City. Serdak is no stranger to this teleportation hall. Stepping on the shiny marble floor, his slightly hung heart finally fell. He even said H, low to the teleporter in the teleportation hall, before leaving the team out of the teleportation hall. Breathing the air scented with tree oil, and looking at the blue sky, and white clouds above made Serdak feel more at home. The city is very noisy. Some of the girls on the street have put on colorful skirts. The street trees on both sides of the street have sprouted new buds. The streets are also busy with traffic. And almost all of them are magic caravans. Pedestrians passing by the teleportation hall saw a small group of construct knights coming out of the teleportation hall. And they all gave way. The two-headed ogre and the wolf orc once again became the center of attention in the eyes of passers-by. Some girls actually cast very bold glances at the two-headed ogre. Soldak was still thinking about which restaurant to go to. Take everyone to have a good meal. And then take everyone to the Circle Hotel to stay. He would then visit Marquis Luther and Speaker Fred. And wait for Bay after finishing the affairs in Nas City. I first replied to Doden Town on the Belan Plain to check out the situation there. Soldak was preparing to build an iron mine. After the matters in the Belan Plain are settled. Buy a few more tickets to Lut City and take the magic airship back to Lut City. Gary Decker and the Wolf or Tiger stood at the door of the teleportation hall. Looking at this strange city. A magic caravan parked at the door of the teleportation hall. Serdak asked everyone to sit in the magic caravan. Gulitem was still sitting on the luggage rack behind the caravan. The wolf orcs and Bonita got into the magic caravan. In the carriage. Serdak didn't dare to let the frost wolf stand on the street all the time. If it startled any noble's magic caravan, there would probably be some trouble. Fortunately, the space inside the carriage of this magic caravan is large enough. So a frost wolf of that size can actually lie on the carpet in the carriage. After getting on the magic caravan, Soldak asked everyone to open all the windows and take in the scenery of Benis City. Soldak told the coachman the name of a restaurant. The coachman had already comforted the frightened Gubalai Ma, and then drove the magic caravan into the traffic. Gary Decker squinted his eyes, and looked curiously at the buildings outside the window. His long legs were crossed together. Even if he was wearing heavy pants and armor, he could not hide his beauty. Samira sat next to her, leaning against the soft sofa in the caravan with her eyes closed and meditating. The half-elf archer always had a cold and beautiful face wherever he went. And the arrogance only possessed by elves seemed to be engraved in her bones. On the other hand, Andrew was very enthusiastic and was introducing the shops on the street to Tego, who was wearing an earth shield magic pattern outfit. When he went out to hunt the demon lord for the second time, Serdak gave the earth shield to Tego. This wolf knight usually wore leather armor. But the orc tribe did not have such advanced armor. With a magic pattern structure. All their combat power comes from themselves. The orc warriors equipped with magic patterns are more brave than Andrew on the battlefield. When the magic caravan passed through a shopping street, Soldak remembered that Harvey Goffro had brought him here. This was the industrial area of Benna City. And Harvey's leather-making workshop was not far ahead. On the right side of the street, thinking of Harvey's leather shop, and thinking that he is Beatrice's biological brother after all, no matter what the relationship between Beatrice and her family is. I still need to care about it occasionally. Especially what Harvey has done recently. In the leather business, they still use the hard skin of ghost-striped red and to make war horse armor. 
Serdak couldn't help but cast his eyes out the window. When the magic caravan passed by the entrance of the workshop, he saw a group of swordsmen surrounding the entrance of the workshop. Standing at the front were several young nobles who were blocking the way. Harvey in front of the gate asked something. Soldak patted his forehead speechlessly. He was just thinking about taking care of Harvey Goffaro. But he didn't expect to see such a scene. Coachman, please stop in front. Soldak leaned out of the window and said to the coachman on the driver's seat. The coachman hurriedly grabbed the horse's reins and stepped on the brakes to slow down the magic caravan and then stopped at the side of the road. You guys wait here. I'm going to take care of something and I'll be back soon. Serdak said to the team members in the car. After saying that, Serdak opened the carriage door and stepped out of the magic caravan. Andrew knew that something must have happened to Serdak. And he quickly followed Serdak and jumped out of the magic caravan. Tiger, the wolf orc, hesitated for a moment. Then reassured Bonita to stay in the carriage. Followed Andrew and jumped out of the carriage. And walked back with Serdak. Seeing Samira sitting in the carriage with her eyes closed and not moving. Gary Decker also stayed in the carriage. Just curiously pushing the carriage door open and watching the backs of Soldak and his group. Soldak came to the door of Harvey Goffaro's leather shop and watched a group of swordsmen blocking the door of the workshop tightly. Through the crowd, he could see several young nobles planning to rush into the workshop. Harvey led some craftsmen in the workshop to block the door. There was a very obvious footprint on Harvey's chest. His face was almost swollen. There was a trace of blood hanging from the corner of his mouth and the aristocratic dress on his body was torn. After a while, it looked like he had suffered a small loss. Serdak was about to walk in, but was stopped by two swordsmen with their hands. Then the swordsmen saw the magic pattern structure on Serdak's body, and the expressions on their faces immediately became more respectful, and they glanced at Sue the noble badge on Erdak's chest said to Serdak, My lord, this leather workshop is currently closed due to minor disputes. If you want to buy leather goods, you can go to other workshops. Before Soldak could speak, Andrew, who was following behind, said unceremoniously, What qualifications do you have to tell me where to buy leather goods? Get out of the way, and don't block the way of our captain. The fierceness in Andrew's eyes, and the coercion of the second-level strongman immediately made these swordsmen feel invisible pressure. The swordsmen backed away under Andrew's cold gaze, and made way for them in the middle. Serdak climbed the steps without saying a word. Several young nobles blocking the door of the workshop were still preparing to take action. When they saw Serdak coming up from behind, they saw that he was still a count. Several people after exchanging glances, they found that no one knew anyone. The most important thing was that they were still wearing high-level magic pattern structures. So they asked with some vigilance, Who are you? If it has nothing to do with Harvey, stay out of it. The young noble handed a warning to Serdak. Serdak ignored the young nobles and slowly climbed up the steps, and stood in front of Harvey Gofello, looking at his swollen face and stubborn eyes. He felt that he seemed more mature than a year ago. Some, no longer the aristocratic young man who found himself deceived and stood at a loss at the door of the hotel. Although Harvey Goffaro is still a little stupid now, he at least has some sense of responsibility. Brother-in-law, Harvey whispered awkwardly, just saying, brother-in-law, made Soldak feel a lot softer. He reached out his right hand, and gently touched Harvey's swollen face. And a trace of the power of holy light appeared in his palm. The soft holy light quickly healed the swelling on his face. Soldak asked calmly, Harvey, who shot this? He didn't even ask why or what happened. He only asked, who hit this? Harvey felt that the corners of his eyes were a little sore. And his eyes suddenly became blurry. Chapter 1193 Support The young noble standing opposite Harvey seemed to think of some things from last year based on Harvey's words. Brother-in-law, Yes. Harvey has a sister who is married to Leite City. But it is a kind of dowry between nobles. And it is said that she is married to a small border town far away. So everyone has almost forgotten that Harvey has such a sister. Sister, I also forgot that Harvey actually had a brother-in-law. As luck would have it, this brother-in-law is actually in Benna City today. What's even more troublesome is that this brother-in-law is not only an earl, but also a construct knight. In Benna City, the count is not scary. In the aristocratic circle, there is no one whose family does not have an earl relative. However, the identity of construct knight represents another meaning, which means that the sword, shield and fists are strong enough. Many times, when nobles solve problems, they have to rely on fists. However, generally speaking, noble retinues and private soldiers would not intervene in this situation. After all, 
the status was not equal. If civilians attacked nobles, they would violate the laws of the empire. Harvey set his sights on one of the young nobles, who looked a little thin, but had a sword hanging from his waist and a small, lightweight buckler tied to his arm. The young noble took a step back with a guilty conscience and shouted to Soldak, It doesn't matter if I hit him. Harvey. He seemed to be the kind of person who had overindulged in sexual activities. His eye sockets were a little blue. His nose was straight, and he had long golden hair with an aristocratic headband inlaid with gems. Sernak turned around, and no one around him could see clearly how he took this step. He stepped in front of the young noble in one step, stretched out his palm, and put it on the young noble's cheek. His slap seemed to have some kind of suction, so that the young noble could not avoid it no matter what. The young noble quickly used his hands to he hug Soldak's arm and tried to move his attached arm away but failed several times. This time I just want to warn you that no matter what happens, using force to solve the problem is always the lowest behavior. Do you understand? Sardak's palm slightly left the young noble's face, only about one centimeter away, and then he threw it hard. The young noble's head tilted violently to the other side. His mouth immediately became swollen, and there was a trace of blood hanging from the corner of his mouth. The young nobles around wanted to rush forward, but were stared at by Sardak coldly. All their courage ran away, and everyone took a step back in order. Serdak pushed the young noble to the ground, raised his foot, and stepped on the young noble's chest with the sole of his boot and laid with a layer of thick armor. The swordsmen behind them rushed up one after another, but were stopped by Andrew and Tago. These swordsmen discovered that the usually gorgeous sword moves had no effect in front of the indigenous warriors and orc warriors. The axe just swung out. With one sweep, the swords in everyone's hands were neatly broken. What on earth do you want? The young nobles around him had lost their usual vigor and questioned Serdak one after another. Now can we sit down and talk? Serdak asked the young nobleman at his feet. Then he raised his feet, turned to look at Harvey Goffaro, and said to him, Now you can tell me what is going on. I hope you can tell the truth completely like a knight. Come out. Harvey was so frightened that he suddenly shrank his neck and said to Soldak, Brother-in-law, they want to settle some old debts with me. At the beginning, we pulled money together and wanted to do some profitable business in Benna City. Everyone contributed money, but all those businesses were lost. Later, I met a scammer and put the last bit of capital into it. In the end, I got the bulk of the money, but now they want me to pay them back all the money they spent, or else they want me to use this leather workshop to compensate them. Harvey said somewhat unconvinced. Is there any problem with what Harvey said? Soldak turned to the young nobles and asked. Young nobles, Look at me and I look at you. The young nobleman who was slapped by Soldak wanted to say a few words, but was firmly held back by his companions. Then someone whispered in his ear, Forget it. Roka, you looking at the magic pattern structures they wear. I remember that they were added to the oil painting hanging in the corridor at home. That oil painting painted my grandfather. Luo Ka, do you know my grandfather? The young nobleman obviously also came from a prominent family. When he said this, although the other young nobles looked a little unwilling. They all backed away, seeing that Serdak didn't intend to stop him. He ran away with a group of swordsmen with a bang. Soldak walked up to Harvey and patted his face, seeing that the swollen face had quietly recovered under the influence of the holy light. He patted the footprints on his chest and said, Wei said, Harvey, I'll see you another day. After saying that, he walked along the street and got on the magic caravan. Gary Decker came up curiously and asked with a smile, What's wrong? Captain, is a relative at home being bullied? Serdak smiled helplessly and shook his head. Gary Decker continued, I often encounter this kind of thing. Sometimes I can't tell the difference between right and wrong in many things. So I have to fight 50 times each. So many times I would rather Blue Bridge Fortress than when I go home. Those things are really annoying. Soldak did not look at Harvey's figure standing on the street outside and said to the coachman, Let's go! Soldak took the team members to experience Benna cuisine in a pretty good restaurant. The most unique feature of this restaurant is a kind of eggplant pancake to eat with fried chicken. And it is soaked in a light and delicious food. Inside the sweet soup, it tastes soft, crispy, and very sweet. But you will get tired of it if you eat too much. But this is not a problem at all for the two-headed ogre. Then Serdak took everyone to stay in the Circle City Hotel. The waiters at the hotel saw that the group of warriors brought by Serdak were all wearing magic pattern structures. How could they dare to neglect them? The waiters knew the two-headed ogre Gulitem. After all, the two-headed ogre could live in the hotel. 
very few. They built a large tent for the two-headed ogre in the garden of the hotel's inner courtyard, covered it with thick blankets, lit a bonfire outside, and set up a large iron pot. The hotel manager seemed to know the temperament of the two-headed ogre very well. He took out a whole ham and threw it into the iron pot to cook, making the two-headed ogre almost smile from ear to ear, because there were orcs and a giant frost wolf in the team. In order to avoid affecting the rest of the other nobles, the waiter chose several rooms on the east side of the second floor for the Serdek team. From here, you can go directly through a staircase. The passage goes downstairs, so that Bonita can avoid scaring other guests when she walks around in the corridor upstairs. Such an arrangement made Suldek very satisfied. The next morning, Gary Decker took Samira out for shopping. Everyone else stayed in the hotel and did not plan to go out. Suldak wanted to deliver a letter of visit to Speaker Fred Dunstan, and also he had to rush to the military headquarters in the morning to report on his duties, and then go to see Marquis Luther. After breakfast, Suldak took a magic caravan and set off from the hotel. The first stop was at the Dunstan family's mansion. After submitting a letter of visit to the concierge, he left in a hurry. Then he went to the military archives and recorded that his half-year service on the battlefield was successfully completed. Then he rushed to Marquis Luther's office before noon and talked to Marquis Luther about what he had done during his time on the battlefield. Matter. Marquis Luther also sighed when he heard that Serdak formed a hunting team to enter Death Ridge for the first time when he entered the battlefield. At noon, Marquis Luther took Suldak and left early, returned to the Marquis Mansion, and hosted a banquet in honor of Suldak. Next, I plan to build Makuso City. In addition, Ruth City also needs to be revitalized. After all, it is the only entrance to the Ganbu Plain. I want to increase the intensity of trade. Suldak expressed some of his thoughts to Marquis Luther. Marquis Luther just sat aside and listened quietly. At the end of Suldak's words, Marquis Luther asked, Did you come up with these ideas yourself? Actually, I also borrowed some practices from other people and combined them with the advantages of the dry cloth plain. So I came up with these plans, but I haven't tried them yet. And I don't know if these methods are suitable for the dry cloth plain. Soldek said earnestly. Go ahead and do it boldly. As long as you put urban development first. Even if you take some detours, you will be able to correct it sooner or later. I will hand over Ruth City to you. And you will be responsible for the construction of this city. If you need any resources from Benna City, you can write to me. Marquis Luther patted Soldak on the shoulder and said to him. Although the military headquarters cannot affect Benna Trading Company, you can also choose to cooperate with some military merchant groups. These military merchant groups still have a certain degree of credibility. In addition, the military headquarters controls the portals of various planes and requires other for the portal pass. Feel free to come to me at the military headquarters. Although the Ganbu plane does not have any unique mineral resources, it is a small plane with abundant products. Whether it is environmental climate or human geography, it shows that it is a very livable plane. Of course, this sentence the premise is to rule out demonic invasion. I think some of your ideas are good and worth a try. Marky Luther and Soldak talked in the study all afternoon. If Mrs. Marion hadn't come to urge them to have dinner in person, they might have talked all night long. Chapter 1194 Duo Dan Town Marky Luther and Lady Marion sat side by side at the head of the dining table, with Lady Mabel and Lady Cece on both sides. The other three daughters sat beside Lady Mabel. Soldak sat directly opposite Marky Luther. The dining table was long and almost filled with exquisite food. As all the ladies know, Marquis Luther admired Soldak very much. Not only did he marry his favorite daughter Hathaway to Soldak, but he also gave the entire city of Ruth to Soldak as a dowry. Now that Soldak has successfully returned to the Bena province from the battlefield, everyone has discovered how unique Marquis Luther's vision is. When Marquis Luther first met Soldak, he was just a little-known ordinary knight in the guard camp of Alinsa City. But now, he has not only been promoted to an earl, but also a second-level strongman. He had participated in several battles and had some outstanding performances. And now, he was able to sit at the dinner table and talk to Marquis Luther. The more Mrs. Mabel saw that Soldak was performing extremely well in all aspects, the more she regretted it. It was definitely the second major mistake in her life that she had not allowed her daughter to marry this young man. The first major mistake in her life was that when she was young. She secretly had an affair with a young Viscount in Benna City while Marquis Luther was on an expedition to the Bernona Plain. Unfortunately, the Viscount had an affair while drinking, told this affair to her friends, and somehow it reached the ears of Marquis Luther, 
so that Marquis Luther always suspected that none of the three daughters born to Mrs. Mabel had blood from the Luther family. It is precisely for this reason that Marquis Luther does not like Mrs. Mabel and her three daughters. If it weren't for the close relationship between the family behind Mrs. Mabel and the constructed swordsman group controlled by Marquis Luther, Mrs. Mabel might have been kicked out of the Marquis mansion by Marquis Luther. Now looking at Soldak, who was slowly cutting the barbecue with a table knife, Mrs. Mabel's eyes were full of reluctance. Compared to Mrs. Mabel's unwillingness, Mrs. Marion's smile was much more cordial. She asked Soldak, Dak, after serving in the battlefield, when can I return to Rue? Special city? Soldak put down the knife in his hand, wiped his mouth and said calmly, it will be around the end of the month. Before that, I will go to the Invercargill Forest Territory in the White Forest Plain for a tour. There is an iron mine there that has not yet been built. I am going to organize an iron mine there. Preparatory work. Mrs. Marion glanced at Marquis Luther and complained. Ferdinand, if you hadn't asked Dak to form a cavalry battalion and go to the Belen Plain to garrison, I guess he wouldn't have to run so hard on both sides. Now Belen also has a piece of land. The territory also needs to be managed. And most of the Ganbu Plain needs to be rebuilt which is really enough for him to keep busy. Territory. What noble lord would think that he has too much territory? Marquis Luther laughed and said, Besides, there is nothing wrong with working more when you are young. Otherwise, you can write to Hathaway. Let her come to Benna's city. When she arrives in Benna, she can take the magic airship back to Rit with Dak. That's a good idea. Speaking of which, I really miss her. Mrs. Marianne said as she called the maid beside her, reminding herself to do this later. Serdak also didn't expect that Marquis Luther asked Lady Marion to write a letter to Hathaway, asking her to come to Benna's city just so that she could return to Red City with him at the end of the month. Soldak was still a little reluctant to let Hathaway travel thousands of miles to greet him in a magic airship. But Mrs. Marion said that she missed her daughter again, which made him unable to stop her. He could only sit across from her and carefully eat the roasted plesiosaur meat on the plate. Seeing Soldak getting along so well with Marquis Luther and Lady Marion, Mrs. Mabel felt as if a gauze was tightly twisted around her chest. The dullness and oppression made her unable to breathe. When you are in Benna City, remember to participate in more activities, such as operas, dances, or manor hunting. If you need invitations, come to me at any time to choose. Although these activities are a bit boring, they can allow you to expand some connections. This will be helpful for your future development. Marquis Luther warned Soldak when the dinner was about to end. Soldak took a sip of the sweet wine and then agreed. Okay, if there is enough time and it suits me, I will participate. But I am more looking forward to attending these dances with Hathaway. After all, some of the dances I don't know much about etiquette at all. And I'm worried that I'll embarrass myself at the dance. Only then did Marquis Luther realize that two years ago, Sardak was still a knight who had little contact with the aristocracy and upper class society. I am even more satisfied with Sardak's caution and etiquette. After dinner, Marquis Luther and Lady Marion asked Soldak to stay at the Marquis Mansion. And Soldak agreed after thinking about it. However, the residence arranged for him, this time is no longer the special guest room, but Hathaway's room in Marquis Luther's mansion. This room still retains the appearance when Hathaway left it. With all the furniture and furnishings, nothing has changed. Only some of Hathaway's beloved things have been brought to Luther City. This room at the top of the tower was originally Hathaway's place of confinement. Later, after living there and getting used to it, Hathaway moved her bedroom here. This bedroom is so large that the big bed surrounded by gauze curtains only occupies a small corner of the room. There are some musical instruments in the room, and there are several long strings inlaid with gems hanging on the wall. Swords. But these long swords are not the ones Hathaway usually uses. Hathaway's long sword has been brought to Ruth City by her. Serdak casually pulled out a long sword, only to feel that the sword's edge showed a light blue color but he prefers the broad sword on his waist. After all, he is used to it. Next to the wall where the long sword is hung, there is a large open space with a thick carpet on the ground and a wall. There are two wooden figures practicing sword skills. Hathaway also graduated from the Bina Advanced Swordsman Academy. So she also practices swordsmanship in her spare time. During the period of confinement, she moved her sword practice place to this spacious bedroom. The bathroom and the bedroom are also together. There is no partition at all. There is only a gauze curtain separating the bedroom and the bathroom. Soldak wonders whether such a large room will be very cold in winter. The quilts and blankets on the bed were very dry in the sun. And you could smell a faint smell of sunshine when you walked in. 
Serdak sat down on the edge of the soft bed, just as he was about to lift his feet and take off his heavy boots. The maid who had just led him over was already squatting on one knee in front of Serdak and helping him take off his boots, and placed a pair of soft slippers at his feet. There is a maid filling the hot water in the bathroom. Although Serdak was not used to it, he still took off the magic pattern structure on his body with the help of the maid. It felt really good to have someone serving him by his side. With a little stretch of his hand, the leather armor and coat were taken off. But what happened next was somewhat unacceptable to Serdek. The maid next to Madame Marion had already begun to roll up her sleeves. And she clearly wanted to help Serdak take a bath. I can do the rest by myself. You can go and rest. Serdak refused while standing next to the bathtub. The maids bowed their knees to Serdak. Then bowed their heads and retreated. Soldak only stayed at the Marquis Luther's mansion for one night. And he bid farewell to Marquis Luther early the next morning. I thought you would stay in Benna City for two days. Marquis Luther stood at the bottom of the steps and said to Soldak, who was holding the horse. Soldak said, I want to deal with the matter on the Invercargill Forest side as soon as possible. After making preparations, we will move the steel workshop on the Ritz side. Come back as soon as possible after finishing your work on Bylin's plane. Hathaway should be here by then. Marquis Luther ordered to Soldak. I will come back as soon as possible. After Soldak finished speaking, he quickly saluted Marquis Luther and Lady Marion, and then rode away. Soldak took the pass to the Belland Plain and led the team members to enter the Belland Plain through the portal in the back garden of Duke Newman's mansion very smoothly. The Wilkes in front of you is like an extension of Benna City in another dimension. Almost all the architectural styles are the same. Walking out of the lively square of Wilkes City, you can still see the people lined up on the edge of the square. A long line of business groups. The northern part of the White Forest Plain is vast and there are vast stretches of pasture everywhere. Unfortunately, what grows on the white forest plain is a kind of white-stemmed glass grass. This kind of pasture is not suitable for raising black-scaled horses and green-scaled horses. What kind of grass is there? The ancient boli horses that eat all the food can live here. Nearly a thousand guba horses were circled in front of the square, and they seemed to be preparing to enter Benna City in the evening. The Soldak team did not stop in Wilk City. They bought three ancient boreal horses at the horse market that day. The group of six people passed through the north gate of Wilk City and walked along a river, head all the way north, probably because he hadn't seen such a vast grassland for a long time. Frost Wolf Bonita rushed out first with Tiger, a wolf knight, compared with human cavalry. Wolf cavalry has stronger endurance and is also the most loyal fighting partner of wolf cavalry. On the battlefield, the combat effectiveness of a Frost Wolf is no worse than that of wolf cavalry. However, the shortcomings of the wolf cavalry are also obvious. That is, the lack of explosive power and collision power. When the legions were fighting, they were completely crushed by the constructed knights. However, in the case of individual combat, a wolf cavalry and a construct knight are dual. As long as it can withstand the charge of the construct knight, the balance of victory will tilt infinitely towards the wolf cavalry. There are also many wolves on the grasslands of the Belan Plain. But frost wolves have never appeared here. So when this frost wolf appeared on the grassland, the original herders, who were grazing came from all directions on the grassland on horseback. They were very worried that this frost wolf would give birth to offspring on this grassland. But when they found out now that Bonita is a female wolf, these aboriginal herdsmen feel more at ease. But he still offered twelve oxen and twelve yellow sheep as tribute to Tiger, hoping that he could restrain his fighting partners and never leave such terrible descendants of monsters on the grassland. Tiger the Orc of the Wolf tribe, accepted these tributes almost with a dark face. What these herdsmen said was simply an insult to Bonita. Bonita is Tago's lifelong partner. For Bonita, he will not even marry another female orc. So Bonita will only give birth to stronger orcs in the future. But after all, they were twelve oxen and twelve yellow sheep. Under the strong request of Bonita and Gulitum, the wolf orc Tygo made a very solemn promise to these aboriginal herdsmen that he would not do anything here. There is no trace of Bonita's blood left on the prairie. In order to be able to ride the Gubalai horse, Carrie Decker could not wear the heavy armor with magic patterns. She could only wear a leather jacket casually. Her tall figure made her look heroic on horseback. She and Samira often race horses on the pasture. Although Gary Decker is better at horseback riding, the live Samira wins more times. It was originally a seven-day journey from Wilk City to the town of Doden. But Soldak's team extended the journey every day. So in the evening of the fifth day, Soldak saw the town of Doden, that war college in the south, in the afterglow of the scorching sun. 
the Battlefield Academy and Duodan Town seem to have a golden edge. At this moment, Duodan Town is hidden in the shadow of Duodan Canyon, with only the rolling Duodan River still sparkling in the sunset. The row of riverside wooden houses on the river bank are neat and exquisite, and the melodious bells from the church can be heard in the distance. A group of sheepherders were driving the sheep back to the sheep pen outside the town. When the sheep saw Bonita, they all collapsed on the grass and refused to take another step forward even though the children were beating them with whips. This is how Serdak led his combat team into the town of Doden. Entering Doden Town, Serdak discovered that this town had undergone almost earth-shaking changes compared to a year ago. The busiest streets in the town were almost lined with various shops, some adventure groups and mercenaries. The soldiers of the regiment were wandering on this noisy long street, and the aroma of various delicacies wafted from the restaurants on the street. Along the way, Serdak saw seven or eight open taverns. However, there is still only one bakery in the town. When Soldak passed by the bakery, there was still a long queue outside the bakery. This bakery still only sold roasted wheat sprinkled with some salt, pancakes and whole wheat bread. But it almost monopolizes the town's bread industry. There is no secret at all. Duodan Town will allocate part of the financial subsidy every month to sell extremely low-priced wheat flour to the bakery. The bakery also operates the bakery with extremely low profits. Currently, every wheat cake in the town I still only bought two copper coins. At this price in Wilk City, I couldn't even buy the same amount of wheat flour. In order to enjoy this benefit, some mercenary groups and adventure groups basically hire one or two locals in each team. Only in this way can they purchase these cheap foods. Chapter 1195 Duodan Town 2 There are many shops on the long street of Duodan Town. The town is full of merchants who are engaged in the leather goods trade of Warcraft. They come here to do the leather goods business of red ants. Many business houses still have leathers of red ants hanging on their plaques. The leathers are floating on the plaques. Looks extremely eye-catching. It is precisely because of these foreign businessmen that many small town residents have jobs. There are also some small town residents who simply rent their houses in the town to business groups and can live a good life with a considerable monthly rent alone. The same is true for the aboriginal people in the town. Nowadays, the prices of the houses close to the central shopping street are ridiculously expensive. Many aboriginal people take this opportunity to sell their houses in the center of the town at a high price and then continue to live in the small town. Some wooden houses were rebuilt on the edge of the town. When Soldak led the team through the center of the town, some hotel waiters stood at the door and kept greeting the passing businessmen. They kept saying that their hotel not only had hot water, but also included three meals a day. In addition, they could wash and feed the horses for free. Serdak ignored the hotel waiters and led everyone to the military camp. Until Serdak, Andrew, and Samira appeared at the gate of the camp on horseback at the same time. The captain on duty, who was guarding the door of the military camp, only glanced at it, and his eyes widened. He blew the whistle on his chest almost instantly. Call out. This whistle sound immediately caused the entire camp to explode. The cavalry, heavy infantry, and archers who were training on the camp grassland quickly rushed into the barracks. After a while, a group of armored warriors ran out of the barracks. As they ran, the shield warriors of the infantry regiment quickened their pace and strode to the front of the team. The camp even heard the neighing of some war horses, and a group of cavalry warriors came out from the stables holding knights' long guns. The garrison soldiers quickly arrived at the gate of the military camp. When they saw Soldak and Andrew, they neatly rode on reinforced war horses and lined up on both sides of the gate of the military camp. Serdak looked at the cavalry battalion soldiers on both sides, then rode into the military camp with the members of the hunting team. For a time, many people gathered at the entrance of the military camp. Almost everyone in the military camp knew that Commander Soldak was back. Amid everyone's cheers, Soldak and his party arrived directly in front of the single building in the center of the military camp. Samira and Carrie Decker will stay in this small building for the time being, Soldak told the two ladies following him. Samira got off the horse without hesitation, carried a few items, and walked into the small independent building. Gary Decker quickly jumped off his horse, picked up a simple salute and followed. Samira opened the door of the independent building. The furniture in the living room was covered with a layer of linen, and the room was filled with dust. Samira left the salute at the door of the small building, walked in alone, and found a jade handle, a rag, and a small iron bucket in the utility room of the kitchen. She threw the jig handle to Gary Decker and said lightly, Let's clean up together. Your room is upstairs. Serdak continued to lead the team into the military camp. There was now a curtain around the shower wall, 
completely isolating the soldiers bathing inside from the outside. Andrew arranged for Wolf Knight Tago and Frost Wolf Bonita to stay in separate dormitories at the captain level. The captain level dormitories are independent rooms. In addition to a bed, there are some basic wooden furniture, such as tables, chairs, and wardrobes, long and narrow wooden benches, etc. Frost Wolf Bonita obviously liked this dormitory very much. He walked straight into the room and laid down on the carpet in the room without moving. Gilladam's residence in the military camp is still preserved, which makes the Ogre brothers very happy. As for Andrew, he has always eaten and slept with the cavalry in the cavalry camp. Now he will not return to the military camp. Exception. A group of cavalry surrounded Andrew and asked him about his adventures these days. The camp, where everything seemed to be in order, suddenly felt like a pot was boiling, and countless soldiers wanted to squeeze in and have a look. After everything was arranged, Soldak left the military camp alone on horseback. The captain doesn't live here? Gary Decker asked Samira when he saw Soldak riding away and twirling his wet hair with a dry towel. Samira said casually, Sometimes I live here. But most of the time I stay in the wooden house by the river. A smile appeared on Gary Decker's face. He just sat across from Samira in a bathrobe and said to her, Hey, Samira, do you know why the captain doesn't want to stay here? Why? Samira stopped holding the rag in her hand, raised her head, and looked at Gary Decker and asked. Gary Decker smiled even more proudly and said very decisively, Of course you are not proactive enough. You should learn from me on this. Think about it. If I hadn't taken the initiative in the first place, how likely would I have been to join your team? No chance at all. Samira replied. Gary Decker snapped his fingers and said decisively, You're absolutely right. That's why I offered to join you. If you don't agree, I won't leave. That's all you need. Samira sighed helplessly. The water of the Duoden River flows westward, reflecting the sparkling waves in the night. Selena was in the kitchen, instructing a cook to cook dinner. Since she was very busy dealing with a large number of documents every day, she specially hired a cook. This cook usually did more than just one job at the Riverside Wooden House. Eat three meals a day and do some simple housework. Not only that, Selena also hired a tutor through the Mercenary Union. This teacher was a bard. It was said that he came to Doden Town just to take a look at the Chain Bridge Camp. He had already spent all his money when he came to Doden Town. In order to earn some traveling expenses, he turned into a teacher for Zygna and Nika. The two girls are currently learning Mandarin from this bard. They heard that he writes poems very well, and he often attracts young ladies from noble families to him. The book of poems the bard is holding is a handwritten version of the poems, facing the two girls who are biting pencils and frowning. He is reciting a poem. Occasionally, the bard will ask the kitchen take a look over there. He looked at Selena with a hint of obsession. The bard's voice is soft and full of magnetism. He is thin, but has the unique charm of a man. His long hair is tied back casually and unkempt. He has a long sword hanging on his waist and a bagpipe in his belt. His clothes were open, revealing his strong physique on his chest. The bard was thinking about a reason to approach Selena. At this time, the door was suddenly pushed open, and Soldak strode in from outside. Chapter 1196 The Developing Town of Duodan Soldak walked into the softly lit riverside wooden house and saw Signa and Nika sitting on the desk outside. Each held a pencil in their hands, thinking hard on a piece of parchment. It looked like it's a student doing homework. The handsome bard raised his head and happened to see Serdak, who was half a head taller than him, and nodded to him very naturally. Signa turned around and saw Soldak, jumped down from the chair, ran toward Serdak, hugged Soldak's thigh, and shouted to Soldak, Soldak, you're back. Soldak also hadn't seen Signa for a long time. He touched her soft hair and asked in a soft voice, Signa, what are you doing? Signa immediately cried, Soldak, please take good care of Selena. Recently she always brings this wild man into her home to torture us. Serdak didn't know what to say especially since the bard whom Zygna called a wild man was standing behind them. Hello, I am Kavan, Zygna and Nika's Green Empire language teacher. The bard put one hand on his shoulder and saluted Serdak. Hello, I'm Serdak. Serdak let go of Zygna and performed a knight salute to him. His eyes fell on his chiseled face and only said, Look, get up. Your class isn't over yet, so why don't you continue? Soldak carried Signa back to the chair and said to Nika, Nick, you must also seize this opportunity to learn. Yes, master. 
Nika stood up and saluted Soldak and said. Serdak nodded. Even though Serdak had corrected Nika several times, she still called him master. After Soldak finished speaking, he walked towards the kitchen of the wooden house. Selena was leaning at the door of the kitchen, wearing a long woolen skirt. Her hands folded across her chest, and her plump buttocks almost completely leaning against the kitchen doorpost. Seeing Serdak coming in from outside, he smiled brightly at him and naturally stretched out his arms. Serdak took off the broadsword from his waist, hung the Gerda shield on the wall beside him, strode up and hugged Selena in his arms. Kiss. Neither of them wanted to say another word. Then Soldak picked Selena up sideways and carried her directly to the bedroom on the second floor. Kevin felt that he had really made a mistake this time and should not have come here to teach tonight. When he was reciting poetry, a tragic character always appeared in his mind, and the love that had not yet unfolded was ruthlessly strangled. In the cradle, and the intermittent tones upstairs made him almost uninterested in teaching at the moment. Perhaps it would be a better choice for him to enter Invercargill Forest with a caravan. He drank a large glass of ice water. Under the gaze of Zygna and Nika, he smiled awkwardly, pointed to a poem in the book, and said, Let's continue studying. The place shrouded in eternal and bright moonlight, rarely seen by mortals. You are the clear spring water. You can touch the bright stars in the night sky with bare hands. His singing voice is indeed very beautiful, and it has a unique melody, and the lyrics also rhyme very well. However, Zygna looked at Kevin with a dark face. This believer of the dark goddess did not want to praise the moon god. Nika also stood there a little embarrassed. She didn't want to praise the moon god. After all, she was now the saint of the temple of light in the twin goddess temple in the town. Although this identity was only recognized in the town. At this time, it was completely, there was no reason to tug on Luna's skirt. Seeing the two girls sitting there without saying a word, Kevin suddenly realized something. So he asked tentatively, Do you all have beliefs? I know that the people in the Empire believe in the Statue of Liberty. And I think she won't mind now. You sing praises to other goddesses. Nika frowned and whispered. We usually serve as the saints of the temple in the town's twin goddess temple. And we are not used to people singing praises to other gods in front of us. Calvin's Adam's apple twitched. And he looked at Nika and Signa in a daze. Completely unaware that he was actually teaching two temple saints. Okay. Let's change to other poems. I have been to many places and learned many poems describing the beautiful local scenery. Teacher Calvin, I think it's almost time. Zygna rolled her big black grape-like eyes, and then said, You see, it's not convenient for us to have you at home for dinner today, so why not have today's class? Let's end it here. Calvin felt even more embarrassed, but he still smiled gracefully and said, Okay, then we will take the next course tomorrow. Nika hurriedly opened the door for him. Calvin put on the woolen felt hat often worn by bards, and walked out of the riverside wooden house with an expression on his face. He stepped on the floor suspended on the river outside the wooden house and felt that the night breeze was a little strange. Wet and cold, he couldn't help but turn his head and look at the second floor of the riverside wooden house. The master bedroom, where he once fantasized about being able to walk in and stay for a night, was lit with lights on, and the curtains were gently swaying in the night wind. Kevin looked towards the bustling center of Doden Town, feeling for a few extra silver coins in his pocket, ready to find a tavern to have a drink. If you can meet a bar girl who admires poetry and music, you might even have a good night. After taking a shower again, the two of them lay refreshingly on the big bed with the sheets changed. Neither of them had eaten dinner, and their stomachs were growling with hunger. It was almost midnight. Selena tiptoed downstairs in a thin nightgown and ran to the kitchen, only to find that there was indeed some white bread left for the two of them on the dining table as well as sliced sausages and barbecue. And even juice was fully prepared. A big jar. After putting all the food into the tray, Selena went back upstairs with the tray in her bare feet. The two hugged a thin blanket and wolfed down the already cold dinner on the bed. After eating, she placed the dinner plate on the bedside table. Selena rested her head on Soldak's chest. Her beautiful face reflected soft light in the room, and her eyes were like the brightest stars in the night sky. She looked at Sue Erdek asked, how long can I stay in Duo Dan Town this time? Serdak put his hands behind his head, stretched his body, and said, It's only about half a month. And I also plan to go to the iron or in Invercargill Forest to take a look. I'm going to prepare the iron or plant. I don't have the right manpower here. I'm afraid I need you for this too. Come take charge. Selena turned over, pressed her arms on Soldak's chest, 
put her pointed chin on her arms, looked at the man in front of her seriously, and asked, You're going to build that iron mine in Invercargill Forest. Soldak reached out and touched Selena's smooth, satin-like back, and said softly, Not only that, I am also planning to move the almost abandoned large-scale iron or mine in Rit City to the town of Doden. In the future, all the refined iron or sand in that iron or vein will be transferred from Invercargill. The forest is continuously transported to Doden Town, and is smelted into iron ingots in the iron mining workshop in the north of the town, and then transported to Wilk City. Compared with the trading of Warcraft materials, these two mines are Doden the lifeline of the town. Selena holds the accounts and monthly balances of the copper mine, so she naturally knows how heavy the transportation of this kind of metal ingots is. With only the transportation capacity of the Thunder Rhinoceros Caravan, I'm afraid it will be difficult to undertake such a heavy transportation task. Selina asked with some worry. Zerdak waved his hand indifferently and said, That is the problem that Malakom wants to solve. If he can't solve it, I'll let a few more transport teams. He then asked Selina, Are there any unresolved troubles in Duodan Town recently? These are some daily chores that Mrs. Luna and I can usually handle. Selina entangled herself like a Medusa and said almost into Serdek's ear, It's just the recent public security situation in the town. It's not good. The garrison camp has doubled the number of patrol guards. But the situation still hasn't changed. Serdak turned over again and whispered to her, I will call professionals to solve this kind of professional matter. Samira and the others are back with you? Selina asked with charming eyes. Um, that's great. Ah, Selina said absently. Serdak did not expect that Doden Town would undergo such a big change in just one year. The wealth of the residents of the town has increased exponentially. Those who own houses in the center of the town have almost become models of overnight wealth. Nearly a hundred businesses have sprung up in the town. I remember that when Serdak first arrived in Doden Town, there was only one trading house in the town. And the trading house almost monopolized all transactions in the town. Now most of these trading companies come here for Warcraft materials and the number of adventure groups and mercenary groups in the town has also surged to nearly a thousand people, together with merchants, clerks, dancers, wanderers, and other messy businesses. Currently Doden the migrant population in the town accounts for almost half of the total population of the town. With the increase in the foreign population, the security issues at night in Doden town have also been the most distressing to Selena recently. There are often some homeless people or thieves who take advantage of the night to rob or steal the money of the drinkers. What is even more outrageous is that some dancers collude with the robbers and not only steal all the money from the drinkers and would also go to the hotel where the person was staying temporarily and remove all the belongings in the hotel. When those drinkers wake up from their sweet dreams the next day, they will find themselves lying with almost nothing on in an alley where few people come or lying next to the trash can or leaning against the corner. At Selena's request, the garrison camp has expanded the patrol scope to the entire town. And the increased frequency of patrols still cannot prevent the occurrence of these vicious incidents. Soldak and Selina arrived at the Doden Town Hall the next morning. At the gate, Mrs. Luna walked down from a magic caravan with a stack of documents in her arms, giving orders to those around her as they walked. Clerk some things. When he saw the magic caravan that Selina usually rode in entering the courtyard of the town hall, he swung his buttocks and walked outside Selina's carriage. Selina, several farmers outside the town are unwilling to continue farming this year. They want to turn their farms into pastures and raise horses with those ranchers. If this is the case, the residents of the town may have to go out this summer. Eat grass. At this time, the carriage door opened, and Soldak stepped out of the carriage. Ah, uh, Mayor Sardak, you're back. Mrs. Luna hugged a stack of documents and shouted happily. Let those farmers come to town, and I will talk to them. Soldak ordered Mrs. Luna. Okay, Mr. Mayor, I'll do it right away. Mrs. Luna immediately became more energetic, and even inadvertently puffed up her chest. Making the dress, she was wearing more plump and bulging. Tax collector Butra looked like he was sleepy, and walked in from outside the town hall courtyard. There were two attendants behind him. As soon as he entered the courtyard, he heard Mrs. Luna's voice. He was originally suffering from a hangover. But his groggy head suddenly became much clearer, and his eyes became very bright. Walking quickly to the courtyard, he saw Soldak and Selina walking into the town hall side by side, and immediately caught up with them. Mr. Mayor Serdak, are you back? Tax officer Butra greeted Serdak. When his eyes fell on Serdak's chest, he realized that the golden badge was so dazzling, 
And then he immediately changed his words. Lord Earl Sardak, have you been promoted to Earl? Sardak walked over, reached out, and patted Tax Officer Butra on the shoulder, and said to him, Tax Officer Butra, I just wanted to find you. What I am most concerned about when I come back this time is the financial situation of the town. Wait and come to my office with the specific accounts. Yes, your majesty the Earl. Tax Officer Butra bent his waist almost to the ground. Then Soldak and Selina came to the office of the town hall. Before Selina's female assistant returned to the town hall, Samira, Carrie Decker, and Tago had already rushed to Soldak's office at the town hall. Soldak, the town's financial taxes for the year are being checked with Butra. Although the town has almost doubled the number of buildings, and also built the Twin Goddess Temple and the War College, this year's taxes have almost paid off all the arrears. Not only that, the town hall is still in Doden Town, owning a large property. When talking about this, Tax Officer Butra's eyes were particularly bright. Okay, these accounts are relatively clear. That's it. Serdak closed the account book in front of him and said to Butra, He won't be too harsh. As long as it doesn't shake the foundation of Doden Town. It doesn't matter if Butra Tax Officer makes some small moves in private. He still understood the meaning of the saying. If the water is clear, there will be no fish. If the people are careful, there will be no disciples. When he saw Samira, Gary Decker, and Tega waiting outside the door. He decisively ended the conversation with Tax Officer Butra. Although Tax Officer Butra still had a lot to say to Serdak. When he saw Serdak waving his hands away, he immediately shut up and turned around to leave. When he came to the door of the office, he saw two men and one woman standing at the door. They were all knights wearing magic patterns, and there was an orc among them. He was so frightened that he immediately hid aside. Chapter 1197 Changes in the Forest Of course, Gary Decker didn't care about the tax collector in a small town. He took the lead into Soldak's office and casually sat down on the sofa in the rest area. Mrs. Luna was like Serdak's assistant at this time, walking in from the outside carrying a tray with four cups of black tea with a faint aroma on it. Soldak walked from his desk to the rest area and asked Gary Decker and Tago cordially, How did you rest last night? It's very good. I haven't slept so soundly in a long time. Of course, no matter what, I can't compare to you. Captain, Carrie Decker said with a half smile. As for whether others can sleep well, I don't know. Her eyes were bold and naked, causing Soldak to avoid her gaze. I came to you to ask you to help investigate some robberies in the town. Now the town does not have the manpower in this field. There have been many robberies of drinkers at night. I am worried that if this continues, it will have a negative impact on Duodan town. It will have a negative impact. So I ask you to investigate and arrest the robbers, Soldak said with a serious face. After hearing Soldak talking about business, Gary Decker and Samira sat upright. After hearing what Serdak said, Gary Decker looked at Samira and Tago and thought, Captain Serdak asked his second-level warriors to catch the robbers in the town. It's a bit overkill. However, Samira was more direct. She stood up from the sofa and said directly to Soldak, You arrange for people to erect a few crosses in the square in front of the Twin Goddess Temple. Before tomorrow morning, I will arrest all those who participated in the robbery and are still hiding in Doden Town and hang them on those wooden crosses. Callie Decker looked at Samira with wide eyes and said in his heart, Even a second-level powerhouse can't possibly have this ability. In fact, Gary Decker really underestimated Samira's ability. Or she ignored the abilities of Wolf Rider Tago and Bonita. Samira gathered together all those who had been robbed and reported the crime to the security brigade. In just one night, under the keen sense of smell of Tago and Bonita, three lurking dancers in Doden Town were identified. All the criminal gangs that engaged in fishing and then carried out robberies were arrested. In addition, some homeless people and thieves were also dug up from various parts of Doden Town. One, during the night, Samira captured more than 30 people. These people were tied to wooden crosses at the entrance of the Temple of the Twin Goddess. The hands of the criminals were hung on the cross, and their bodies were suspended in the air. This kind of pulling force of the body's own weight on the arms could be supported by their own strength at first. When they had no strength at all and gave up resistance completely, their arms would be pulled by their own weight. The pulling is completely dislocating, and that is the most painful moment, regardless of whether they were men or women. Almost everyone suffered the same punishment. Moreover, in the morning, it happened to be the day when the residents of Duodan Town came to the Twin Goddess Temple for Mass. A large number of town residents poured into the Twin Goddess Temple, 
And then they saw these prisoners outside the temple. Some prisoners, who were usually habitual criminals, were hung here. The townspeople who had been coerced by them picked up stones and threw them at them. Some prisoners are just the opposite. They are honest and responsible people in the circle of daily life. And now they are hung on wooden crosses. When the relatives and friends saw them being hung up, they all had expressions of disbelief. Some even rushed to the foot of the wooden cross and cried loudly towards their tortured relatives. Samira led a group of members of the security team to write the crimes they had committed on a wooden board and then found a rope to tie around the neck of each prisoner from sunrise in the morning to sunset at night. The first way they can alleviate their crimes is to repay the property of the group of victims. And the second way is to reveal the robbers and thieves who have committed other crimes but have not yet been arrested. In this kind of situation under torture, as long as the accomplice is not a close relative, he will almost always be bitten out by his companions or criminals from other gangs. There were not many prisoners who could afford to repay the property. In the end, these robbers were just whipped and released. Those criminals who could not repay their property would be sent to copper mines to mine or after being whipped. They would not be released until they earned back the money through labor. As for the criminals with blood and human lives on their hands, they are not so lucky. They will always be hung on the wooden cross or their bodies will rot or the wooden cross will rot. This was the biggest move of Soldak's return to Doden Town. He called this arrest operation a severe crackdown. During the next period of time, Samira and Gary Decker will be jointly responsible for the security issues in Doden Town, with Samira also serving as the captain of the Archer Brigade in the military camp, and Gary Decker serves as the captain of the Doden Town Security Brigade. As for Andrew and Tago, they serve as the military commanders of the Cavalry Battalion and the Heavy Armored Infantry Battalion. Next, the two of them will go to the Iron Chain Bridge Bridgehead Camp to inspect the situation there. It is said that last year's beast tie greatly weakened the vitality of the ghost-marked red ants in the Darkworm Valley. Throughout the winter, a large number of adventure groups crossed the poisonous fog swamp and entered the Ice Lake area. The ghost-marked red ants were suppressed in the Insect Valley and did not dare to show their heads. A large number of monsters, the materials were transported back to Doden Town from the Quoto Camp, which also indirectly proved that the adventure group was extremely exploiting the Darkworm Valley. Although the poisonous mist swamp has now reblocked the Darkworm Valley. Many adventure groups are still stationed at the Quoto Camp and have expanded their scope of activities to the swamp to the west and the Three Rivers Plain to the east, while the residents of Doden Town were still panicking under the shadow of severe crackdowns. Serdak had already led Andrew, Tago and Gulitem through the Doden Canyon and into the hills and mountains. This time, Serdak also recruited two fellow blacksmiths from Doden Town who had some knowledge of iron ore. Today, there are almost no traces of Warcraft in Invercargill Forest. Those Warcraft were there during the Beast Tide. Being forced to leave the forest, I would never have thought that I would never have the chance to return to Invercargill Forest in the days to come. Now the Thunder Rhinoceros Merchant Group has opened a wide dirt road in the forest. Some difficult valleys have been filled with rocks and logs to create a passage. In addition to the road leading to the Copper Mine, there are also other roads in the forest. There are paths leading to various tribes. Soldak was the largest lord in Invercargill Forest, occupying almost one-third of the forest's prime land. During this year, other lands in the forest were also purchased one after another, although their land does not have any minerals. It does at least have a large area of forest. The wood is also valuable, and there is a road leading into the forest. Even if they want to build a logging farm, they are not afraid that the wood cannot be transported out. Even the indigenous tribes in the forest have now begun to engage in the lumber business. In addition, they also control more than 90% of the magic herb production areas in this forest. So the living conditions of the indigenous tribes are getting better day by day. Even so, the copper mine is still a holy place for work in the eyes of all tribal aborigines. They can enter the mine to dig stones, get two sets of clothes and two pairs of shoes every year, and earn a monthly salary of one gold coin. Many aboriginal people looking for work in towns cannot earn so much money every month. Chapter 1198 Copper Mine on the third day after entering the Invercargill Forest, Soldak finally arrived at the copper mine in the middle of the forest with the Thunder Rhino Caravan. This is the first time Soldak has returned to the mine after a year away. When entering this mountainous area, you can see the chaotic buildings on the hillside from a distance. This area was originally the work sheds where miners live, but now it has been turned into wooden houses of various forms. The outsides of these wooden houses put up some plaques, although it was too far away to see what was specifically written on these plaques. Serdak learned from Selina that during the year, 
The free market outside the copper mine had expanded and occupied the entire hillside. The dormitories of the mine workers were also moved from this hillside to the mountains further north, which is closer to the mining area. On the top of the mountain, the large chimneys set up by the three copper or smelters are billowing thick smoke, accompanied by some rumbling sounds. And occasionally strong steam will be sprayed out from a certain overflow valve. Just like three steel beasts lying on the top of the mountain, the giant beasts are constantly devouring the copper or transported from the mountains. On the southern hillside, these three steel giants will spit out carts of copper ingots along the steel rails erected on the hillside. These mine cars will continuously transport the copper ingots to the foot of the mountain. The copper mine has been operating normally for nearly more than a year and has successively produced 25,000 tons of copper ingots and one ton of magic red copper. These copper ingots were transported from Invercargill Forest to Wilkes City for trading. The market has brought Serdak an income of nearly 20,000 magic crystals. Of course, this also includes about 70% of the labor expenditure. After excluding some miscellaneous expenses, Serdak can put about 20,000 magic crystals in his pocket. 5,000 magic crystals. 5,000 magic crystals can buy almost 30 sets of magic pattern structures. Therefore, for Serdak, this mine can be regarded as a continuous and stable income. When Suldak and Selina walked out of the wooden house on the back of Thunder Rhinoceros, the 14 supervisors of the mine were already waiting respectfully at the material transfer station at the foot of the mountain. Andrew and Tego did not follow Suldak to the copper mine, but rushed directly to the bridgehead camp north of the Great Rift Valley Chain Bridge halfway. The only people following Serdak were Selina and Gulitum. During the period when Serdak was not in the Belen Plain, Selina was always in charge of managing the copper mine. She almost every two I have to inspect the copper mine once a month. She checks the shipping list at the material transfer station. And occasionally checks the shipping list at the Malakom Thunder Rhino Caravan. As long as these documents are completely consistent in terms of amounts. Selina rarely interferes in the copper mine. Management matters. Although Selina will not interfere in the management of the copper mine, she will strictly monitor the living conditions of these workers in the copper mine in accordance with Suldak's requirements. At present, the workers in copper mines are mainly divided into three parts, mine management, technicians responsible for refining furnaces, and ordinary miners. The mine management team has now expanded to 14 people. Among them, there is a mine director and a magic apprentice who can simply maintain the refining furnace. There are also 12 supervisors, each of whom manages nearly 500 miners. These 12 groups of miners are divided into three major groups. Each large group supplies the smelting copper or required for a furnace. And the four groups need to take turns pushing the mine copper or to the feed port in front of the furnace. According to Soldak's requirements, miners at the lowest level need to have complete welfare benefits. Not only do miners eat and live for free in the mine, but there are also strict regulations on the miners' weekly meals. In addition to sufficient wheat cakes and vegetable porridge every day. In addition, there will be a meat meal every three days. There is one day off for every six days of work. And the mine cannot be occupied on this day for any reason. The miners are also issued two sets of strong and wear-resistant work clothes and anti-smash shoes every year. Of course, these are just some small benefits. The most attractive thing about the copper mine is the high salary. Ordinary miners can get one gold coin per month. Even the trading companies in Duodan Town rarely offer such high wages. Salary The mine currently has 6,000 miners. And the salary paid by the mine for these miners alone is almost 6,000 gold coins per month. For an aboriginal of a local tribe, earning one gold coin per month is enough to allow him to marry 10 wives in the tribe, raise a lot of children, and live without any problems. Therefore, 37 indigenous tribes have always competed with each other for the number of miners in the copper mine. This time Soldak came to the copper mine and invited these 37 tribal leaders to come to the copper mine to discuss the future development of Invercargill Forest. The Thunder Rhino Caravan will line up in a long line outside the yard of the material transfer station. The huge shelves will be parked outside the courtyard. And these Thunder Rhinos will be led to the stream to drink water and be fed. Serdak stood on the wooden platform and saw that the courtyard of the transfer station was almost filled with stacks of copper ingots. Selina has a separate wooden building next to the material transfer station. This wooden building even introduces a mountain spring and builds a small pool in the yard. The bumps along the way made Selina exhausted. After arriving at the material transfer station, Selina did not follow Suldak to inspect the copper mine, but ran back to the small building with her assistant to rest. Serdak was surrounded by a group of mine supervisors. 
The group of people first walked around the transfer station. Zerdak randomly picked up a few copper ingots and saw that these copper ingots were all soft purple. There are almost no impurities visible. It seems that the three refining furnaces designed by the magician Victor are quite good. Afterwards, Soldak took everyone around the free market again. In addition to some food, seasonings and daily necessities. This market mainly trades Warcraft materials. In addition, after many adventure groups enter the Invercargill Forest, they are reluctant to run back to the farther town of Doden for supplies. So they come here, along the way, dispose of the captured Warcraft materials in this market and replenish some supplies. Occasionally, some aborigines come here to buy some daily necessities. So the business here has always been good. The traders in the free market saw the mine supervisor surrounding a nobleman, whose identity they could not yet guess. The name Soldak is almost a household name in Doden Town. So when the news spread from the free market, a large group of onlookers immediately came. At first, the suffix of Serdak's name was only commander. Later, he became the mayor. And now he has become the lord. After leaving the Belan Plain for nearly a year, many people have not seen the true face of Soldak. Now that they heard that the lord of Invercargill Forest appeared in the copper mine, many people are eager to see Soldak. Erdak's appearance. So as Soldak walked, he found that the stalls on both sides of the market were almost invisible, but were filled with excited onlookers. I don't know who shouted, Soldak. Suddenly everyone in the market shouted loudly at the same time, Soldak Serdak. The shouts almost penetrated the valley, causing the birds that inhabited the forest on the opposite hillside to fly into the sky. Soldak was not prepared to give a speech in a chaotic place like the free market. So when he saw that the order of the free market was somewhat disordered, he immediately left the market with the mine managers. Walking up the stone steps built on the gentle slope. From time to time, you can see a mine cart filled with hot copper ingots slowly rushing down the hillside. There is almost a traction rope tied behind each mine cart. These fully loaded mine carts, when the copper ingot mine cart rushes down the mountain, it will also pull an empty mine cart at the bottom of the mountain to the top of the hillside. Looking at the miners in the mine wearing gray white work clothes, anti smash shoes, and hard leather hats on their heads, Soldak felt as if he was in another world. It was only when he saw three magic-powered steel behemoths that he instantly returned to reality. These three refining furnaces emit huge heat. And you can feel the heat waves hitting your face from more than ten meters away. Serdak endured the blazing heat and asked about all the key nodes of the furnace. Then nodded slightly. And then inevitably felt a little disappointed. Now that he had learned about the specific conditions of the refining furnace on site, he finally understood that this kind of refining equipment could not be used in the iron or field. The reason was that this kind of refining equipment that consumed magic crystal has energy consumed almost every day. To swallow dozens of magic crystals, the output of copper ingots is only about 70 or 80 tons. But after all, this is still a relatively valuable copper mine. Compared with copper ingots, the value of iron ingots is much lower. If this kind of refining furnace is still used to refining iron ingots, then I am afraid that the value of all the iron ingots produced by the mine after excluding the high labor costs and transportation costs, will be the last bit of profit that is lost to these steel giants. If the beast devours it, maybe Serdak will pour money into it. But Soldak never thought about deducting the worker's income. After all, digging rocks in the mine is not something everyone can do. It seems that the relocation of the abandoned steel workshop in Ruth City must be put on the agenda as soon as possible. Only by using a cheaper steel workshop steelmaking process can the high cost problem be solved. Serdak left the refining furnace on the top of the mountain and followed the mine supervisors to the front of the mine being excavated. A large gap had been dug in the mine here, and the exposed or showed a light green color. Some miners were stuffing some black powder into the cracks dug out of the rocks. With a muffled sound, the rock walls loosened and cracked. The remaining miners began to process the broken and loose ore. After they chipped the ore, they loaded it onto flatbed trucks and then transported it to the three refining furnaces not far away. After a round of inspection, Serdak finally came to the cafeteria of the copper mine. He saw several pig legs cooking in a large iron pot in the cafeteria. The delicious smell of meat wafted far away. He casually called out to a man. The young aboriginal miner asked him, How many days will it take you to eat a meal of meat like this? Chapter 1199 Rich Copper Mine Under the gaze of a group of mine supervisors, the young aboriginal miner suddenly looked a little flustered on his face and said with some stumble, just eat once every few days. Two days of vegetarian food and one day of meat. He remembered that his father in the tribe had asked the same question. So he added another sentence. Serdak nodded slightly 
and let the aboriginal miner leave. Then he walked to the big iron pot, grabbed a copper spoon, and handed it to Gulitum. The two-headed ogre happily became a taster. He was not afraid of being burned. He directly stirred the soup from the bottom of the soup pot with a copper spoon, then scooped up a large spoon of soup with offal and put it to his mouth and blew it fiercely. He breathed it out and then drank it into his stomach. Not bad. The offal is cooked very soft, Gulitum commented. There are a lot of braised offal on the plate next to the soup pot, which have been sliced thinly. There are onions, mint leaves, etc. on the side. It seems that all kinds of small ingredients are quite well prepared. Saldek nodded and said, As for the food in the cafeteria, I only hope that you can do one thing. You must be able to eat it yourself. The mine director, who had been following Serdak closely, wiped the sweat from his face and made a promise. Lord, please rest assured that you have set such high food standards. If the food is inedible, then I will definitely ask the entire team of cooks out of the mine. This mine manager was personally selected by Serdak. He was among the first group of people in Doden Town to follow Serdak to the copper mine to open up Wasteland. If we say how capable he is, he actually has no. But it has a great advantage. That is, it can complete the tasks assigned by Serdak firmly and without compromise. The miners who were eating in the canteen saw that the big shots had left the canteen. And then they dared to speak loudly. The cooks and cooks in the cafeteria also breathed a sigh of relief. Fortunately, Today's awful soup was the best among meat dishes. At this time, everyone began to discuss. Who is that person? He actually asked our mine manager to accompany him personally. I didn't expect that our mine manager could bend his waist like that. A miner from Doden Town lamented. The miner who came from Duoden Town with him drank delicious broth and responded without raising his head. I don't know. He must be a great big shot. Could it be the Lord of Invercargill? The previous miner guessed. The miner who was concentrating on drinking soup finally put down his soup bowl, raised his head, looked around, and said, That Lord Serdak. The previous miner snorted before saying, Other than him, who else can make our mine director follow behind so respectfully? It must be him. The miner who was drinking the soup said excitedly, Oh my god! Our lord actually just passed by me, and I didn't even raise my head to look at him. After walking around the mine, Soldak was quite satisfied with the current status of the mine. Next, the atmosphere became much more relaxed. In particular, the mine director took Serdak to see the mine's output of magical red copper this month. Magical copper, as an associated mineral deposit of the copper mine, is very rare. This type of magic metal has a very wide range of applications in the field of magic, so it is almost equivalent to gold. Since last month, the output of magic red copper in the Invercargill copper mine has suddenly increased by nearly 10 times. The reason is that the seventh group of miners dug a vein. If this vein continues to extend inward, there will be this a very precious magical copper. A wooden box in the room contains a lot of red copper metal pieces. And there is even a record book next to the box, which records in detail the time when each piece of magical red copper was discovered. What's the reason for this? Serdak didn't expect such a thing to happen. So he couldn't help but turn around and asked the two Doden Town blacksmiths who invited him. One of the blacksmiths stood up calmly and said, Reporting to the Lord, It is very possible that this vein is a rare copper-rich vein, and it may also be a magic copper-rich vein. The method to confirm whether this is a copper-rich vein is also very simple. You can follow to check the trend of the mineral vein. Dig a hole in the middle of the mineral vein to check. Hearing what the blacksmith said, Soldak suddenly remembered the alchemist he was competing with for this copper mine when he killed his student in a crack in the ground in the middle of the mountain range. It was only with the help of Count Fonak that he found the alchemist, the remains of a magical assistant. I remember that there seemed to be cracks in the ground over the middle mountain range, Saldek said. Remember to find someone with flexible hands to explore there. I understand. Lord. The mine director immediately agreed. An assistant caught up from behind and whispered a few words in the mine director's ear. The mine manager immediately said to Soldek, Lord. The leaders of the indigenous tribes have almost arrived. When are you going to capture them? Soldak thought for a moment. And then he said, Let's go there now. Serdak sat on the main seat in the center of the conference hall. This was the only building in the mine that seemed to have some interior decoration. The triangular beams on the top of the hall still made it look very rough. Thirty-seven tribal leaders have arrived at the council hall one after another. Everyone is sitting casually and loosely in various corners. Familiar tribal leaders are huddled together and talking. And there are also several feudal lords, 
who are sitting far away from each other. Saldak knocked on the table with his hand. And the room suddenly became quiet. I invite you here this time because I want to discuss the future development direction of Invercargill Forest. Saldak said to the tribal leader. When everyone's eyes turned to him. Saldak paused deliberately. And then said. I think everyone has felt it. With the influx of a large number of caravans and adventure groups into Invercargill. The land here has been injected into vitality and new business opportunities. Then next. I want to discuss with you all whether we should cater to outside business groups and adventure groups to enter Invercargill Forest, or whether we should keep them out of our living circle. The tribal leaders all looked at each other, and one of them boldly said, Our tribe still welcomes these outsiders, but only if they abide by the rules. Actually, many young people in our tribe have become guides for these foreign adventure groups. Another tribal leader admitted frankly, The young people in our tribe are also willing to accept them. But the older people in the tribe are not very willing to accept them. Love these adventure groups. Soldak nodded and said, I can understand this. After all, some of the adventure groups may have originated from slave traders who once haunted the Invercargill forest. Then this question is before us. How should we cater to these outsiders who are pouring into Invercargill? What should we pay attention to in normal times? This is what I want to discuss with you. As for the previous grievances, I hope everyone can treat them calmly and apply for legal sanctions from Duo Dan Town. But they must not use private armed forces to launch large-scale armed fights, let alone human lives. After all, we all have to accept the imperial civilization. The tribal leaders looked at each other, and the room began to grow quiet. Let me first talk about the benefits of their coming here. Serdak raised his head and looked around, and said to the tribal leaders, Then I will talk about some of the disadvantages that their arrival has brought to us. The advantage is that their arrival will allow the young people in the tribe to accept the outside world as quickly as possible, and will also bring outside knowledge and materials. But there will also be some disadvantages. That is, when they use generous benefits to attract young people from the tribe. As the brain drains, the tribe will soon intensify its aging. So I need the tribal leaders to make some positive responses to this. For example, to speed up the reform process of the tribe and make the tribe rich in addition to hunting and gathering in the past. You also need to rely on rich land resources to develop animal husbandry and forestry, raise livestock, and cut wood. But there is one thing I want to remind you. Everyone, I hope you will try not to waste the cleared land. If you really don't plan to cultivate it, then transplant some saplings. When your children grow up, you can continue to cut trees on this land. When Serdak said these words, the tribal leaders listened quietly. It wasn't until Serdak finished saying this that a tribal leader stood up and said, Lord Serdak, I have a proposal. Serdak was slightly moved. He had said so much. It was rare for a leader to listen to everything and understand it. Please speak, Serdak said. The tribal leader immediately stood up and took the opportunity to say, Lord, can you expand the scale of the copper mine and recruit more miners? There are many young people in our tribe who hope to come to the mine. Serdak looked at the tribal leaders below with some speechlessness, and finally felt like a chicken talking to a duck. He then thought about preparing to build an iron mine, and then said to these tribal leaders again, When I call you here this time, I want to talk about this matter. The copper mine is restricted by the refining furnace, so the scale of the mine can only remain at the current level, and it is temporarily unable to continue to recruit miners. Next, I will build an iron ore mine, but the miners may have to work harder first, and the monthly salary will be slightly lower. Before Serdak could finish speaking, the tribal leaders below exploded. Someone stood up first and shouted at Serdak. When it comes to hard work and hard work, who can be better than our Nakan tribe? Our Yakiki tribe is not bad either. Shut up and wait until the Lord finishes speaking. Suddenly a quarrel broke out in the tent, and the sound could almost fly through the high roof and into the sky. Chapter 1200 Iron Mine When Soldak talked about the development of Invercargill Forest, Few tribal leaders were willing to discuss it. But when he talked about opening an iron mine, almost all tribal leaders rushed to stand up and wanted to fight for their tribes. To a greater share of employment, everyone has obviously tasted the benefits of the miners. But no one is willing to develop Invercargill Forest. Soldak made it clear that because the value of iron is far less than that of copper, iron mines cannot pay as high as copper mines. These tribal leaders are willing to cut their salaries in half to get a share of employment. After discussing the issue of hiring manpower, Serdak only stayed at the copper mine for one night, and then led a group of people to continue north, rushing to the iron or vein near the edge of the rift valley. 
now that a bridgehead camp has been built on the north bank of the Great Rift Valley. The ghost-striped red ants have little chance of crossing the Great Rift Valley. There are very few monsters in this jungle. The adventure group is hunting everywhere in the jungle, which also makes the beasts in the jungle flee immediately when they see humans. Along the way to Sertak, apart from seeing many birds in the forest, even snakes, ants and poisonous insects were rarely seen. The entire forest was full of lush vegetation. Before the group reached the mountains of the Iron or Vein, some tribal leaders had already mobilized a group of young people from the tribe to follow Sertak to explore the Iron or Vein. Starting from the Copper Mine, Soldek walked for two consecutive days. After passing through a valley, he saw a red mountain range. The lush trees in the Invercargill forest became sparse when they arrived here. The two blacksmiths invited from Duodan town saw these red rock formations and quickly walked a few steps forward to the foot of the mountain. They took out the hammer stones from their waists and knocked them on some gravel that rolled down from the mountain. Got some pieces down. When Serdak came over, the two blacksmiths nodded heavily to Serdak and said, Lord, this mountain range is indeed an iron ore vein. Are these ores rich in iron? Serdak asked the two blacksmiths. This ore does not contain much iron. But this is relatively normal. The excavated iron ore needs to be beneficiated and ground to become iron ore that is convenient for smelting. One of the blacksmiths said to Soldak. Several tribal leaders followed Serdak to the Redrich Mountains this time. They heard from a blacksmith that there was indeed an iron ore vein here. Looking at the excited expressions on their faces. They seemed even more excited than Serdak. If it weren't for the boundary monument not far away, it clearly stated that this mine belonged to Lord Serdak. Seeing how happy they were, others might mistakenly think that they had discovered an iron or vein in their territory. Serdak immediately arranged for people to set up a temporary camp at the foot of the mine. These young people from the indigenous tribes have lived in the Invercargill Forest since they were young. So they are very adaptable to the environment here. Even though the area of the iron mine is just a barren mountain range, for these young people from the tribes. Just one a basic wooden house can be built in a week because there is a water-gathering metal rune plate. There is no need to consider drinking water in the forest. Almost all the monsters in this forest were hunted by the adventure group. There were no monsters around. Just a few simple sentries set up at random. The last time Soldak came here was when he and Wilk City Bureau of Land Management officials were setting up boundary markers here. At that time, the iron or ridge was what we see now. The Bureau of Land Management official also it is a bit regretful to say that this place is too far away from the Duodan Canyon. And the mined iron or cannot be transported out at all. Serdak directly led a group of people to climb up the Ridge Mountains. After climbing to the top of the mountain, they discovered that there was a large rift valley behind the mountain ridge. There was only a few hundred meters wide gap between here and the Great Rift Valley. Dense forest. Is there a way to replicate the model of a copper mine and use a refining furnace to directly refine iron or into iron ingots here? It seems that no matter who sees the three huge furnaces in the copper mine and then looks at this iron or vein, they can't help but ask this question. Serdak shook his head and explained to a group of people around him. It's impossible. The added value of iron ingots is not that great. The refined iron ingots cannot replace the burned magic crystals. Hearing what Soldek said, the blacksmith nodded repeatedly and echoed. Many iron ore owners are expanding production scale, extremely suppressing mining and transportation costs, and continuing to mine as long as the revenue in the mine is stable. They mine iron ore regardless of cost, mainly hoping to be able to mine iron ore at the core of the vein. Magical black iron is dug up in the veins. As long as this kind of associated magical metal can be found, the mine owner will make a profit, Serdak said to the people around him. I am planning to build an iron ore mine here. And I am also planning to build a large-scale grinding equipment here that integrates mineral processing and grinding. By then, what we will transport out from here is some selected ore sand. In order to build an iron mine, Serdak also specially communicated with the magicians of the Alchemy Guild in Benis City. There are no steel resources in the Green Empire, but there are many iron mines in other planes. Many iron ore mines will build large grinding equipment on the mines. After screening and grinding, the high-quality iron ore will be transported back to the Green Empire. Serdak planned to move the steel workshop in Lut City to Doden Town, where high-quality iron ore would be smelted into steel ingots. A group of people were talking about the iron ore mine on the top of the mountain. When they saw a follower climbing to the top of the mountain and reporting to Serdak. Lord Serdak, there is a merchant from Malakom who wants to see you. Serdak was shocked, waved his hand to the attendant and said, I've been waiting for him for a long time. Let him come quickly. 
when businessman Malatom panted and climbed to the top of the mountain. He saw Soldak and a group of copper mine supervisors gathered around a rock. There were many stones placed on the rock, and they were making gestures to mark the ground. What are you talking about? The Malakom merchant gritted his teeth and walked up quickly, climbing such a long mountain road. I almost tore out my intestines. Serdak heard footsteps behind him and turned around. When he saw Malakom coming, he immediately opened his arms and said to Malakom, We haven't seen each other for probably more than a year. Malakom was moved and moved forward to give Serdak a hug. For a businessman, this was a supreme honor. The other mine supervisors looked at Malakom differently again. Exactly one year and four months. Lord Serdak, Malakom replied. Did you see it? It's right here. Serdak pulled Malakom and stood on the edge of the rock. He pointed at the ridge extending to the east under his feet and said to Malakom, I am going to build an iron mine here. However, due to geographical restrictions, I only plan to build the steel workshop at the north exit of Duodan Canyon. So huge amounts of iron or will be transported from here in the future. Malakom felt a slight chill in his heart and asked with some concern, Do you want to set up a huge transportation team? After all, this cake is too big. Now the Thunder Rhino Caravan has been responsible for transporting copper ingots from the copper mine to the outside world. You must know that those are only refined copper ingots, which currently account for 90% of the orders of the Thunder Rhino Caravan. For the iron ore here, it is estimated that if Serdak wants to make a profit, the transportation volume will be at least several times that of the copper mine. Or even more. That's why Malakom thinks that Serdak is likely to set up his own transportation team. Serdak laughed and said, Uh-huh. I don't have the energy to manage the transportation team. If you are willing to accept this commission, then I can hand over all the consignments to you. Businessman Malakom seemed to be knocked unconscious by a pie falling from the sky, and he didn't react for a moment. What did you say? I'm saying that I want to hand over the iron or transportation bill to you. But there are some conditions for me to hand over this order to you. Serdak said to Malakom, What conditions do you have? If I can agree, I will definitely agree. Said the businessman Malakom. Then he felt a little guilty again. Build a road from the copper mine to here in this mountain. I mean a flat road that can drive four-wheeled carriages. Soldak said to Malakom, Is this it? Businessman Malakom was slightly stunned and asked uncertainly. Once this consignment note is handed over to him, even if Serdak does not make this request, Malakom will pay for the construction of this road. He is not prepared to use Thunder Rhino to carry iron or out of the mountains. There are many pastures in the Belan Plain and are rich in horses. Therefore, as long as a mountain road is built and a large number of four-wheeled carriages are purchased, transportation costs can be reduced. After all, the magical beasts in the mountains are almost extinct. Thunder rhinos are more suitable for transportation in barren meadows without any roads. They don't like to live in mountains and forests. Yes, as long as you are willing to build a flat road and be responsible for daily road maintenance. I will give you the order to transport iron ore. Serdak said firmly. It's settled. What are you going to do to start construction of your iron ore mine? Malakom asked Serdak. Just this month. Serdak replied. Then I will start planning to build this mountain road right away. Businessman Malakom agreed readily. After discussing the transportation of iron ore, Serdak, accompanied by a group of people, spent most of the day in the iron mine. By nightfall, young people from the indigenous tribe had already built a camp at the foot of the mountain. In addition to the suggested tent set up, there are three wooden cabins. The young hunters of the indigenous tribe hunted a few grouse and a deer in the mountains and the two-headed ogre Gulitum took the initiative to take on the cooking work. Early the next morning, several stewards of the copper mine, businessman Malakom, and two blacksmiths hurried back to the copper mine. Soldak and Gulitum were still going to inspect the Quoto camp. They heard that a minor situation had occurred there. Andrew and Tago had already rushed over to deal with it. Soldak had finished his work here and was ready to go. Rush there immediately. Chapter 1201 Quoto Camp Nearly a hundred tribal young people are left behind at the iron or mine, and they are preparing to build some wooden houses and work sheds at the foot of the mountain in advance. The future mineral processing and grinding machinery will be built at the foot of the mountain. Iron mines and copper mines have slightly different topography. The three refining furnaces were originally built on the top of the first ridge of the copper mine because the ore vein behind them was much higher than the first ridge. It was more like a narrow mine than a vein. The entire mountain range near the iron or mine is filled with iron ore. And in the future miners will dig in from the foot of the mountain. Serdak returned to Bena City this time, 
and wanted to order these large-scale magic machines with the local mineral trading house. In the Grim Empire, many machines originated from the Hextech era of the ancient Goblin dynasty. Many mechanical drawings have been lost in the dust of history. But there are also many Hextech technologies that have been passed down. The goblins designed and built of the most classic machine is the magic airship, which is widely used in almost all parts of the empire. The magic airship overwhelms the teleportation hall of the astrologer guild with its low transportation cost. In addition, the magic cannons that have been in the hands of the imperial magic guild are said to be products of the hex technology era. Countless magicians have always wanted to imitate these magic cannons, but the performance of the imitated magic cannons is far inferior. Not as good as the magic cannon. The core of the grinding machine is said to be hex technology. But the design drawings were probably changed several times in the later period. Now this mineral processing and grinding equipment has been simplified to look like a huge windmill. Many mining trading firms are agents of this kind. Large machinery. Marquis Luther didn't know much about this aspect. But Count Clay Cushing knew it very well. He recommended this mining trading firm in Benna City to Soldak last summer. Originally, Soldak planned to use old equipment from the steel workshop. But this part of the grinding machinery had long since rusted into a pile of scrap iron in the mining area. Many of the removable parts were even dismantled by local villagers and taken home, forged into knives and axes. Therefore, Serdak needs to purchase these out of his own pocket. This time when Serdak came to the iron or mine, the first thing he did was to confirm whether the iron or mine was worth vigorously mining. The second thing was to determine the construction site of the iron or mine. Now there are more than a hundred people left. A young man from an indigenous tribe also wanted to level the foundation in advance. It took Serdak and Guaitam another day to reach the bridgehead camp of the chain bridge. Andrew and Wolf Rider Tago had already arrived here in advance. In the two days since they arrived at the Quoto camp, they started patrolling the northern coast of the Great Rift Valley with the cavalry stationed here. It mainly attacks two aspects. In the first aspect, in order to avoid the tolls of the chain bridge, some adventure groups privately set up ropeways in other narrow areas of the Great Rift Valley and secretly entered the area north of the Great Rift Valley to hunt ghost-marked red ants. This is absolutely not allowed. The first point is of course tax evasion, which resulted in the loss of money that should have been put into Soldek's pocket. The second point also leaves some safety hazards. Once the ghost-striped red ants follow the railway and enter the Invercargill Forest, it will be the most troublesome thing. Several commanders in the garrison camp were away and the cavalry just turned a blind eye to this. Now that Andrew has returned to the military camp, these things immediately enter the category of severe crackdowns. In addition, with the addition of Wolf Riders Tiger and Bonita, they are very good at tracking ghost-marked red ants and finding hiding places. The second aspect is that some adventure groups are also engaged in slave trading. Although the Green Empire has strictly prohibited the indigenous tribes in the occupied areas from becoming slaves, some adventure groups like to sneak into the fringes of the occupied areas and arrest some slave traders. To other provinces, once these slaves enter the slave market and put slave collars on their necks, it is equivalent to certifying slave status. According to the laws of the Green Empire, noble lords are allowed to own slaves. These slave traders captured slaves in other areas, and Serdak had no control over them. But this kind of thing was not allowed in Invercargill Forest. The specific reason is also very realistic. A large part of these young people from the indigenous tribes will join the army of Serdak to serve in the army in the future. In addition, almost all the indigenous young people hope to work in the two mines of Serdak. Work. Slave traders, who hunted slaves in Invercargill Forest, were essentially poaching Soldak. Therefore, this matter is not allowed. When these adventure groups enter Duodan town, the town sheriff will officially notify these adventure groups. However, there are still adventure groups willing to take risks for this. This is not a slave trade. How profitable. But the prejudice against the aborigines in their hearts is almost deeply ingrained in their bones. The wolf knight Tago also hates those slave traders. In the past two days, Andrew and the wolf knight Tago have discovered two ropeways hidden in the dark. And Bonita also followed the smell left by the ropeway and found them. Two adventure groups sneaked into the northern region of the Great Rift Valley for hunting. And one of the adventure groups was a slave catching team. Faced with Andrew and Tiger, two powerful second level players, chasing them from behind, the two adventure groups had no choice but to catch them without help. In fact, given the characters of Andrew and Tago, they do not want these adventure groups to surrender, because only resistance can lead to killing. 
bringing prisoners back to the Iron Chain Bridge camp is far less straightforward than killing them directly. When Suldak arrived at the Quoto camp, the two members of the adventure group were tied to wooden crosses outside the camp by Andrew. They had been hanging here all day, and now they didn't even have the strength to cry out for mercy. Both arms were dislocated, and the person became unconscious under the severe pain. Serdak came to the camp and first learned the basic situation from the guards guarding the crosses before entering the camp. However, Andrew and Tego were not in the camp. They led a cavalry squadron into the west side of the Rift Valley to capture the slave-catching team hiding there. As soon as Serdak arrived at the military camp at Quoto Camp, the leader of the adventure group asked for a meeting outside the camp. Lord Saldak, this is Job Hurst, the leader of the Phoenix Adventure Group. I am here this time to pray for the entire Stone Castle Adventure Group to forgive their crimes. For this reason, Stone Castle Adventure Group is willing to pay a certain amount of fine. The leader of the adventure group walked in, saluted Suldak and said. Suldak sat on the chair, resting his elbows on the armrests of the chair, placing his fists on his chin, and quietly stared at the man named Job, Hearst's leader. Then tell me what mistake the Stone Castle Adventure Group made, Suldak asked casually. They entered the hunting area in the northern part of the Great Rift Valley without authorization through the ropeway. Job, Captain Hester said immediately. As far as I know, they were not only arrested for this, but they also arrested some women from the indigenous tribes in the Invercargill Forest. These people completely ignored the warning of the sheriff of Doden Town. And after my explicit order, even though it is prohibited, they are still catching slaves. Serdak's tone kept rising. That job. Seeing Suldak's angry look, Captain Hester knew that this visit would be in vain. And he said unwillingly, Lord, they are just local aborigines, and they are also a resource that can be used by the adventure group. Besides, the women in the tribe are now in surplus. They captured some tribal women, which will not have much impact on these tribes. Impact. So this is the reason why they captured slaves? Soldek put down his arm and faced Job. Captain Hester asked sharply. Well, many adventure groups have always done this, but no lord or mayor had such a request before. Job. Captain Hester said in a neither humble nor condescending tone. So you think I like other mayors, should have a silent attitude towards the slave-catching adventure group? Soldak looked at Job with a cold look. Captain Hester said, I can tell you responsibly. That is impossible. Just step back. You can leave before I change my mind. Job. When Captain Hester heard what Serdak said, he immediately left Serdak's room in despair. Serdak turned pale with anger and slammed a silver teacup on the table. The ogre Gulitum poked his head out and looked into the room. When he saw that there were no traces of fighting in the room, he immediately retracted his head. Go ahead and tell me that anyone who is caught catching slaves in Invercargill Forest will be tied to a wooden cross and left to dry in the sun for three days. Then they will be tied to Doden Town for trial like slaves. Saldak called to Quoto. The squadron leader of the cavalry battalion on this side of the camp gave casual instructions. Yes, commander. The squadron leader was a veteran of the cavalry battalion and he still used his previous title when facing Soldak. Job. Captain Hester never expected that the slave traders outside would hang on the cross for two more days just because of his request for permission. The squadron leader of the cavalry battalion received the order and was about to leave. Soldak thought for a moment and called him back. As for the adventurers who just smuggled here, let them pay some fines and put them down. Yes. Commander. The squadron leader replied loudly. Then he saluted and left. Chapter 1202 The Injured in the Camp In the afternoon, the Quoto camp became very lively. Many adventure groups brought back some hunted monsters from outside the camp. The entire camp looked like a large slaughterhouse. There are peelers everywhere peeling, cutting and dividing the bodies of red ants. After peeling off the hard carapace, they have to be soaked in the acid of red ants for two days to completely soften them before they can be spread on the ground. Drying on wooden boards. After drying, the ghost pattern red and leather is very smooth, but it is also hard. This kind of hard skin is easier to transport. And the peeled red and meat can also be dried into dried meat. The tentacles and acid venom sacks of ghost striped red ants are also purchased by special personnel. Nowadays, the trade of ghost pattern red ants and Warcraft materials in Duodan Town has evolved into an industrial chain. Almost every bit of material in the body will not be wasted. If there were so many merchants in Duodan Town when the bees tide broke out. Groups. Those corpses of ghost marked red ants piled up outside the city wall may bring greater wealth to Duodan Town. 
I heard that the ghost striped red ants were forced by the adventure group to not dare to escape from the poisonous fog in the swamp. It seems that a large number of ghost striped red ants are still captured by the adventure group every day. Some thoroughly dried hard armor has been loaded onto the truck. And sacks of dried meat have also been transported back to Doden Town. Serdak changed out of the magic pattern structure on his body and walked around the camp casually without any followers. Not far away. I saw a skinner cutting translucent fresh meat. More than half of the hard armor of the ghostly pattern soldier ants had been peeled off on the meat table. The skinning technique was very skillful. Seeing Serdak standing behind and watching, he cut off half of the arm-thick red ant leg and handed it over. Take it back and try it. The red ant meat from this part tastes best when grilled. The skinner said to Soldak enthusiastically. Serdak waved his hand. As long as he was a warrior who had experienced the beast tide, no one would be willing to eat this kind of jelly-like meat. Seeing the skinner's cutting technique, Soldak pulled out the skinning knife and said to the skinner, You can try to cut here, along this dark line, so that you can cut at least, you can peel five ghost striped red ants in a row without sharpening your knife. The skinner followed the cutting points pointed out by Soldak and cut the skinning knife silently into the hard armor. It really felt much smoother. When he peeled off the hard armor, he raised his head to express his gratitude to Serdak, but found that Serdak had left quietly. Soldak walked on the edge of the camp and climbed to a high observation tower. He looked up and saw the rocks in the sky flying southward. It seemed that their predatory area was extending southward, and the Immercargal Forest was to the south is the northern occupied area of Bena Province in the White Forest Plain. This area is filled with a lot of pasture and small towns. The Pingyu family here dominates the sky of the Belan Plain. So much so that there are no magic airships in the Belan Plain. But all this time, rocks rarely fly over Thorny Mountain. Soldak guessed that the ghost-striped red ants in the Dark Worm Valley were hunted in large numbers by the adventure group. So that the ghost-striped red ants usually hide in caves. And the rocks cannot catch enough food. So they have to fly to hunting on the grasslands south of the Thorn Mountains as Invercargill Forest is developed bit by bit. Many negative impacts are revealed bit by bit. Ghost pattern red and leather has now become an industrial chain in the northern part of the Belan Plain. And a large number of leather goods have been sent to Benes City. But now Serdek discovered that on the high platform of the watchtower, two crossbows were installed with a pitch angle of 90 degrees that could shoot into the sky. It seems that the Pinyo should have attacked the Quoto camp. Andrew and Tego returned to the camp with a group of cavalry. They failed to capture the slave-catching adventure group this time. They probably knew that the garrison camp would punish the slave-catching adventure group this time. And they would also have to be hung on a wooden cross outside the camp and exposed to the scorching sun. The members of the adventure group were forced to a cliff in the Great Rift Valley by the cavalry who came to round them up. All the members of the adventure group would rather jump off the cliff to fight for their lives than be captured without mercy. Seeing the members of the adventure group jumping into the rapids of the canyon one after another, some of them were unlucky and fell directly to death on the rocky shoals. Andrew felt a little inexplicably irritable. Back at the camp, Serdak was waiting in the barracks. Wolf Rider Tiger immediately stepped forward and said to Serdak, Boss, when did you arrive? It'll be there at noon. Seeing Andrew sitting aside angrily, Soldak asked him, What's going on here? Andrew told Soldak about the slave-catching group jumping off the cliff. Soldak nodded and said, I guess it won't take long for this matter to spread in this area. And I guess those slave-catching groups will be able to restrain themselves by then. Andrew saw that Soldak did not mention the ghost-marked red ants. So he asked Soldak, Boss, haven't you seen Bob Cobden when you got here? Soldak looked confused and asked, Bob Cobden, who is he? It's a member of the adventure group who was seriously injured. Andrew replied casually. Then he raised the curtain of the barracks and shouted outside the garrison camp. Who is the squadron leader staying in the camp today? After a while, a squadron leader ran in and saluted Andrew. At this time, Andrew pulled Soldak and was about to walk out of the barracks and angrily yelled at the confused squadron leader. Kingsley, what did you do? Didn't I say that when the commander arrived at the bridge camp, he must report Bob Cobden's incident as soon as possible? The squadron leader named Kingsley immediately explained. Captain, the adventure group in the camp this afternoon wants to use various channels to rescue the members of the adventure group who are hanging on the wooden cross outside. I have been dealing with this matter and haven't had time to report it to the commander. Andrew pushed Kingsley aside, took Soldek's arm, and said, Boss, come with me. Captain Kingsley was pushed back two steps by Andrew and followed from behind without saying a word. Andrew led Soldak through the camp and came to the outside of a tent. 
without even saying H, Lo. He opened the tent curtain and walked in. There was a faint smell of blood and acid rot inside the tent. There was a felt blanket on the floor. An injured member of the adventure group was lying on the blanket wrapped in bandages. Looking like a mummy. Andrew squatted next to the member of the adventure group. Nodded to the members of the adventure group beside him as a greeting. And then said to Soldak. Boss! This person is Bob Cobden. Serdak saw that there was only one member of the adventure group left in the tent, probably staying to take care of the wounded man. When he stepped forward, he discovered that the wounded man lying on the carpet seemed to have been corroded by the acid rot of red ants, and some blood was seeping from the hemostatic bandage wrapped around his body. There is also an empty bottle of high-quality healing potion on the shelf nearby. This kind of advanced healing potion is not something you can buy in remote areas like Duoda in town. I remember that Andrew should have two bottles in stock. They were brought back from the battlefield. He glanced at Andrew and didn't expect that this Bal Bob Cobden deserves a bottle of good healing potion from Andrew. In addition to the healing potions, there are also bottles of antidote potions next to them. Bob Cobden was lying on the carpet, his breathing short and weak. If there were no other treatment methods, he might die soon. Serdak lifted off a piece of the hemostatic bandage, and the skin inside had begun to rot. The members of the adventure group standing by looked at their companions with sad faces. Soldak didn't ask. He squatted down, raised his hand to condense a ball of holy light, and then dropped it on Bob Cobden's head. The holy light technique has the power to purify the acid liquid. Balls of holy light fell down, and Bob Cobden's condition slowly improved at a speed visible to the naked eye. The man's rapid breathing turned into gentle moans. It could be seen that the pain on his body was still continuing, but he was finally able to scream. Andrew looked at Soldak. Even if the two didn't speak, they could understand each other's eyes through eye contact. Andrew was asking Soldak, Can this man be saved? Soldak then nodded and said, This man can still be saved. Andrew didn't say anything. He patted his companion, who was guarding Bob Cobden, and said to him, Let's go outside and wait. Only Serdak was left in the tent. Serdak set up a sacrificial altar, summoned the two-faced demon god, and quickly sacrificed the head of A.H. L. Dog. A beam of light fell on Bob Cobden. The blessed body fell on him and the powerful recovery power immediately made Bob Cobden sober. Soldak gave himself the blessing power of the Eye of Truth through the H, L dog's head, and then saw the situation inside through the layers of bandages. Almost all the surface of Bob Cobden's body was covered in acid. The liquid corroded it, as if the whole person had fallen into a pool of acid. The recovery power of the Divine Blessing body is very effective for him, but if he wants his injuries to improve, he may have to pay a higher price. It can be said that one of the high-end sacrifices that Serdak brought out from the battlefield is one less. And it is almost difficult to replenish them here. But judging from Andrew's attitude, he probably wanted to save the member of the adventure group in front of him. He had no choice but to take out another demon warrior's head from the demon ceiling box and sacrifice it. And a stronger divine light fell on Bob Cobden's body. Tyrants. As long as there is still breath, people will not die in the hegemonic state. Seeing that Bob Cobden was in a peaceful coma again, Soldak began to carefully cut off the hemostatic bandage on his body, and then began to clean the pus and blood from the ulcers all over his body. Prepare some water and new hemostatic bandages, Serdak shouted outside the tent. After a while, the squadron leader named Kingsley stood outside the tent with a basin of water and asked cautiously, Can I come in? Serdak walked to the door and took the basin, blocking him from the tent. After some cleaning, Almost all the remaining acid on his body was washed away. After rebandaging the wound, he walked out of the tent with a wooden basin. The member of the adventure group waiting outside immediately got into the tent to check on Serdak's treatment. Soldak poured away the blood in the basin and saw Captain Kingsley still waiting outside the tent. He asked strangely, Where is Andrew? The captain is dealing with the slave-catching adventure group members outside the camp. Squadron leader Kingsley answered honestly, Kingsley is a veteran brought by Serdak from the desolate land. He originally joined the cavalry battalion because of his rich combat experience. But he has some hidden diseases in his body. He has been through Serdak's holy light technique and divine blessing several times. After receiving physical treatment, not only did his body recover as before, he was actually promoted to a first-class warrior and accepted the magic pattern of being colonized by Serdak. Now he is a squadron leader in the cavalry battalion. Soldak patted him on the shoulder and told him, Go! Call Andrew back! Holding a whip in his hand, Andrew strode into the barracks and placed the whip in the corner of the barracks. Serdak was sitting with Taiko, Gulitam, and Bonita, 
shaving me from a roasted yellow sheep. The frost wolf was also enjoying the treatment of the barbecue. Instead of everyone eating the leftovers. Meat bones. After getting along with each other for a long time, everyone discovered that except that this frost wolf could not speak imperial language. It had the same intelligence as an adult. Moreover, his performance in the battle earned him the respect of everyone in the team. And he also gained the right to dine together. Tego took a knife, cut off a piece of blood streak meat, put it on Bonita's plate, and gave Andrew an empty plate. Andrew didn't mind it either. So he cut off a piece of meat from the burnt place, sprinkled some salt on it, and stuffed a piece into his mouth. Andrew, don't be too extreme with those adventurous groups that capture slaves. We just need to let them know our attitude, Sir Dagna and the knife said. Andrew groaned, seeing Andrew's disinterested expression. Sir Dak continued, You have to give them some time. Some things need to be changed subtly. In many places in the Green Empire, slave hunting is legal. I'm afraid many adventure groups have I can't understand why we should ban slave catching. So we have to publicize that even if slave hunting harms my interests, it is equivalent to appropriating my property. And we can use imperial laws to restrict them from the standpoint of aristocrats, rather than an extremely profiteering method. Seeing that Suldak had said so much, Andrew said impatiently, I know. Boss, I will listen to you on this matter. By the way, how is Bob Cobden's situation? Andrew took a sip of ale and then asked. Suldak nodded to Andrew and said, I have used all the means that should be used. If nothing else happens, things should get better tomorrow morning. Andrew, is he your friend? Andrew was startled for a moment, then shook his head and replied, No. Chapter 1203 Strange Travel His companion said that he escaped from the Dark Worm Valley with a single injury. When he was unconscious, he kept calling for the ghost-striped Ant Queen. I guess he may have seen the Queen in the Dark Worm Valley. Andrew reached out and cut a large piece of roast meat on the yellow sheep's ribs and said to Soldak. The next morning, Andrew saw Soldak walking out of the barracks and reported to him that Bob Cobden had woken up. Serdak walked into the tent with Andrew and happened to see his companion feeding him wheat porridge. His face was still very weak. Seeing Serdak walking in, the companion immediately stood up and saluted Serdak. Bob Cobden was lying on the bed. Although he was very weak, he looked at Soldak with gratitude. He wanted to say something to Soldak urgently, but his throat could only make a gurgling sound. Soldak checked his throat and found that it was only inflammation in the throat that temporarily prevented him from speaking. Have a good rest, and your voice will recover soon, Soldak said to Bob Cobden. Bob Cobden looked towards Soldak with a grateful expression, but could not make any move. When Soldak left, the companion who had been taking care of Bob Cobden took the initiative to send Soldak and his party outside the tent. When Soldak came back to check on Bob Cobden's injury in the evening, he found that under the blessing of the powerful god, his injuries had basically formed a layer of oil film and many places healed very quickly. Bob Cobden sat on a box, and his companion fed him some water. This time he can speak, but he cannot speak continuously for too long, and he has to drink water frequently to continue speaking. Bob Cobden first expressed his gratitude to Soldak, and soon talked about the Dark Worm Valley. He knew exactly what Serdak wanted, so he laid down in this tent and began to talk about some of the things he had encountered when he sneaked into the Dark Worm Valley alone. I just wanted to walk around outside that day. Unexpectedly, after leaving the camp, I happened to see a main beast in the jungle on the edge of the poisonous fog swamp. This kind of monster is very rare in the area south of the Rift Valley. So I planned to kill this main beast and then return to the Quoto camp with the loot. Before I could touch it, I saw a huge rock falling from the sky above my head and slaying the main beast. I lay in the corner and didn't dare to move. I thought I could escape by taking the main beast away. I didn't expect that I managed to escape the giant mouth of the punk bird, but became the prey of a group of ghost-striped red ants. Seeing that I couldn't escape, I had to pretend to be dead in desperation. I may look like a grain of food in their mouths, pinched around the waist by a ghost-striped worker ant with giant pincers, and then carried by the ghost-striped worker ants into the burrow, across the poisonous swamp fog, and all the way across the stone bridge, and finally entered a huge cave. The stone bridge spans the entire lake. After passing the stone bridge, the entrance to the crypt is actually not too far from the stone bridge. The cave was not dug vertically. Instead, it was dug seven or eight meters deep and then extended downwards at an angle because the cave was uneven. I couldn't feel my way down even when I was in suspended animation. After passing through an underground tunnel about three to four kilometers long, 
you will enter the interior of the dark worm valley. I found that this place is more like a small basin. Standing in the wide open field, you can actually look up at the starry sky above your head. The cave is very spacious. Far from the deep cave we thought. Then I stepped on the perimeter of this huge basin and discovered a row of ring-shaped entrances. At that time, I thought again that this was probably the real cave entrance of the red ant. And that huge basin felt very strange to me. It looks like a huge tree hole. And the entire tree roots are completely hollowed out. It's very similar. But I can confirm that those mountain walls are very hard rocks. Not rotten tree roots. I was lifted high into the air by a giant claw of a ghost-striped worker ant. At that time, my waist was almost severed by the worker ant. And then I entered the underground ant nest. These ant nests are crisscrossing underground. With winding passages and countless ghost-striped red ants are walking through them. There are huge caves not far apart in these passages, and some are places where a lot of non-perishable food is stored. Go further inside, and you will see an incubation chamber filled with fraternal eggs hanging on the top of the cave. There are many such chambers, and some ghostly patterned soldier ants will guard these stone chambers. I was taken deep into the cave. During this period, I tried to find opportunities to escape, but unfortunately I failed. It looked like a castle until I saw that huge thing in the deepest part of the cave. To be precise, half of his body should be connected to a huge castle. Those one meter high white giant eggs are squeezed out of the twelve castle doors. Ghost patterned soldiers are waiting next to each door. And they will move the hatched fraternal eggs into the incubation room. It was only after I came here that I had the idea of escape. I am an assassin. I have learned how to fake death and how to hide. I can cover up my body smell and hide in any dark corner without being noticed. Unfortunately, when I was escaping, the queen ant found me. Although she couldn't move, it seemed that the entire ant hole was full of eyes. No matter where I was hiding, they would easily find me. It commanded a group of ghost-striped soldier ants to capture me in the cave. And I first hid in an incubation room. Unfortunately, every time I went to an incubation room, I was always quickly found by these ghost-striped red ants. In the end, I couldn't hide, so I opened a fraternal egg and got in. When Bob Cobden talked about this, his pupils tightened, as if he recalled the scene he least wanted to see. At the beginning, the fraternal egg contained clear egg liquid, and there was no special feeling except that the whole body was sticky. It's a pity that I couldn't escape at that time, so I kept hiding in that fraternal egg, until the fraternal egg slowly deteriorated. The egg liquid gradually turned into sour liquid under such circumstances, and I soaked in it. The group of ghost-striped red ants discovered this broken fraternal egg. A ghost-striped worker ant threw the fraternal egg out of the cave, and I was able to escape. However, by then the acid rot had corroded my whole body, and I must have passed out inside the fraternal egg. I don't know who saved me. The companion who had been taking care of him spoke at this time. The ones who rescued you were our colleagues. At that time, they thought you were an egg-laying human being. You crawled out of the fraternal egg all wet, which shocked them. They rescued you, originally planning to sell you to magic. The Union later found out that you were actually a member of the adventure group. So we took you back to the Quoto camp. At that time, we saw that all the skin on your body had been corroded. So we all bought a coffin for you. Chapter 1204 Constructing the Night Sorry, we didn't have any means to treat you at that time. We could only reveal the news that you were dragged into the Dark Worm Valley by Red Ants to the garrison camp. We planned to seek some help from the local garrison. We hope to buy some antidote or small a dose of healing potion will help you survive the most dangerous period. But you don't know how expensive treatment potions are now. We just bought a few bottles of antidote potions. We later discovered that these antidote potions had no effect on your injuries at all. Fortunately, Captain Andrew heard the news about you and rushed to the camp in time. He took out a bottle of high quality healing potion and extended your life for three more days until Commander Serdak arrived. Come here and save you. Bob Cobden, your life was saved by Commander Soldak. The companion sat next to Bob Cobden and told him what had happened in the past few days. Bob Cobden probably wanted to move, but with just a tiny bit of effort, a sharp pain immediately shot through his body, almost causing him to faint, probably because the scabs on the body had cracked again. Blood stained several bandages. Thank you, Commander Serdak. Bob Cobden's voice was a little weak when he spoke, but the gratitude in his eyes was revealed. Bob Cobden has always been a scout in the adventure group. He is proficient in detection and concealment skills. So he always runs around looking for traces of ghost-striped red ants in the wild. 
This time, he had the opportunity to go deep into the depths of the Darkworm Valley. Although it was not his original intention, due to a combination of circumstances, he could be regarded as seeing the most real situation in the Worm Valley. According to Bob Cobden, there are still a large number of ghost-striped red ants in the Worm Valley, and the fraternal eggs almost fill the underground caves. There are also queen ants that are said to be as huge as a small building. They need to eat a lot every day, and can a large number of eggs are produced. If it weren't for the overproduction of fraternal eggs by queen ants, there wouldn't be a tide of beasts that occurs once every 10 years. However, Serdak was still very curious. After crossing the vast lake and entering the ant hole, he actually entered a huge circular valley. The real entrance of the ant nest is around this circular valley. This area, the circular valley, is more like the living area of these ghost striped red ants. Unless there is a shortage of supplies in this area, they will not run out of the insect valley to find food. The way the ghost striped red ants cross the poisonous swamp is not because they themselves have the ability to resist poison. Maybe the red ants have difficulty crossing the swamp. The way they enter and exit the swamp is to dig underground in the swamp. Out of the cave. After hearing the news brought back by Bob Cobden, Serdak gave up his plan to attack the Dark Worm Valley in the short term. According to Bob Cobden, Serdak had a construct night. The regiment may not be able to capture this insect valley. However, Serdak is very interested in this crater. If the ghost marked red ants can be completely eliminated in the future, this valley will probably become a paradise. This is why Andrew feels that Bob Cobden is worth Serdak's efforts to treat. After all, this assassin has detailed information about the Dark Worm Valley. Soldak did not ask for too many details. But he was a little shocked when Bob Cobden hid in the fraternal egg and escaped the pursuit of the ghost-marked red ants. Originally, Serdak was planning to reorganize an army this winter and launch a tentative attack on the Dark Worm Valley. After all, he currently has 12 heavy armored infantry regiments. Although most of the troops are concentrated in the Ganbu Plain, it is not easy for Serdak to temporarily recruit a group of troops into the Belan Plain. Calculation is difficult. During the period when the Luther army was stationed in the Belan Plain, if Serdak wanted to mobilize some troops, he only needed to submit an application to the Bena City military headquarters. Now it seems that this matter may need to be discussed again. After all, if you want to invade the Dark Worm Valley, your first stop must be to cross the lake outside the Worm Valley. But this is not the most dangerous. The most dangerous thing is to pass through the ant hole and enter the ring basin. Once the ghost striped red ants ant in the ring basin an ambush is set up at the entrance of the cave. It only takes a few heavily armored ghost striped male ants to guard the entrance of the cave to block the wormhole firmly. By then, no matter how many elite troops Serdak has, it will be difficult to invade the ring basin. Soldak and Andrew looked at each other, and they instantly understood each other's thoughts. And they could only shell the plan to send troops to the Dark Worm Valley for the time being. Standing up in the tent, Soldak said to Bob Cobden, Bob, you just need to pay attention to your injuries during this period. These injuries will take about two weeks to basically heal. However, after recovery, the skin will be difficult to recover. Restore the original state. The companion also stood up and asked Serdak, Commander, is there anything you need us to do? Soldak shook his head and continued to say to Bob Cobden, Take good care of yourself. Protecting every adventure group in the Quota camp is originally the duty of our camp garrison. As for treating you, we have also obtained a lot of useful information. By the way, you can try to sort out this information and take it to Doden Town to sell it to the local mercenary union and adventure group union. It is estimated that there should be a lot more the adventure group is willing to know about this dark warm valley. Before Soldak left, he did not forget to say something to Bob Cobden. After walking out of the tent, Andrew followed from behind and asked Soldak in a low voice, Boss, are we really not going to try to take advantage of the Ant Queen this winter? I think as long as we are better prepared, we can it shouldn't be too difficult to deal with this Queen Ant. What level of strength do you think this Queen Ant can reach to rule such a large ant nest? Soldak stopped and turned to Andrew and asked, At least level 5. Maybe level 6. But it's not like we haven't hunted level 6 monster lords before. Andrew said very confidently, but those demon lords are exiled on the battlefield. Lack of food and clothing. And are in a semi-sealed state. The situation of this queen ant is completely different. She has at least hundreds of thousands of ghost marked red ants under her command. Do you think we will encounter a tide of ants when we enter the ant nest? Serdak put his hand on Andrew's shoulder and asked. Andrew was speechless for a moment. Soldak continued to say to Andrew. Call the cavalry you selected later. Isn't the magic pattern structure we worked hard to get back from the big battlefield just to establish a structure knights? 
although now we have the magic pattern constructs accumulated in the army, are not enough to form a 500-member Construct Knights group. But currently there should be no problem in setting up three squadrons of Construct Knights. Andrew's eyes brightened. He saluted Soldak and said cheerfully, Yes. Chapter 1205 Constructing Knight 2 The Cavalry Battalion dispatched a total of 300 cavalry, 500 heavy infantry, and 200 archers to garrison the bridgehead camp. This is the northernmost gate of Sertek's territory, because the bridgehead camp is close to the Poison Mist Swamp and the Darkworm Valley. The garrison sent by Sertak is also the most elite force. The cavalry and heavy armor left in Doden Town the infantry is far inferior to the soldiers here in terms of combat effectiveness. Almost all of the 300 cavalry have been imbued with the strength and resilience life magic pattern. And their war horses have also been imbued with the same life magic pattern. In terms of explosive power, these war horses are even stronger than the black scale horses. Sardak captured a total of nearly 120 sets of magic pattern structures in the Gombu Plain. Archmage Harper helped Sardak repair 100 sets of magic pattern structures. And some other magic pattern structures. Sardak simply took it to the Inscription Master in Bena City for repair. Now all these magic pattern structures have been repaired. In addition, Sardak also brought back 90 sets of magic pattern structures from the battlefield. These magic pattern structures were all obtained by Sardak in exchange for a large number of unidentified magic crystals in the underground trading market. During the six months he spent on the battlefield, almost all his savings were invested in the primary magic pattern construction. Originally, Sardak had also raised a large amount of magic crystals. Unfortunately, large-scale transactions like this on the battlefield still require unidentified magic crystals. The magic crystals accumulated by Sardak could only be bid in the auction house. Although the magic crystals for those magic pattern structures that appeared in single sets were not spent, Sardak now has more than 200 sets of primary magic pattern structures in his hands. These magic pattern structures can fully arm three cavalry squadrons. Andrew also did not expect that Sardak would give priority to equip the cavalry battalion of the Belan Plain. After all, Sardak also formed a larger cavalry regiment in the Gombu Plain. Almost all of these cavalry in the bridge camp belonged to Andrew. Subordinates, when Soldak opened up the Ganbu Plain, Andrew had been stationed in the Belan Plain. He almost led these cavalry to fight in the Invercargo Forest. He led this cavalry battalion and even set foot on the Three Rivers Plain in the east and the Anya Swamp in the west. The magic pattern structure was distributed to the cavalry of the 1st, 2nd, and 3rd cavalry squadrons. And the entire cavalry battalion was excited. Almost all of these cavalrymen followed Sardak from the deserted land to the Belan Plain. When Sardak was clearing out sand pirates in the desert on the northwest border of the deserted land, he could hardly even ride a horse. Later, everyone learned to ride a horse, but they were still unable to fight on horseback and could only be regarded as horse infantry. Later, when they were stationed in the Belen Plain, 19 native herdsmen came to the camp. With their help, the cavalry's equestrian skills improved significantly. Now everyone has become a qualified cavalry, but no one expects to become a construct knight one day. In the minds of these cavalry, those knights who can afford to wear magic pattern armor are almost all a group of nobles. In the spacious open space in front of the Quoto camp, almost all the garrison soldiers in the camp were gathered here. There were actually a thousand soldiers stationed in the garrison camp that didn't look too big. When everyone gathered together, Sardak realized that there were actually so many people in the camp. The first three squadrons of the cavalry battalion stand at the front of the team. They are the well-deserved elites of the cavalry battalion and the entire cavalry battalion is the elite of all the garrison. Seeing the rare large-scale gathering of the garrison, the members of the adventure group in the camp thought something big had happened here, and they all ran to the outside to watch from a distance. Serdak, Andrew, Gulitam, and Tago stood in front of the army. Serdak got off his horse, took out boxes one by one from his magic belt bag, and piled them in front of everyone. Andrew took Gulitam and Tago to award these magical boxes to the cavalry standing in the front row looking at the heavy magic sealing boxes in their arms. The cavalrymen wanted to press their bodies against these boxes and follow the gaps in the boxes to see what the magic pattern structure inside looked like. After all the magic pattern structures were distributed, Sardak jumped onto the wooden pier in front of the empty field. He also held such a magic sealing box in his arms. He patted the box hard, and the huge sound attracted people, attracting everyone's attention. The empty field instantly became quiet. Sardak then said loudly, I know you must have heard of the magic pattern construct. And you have also seen the knights wearing the magic pattern construct galloping on the battlefield. But I believe that few of us on the field have actually used it. Now! 
I will select some of the best cavalry among you and let you become construct knights. When Saldek said this, the scene almost boiled. Although it has long been a foregone conclusion who the magic pattern structure will be distributed to. But after all, it is the magic pattern structure that is regarded as a heirloom by the nobles. Serdak could only pause for a moment, letting the sounds of the scene fall silent. Then Serdak continued, Everyone should know that activating the power of the magic pattern structure requires some expensive magic crystal fragments. After the magic pattern structure is worn on the body, it can improve its various attributes and enhance combat strength. Everyone listened attentively. Soldek suddenly asked a question. But by wearing this set of magic pattern constructs, does it mean that you really become a construct knight? He did not wait for everyone present to give answers, but answered directly. In fact, our empire's definition of construct knights is much more than that. Not only do you need to be a first-level warrior to be qualified to wear them, but you also need to know how to use their power in order to be considered a qualified construct knight. The most powerful thing about the magic pattern structure is not to greatly enhance its own strength, but to use the magic pattern to construct a bridge that allows you and your war horse to become one. This is the power of the magic pattern structure. So how to turn the magic pattern structure into a bridge and use the structure to transfer our power to the war horse is the main direction we need to learn next. Due to the limited number of magic pattern structures we have prepared, we can only equip the top three squadrons of the cavalry battalion with the best ones at the moment. Next, I will gradually equip the cavalry squadrons at the back with magic pattern structures. But here, my expectation for everyone is that everyone who has obtained the magic pattern construct can flaunt themselves as a true construct knight. After Soldak said these words, the scene became boiling again. He did not stay at the scene any longer. Next, Andrew would conduct systematic training on these cavalry. But before that, these cavalry must learn how to correctly wear the magic pattern structure on their bodies. This was also the first lesson Andrew taught them. The members of the adventure group who were watching were a little dumbfounded at this moment. For them, they had witnessed the birth of three squadrons of construct knights with their own eyes. For the entire Quoto camp, the cavalry stationed here have been upgraded to constructed knights, and the soft power of the entire camp has been significantly improved. But for those adventure groups who secretly carry out slave trading, seeing such things makes their hearts a little more gloomy. No one can ignore the existence of construct knights. At night, Andrew walked into the barracks from outside and saw Soldek still writing some plans on the table. So he took the initiative to get over. Soldek raised his head and saw Andrew, and immediately said to him, It just so happens that I have to send someone to find you. I'm afraid you will have to stay here for me during the next period of time. I am always worried that those ghost striped red ants will make a big counterattack and swallow up this temporary camp. So I hope that you will stay here during the next period of time. Over here, watch the door here for me, Soldek said to Andrew. Andrew sat opposite Soldek, poured himself a cup of black tea, and drank it all. Don't worry. Boss, I will help you guard this gate. Not just this gate. I will help you guard the entire Great Rift Valley. Andrew agreed readily. Serdak nodded and said, After the beast tide, we all underestimated this group of ghost-striped red ants. During the battle last winter, I even mistakenly thought that their population was shrinking significantly. Now it seems that at least it is not as serious as we thought. I will let Samira stay in Duodan Town. At least if there is a situation here, Duodan Town will be able to respond quickly. Andrew asked. What about the Ganbu Plain? I took Gulitam back to Ritz City. The new army there has been established. Next, we need to vigorously develop the economy of Makusuo and Rut. There are no threatening monsters in that plain. Low-level monsters, the demons are basically extinct, and there won't be any emergencies for the time being. Soldek stopped the pen in his hand and said to Andrew. Besides, you have to be careful of the Pingyao clan further north. I think they kill livestock, herdsmen and caravans on the grassland. Maybe not because there is not enough food, but simply because they just want a change of taste. Soldak added another sentence. I'll ask Tago and Bonita to stay and help you too. Andrew nodded. And then the two chatted about the training of the Construct Knights. Commander Felix's notes on the experience of the Construct Knight left to Serdak contain very detailed records on the initial targeted training of the Construct Knight. Serdak only needs to train according to the experience notes to train these cavalrymen. Train to become a qualified knight. After handling these matters, Serdak left the Quoto camp with the two-headed ogre the next morning, rushed back to the copper mine, joined Selina who was waiting there, and then returned Doden town. Soldak spent exactly 12 days wandering around the Invercargill forest, 
seeing that half of the month has passed. Soldek did not dare to linger in Doden Town. He did not even have the chance to visit the War College and hurried back to Wilk City. Finally, it was the end of the month. Number 25 passed through the portal and returned to Benes City. Chapter 1206 The Tale of April At the end of April, a light rain suddenly came at night in Benes City. A gust of cold wind blew through the back garden of the Duke's Palace, making people waiting in line to pass through the portal feel a chill. Zerdak took the two-headed ogre Gulitum and walked out of the portal under the surprised eyes of everyone. The two finally rushed back to Benes City before the end of the month. There was a row of magic caravans parked on the roadside in the back street of the Duke's Palace. Soldak summoned one casually, and the ogre Gulitum was still sitting in the caravan as usual. Behind the carriage, Zerdak boarded the carriage alone. This time he returned to Benes City, which seemed a bit deserted. My lord, where are you going? The coachman asked respectfully, standing outside the carriage door. The Dwarf Precision Forging Workshop at number 69 Pro Street in the fourth block, Soldek said while sitting on the leather sofa in the carriage with his eyes closed. As the carriage slowly drove into the traffic, Soldek, who was slightly tired, rubbed the corners of his eyes with his fingers a few times. This is the most prosperous place in the aristocratic neighborhood because it is adjacent to the back garden of the Duke's Palace and is also the exit of the 13 plane portals. This street is crowded with various vehicles loaded with goods every day. Serdak always couldn't figure out why the first Duke built the plane portal in his back garden. Didn't he think that once the plane was occupied by the demons or the dark army, the army would rush through the plane portal? When you come in, will the first place you occupy be the Duke's Palace? Presumably the first Duke must have other plans. Serdak turned to look at the street because this is the most congested place in Benes City. Street stalls are usually restricted. Some food stalls can only be seen in the street alleys. The road ahead was blocked for unknown reasons, and the magic caravan could only be sandwiched among the many carriages. At this time, there were actually some food stall owners carrying steaming food and selling to the guests on these carriages along the street. Of course they would not offend the nobles, and would give smiles to civilians and businessmen. Serdak had no idea that a stall owner who was not afraid of death would run up to Gulitum and hold up the food on his plate. Of course, the ogre behaved very generously at this time. He took the dinner plate directly, then took out a handful of silver coins from his arms and stuffed them into the stall owner's hand. At this time, the carriage suddenly could move forward. The stall owner counted the silver coins in his hand and chased behind the carriage and shouted at the ogre, I gave you too much. You gave me too much. At this time, Gulitum was showing off to his good brother Nailware how capable he was. And someone actually took the initiative to deliver food. But now Huar saw that the stall owner was almost scratched by the carriage behind him. And quickly shouted to the back. Get out of the way. Be careful of the carriage behind you. Any extra will be our tip. The Dwarf Precision Forging Workshop is located in the workshop block of Benes City. Here are hundreds of the most famous large and small workshops in Benes City. However, the workshops that can survive here all have their own characteristics. Those the workshops with nothing have long been overwhelmed by the high rents of the houses here. Soldak had been here when he attended the metal ceremony, and had also talked with the workshop owner here about purchasing a grinding machine. However, it was unclear at that time how much tonnage he wanted to purchase. Now, after an on-site inspection of the Invercargill Forest in the White Forest Plain, Soldak wanted to purchase a larger one, at least for this workshop the largest grinder the workshop could ever build. The magic caravan is parked at 69, Pro Street. You can always see some multi-wheel trucks with a body length of more than 10 meters on this street. The wheels of these trucks are very interesting. There are many sets at the front and rear, and they all seem to be equipped with differential devices to facilitate the movement of these long and narrow trucks on the street. Turn. At the entrance of some workshops, you can still see workers loading goods onto the carriages. It can be seen that the workshops in Benes City are far more prosperous than those in other cities. At least there is no such scene in Wilk City, let alone Ruth City, Makuso City or Halensa City. Soldek rushed over this time, and the person who came out to receive him was actually the owner of this workshop, Baron Camber. Although the title of this workshop owner was a bit low, his business was not small at all. The entire workshop actually owned there is a complete casting and forging workshop. And in the processing workshop, you can also see dwarf craftsmen wearing leather pants and a row of tools hanging from their waists. There were so many dwarf craftsmen. Serdak took a casual look and saw at least 20 dwarf craftsmen. Baron Camber brought Serdak to an exhibition room and introduced Serdak to the functions of these machines one by one. Apparently, 
Baron Camber did not have enough respect for magic, and many of the instruments had been separated from magic. Moreover, Baron Camber also highly praised Hex technology. If some words were heard by a magician, it would be disrespectful to the god of magic. Maybe he would be convicted of becoming a heretic. Serdak had no intention of slandering the god of magic, so he went straight to the point and ordered a large grinding equipment and added a mineral processing mechanism in front. After finally discussing the price of the machinery, discussing transportation issues, installation and commissioning issues, and setting the delivery date in two months, the two parties directly signed a magic contract. Serdak didn't even need to pay a part of the deposit, and the transaction was successfully completed rejecting Baron Camber's kind invitation. Serdak left the dwarf forging workshop with the two-headed ogre. You really don't want to go with him? In the single-story building of the military camp in Doden Town, Gary Decker was wearing a pajamas and sitting on the windowsill next to the attic window, wiping his wet long hair with a towel. She was the kind of woman who could bathe with the soldiers in the public bathroom. Naturally, she didn't care how much impact the thin pajamas would have on the soldiers in the military camp. Samira was lying on the bed, wearing a conservative pajamas. She rarely took off her magic pattern structure. Recently, she had been staying with Carrie Decker for a long time. And she had changed a little bit, becoming more beautiful. I was able to enjoy life more before. It's better to be here than over there, Samira said with her eyes closed. Hey, is it true? Carrie Decker asked curiously. If you think it's true, then it's true. Samira still didn't open her eyes. Carrie Decker compromised and did not continue to dwell on this matter. He said casually, Okay, actually it's pretty good here. Samira turned over on the bed, lying on the bed, holding the pillow with both hands and staring at Gary Decker, and said, Stop talking about me. Let's talk about you. You have been out for so long. Don't you want to go back to Ababa? Can you take a look at your home in the province? What's good to see? Those who like me, and those who love me are gone. There are only those who are jealous of me hate me, and are afraid of me. Do you want me to run back and scare people? Carrie Decker put down her words. With a wet towel in his hand, he rolled up his long hair and said, Samira, where is your home? Was Amala from the Maka Plain. I grew up in the rescue station. There were many mouths waiting for food there. I really couldn't survive. So I signed a five-year long-term contract with the captain. Samira said. Gary Decker did not expect that Samira had such a difficult and difficult past. Looking at the half-elf archer in front of him, who was feared by all the strong men in Blue Bridge Fortress, he exclaimed, Wow! Then he is now didn't you make a lot of money? I made a lot of money! Samira hugged the pillow and answered firmly. Ignore the confusion on Gary Decker's face at all. Gulitam still chose to stay in the Circle Hotel. He was already familiar with this hotel. Or it could be said that this hotel was used to the occasional two-headed ogre staying here for a night. He didn't want to go to Marquis Luther's mansion. There were many rules there, but the main thing was the look in the eyes of the servants, which would make the two-headed ogre very uncomfortable. It didn't mean that the servants didn't respect Gulitam. That kind of look it's like looking at a stranger, with eyes full of alertness and caution. But in the Circle Hotel, the ogre will not be surrounded by such eyes. As long as he is willing to take out a few silver coins as a tip, he can get the most considerate service. After Suldak settled Gulitam, he took the magic caravan to the gate of Marquis Luther. When the guard saw Suldak pushing open the window, he immediately ran to push the door open and let the coachman drive the magic caravan straight into the Marquis Mansion. When Suldak paid the fare and got out of the carriage, he didn't know how the doorman informed him. Butler Kenneth was already waiting at the bottom of the steps with several servants. When he saw Suldak after stepping off the carriage, he quickly saluted. But Serdak didn't have any luggage. Only then did Serdak remember that he should actually take one or two pieces of luggage politely and put them in the back of the car. In this way, the servants could move the luggage while he got out of the car, which would make it more lively. He should even give it to everyone. Prepare some gifts. You can't come empty-handed every time. Just when he was standing on the steps, a little embarrassed, thinking about all these things, the door of the house was pushed open suddenly. Hathaway and Beatrice ran out of it wearing long white house dresses, followed quickly by two maids. They ran down the steps quickly with their long skirts in hand and rushed into Suldak's arms without stopping. Inside, if Serdak hadn't been prepared, the two women would have thrown him onto the stone slab under the steps. At this time, the carriage had already left the Marquis Mansion quickly. Suldak put his hands around the slender waists of Hathaway and Beatrice, kissed them on the lips, 
and then let the two women bury their heads on Soldek's shoulders. Hathaway and Beatrice held Soldek's arms on the left and right, and the three of them walked into the hall of the Marquis Mansion together. Mrs. Marion. Mrs. Mabel and Mrs. Cece were waiting in the hall. Mrs. Marion stood at the front and asked Soldak with a smile. Did the trip go well? Serdak saluted Madame Marion and replied. Yeah, it went very well. Mrs. Marion was obviously in a very good mood and said to Hathaway. Hathaway, let Soldak take a bath to relieve the fatigue of the journey. Ferdinand will probably come back in the evening. When dinner is ready, I will send someone to call you. Hathaway couldn't wait to hold Soldak's arm and walk towards their attic bedroom. When climbing the spiral staircase, she hung on Soldak's body like a koala and asked for a kiss. Lying on the soft big bed, Serdak let out a long breath. Hathaway's thick golden curly hair spread on his chest, and her green eyes looked intently at Soldak's stubbled chin. On the windowsill, Beatrice was stroking the harp with a flushed face under the afternoon breeze, and the elegant and smooth notes flowed out from her slender fingers. How is the situation over there in Ruth City? Soldak patted Hathaway's round apple and asked casually. He just wanted to distract her. Everyone needed a break. As expected, Hathaway stopped making some small moves and told Soldak about the recent situation in Ruth City. Fortunately, as the economy of the Ganbu Plain continues to recover, Ruth City has also gained some business opportunities. The situation in the entire city is getting better. At least the unemployment rate is no longer so high. Soldak then stated his plan. This time I plan to move the steel workshop in Ruth City to Milan. The iron ore mine in Invercargill Forest will be built next month. The two also discussed how to move such a large iron mine to the Belan Plain. Finally, they talked about how a large piece of land would be vacant in Rear City after the steel workshop was moved. What are you going to do with the land left idle by the workshop? Hathaway asked. Serdak seemed to have thought of something, and immediately leaned forward and took out a map of Ruth City from a magic waste bag scattered under the bed. The area in the steel workshop on the map had been completely blackened by Serdak's ink. Soldak laid the map on the bed and said to Hathaway enthusiastically, This is close to the workshop area and civilian area of Ruth City. I plan to build a dining plaza here. A dining plaza that is open to all Ruth citizens and integrates food and accommodation. Hathaway had no specific concept of the dining plaza described by Soldak and asked with some surprise, Is the entire area just a hotel with catering? It's not one restaurant but many restaurants and hotels clustered together, like the food court next to the Swordsman Academy. Soldak explained carefully. Hathaway questioned. In that case, wouldn't the competition be too fierce? Soldak put his arm around Hathaway's smooth shoulders and said, How should I put this? There will definitely be competition. But as customer traffic increases and everyone opens restaurants together, business will get better. Leaning her head in Soldak's arms, Hathaway's eyes were a little drunk and she just asked in a low voice. Duck, do we also want to open a restaurant in Ruth City? Serdak shook his head and said. Us? Oh no. When we build a food court, we will rent those shops to people who want to open restaurants. What we will do in the future is property management of the food court. At this time, Hathaway was already like a beautiful snake crawling into Soldak's arms, and whispered, Then shall we come again? Chapter 1207 Meeting Again Hathaway and Beatrice took a shower and changed before going downstairs for dinner. At this time, Marquis Luther had returned from the military headquarters. Soldak was sitting on the right-hand side of Marquis Luther. The two of them were sitting in front of the dining table, eating and chatting, and the people next to them could hardly get a word in. Hathaway listened carefully for a while and realized that the two were talking about the construction of the knights. After hearing Soldak talking about the difference between construct knights and construct swordsmen, and also talking about the formation of a construct knights at the bridgehead camp on the Belan Plain. Hathaway put down the spoon in her hand and spoke to Sir Duck Ast with a surprised look on his face. Duck, have you already started to form the constructed knights? Sir Duck nodded and admitted. Yes, but there are only three squadrons at the moment. Hathaway looked at Marquis Luther in surprise. Marquis Luther had said that Sir Duck would be his successor, and the troops in his hands would be handed over to Sir Duck one after another in the future but that was things to come. Marquis Luther is currently able to become the Lord Representative of the main war faction in the Bena province because he controls the Luther Legion, the most elite of which are two regiments of constructed swordsmen. He never said that he would hand over the constructed swordsmen group to Serdak now. Dak captured a batch of magic pattern constructs when he wiped out Lord Macdonald on the Gombu Plain. This time he went to the big battlefield and accumulated some. 
His three squadrons of construct knights relied on their own strength. Earn it back. When talking about this, Marquis Luther also showed pride on his face. After all, Suldak was the person he took a liking to at first sight. The women at the table looked at Suldak in disbelief. In this day and age, the difficulty of forming a constructed knights on your own is no more than completing a small goal. In any case, if you complete this small goal, you will be qualified to start. Mrs. Marion looked at Suldak sitting at the dining table and felt very satisfied. However, her daughter had not been able to get pregnant since her wedding. This made Mrs. Marion a little anxious. After all, Soldek had a daughter in her hometown. With a wife and a son, Hathaway needs to give birth to a more legitimate heir as soon as possible. When Mrs. Mabel heard what Marquis Luther said, she felt even more unhappy. Seeing that there were no seats for her three daughters on the dining table, she was so angry that she couldn't eat. She put down the knife and wiped it with a napkin. He curled his lips and stood up to leave the table. After dinner, Marquis Luther took Soldak to the study and continued to convey to him some experience in managing the territory and the army. Soldak told Marquis Luther about the dark worm valley and the ghostly red ants. Marquis Luther smiled and said, I didn't expect that the dark worm valley would be the biggest treasure in Invercargill Forest. Mrs. Marion also took the opportunity to call her daughter and Beatrice back into the room. Elf women are one of the groups that least like to conceive. Therefore, many magical potions about what are spread from the elven world to the green empire. This magic potion is very precious and is only spread among the upper class nobles. This time, Mrs. Marion explained the details in this regard to Hathaway. In addition, she also carefully explained to her daughter how to get along with husband and wife. Now Serdak also owns a lord of a plane. And he is so young. By the time Soldak returned to the bedroom for Marquis Luther's study, it was almost midnight. I thought Hathaway and Beatrice had gone to bed long ago. On the way back, Soldak was thinking that in order to avoid waking them up, he would sleep on the single bed at the door of the room. When he returned to the door, he saw Hathaway's maid sitting on a stool in the corridor and dozing off. She woke up when she heard footsteps and opened the door for Soldak. In the room, Hathaway and Beatrice were lying on the bed chatting. Although their eyelids were so sleepy that they kept fighting, they still endured the sleepiness and did not fall asleep. At noon the next day, Soldak was invited to attend a luncheon held by the Dunstan family. Almost all the people who came to the luncheon at Dunstan's house were young nobles from Bena City, and most of the young people were with the status of Viscount and Baron. The number of young people who can become Earl can be counted on two hands. Count Jim Dunstan, who organized the luncheon, is the youngest son of Speaker Dunstan, and is also the most favored son of Speaker Dunstan. He may not be able to inherit the family business in the future, but he is likely to control the Dunstan army. So under the instruction of Speaker Dunstan only then did Count Jim Dunstan take the initiative to hand over an invitation letter to Soldak. In fact, Marquis Luther also very much hopes that Serdak can enter the aristocratic circle of Bena City. However, Hathaway's social circle is almost all a group of aristocratic ladies. At this time, of course, we cannot throw the fat piece of Soldak into the wolves. Attending the luncheon hosted by Earl Dunstan became Soldak. This was an opportunity for him to enter the Benin noble circle. So Serdak had to postpone his return to Lit City. Earl Jim Dunstan is somewhat similar to Commander Adolphus. Especially his falcon-like eyes. At a glance, you can tell that he is a second-level powerhouse. He wears an exquisite magic pattern structure. Even if he is the same outfit was worn at the luncheon. When he saw Serdak, he said to him, Count Serdak, my uncle spoke highly of you in his letter and said that I must learn more from you. Earl Jim Dunstan is older than Soldak. After hearing what he said, Serdak immediately said, Commander Adolphus is our role model. During this time on the battlefield, I am really grateful for Commander Adolphus's care. There were many guests, and Earl Jim Dunstan could not stay with Soldak all the time. After introducing him to a few friends around him, he went to chat with other guests. Of course, Earl Jim Dunstan's friends are also curious that Earl Soldak can actually receive such care from Earl Jim Dunstan. You must know that Jim is famous for his cold face. These people are all related to him. His friends of more than 10 years knew his temper all too well. Later, when chatting, everyone learned that Serdak was a second-level strongman who had just returned from the big battlefield. And the eyes of the surrounding nobles became much more friendly. When Earl Jim Dunstan came back and mentioned that his great-uncle admired Soldak and that he was the successor chosen by Marquis Luther, he finally had some impression of Soldak. Serdak is more easygoing and easygoing. Sitting among this group of nobles, 
he will not feel left out. The lunch meeting ended after only two hours. Soldak did not go to a high-end place to have afternoon tea with his people. Before he got to know them well enough, he took a magical ride from Speaker Dunstan's residence. The caravan leaves. Just when the magic caravan had just left the gate of Speaker Dunstan's mansion, Soldak happened to see a magic caravan stop at the corner of the street. A young noble jumped out of the magic caravan, quickly boarded and followed behind. That magic caravan. After closing the door, the magic caravan in front drove straight into Speaker Dunstan's mansion. The noble lady in the carriage. Serdak felt a little familiar and couldn't remember where he had seen him before. But when he saw the young nobleman boarding the magic caravan, he suddenly remembered that he had seen them in the Circle Hotel last time. Why hadn't he returned to Alenza yet? The journey back to Red City on the magic airship was the most relaxing time for Serdak in recent days. And it would not be boring if Hathaway and Beatrice were with him. In fact, the three of them spent more than half of their time on the airship in the room. And occasionally went to see the Sea of Clouds. However, the wind was too strong on the deck and was far less comfortable than in the room. The magic airship traveled within the wind layer for seven days. The clouds in the sky happened to be extremely thin, and the distant city of Rig gradually became clear to everyone's eyes. Approaching Ruder City, you can already see the football field like back garden behind the castle in the city. Hathaway, wearing a thick cloak, stood with Soldak on the deck with Beatrice, facing the wind and said loudly to him, Have you ever thought about building several airport terminals in the Gonbu Plain? Soldak shook his head, pointed at the sails falling overhead, and said to Hathaway, I asked her earlier about this at the beginning, and I heard that it is because there is no wind speed layer on the Gonbu plane at all. After the magic airship floats into the air, it can only float slowly in the sky. So the Gonbu plane has always been none of them have magic airships. On May 3rd, Soldak, Gulitem, Hathaway and Beatrice arrived at the airport terminal in Ritz City smoothly, returning to Ritz City this time. He will hand over the power of Root City with Count Clay Cushing, looking at the city under his feet, which looks even more desolate than Alinsa. Serdak feels that it is better than last year. In autumn, it is indeed more lively. Especially the traffic on the teleportation square was busy. A large number of merchant carriages lined up from the teleportation gate of the square, and then drove all the way out of the city, heading straight towards the Tabiai area. Root City is a city with extremely clear class divisions. The residents at the foot of the mountain represent poverty. Standing on the platform of the airport terminal, Soldak could just overlook the urban areas and workshop blocks of the entire city. On the high airport terminal, the backward side of the city was clearly revealed. The emaciated women holding their children sitting under the eaves of the street, as well as the children running around the streets with bare feet and upper bodies, seemed to be the most authentic portrayal of the city. No matter what, we must at least improve life in the slums. Soldek rubbed his forehead in distress and said to Hathaway and Beatrice beside him. Chapter 1208 Aristocratic Life Root City is located in the southern part of the Terra Pagan region. In May, with the fall of a spring rain, everything begins to grow crazily. The ginkgo trees on both sides of the street sprouted green branches and leaves. They say that to see if a city has a long history. In addition to the precious cultural relics in the museum and the modeled ancient buildings in the city, you have to look at the trees in the city. The streets of Ritz City are covered with towering ginkgo trees. These huge ginkgo trees have almost completely obscured the streets. The magic caravan is driving under the green shade of the big trees, looking towards the other end of the long street. It's like entering a tree hole made of intertwined trees. There were not many horse-drawn carriages on the street, and pedestrians hurried past on both sides of the street. Only some women and old people holding their children will find a place where the sun can shine in front of their door to bask in the sun. This city had just received the baptism of war a year ago. But obviously the most severely traumatized places were the slums in the lower city. While the streets in the aristocratic neighborhoods living in the higher places were still smooth and clean. And magic caravans drove on the stone paved streets. On the street, horses hooves trampled on it. Making a crisp sound. Clusters of apricot yellow spring flowers bloomed in the wind next to the castle. Hathaway opened the car window. Put her beautiful face close to the window. Closed her eyes and smell the fragrance of the flowers outside the window. When entering the castle gate, the four guards standing at the castle gate saluted the magic caravan. They were wearing standard light armor, with chain mail helmets on their heads, and holding spears. They looked quite energetic. After the gate slowly opened, the magic caravan slowly drove into the vestibule with a circular flower bed and stopped in front of the castle steps where the two statues were erected. 
more than 20 maids wearing uniform primary color linen skirts, stood on both sides of the steps. A male butler and a middle-aged female housekeeper with a somewhat old-fashioned face stood in front of these maids. When the carriage stopped, the carriage driver immediately stepped out of the carriage. He jumped down from the driver's seat, quickly opened the car door, and put the ladder stored on the rear shelf on the outer edge of the car door. Hathaway nodded to Soldak, who then took the lead to step out of the magic caravan. Hathaway and Beatrice followed closely, and then stood on both sides of Serdak. Under the leadership of the two housekeepers, almost all the maids said at the same time, Your Majesty, Count Serdak, welcome you go home. Soldak was slightly startled. He was still not used to the title of Earl. Seeing that Soldak didn't speak, Hathaway asked, Has anything important happened in the castle recently? Everything goes well. Mrs. Hathaway! The housekeeper's voice was a little hoarse. But her enunciation was extremely standard. Serdak walked along the red carpet into the hall on the first floor of the castle. Thea ran out of the corridor at the back of the hall, swinging her long wet hair. The long dress on her body was still stained with water. It was like she put on a long dress after swimming in the pool without even having time to dry herself off. The long skirt is wrapped around the body in many places. Dak, you're back. Sia rushed up and gave Soldak a big hug. Yes, it seems that you are doing well in Ritz City. You have obviously gained a lot of weight during this period. Soldak pushed away the slightly wet Thea and asked with a smile. But when do you plan to go home? Hey, how could you ask such an embarrassing question to your guests right after you come back? Besides, I'm already a member of your battle team. Although I'm not qualified to enter the big battlefield this time. Maybe I can fight with you next time. You guys have entered the big battlefield together. Hey, where are they? Thea raised her hand to pull up her long matcha-colored hair that was as wet as seaweed. She glanced behind Soldak. Apart from the familiar Hathaway and Beatrice, there was only the two-headed ogre Gulith. Moo. Andrew and Samira are staying in Duodan Town. Andrew needs to help me guard the bridgehead camp. And Samla is responsible for managing the military camp in Duodan Town. Serdak said. On the gorgeous sofa with gold trim in the living room. Two maids immediately knelt in front of Soldak's feet. Took off his long leather boots. Put them on soft cotton slippers. And helped him remove the magic patterns on his body. He took off the disguise. And put it into a magic sealing box at Soldak's instruction. Then the two maids entered a washroom with a bathtub to take a bath changed into aristocratic clothes, and then sat back in a small hall on the second floor, listening to the middle-aged butler's report, basically the latest news during this time. The nobles of Ritz City visited, or some nobles sent some invitations, and the housekeepers responded accordingly, etc. Thea almost fell asleep while listening, and the report was finally over. Soldak was finally able to escape. He went to another side hall, and saw that the housekeeper was reporting the daily expenses of the castle to Hathaway. It was actually more cumbersome than his own. Hathaway and Beatrice seems to have adapted to this kind of life. After everything they say, they will discuss it. Seeing Soldak sitting next to him a little impatiently, Hathaway said to him, We will be fine soon. If you feel bored, we can have afternoon tea together in the back garden later. In the back garden. If Sia doesn't go out, she will always soak in the garden pool. She has only been active outdoors recently. After all, the winter in Ritz City is a bit cold, and the outdoor pool will be drained in the winter. Water will not be refilled into the swimming pool until the end of March. Serdak sat down on a wicker chair by the swimming pool in the back garden, took out the construct night experience notes given to him by Commander Felix, and read them carefully. The entirety of this notebook explains how a construct knight can unleash his greatest potential in battle. In the view of Commander Felix, the strength of a knight cannot fully represent his combat effectiveness because there are many uncertain factors on the battlefield. If the knight has strong adaptability and rich combat experience, even if his even if your own strength is slightly weaker, you can still exert your full strength to win the battle. If a knight has never been on the battlefield, lacks the ability to adapt, and is always accustomed to sticking to the fighting methods and training, even if the power he masters completely crushes his opponents, he may not be able to defeat enemies with lower strength than him on the battlefield and stimulating one's own potential in battle is the path to becoming a strong person that Commander Felix has been pursuing. For this reason, he discovered core runes in some magic matrices such as acceleration and speed excitation, formed a new magic matrix, and integrated some knight's power to form advanced skills that only knights can master. Name this skill White Heat. Soldak held his experience note in one hand and Eisenhard's broadsword in the other. 
He continuously poured the condensed runes into the broadsword in his left hand. When he swung the sword, two afterimages suddenly appeared. Sharp and sharp. His sword energy even left three deep sword marks on the stone platform by the swimming pool. In the swimming pool, Sia was startled by the noise at the edge of the pool. She swam over cautiously, only to find that Suldak was also staring blankly at the broad sword in his hand, and then squatted by the pool to carefully examine the sword marks on the stone slab. Thea lay with her arms on the stone platform by the swimming pool, with crystal water on her face. She leaned over to look at the deep sword marks with her big blue eyes, and asked Suldak, What is this? Serdak said casually, The ninth skill. Mr. Felix calls it white heat. Maybe the sword skill. I mean this heavy sword is more suitable for chopping. Sia laughed ha ha and said quickly, Uh huh. I thought you only knew how to shield and attack. Serdak touched his nose in embarrassment and said, I rarely come into contact with the martial arts of high-level knights. Is this the knight's seal? Fia asked with interest. Probably not. Serdak said with some uncertainty. After casually placing Commander Felix's notes on the small table next to the wicker chair, Serdak put down the broad sword in his hand and laid down on the wicker chair, breathing the air full of plant fragrance. The afternoon sun shone on him. He didn't expect that the leisure life of the nobles would be so comfortable. It's no wonder that the young nobles are unwilling to work hard. How could they still live in this kind of environment all year round? Have the courage to hold the sword in your hand again. A gust of breeze blew. And the experience note was blown back a few pages. The note at the back clearly said, Halo of fanaticism. Such a huge castle requires meticulous maintenance every day. There are two gardeners in the castle pruning the green plants in the back garden. And three craftsmen have to repair or clean some loose stones in the castle every day and occasionally clean them. Looking at these exquisite stone carvings in the castle, the most dangerous place is the back garden with half of the site suspended on the cliff. The load-bearing foundation stones supporting the back garden are all on the cliff. The top of this cliff allows birds to build nests, but does not allow termite nests or animals such as pangolins. The maintenance work every spring is the most difficult day for these craftsmen. However, the situation has improved somewhat this year because there is a two-headed ogre squatting on the top of the cliff. The three craftsmen in the castle only need to tie one end of the safety rope around his waist, and then climb down the rock wall. That's fine. When you need to come up, you just need to shout to the top. Master Ogre, please pull the number three rope to come up. The two-headed ogre squatting on it will pull up the craftsmen hanging from the cliff as quickly as possible. Of course, this kind of service also comes at a price. That is, all the pangolins caught on the cliff must be dedicated to the ogre. Gulitum recently learned a dish called braised from Suldak. He has tried many Chinese meat products. Pork, beef, chicken and fish. Basically, any meat is very suitable. Especially meat that has a strong fishy smell, but is very delicious is best suited for braised meat. Hearing that the castle craftsmen could get pangolins, the ogre suddenly wanted to try them. But he didn't expect them to be very delicious. Serdak found that the house was too big and one inconvenience was that it was a long way to go from the bedroom to the dining room. He had to go through two cloisters and three corridors to get to the huge dining room. Moreover, the dining table in the restaurant was 15 meters long. And there were only four of him. Hathaway, Beatrice, and Thea every time they ate. Even with a group of maids standing nearby. The restaurant still seemed a little empty. Serdak was deeply touched. He felt that the castle looked bright and beautiful on the outside but in fact it was far less comfortable than a small villa. His back garden hung on the top of the cliff and was as big as a football field. But he didn't need to use it. Come play football. Soldak picked up the table knife and asked Hathaway while cutting the beef. Have you been eating dinner here these days? The round-faced Beatrice said quickly. No. Most of the time, I let them bring dinner into the room. Sit here empty and be stared at by a row of servants. It's not comfortable at all. Serdak looked at the butler standing at one end of the dining table, and then suggested to the three ladies, How about we also bring back our favorite dishes? Beatrice immediately agreed. Okay, I want the grilled fish, boiled kale, and fruit salad. Serdak found that the bedroom he slept in was actually a suite, in addition to a separate bathroom and dressing room. There was also a living room outside. Beatrice asked the servants to place these meals on the coffee table in the middle of the sofa. The table was fully arranged and the four people sat around the coffee table. After dismissing the maid who was guarding the side, the atmosphere became much warmer. If the weather gets a little warmer, we can put these foods on the small table outside on the patio. 
It will feel even better. Beatrice took out a bottle of golden cider from the ice bucket and gave it to Sol first. Dark and Hathaway poured some and then poured some into their own glasses. Sia doesn't like drinking, so she can only sit and eat fish. How is your cosmetics business doing? Soldak asked casually. Hathaway smiled and said, It's not bad. The powder made from pearls that Sia proposed and the magic scroll mask she drew are both very popular. But they can only make a small amount every month. There are many people who want to buy them. Speaking of this topic, Sia, who was sitting opposite Soldak, threw away the fish bone in her hand, wiped her lips again, sat up straight, and said to Soldak, By the way, I have collected some money. Dak, when will you take me to the slave market? I am ready to rescue my people. Then you will take them back to the seven seas? Serdak asked. Thea's blue eyes turned around, with a faint smile on her face and said, I have no such plan. I want to place them in Lake Noma, and I don't help them regain their freedom for free. They must earn back the money I paid. And then, I will use this money to save more tribesmen. Serdak couldn't help but complain. They usually live in the sea. Do you think they will get used to it if you send them to a freshwater lake? It should be fine. I don't think there's anything I'm not used to. Sia said, frowning, and asked Serdak, Dak, why do I feel like there's something else wrong with what you're asking me? What does it mean? You are overthinking and have a good meal. Soldak quickly lowered his head and began to deal with a perfectly roasted beef on the dinner plate. Chapter 1209 The First Day in Office In the vast ice sea, he shuttled among countless ice flows against the huge waves. He was like a swimming fish. Nimbly shuttled between the ice flows. After squeezing out the last bit of mental energy in the ice sea, Serdak finally sank into the ice sea again less than a hundred meters away from the coastline. The next moment, Serdak woke up from his dream, feeling as if the spiritual power in his body had been completely emptied. The entire sea of spiritual consciousness was like a mirage in the desert. It could be felt but could not be touched. He removed the long snow-white legs from the soft bed and sat up sweating profusely. The maid was already waiting at the door of the bedroom. When she saw Soldak getting up from the bed, she immediately brought a pile of clothes, washing up under the service of the maid. The feeling was simply an extreme enjoyment. And I simply ate some breakfast. Hathaway was still lying in bed and sleeping in. But Beatrice and Thea were doing morning exercises by the pool early. It is said that the Silver Moon Elves in the Elf Kingdom still adhere to the monogamy system because most male elves often pursue love and art more than desire. It is this kind of thinking that is prevalent in the elf kingdom. And it also makes the elves their fertility is declining year by year. Today's elven country is extremely aging. And young elves want to break the shackles of the world and often go to intermarry with humans and orcs. This makes it even more difficult for the elves to ensure the purest bloodline. It is also for these reasons that the elven elders who are proficient in potions began to spend some energy on potion research and developed various aphrodisiac potions. In view of Madame Marion's reminders and warnings, Hathaway finally felt sorry for her and Solda. There are some new ideas on the issue of Graham Ayers. Last night, she and Solda completed an exchange in complete elf style, which made Hathaway still stay in bed and refuse to get up. Under the service of the maid, Solda changed into a brand new noble dress. Before going out, he thought about it, and put on the magic pattern structure again. After all, in the city of Lut, the second level strongman, but even rarer than the Count, a brand new magical caravan was parked at the foot of the castle steps, and the coachman was standing next to the door in a smart black dress. The assistant Sia finally changed her clothes and dried her hair, and ran out of the castle following Soldak's footsteps. The two-headed ogre Gulitum was sitting on the shelf at the back of the carriage, holding two baked wheat cakes in one hand, thick meat loaf, Cheese and vegetables were sandwiched between the wheat cakes. He took a bite and watched. It's very satisfying to go up. Ghoul item. Brain flower. How did you sleep last night? Serdak sat in the carriage. Opened the window at the back of the carriage. And asked the two-handed ogre brother sitting on the shelf. Very good. Ghoul item gave a short answer. Because he wanted to eat meat pie. At this time. Nalwar said somewhat exaggeratedly. Dak. This is my first time sleeping on such a big back garden lawn. No matter how I turn over, I won't fall under the bed. This feeling is really great. Serdak smiled and said, Hey, man, I have to remind you. Once you feel like falling out of bed while sleeping, you must grab something as much as possible or wake up as soon as possible. You have to know that the back garden is at least three or four miles away from the valley at the foot of the cliff. A hundred meters high. 
Even if you are a strong ogre warrior, if you can't actively deal with it, you will probably fall into a piece of meat. Don't worry. It's impossible for this kind of thing to happen. The wall in the back garden is high enough. And it's enough explanation. There are so many towering trees around the wall. So that won't happen. The two-headed cannibal. Although the devil said this, it was obvious that when he ate the baked wheat cake with thick meat patties, he felt that it was not as fragrant as before. The magic caravan drove slowly along the stone road, and the two-headed ogre subconsciously grasped the shelves tightly with one hand. This is not the first time for Soldak to visit the city hall of Ritz City, but when he came to the gate of the somewhat solemn city hall again, there were already a group of nobles in formal clothes waiting in front of the steps of the city hall. They saw this brand new and conspicuous magic caravan without any emblem stopped. A group of nobles quickly gathered around. The coachman stretched out his hand and jumped out of the carriage vigorously and opened the carriage door for Soldak. The two-headed ogre stood next to the magic caravan, looking very intimidating. Regardless of his strength, just looking at his size was enough to suppress everyone present. Sia, who was wearing a small dress and a knee-length skirt, walked out of the carriage first and then Serdak appeared in everyone's sight. There was a warm applause immediately on the steps. Soldak nodded towards the nobles in the city hall. He did not deliver a speech on the steps, but walked directly into the city hall building. Earl Clay Cushing probably also heard the news of Soldak's arrival at the city hall, and came down from the office upstairs to greet him. Seeing Serdak walking into the hall, he opened his arms to him, and said with a smile, Dak, I thought you would rest for a few more days when you returned from the battlefield. I didn't expect you to come to the city hall so soon. I've been waiting for you for more than half a year to do the handover. It's great that I finally have you back this time. Soldak stepped forward and gave Count Clay Cushing a big hug and said, Count Clay Cushing, I hope to learn to manage the affairs of the city hall as soon as possible, but I am not familiar with this place. I hope you can take me with you for a while. The two of them walked upstairs side by side and Count Clay Cushing said, That's no problem but the specific affairs of the city hall and the house of representatives must be transferred to your hands this time. I only need a position as a member of the house of representatives. If you have any questions, you can come to me, although I, I dare not promise that I have the ability to solve it. But as long as it is the affairs of Ruth City, I still know something about everything. Earl Clay Cushing then introduced the logistics minister and financial officer of Rear City to Soldak. One of these two men holds the supplies of Ruth City and the other holds the money bag of Ruth City. If Serdak takes over as the governor of Ruth City, these two departments must be fully controlled. Just have it in your hand. The chief of security and the commander of the city defense brigade did not appear in the welcoming crowd. Soldak came to Count Clay Cushing's office. This room is located on the sunny side of the top floor of the city hall. There is also a huge terrace to the south of the room. It is the room with the widest view in this three-story building. Standing on the terrace looking southward, you can even see the vast wilderness outside Ruder City. On the third floor of the city hall, there is only one office belonging to the consul. There were few personal belongings in the room, and it seemed that Count Clay Cushing had packed them away before this. After Earl Clay Cushing asked Soldak to sit down, he told the assistant standing beside him, Inform all members to hold an extraordinary meeting in the House of Representatives at one o'clock in the afternoon. No matter what the reason is, they must be present. Okay, Lord Earl. The assistant walked out holding a stack of documents. Only Earl Clay Cushing and Soldak were left in the office. Earl Cushing handed Soldak a cup of black tea and said to Soldak apologetically, As you can see, although I am the governor of Ruth City and also the speaker of the House of Representatives, but my control over this city is not much greater than that of a department minister. Although I once wanted to reverse this situation and make some contributions to the city, there are many factors involved. So there is not much I can leave you. However, after I step down as governor and speaker of the House of Representatives, I will not leave immediately. I will help you sort out the interest relationships among the nobles. Earl Cushing said to Soldak in a serious voice. His old face showed a tired look. But he did not avoid Serdak's gaze. Soldak sat on the sofa and said directly without being polite to Count Cushing. I have some ideas about the future of Ruth City. But this time, I am not prepared to change it a little bit. This city belongs to me for a period of time in the future so I will push it in a good direction. Keep moving forward. Any obstacles. Anyone who stops me from pushing this city forward. I will not hesitate to cut them off with a long sword in my hand. Looking at Soldak's determined gaze, Count Clay Cushing was a little surprised and speechless. 
He didn't expect that such a humble young man would act as murderously as a commander on the battlefield. He could even see the faint murderous intent in Serdak's eyes. And he also believed that the young man in front of him had the ability to keep his word. Just like he did when he faced those small town nobles in the Ganbu Plain. Chapter 1210 Speech In the conference hall of the city hall, a group of ministerial-level dignitaries from Ritz City sat together, some smoked cigars and greeted everyone with smiles. Some were huddled in chairs with their eyes closed and dozing off. Some were listening to everyone's whispers. And some were people are talking about this new consul again. Treasurer Kurt Lady. Logistics Director Alan Benton. Guard Battalion Chief Nathaniel Malley. City Defense and Security Brigade Commander Mickey Mind and other department heads have all arrived at the city hall. Several female clerks inside brought in some refreshments from outside. And everyone's conversation became more lively. The bearded Nathaniel even joked to Commander Min with a smile. Min, I heard that you hooked up with a girl from the assistant office on the second floor. How about it? Have you tasted the taste of peaches? Go away. I, Min, am not that kind of person. Where did you hear this rumor? Commander Mickey Min immediately countered. The two hold military power in Ruth City. Chief Nathaniel is responsible for the police and security in the city. And Commander Mickey is responsible for the city defense of Ruth City. Rumors of discord between the two have long circulated in Ritz City. The news spread among the aristocratic circles here. Although no one could do anything to the other, there were constant conflicts in private. Mickey, your vision is far inferior to that of our new consul. The head of the guard battalion mocked Commander Mickey. Mickey men didn't want to expand on this topic. So he just snorted and kept silent. Someone nearby couldn't help but ask. Nathaniel, are you saying that the new Archon has acted like a clerk in the assistant department so quickly? There were two. Ding ding. Sounds from the door of the council hall for a meeting. When everyone knew that the consul, Earl Lake Cushing, was coming, they immediately became upright, and the meeting hall immediately became quiet. Earl Lake Cushing took Soldak into the conference hall. He smelled a choking smoke in the room, and signaled his assistant to turn on the exhaust fan by the window. Then he sat down at the main seat in the conference hall, and asked Soldak to sit next to him. As for Thea, she was also following Lady Tanya. Earl Cushing's assistant, looking curiously at the room full of nobles. Earl Cushing paused and said with a relaxed expression, Two years ago, the Marquis of Luther captured Lutz City, and Lord MacDonald withdrew to the Ganbu Plain. After restoring order in Lutz City, the Marquis led the Luther army to evacuate Lutz City. Then he gave the city to me. Speaking of this, Earl Cushing looked melancholy, with some regret on his old face, and continued, it's a pity that I didn't have enough personal ability to bring any changes to Reuter during my tenure. There was a hint of bitterness in his smile. Now I announce to everyone that I will no longer serve as the consul of Ritz City from now on. According to the appointment letter issued by the Bena Provincial House of Representatives, the consul of Ritz City will be awarded to Count Serdak. I hope that in the coming days, everyone can actively cooperate with the work of Governor Soldak and jointly build our beautiful home. Ruth City, Earl Cushing said a lot. But the ministers present listened attentively. After Count Lu Xian finished speaking, applause broke out in the conference hall. Earl Lake Cushing smiled and nodded to Soldak, gesturing for him to also give a few words of office speech. Soldak slowly stood up from his position, smiled modestly at the ministers present, and then said, To be able to become the consul of Rear City, first of all I would like to thank Marquis Luther for his strong recommendation, and I would also like to thank Earl Lake Cushing for his continued help and support. Just this sentence made the minds of the ministers in the conference hall stir. Everyone present knew that Serdak's backstage was Marquis Luther. But this relationship should have been tacitly understood. But Serdak said it directly. Serdak continued. At this time last year, I received an order to raid Lord MacDonald's manor in the Ganbu Plain. I followed the second-level warriors from the three lords' legions in the Bena province into the Ganbu Plain to capture Lord MacDonald. The arrest operation was very successful and we successfully captured Lord MacDonald, who was hiding in the Ganbu Plain, and brought him back to Bena City. During the capture process, we discovered that it is possible to regain the Ganbu Plain. So, with the support of the military department, a new legion was formed in the Ganbu Plain and successfully occupied Makuso City. According to the Territory Development Law of the Green Empire, it owns a quarter of the fertile land in the Ganbu Plain, and owns the ruins of Makuso City. Now there are nearly 5 million people in the Ganbu Plain. And they need to rebuild. Home. This is the gateway to the Ganbu Plain. All materials produced from the Ganbu Plain need to flow from Ritz City to the entire Bena province and even the entire Green Empire. 
I think it is for this reason that when I became the governor of Makusuo City, I was also appointed the governor of Rith City. Finally, let me tell you my hope. I hope that Rith City will become the trade hub of the entire Ganbu Plain and the gateway to the outside world for the Ganbu Plain. This place will also become more prosperous because of the Ganbu Plain. I hope to transform this place into a trading city. And I hope to encourage you all. There was a round of applause in the chamber. Much louder than after Lord Cushing had finished speaking. The nobles of Rith City are not fools. Everyone has heard about the incident in the Ganbu Plain. And they also know that Serdak is a direct descendant of Marquis Luther. Everyone knows that Earl Lake Cushing was able to persist in the position of consul for more than half a year. In addition to the support of Marquis Luther. He was also waiting for the arrival of Earl Soldek. Now that he is here, the message is very clear. It is to take advantage of the geographical advantages of Rith City to restore the prosperity of the Ganbu Plain and at the same time drive the economy of Rith City. The question now is whether the noble lords of all parties who control Rith City are willing to cooperate with Serdak to jointly build the prosperity of Rith City. Sometimes the prosperity of the city will sacrifice the interests of some lords. For the ministers of various departments in the city hall, when Earl Cushing was the city governor, he adopted decentralized management. Now that Soldak takes over as the governor, will he ask everyone to hand over their power? Go up. The aristocratic authorities also have vague expectations in their hearts, hoping that a disruptor will jump out at this time. Everyone wants to know what means Serdak has to restrain all the forces in Rit City. It's just that among the ministers in the city hall, no one wants to be the first to stand up. Everyone hopes to wait and see how the situation develops and throw their chips into the prize pool when they're right. But everyone was a little worried at the same time. And they didn't know whose head Serdak would burn first. I just vaguely felt that this matter would not be that simple. In the peaceful-looking conference hall, the ministers were all looking at each other. Serdak did not stay in the conference hall. After saying this, he did not even bother to get acquainted with the ministers of the Ritz City Hall and left in a hurry. This is really an arrogant and straightforward construct night. Sitting in the corner of the conference hall, the minister responsible for the city's health muttered quietly. Let's see. We don't know who will be unlucky first. The director of the Bureau of Land Management said sitting next to him. Almost all of the public land in Ritz City has been occupied. So the Bureau of Land Management now looks more like a decoration in Ritz City. The minister of health laughed. It is also a marginalized department. And his department is even worse than the Bureau of Land Management. It can't be you and me. The health minister said with a smile. At noon. Serdak did not go out for lunch. He and Count Lake Cushing made a high-profile appearance in the staff canteen of the city hall. In fact, Count Lake Cushing often came here to have lunch. After all, it was a simple work meal. As long as you are at the level of deputy minister or above, you can order food from the canteen in the staff canteen of the city hall. Soldak proposed to have lunch in the city hall staff cafeteria, and Earl Lake Cushing readily agreed. He also told Soldak that the fried steak in the cafeteria tasted quite good. The two of them walked into the lobby of the staff restaurant on the first floor side by side, talking and laughing. Mrs. Tanya was Count Cushing's assistant. At this time, she took the lead to go to the small canteen and said H, low to the chef in charge. There are many more civil servants in Red City City Hall than in Makuso City Hall. And during lunch time, the hall is almost full of people. Those ministers who did not want to go out for lunch almost all hurried into the small restaurant. The restaurant was almost always a cubicle. And everyone gathered together in twos and threes to have lunch. The news that a new consul had arrived in the city hall had already spread. When the low-level clerks and clerks saw Count Cushing walking into the restaurant with a construct night, their eyes invariably fell on Serta. Graham's body. Then many people saw Sia, who was following Serdek. Her big sea-blue eyes were almost as clear as lakes. Everyone who saw her couldn't look away. Her innocent face was quiet and melancholy. Almost during lunch, the news that the new consul had a pure and beautiful assistant spread throughout the city hall. The lunch steak and seafood soup were indeed very good. Soldak felt that the dishes in high-end restaurants in Red City were probably just like this. And the last dessert was the finishing touch. No wonder Earl Cushing recommended the small restaurant in the city hall to Soldak before lunch, suggesting that he could come here often for lunch in the future. After lunch, Earl Lake Cushing gave up his office in the city hall and asked Soldak to rest in this office. Earl Cushing also had a speaker's office in the House of Representatives. A parliament will be held in the House of Representatives in the afternoon. The main content is that Earl Lake Cushing will resign as speaker and then elect a new speaker of the House of Representatives. Chapter 1211 Judgment The Chamber of the House of Representatives and the City Hall are two adjacent buildings. 
But the two buildings are not in the same yard. In the imperial system, the city hall and the house of representatives are two institutions that restrict each other. The city hall is the institution that maintains the normal operation of the entire city. While the house of representatives is more like a group decision maker, many laws are promulgated by the house of representatives. This time, Serdak not only serves as the governor of Ruth City, but also serves as the speaker of the house of representatives. In addition, he is currently a major lord in the Terra Pagan area who controls a certain private army. Only by gathering these three identities can he do this. Really take charge in Ruth City. The meeting held in the House of Representatives in the afternoon was to get the members of Ruder City to recognize Serdak as their new speaker. Another procedure for the position of speaker is that the members of Ruth City must vote for it. If more than 60% of the members agree, Soldak can become the speaker of the House of Representatives in Ruth City in order to help Serdak get enough votes. Earl Lake Cushing was communicating with the members of Ruth City after lunch. Earl Lake Cushing looked at Councillor Slim, who turned to leave, and couldn't help but frown. The current situation was much worse than he thought. Usually many councillors showed kindness to him. This time Earl Lake Cushing when it came to voting. Many of these congressmen actually showed some hesitation. And they left without making any commitments. Earl Lake Cushing couldn't figure out whether these people had shit in their heads. When the situation is so clear, what do they want to do? Putting down the teacup in his hand, Earl Cushing drank a lot of tea during the noon period. He closed his eyes and rested for a while. Until Lady Tanya came to remind Count Cushing that Count Soldak had arrived and that the time for the election of the parliament was coming soon. Earl Cushing immediately stood up from the chair, took the towel handed by Mrs. Tanya, wiped his face carefully, and then walked out of the lounge and joined Soldak, who was waiting in the office, to the chamber of the House of Representatives. As expected, less than half of the members were in the chamber of the House of Representatives, and the seats of other members were still empty. Count Cushing could only bring Soldak to the rostrum and let him sit side by side with him in the speaker's seat. Then, there was a long wait until two quarters of an hour later. All the congressmen arrived. Lake Cushing only then did the Earl knock on the table hard, asking the members in the meeting hall to stop discussing. And the whole hall finally became quiet. Earl Lake Cushing began by introducing Serdak to everyone. Unexpectedly, the congressmen in the audience did not make any gesture of welcome, and even the applause seemed extremely sparse. Deputy Speaker Glennis, who was sitting on the left side of Earl Lake Cushing, didn't even raise his hand. It seemed like he was too lazy to do the most superficial perfunctory thing. Earl Lake Cushing felt that something was wrong. At this time, will anyone really stand up to compete with Soldak and compete for Speaker of the House of Representatives? Earl Cushing braced himself and continued reading. Now, the voting for the nomination of Speaker of the House of Representatives in Ruth City has officially begun. I automatically abstain from voting and ask everyone to re-elect the next new speaker. Two congressmen have placed a half mere high wooden ballot box on the table of the podium. Earl Lake Cushing was the first to step off the podium. Originally, he was holding an envelope. But instead of throwing it in, he hid it in his sleeve. He wanted to see the final results of the election vote. Maybe he didn't need to know the results at all. Cast your vote? Just as Earl Lake Cushing stepped down from the podium. Deputy Speaker of the House of Representatives Glennie stood up first, holding a voting sheet in his hand. He walked slowly onto the podium, but did not enter the ballot box immediately. Deputy Speaker Glennis stood on the podium and said loudly to all the members present, In this election for Speaker, I will vote for myself. The entire chamber of the House of Representatives was in an uproar. No one expected that Deputy Speaker Glennis would do something like this. Many members below who had prepared their voting slips tore up the voting slips in their hands and then quickly picked up a voting slip and filled it out again. The meeting hall was in chaos. Only Deputy Speaker Glennis showed a proud expression. He stood on the podium and threw the voting slip in his hand into the ballot box. Glennis, what are you doing? Earl Cushing stood in front of the rostrum, put his hands on the long table, suppressed the anger in his heart and shouted at Deputy Speaker Glennis. This is the House of Representatives. Shouldn't we respect the decisions of members? Deputy Speaker Glennis responded unceremoniously. Earl Cushing's face turned pale with anger, and he was actually a little shaky while standing on the rostrum. This kind of confrontational scene would basically appear every time the House of Representatives in Ruth City made a resolution. But Earl Lake Cushing did not expect that Deputy Speaker Glennis would actually want to take advantage of it in this situation. Earl Cushing couldn't control the situation and planned to suspend the voting. At this time, the members on the parliamentary bench seemed to have changed their names and walked towards the ballot box on the podium one by one. But this time Soldak did not give a speech. 
he strode onto the podium and punched a big hole in the ballot box. The congressmen who were about to go on stage to vote all froze in place. Looking at Serdek and his fist in surprise, Serdek fumbled around in the ballot box before finding the only voting slip inside. Then Soldek tore up his voting slip on the spot in front of Deputy Speaker Glynis. Soldek suppressed his voice and said to the MPs in the meeting hall, I'm not here to talk about anything with you. I'm just telling everyone present that I will serve as the Speaker of the Ritz City House of Representatives for a long time to come. You are simply unreasonable. You are blaspheming the laws of the Empire. Deputy Speaker Glynis angrily yelled. As he spoke, he grabbed the Deputy Speaker badge on his chest, pulled it off with force, and threw it directly on the floor at his feet. Deputy Speaker Glynis then left the scene angrily. The members on the parliamentary bench were also talking a lot at this time. Some people wanted to support Deputy Speaker Glynis. And some were also talking that Deputy Speaker Glynis might have a backing this time. Many people stood up from the parliamentary seats and insisted. Keep this vote going. The moment Deputy Speaker Glynis stepped out of the meeting hall, Soldak took out a small box from his magic belt bag, which contained a pile of parchment contract documents. He rummaged through the pile of documents for a long time, and then pulled out a piece of parchment filled with records. Serdek said loudly to all the members on the floor, I now officially announce that Deputy Speaker Glynis is suspected of participating in Lord Macdonald's rebellion and collaborating with Black Magic in September 2586. With Macdonald in February 2587, the members of the House of Representatives looked at Serdak in stunned silence. No one expected that Serdak would actually pull out a piece of parchment filled with incriminating evidence at this time. Unfortunately, Deputy Speaker Glennis walked too fast and did not hear Soldak read out these criminal regulations. Finally, Soldak took out another blank judgment, quickly wrote the name of Deputy Speaker Glennis on it, and said to everyone present, I will announce the decision of the military department to arrest Deputy Speaker Glennis immediately, and a military trial will be conducted by the military department of Bena Province. Chapter 1212 Capture Deputy Speaker Glynis walked out of the chamber of the House of Representatives angrily. He was shocked and angry, and even had a hint of excitement on his face, thinking of the dance held at the Duke's Palace in the winter, and the promises Edie Newman made to him personally, as long as it could cause any unhappiness to Soldak in Reuter City. He could write to him. He will even use the resources around him to support himself. Thinking of this, Deputy Speaker Glynis finally got rid of the fear in his heart. It was just that Count Soldak's arbitrary manner was deeply etched into his mind. Especially the punch that smashed open the ballot box. That action was still lingering in Deputy Speaker Glynis' mind. He was in a daze. And several followers quickly followed him towards the door of the House of Representatives. The civilian staff who walked in from outside had strange expressions on their faces. Deputy Speaker Glynis was only thinking about his own thoughts and did not notice the expressions of those people. He even didn't notice Sia walking slowly behind him. Just outside the gate of the city hall, two infantry commanders, Ned Mosby and Edgar, each led an elite infantry regiment to block the gate of the House of Representatives. They led the heavy armored infantry regiment into route this morning. According to Soldak's order, they had been waiting in the central square not far from the city hall since the morning. In the morning, the two did not receive any according to the instructions. He has been standing by in the square. It was only after lunch that they received the news from Serdek. Serdek asked them to have two heavy armored infantry regiments guard the gate of the House of Representatives at one o'clock in the afternoon. All nobles who enter the House of Representatives are only allowed to enter and are not allowed to leave. Ned Mosby and Edgar waited at the gate of the House of Representatives for about half an hour when they saw a group of people surrounding a nobleman walking down the high steps quickly, with Thea following quietly. Behind them, she stood on the steps making quick gestures to Edgar. Edgar immediately stood out from the crowd. He winked at Ned Mosby, then waved his hand and led a group of heavy armored infantry soldiers towards the noble. The entourage around Deputy Speaker Glennis saw a group of infantry rushing towards them along the steps, and they all showed their weapons. Deputy Speaker Glennis became even more frightened and angry at this time. He pointed at Edgar who was walking at the front and asked sternly, Where did you come from? Who gave you the power to besiege the House of Representatives? Edgar ignored Deputy Speaker Glennis's question at all. As a rebel in the Ganbu Plain, he had never been very fond of imperial officials. We are ordered to stay here. No one can leave the House of Representatives without a pass signed by Commander Serdak. The bearded Edgar was wearing dark heavy armor. He lifted his helmet visor and faced Glennis. The Deputy Speaker said expressionlessly, Are you the personal guard of Count Soldak? Deputy Speaker Glennis asked with an angry look on his face. 
We are the garrison of the Gonbu Plain, bearded Edgar replied. Edgar then saw Thea running down the steps and handed an arrest warrant to the bearded Edgar. The bearded Edgar saw the signature of Suldak on the arrest warrant, pointed at Deputy Speaker Glennis, and asked Thea, Thea, is he Glennis? Thea nodded and took two steps back. Edgar immediately waved his hand, motioning for the heavy armored infantry soldiers behind him to follow him, and said to Deputy Speaker Glennis, Well, you are suspected of violating imperial laws. I want to formally arrest you now. This is my arrest warrant. Before he finished speaking, a group of heavy armored infantry surrounded Deputy Speaker Glennis. The entourage around Vice Speaker Glennis immediately surrounded Glennis in the center, and they drew their swords to stop the heavy armored infantry. These heavy armored infantry also set up tower shields and did not rush forward easily. Edgar's face darkened. He pulled out the long sword from his waist and shouted to the back. The archers are ready. A group of heavy armored infantry immediately retreated to both sides, leaving the entire area in the middle. At this time, Deputy Speaker Glennis saw three rows of archers standing on the stone road near the street under the steps of the House of Representatives. The archers in the first row had fully drawn their bowstrings and almost all of the arrows were pointed in front of them. Of these followers, I'm giving you a chance now. I ask you to put down your weapons immediately and accept our control, Edgar shouted. One of the followers next to Deputy Speaker Glennis was wearing a magic pattern structure. Just as Edgar was speaking, the shadow of the Crusader swordsman was released from behind, and then he raised his double-edged sword towards Edgar. Gar rushes over, trying to intimidate Edgar. Although Edgar is not a construct knight, he is a very famous leader in the rebel army. How could he be so easily coerced by a first-level construct swordsman? Just as he took a step back, the heavy armored infantry soldiers on both sides rushed forward one after another. A scuffle immediately broke out at the gate of the House of Representatives. The heavy armored infantry warriors who follow the bearded Edgar are almost all his most capable men. The combat literacy these warriors have cultivated for a long time in the Ganbu Plain makes them very proficient in team battles. There was also a group of archers behind the emperor. The battle almost started. A group of followers of Deputy Speaker Glennis was immediately completely suppressed by the heavy armored infantry regiment brought by Edgar. All these followers were beheaded on the spot, and only Deputy Speaker Glennis remained. Edgar knew that no matter what time, a civilian commander like himself could not kill a nobleman in public, seeing eight corpses lying on the steps, with a large amount of blood flowing out of the corpses. Glennis felt a little cold all over. Under the push of these heavy armored infantry, he did not dare to make any move. He was just beaten by a group of heavy armored infantry. Escorted by armored infantry, he returned to the House of Representatives in a state of embarrassment. Serdak walked out of the hall of the House of Representatives with a group of MPs from Ruth City, just in time to see Deputy Speaker Glennis, who looked embarrassed, being grabbed by a group of heavy armored infantry soldiers, and being pushed by these infantry soldiers. He walked towards the hall of the House of Representatives. Now that they had broken up, Soldak was not prepared to give Vice Speaker Glennis any chance to relent. Soldak nodded to Edgar and Ned Mosby, and then openly announced on the steps, Deputy Speaker Glennis is suspected of participating in the rebellion in the Terrapagan area. He needs to be detained in the prison in Makuso City for the time being. I will send the evidence of Vice Speaker Glennis to the Bena military headquarters as soon as possible and wait for the military to disposal order issued by the subordinates. I declare that the manor and territory of Vice Speaker Glennis will belong to the area occupied by the rebels. I will dispatch four heavy armored infantry regiments from the 13th, 15th, 16th, and 17th areas of Ganbu to fully occupy Glennis. In the manor territory of Ruth City, he handed one of the notes in his hand to Ned Speedy and the other to Edgar, and whispered a few words in their ears. The commanders of the two heavy armored infantry regiments made a military salute to Suldak at the same time. A group of MPs from Ruth City saw the two commanders escorting Deputy Speaker Glennis down the steps. They each led two heavy armored infantry regiments and hurriedly left the House of Representatives. Before dinner, the two residences in Chancellor Glennie's city and the three manors outside the city were completely sealed off. The Lord's private army of Vice Speaker Glennis was suppressed in the manor by the soldiers of the heavy armored infantry regiment. They did not dare to make any rash moves at all. All the members of the Glennies family were taken to the prison in Makuso City, and all their properties in the house and manor were not transferred out before they could move out. Just searching these items took a whole night. Time. The chief of police and the minister of logistics were both present when Glennies Manor was raided. The two of them were shocked into cold sweats as they watched the well-trained heavy armored infantry warriors shuttle through the streets 
and alleys of Earth City. If Deputy Speaker Glennis hadn't jumped out first, the person who was treated like this would probably be one of them. That night, many nobles in Ruth City, who had close relations with Deputy Speaker Glennis, stayed up all night. They were afraid that the heavy armored infantry soldiers would knock on the door that night. It wasn't until daybreak the news came from outside Ruth City. The private troops in the Glennis family's manor outside the city gave up resistance and chose to surrender to the garrison in the Ganbu Plain. Only then did the nobles in Ruder know that although this direct subordinate of Marquis Luther was a young earl, he was not the gentle Earl Lake Cushing. He was a decisive battlefield commander who became after becoming the governor of a city. His acting style also carries a fierce murderous intent. The next morning, Earl Lake Exion convened the members again to hold a voting meeting to re-elect the speaker in the House of Representatives. The members voted unanimously at the meeting. And Soldak officially became the speaker of the House of Representatives in Ruth City. That night, a celebration banquet was held in the castle of Ruth City. Soldak, his wife Hathaway and Beatrice jointly entertained the nobles of Ruth City. At the banquet, the noble ladies of Ruth City discovered that the hydrating facial mask that was popular in Benna City was actually made by the two ladies of Count Soldek. They immediately gathered them in the middle, and a group of women carefully accompanied them. Just hope to get the reservation order. You must know that this kind of magic mask is also a good thing that money cannot buy in Benna City. It is said that many water magicians have failed to imitate this magic mask. At the banquet, Sia wore a simple skirt and followed Soldak all the time. This beautiful and pure-looking assistant had officially entered the sight of the nobles of Ruth City. And everyone also found. The relationship between this assistant and Mrs. Soldak is also quite harmonious. Chapter 12, 13 Measures The furnishings in the office remained basically unchanged. Sia moved several flower pots placed on the desk and beside the wall to the terrace. It's euphemistically called summer. So let those green plants go outside and bask in the sun. And she chose two styles of fish tanks for Serdek. One was a floor-standing type place next to the wall. The fish in it were also one-foot-long silver-scaled cod. And there were many implants in it. Waterweed. Another bathtub is placed on his desk. The fish tank is not big. But the fish inside are colorful. Occasionally, when she has free time, Sia will teach Serdak how to appreciate fish correctly. Earl Lake Cushing sat on a chair looking at Soldak opposite him with a pair of slightly cloudy blue eyes. Soldak signed the document in his hand, handed it to Thea who was standing aside, and smiled lightly at Count Lake Cushing. Earl Cushing was very curious about the arrest of Deputy Speaker Glennis. So he came over to chat with Soldak this time. He also wanted to know the specific situation. So he asked Soldak, Duck, how did you know that Deputy Speaker Glennis would stand up against you and prepare the means to deal with him in advance? Soldak smiled before saying calmly, I'm not the goddess of fate. Of course, I don't know who will stand up against me. I didn't even think about why Deputy Speaker Glennies would be so impetuous. Then why did you prepare all the incriminating evidence against Deputy Speaker Glennis and actually gave him the most fatal blow when he jumped out? Earl Lake Cushing asked with his eyes widened. The incriminating evidence I have prepared is not only for Deputy Speaker Glennis. In fact, I have some incriminating evidence for many ministers and above in Ruth City, Serdak said in a low voice. Earl Lake Cushing was a little dumbfounded. He listened attentively and did not expect such an answer. In fact, only Serdak knew in his heart that strictly speaking, the information in his hand could not be regarded as evidence of crime. Lord MacDonnell was originally the consul of Ruth City and also served as the Speaker of the House of Representatives. Whether it is the City Hall or the House of Representatives, almost all the upper-class nobles in Ruth have some relationship with Lord MacDonnell. This was recorded by one of Lord MacDonald's officers of living. He regarded himself as the master of the plane, and also completely recorded his glorious life. Marquis Luther obtained this information from MacDonald. He was worried that I would not be able to control the situation here after arriving in Ritz City. So he made a copy of this information for me. So I will take this opportunity to clear all the obstacles in front of me. With that said, Serdak pulled out a box from his magic belt bag and opened the lid. It was almost full of documents recording the criminal evidence of the big shots in Ruth City. Earl Cushing looked at the information with mixed emotions and said to Soldak seriously, He thinks you are his successor. I am also very grateful to the Marquis for everything he has done for me. Soldak said, As long as you can be nice to Hathaway in your daily life, it will all be worth it. Count Lake Cushing said with a smile. Serdak smiled. Only when you become a person in power can you deeply feel that how tolerant the world is to men means how harsh it is to women. Serdak has never been able to truly integrate, no matter what happens. 
he will compare it with the world in his memory. This is because the moral principles deep in his heart are still from the previous world. It is deeply imprinted in the depths of his soul. So he has sometimes when faced with something. It's often difficult to make a choice. Now, Serdak's life seems to be divided into three parts. But so far, he has not felt the extremely painful sense of division. Whether he was in Wall Village, Doden Town, or Ruder City, he was surrounded by the gentleness of water. They knew each other's existence. But they would not touch those topics in front of Serdak. Nor would they let him make unreasonable multiple choice questions. This is where Serdak feels most comfortable and where he feels most guilty. So he wanted to compensate them in the gentlest, most perfect, and most considerate way, which actually gave them more. Earl Lake Cushing patted Soldak on the shoulder and asked, Dak, what do you want to do next? Of course, everything must be prepared at my own pace. I have said that I want to move the steel workshop in Ritz City. This is also my recent plan, Serdak replied casually. Then, he carefully sorted out the information in this wooden box. Reading these documents can also indirectly understand the true thoughts of the nobles of Ritz City. He flipped through one page after another, not even noticing when Earl Lake Cushing left. Miss Thea's name quickly spread throughout the Ruth City Hall. And it wasn't all because of her beautiful face. Those who are qualified to serve in the City Hall are basically the nobles in the city. Who doesn't have a few beautiful women in their family? There are many rumors about her. But the most exaggerated one is this one. Lord Prior Serdak is not that picky about life. But Miss Thea has some new ideas about her life in the City Hall. I heard that she wanted to take a bath during her lunch break in order to replenish her skin in time. But few people in the city hall knew that she was from the Naga Sea tribe. Sia had a bathtub installed in the small lounge just so that she could take a bath at noon. But many officials in the city hall couldn't understand this matter. Many people think, for lunch break, it's good to have a simple bed in the lounge. After all, you have to consider that the Archon works day and night. As the Archon of Ruth City, it's understandable to take a rest at noon. Of, but now, putting a bathtub in the lounge is a bit too much. Do the two of them have to take a bath in the lounge before or after that? There is another rumor about Xia. Miss Xia has never been satisfied with the food in the cafeteria. Especially she likes to eat fish and seaweed. But there are rarely such dishes in the food area of the hall here. Because of this, Miss Thea was very dissatisfied with the chef in the cafeteria. Suldak then directly drove away the chef in charge of the cafeteria in the city hall. In response to this, the Minister of Logistics, Earl Allen Benton, also hurriedly raised objections to Suldak in the morning, believing that the chef had done nothing wrong. But Suldak was the head chef who completely ignored Minister Alan Benton's opinions and closed the canteen very stubbornly. That afternoon, the head chef in the City Hall cafeteria left with a salute. The City Hall staff canteen immediately fell into a state of paralysis because of the lack of a chef. For a time, Serdak couldn't find a new chef. So he appointed the two-headed ogre as the chef of the employee canteen. Wearing an oversized apron and two chef's hats, Gulitam stood inside the cafeteria and discussed the evening's dishes with the employees in the cafeteria. The public officials in the city hall didn't care at all what kind of delicacies the two-headed ogre could make. On the contrary, many people joked privately, is the employee canteen about to start eating human flesh? The two-headed ogre Gulitam took over as the chef of the employee canteen. He did not take any new measures, but directly issued a benefit. That is, the masters who cook large pots of food in the hall. After making each dish, not only does he want to eat, but his whole family wants to eat for free. This benefit of the ogre immediately allowed the chefs responsible for various dishes in the cafeteria hall to prepare some dishes that at least Gulitam would not find too unpalatable. The only bad thing is that the cooking style of the small canteen where you can order food has become a bit rough. Not at all. Gulitam's best dishes can be divided into three types boiled meat porridge, grilled meat patties, and sashimi. The ministers in the city hall were not used to the ogre's delicious food, so they all ran to the cafeteria hall to eat. At this time, the logistics minister Alan Benton finally figured out what the problem was. Serdak and Sia also walked out of the canteen with small cubicles. The two sat in the corner of the restaurant. Serdak did not dislike the meatloaf cooked by the ogre. And Sia also there is an exclusive grilled fish. The public officials in the city hall are talking less about Sia in private. And some people are even starting to support Sia. At least when it comes to changing the head chef in the cafeteria. More people understand it than misunderstand it. Soldak took Sia in the magic caravan directly to the street connecting the slums and the workshop block. At the end of the street, a ruin-like steel workshop was sealed in a high wall. 
through the glass window of the magic caravan. Serdak could smell the smell of rust coming from the wall. These seven huge chimneys were erected in the steel workshop. But there are still two chimneys that are still emitting billowing smoke into the sky. Serdak let the magic caravan go around to the gate of the steel workshop. The steel workshop didn't seem to be completely closed down. But the guard guarding the door of the workshop was sitting listlessly in a dilapidated awning. He doesn't pay much attention to the pedestrians coming and going at the entrance of the workshop. Even when Serdak's magic caravan stopped in front of the steel workshop. The two guards didn't even look up. Serdak and Sia jumped out of the magic caravan and walked into the workshop gate. No one stopped or asked. Arriving in front of a large chimney that was still emitting thick smoke. Soldak saw a huge furnace that was still burning flames. And workers lined up to throw scrap iron materials into a crucible. Chapter 1214 Demolition Watching the molten iron continuously flowing out from the other side of the furnace. The molten iron flowed into the stone troughs. As the craftsmen in the workshop opened the stone troughs and set them aside for natural cooling. Groups of steel ingots finally appeared. In front of Serdak. Although this furnace looks a bit old. The magic reaction device works normally. And kerosene is used to refine iron. Using kerosene is far cheaper than consuming magic crystal fragments. Serdak discovered that the furnace was actually still running. And after there was no more iron ore. The steel workshop used recycled scrap iron to make iron ingots. The steel workshop is almost paralyzed. But there is still a group of craftsmen working hard here. Probably because they saw Serdak and the others walking around the furnace in the workshop. Two stewards, who were fairly well dressed came over. The two of them saw the noble metal on Serdak's chest at first glance and then saw the magic pattern structure on his body. He immediately became very respectful and asked, My lord Earl, do you need to purchase steel ingots when you come to our Rooter Steel Workshop? Serdak glanced at the thin middle-aged steward who spoke and replied casually, I heard that your workshop here has stopped working a long time ago. Why is there still a furnace working? Hearing Serdak's question, the middle-aged steward showed a bitter smile and extended his hand to ask Serdak to return to the furnace for another visit. Just listen to him saying to Soldak, this place was originally Lord MacDonald's property. When Lord MacDonald returned to the Ganbu Plain, this place has been out of control. As for no one willing to take over this steel workshop, the main reason is that the iron ore field outside has been hollowed out. And the steel workshop here has gradually become deserted. Even if it is taken over, there will be no iron ore to refining iron ingots will also become a burden for those nobles. Soldak nodded slightly. Count Lake Cushing also said at the beginning that because the iron ore at the iron mine was mined out, the steel workshop declined year by year. Then why do you insist on staying? Serdak asked curiously. The thin middle-aged steward said. Everyone who can afford to leave the steel workshop has long since disappeared. The rest are all metallurgical craftsmen with no life skills. They have spent most of their lives in this workshop. So now I organize these people. Collect some discarded iron materials in the city. And refine them. Turning it into iron ingots just to eke out a living. Earl Cushing did not mention it at the beginning. But there was actually a group of craftsmen in the steel workshop. Seeing that Serdak was silent, the middle-aged steward immediately said tentatively, Lord Earl, if you need iron ingots, you can consider me. The quality can still be guaranteed. Serdak shook his head and expressed that he did not want to buy iron ingots. He turned around and was about to walk out. The young man next to the skinny middle-aged manager quickly stopped him, put on a smile, and said to Soldak, If you think our iron ingots are a bit expensive and you need us to sell them cheaper, it's not impossible to negotiate. But this kind of bargain hunting transaction can't give you any benefits. Although this place used to be the property of Lord MacDonald. After Lord MacDonald was arrested. This place should be regarded as the spoils of the Bene Coalition. It's just that this steel workshop has been losing money in recent years. Naturally, the noble lords didn't want to take over this kind of money losing industry. So they kept it abandoned here. Now the entire Ruth city is managed by Serdak. And this steel workshop is actually his property. It's just that Serdak didn't know that he actually had such a large steel workshop. He originally wanted to trade with the owner of the steel workshop. But now, he realized that there was no need to talk at all. Thinking that although the steel workshop was out of control, there was still a group of craftsmen in the steel workshop. Serdak secretly felt lucky. To other noble lords. These craftsmen were a burden. But to him, these craftsmen were a burden. Craftsmen are all technical talents. He did not reveal his identity immediately because he wanted to get some information from Count Cushing and others. But he didn't expect that these people in the steel workshop would regard him as someone who wanted to buy iron ingots. And they kept pestering him. Serdak also felt a little helpless. 
The middle-aged manager saw that Soldak had no intention of buying iron ingots, but still refused to give up. He repeatedly said, Can you help me? Our salary has not been paid this week. Sia followed Soldak and couldn't help but ask, Why don't you go to the city hall for help in a situation like yours? The middle-aged steward glanced at Sia, but said to Soldak, How could I not go? The stone steps of the city hall were broken by my steps. Now as long as I show up at the gate, the guards over there will he fork me out without any reason. We are really not buying iron ingots. Soldak reached out and patted the middle-aged manager on the shoulder and said to him calmly, I heard that this place will be demolished. So I came here to take a look. The middle-aged steward was a little dumbfounded. He stood there blankly, pointed at the craftsmen working around the furnace, and said with a look of despair, If this place is demolished, how will they live in the future? Serdak said calmly, There's always something for them to do in this city. Of course you can leave here with the steel workshop. This place will become a restaurant and hotel in the future. And there may also be a market, street shops, etc. In short, this steel workshop will no longer exist. The middle-aged steward was a little distracted and said with a wry smile, Ha uh ha. -huh. It seems that the big shots have already made plans. That's right. Serdak said matter-of-factly. The supervisor didn't bother Soldak anymore and returned to the house opposite the furnace with a dejected look. When Hamlin saw Soldak again, it was in the Archon's office of the city hall. He did not expect that the person who said those words to him that day was actually Count Soldak the consul of Ruth City. Although Hamlin was not even the smallest public official in Ruth City, he worked in the steel industry. There is still quite a bit of prestige in the circle of craftsmen, and many craftsmen are willing to discuss anything that happens at home with Hamlin. Therefore, Hamlin is also very familiar with the situation in Ruth City, and he is also very aware of some of the rumors that have been circulating in the city hall and the House of Representatives in the past few days. Hamlin glanced at Soldak secretly, he didn't look like the big shot who killed Deputy Speaker Glennis. Seeing that he is still wearing a magic pattern construct, he is clearly dressed like a construct knight. It seems that his temperament is very consistent with that of a commander. Lord Preter Soldak, I didn't know that it was you who came to the steel workshop that day. It was entirely my idea to open the number 5 furnace in the workshop privately. I knew it was your property. I just wanted to give those people the craftsman pool together as sum of money for living expenses. Hamlin explained to Soldak seriously. He was a little thin, and as he reached middle age, his hair became less and less, and his hairline almost receded to the top of his head, Soldak said without raising his head. I know. Now I am planning to move this steel workshop, but due to previous negligence, I did not consider how to relocate you, and now I have two temporary ideas. Road. Place us? Hamlin had no idea that Soldak would say this and that he would be relocating some clumsy craftsman left over from the abandoned steel workshop. Yes, every craftsman can find a new job if they want. Soldak gave Hamlin a promise, and then said, But now I need to dismantle this steel workshop as soon as possible. At the same time, I don't want to hear any doubts, including those remaining craftsmen from the steel workshop. Hamlin stood up immediately and replied seriously, Don't worry, I will take care of this matter. Soldak said to Hamlin, in addition, I hope to hire you to be the chief engineer of the Doden Town Steel Workshop and fully assist in the relocation of the steel workshop. Hamlin did not expect that the demolition Soldak mentioned was to move the seven furnaces. Me? Hamlin asked doubtfully. Serdak said, Yes, you are the most familiar with this place, and you have a group of craftsmen under you. I think they should know better how to dismantle this melting pot. Where will the steel workshop be moved? Hamlin asked curiously. The town of Doden in the Gonbu Plain is a bit far away from here. But there is a large iron mine there, Serdak said. It is a very beautiful town. You can move your family there in the future. Of course, you can also leave your home here temporarily. I will pay you a settling-in fee. And when you restore this steel workshop to normal operation, you can choose to stay or come back. Lord Archon, do I still have the right to choose? Hamlin asked Soldak with a wry smile. Of course. But I know you won't choose anyone else. Not only will this supervisor be well paid, but he can also help you arrange the craftsmen properly. Serdak lowered his head and signed the mountain of documents. Some of these documents are from Ruth City, and a large pile is from Makuso City. Basically, they have been reviewed by multiple parties and must be signed by him before they can take effect. Okay, I agree. Although he became the chief engineer of the steel workshop, Hamlin was not happy at all. Soldak, 
who was sitting at his desk, put down the quill in his hand, stretched out his hand, and said to Hamlin with a smile, Welcome to Doden Town, Director Hamlin. It was only at this moment that Thea was willing to bring Hamlin a cup of black tea and placed it in front of him. Hamlin stared at the teacup carefully, not even daring to raise his head. Almost all the citizens of Ritz City knew about the rumors about this beautiful assistant. Just because she was unhappy, Archon Soldek kicked out the head chef of the City Hall staff canteen. Just because Deputy Speaker Glennis took a second look at this beautiful assistant and said a few frivolous words, Consul Soldak even sealed the Glennis Manor. He was just a bed bug in the slums of Ritz City. And he didn't dare to offend this beautiful assistant in any way. After finding a person in charge, who was completely familiar with the conditions of the steel workshop, the subsequent relocation work became very smooth. The craftsmen in the workshop were not only very cooperative, but also joined in the disassembly work. The people who are most familiar with these furnaces are these craftsmen. It may not be too easy to build such a furnace, but to dismantle these equipment, the craftsmen only need to after three days. All that was left of furnace number one was the workshop homestead and a towering chimney. The courtyard of this steel workshop is large enough, and the entire chimney was blown down by Gulitum, who buried some black powder. As the first tall chimney towering over the city collapsed, the residents of the slums noticed what was happening in the steel workshops. Then on the tenth day, the second large chimney fell in the courtyard of the steel workshop. The huge earthquake when the chimney fell was felt by almost half of the city, as the number one and number two furnaces in the workshop were disassembled little by little. Hamlin marked them one by one. A Thunder Rhino caravan finally appeared on the mountain road far away from Ruth City. This Thunder Rhino caravan consisted of a total of 132 Thunder Rhinos. And each Thunder Rhino seemed to be like a huge hill. A row of hills were connected together while walking on the mountain road. And it was extremely loud for a while. The shelves of these Thunder Rhinoceros are filled with all kinds of precious and huge wood. These wood are basically transported from the Invercargill Forest in the White Forest Plain. There is not much ironwood. But they are all more suitable for making. Indigo wood for furniture. In order to plan this trip, the businessman Malakon collected almost all the indigo wood stored in the indigenous tribes into his hands. Huge wooden shelves are stacked with this wood. These Thunder Rhinoceros camped together outside Ritz City. Looking from the city wall. It looked like a small town had grown outside the city overnight. The timber was piled up outside the city. But after just one night, a large number of merchants from Makusu arrived in droves. Some merchants even parked their four-wheel trucks directly outside the business group, trading large quantities of timber. It takes two days of going to be considered over. The firewood was then transported to Makusu City day and night. The idle thunder rhinoceros also entered Ruth City in an orderly manner then carried the large parts of the furnace that had been dismantled from the steel workshop on their backs, and slowly walked out of Ritz City. When these thunder rhinoceros passed the city gate, the tall platform on their back almost always rubbed against the top wall of the city gate hole when they walked out. Malakom and Serdak stood on the city wall together, watching a team of thunder rhinoceros carrying large steel parts out of Root, and they almost breathed a sigh of relief at the same time. Serdak looked at the thunder rhino in the distance and said to the merchant Malakom, Malakom, the Thunder Rhino caravan you brought this time is only enough to transport the number one and number two steel furnaces. I have a total of seven large furnaces like this, and I hope you can transport more next time. I know. After I go back, I will organize a larger caravan to come over. Lord Earl Saldak, will you bring Indigo Wood over next time? Businessman Malakom asked seriously. Chapter 1215 Businessman Serdak looked at the owner of Thunder Rhino Trading Company patted his shoulder and walked down the city wall with him, saying as he walked. After nearly a year of renovation work in the old city of Makuso City, the buildings in the inner city have basically been restored to their original state. This batch of wood is ready to enter the market in Makuso. There will definitely be some citizens who want to add some furniture. A lot of furniture needs to be customized after the house is built due to the layout of the house and the needs of the hostess. So I wrote to ask you to ship a batch of good wood. There is no shortage of excellent carpenters in Makuso City now. This batch of wood has been filled into the market of Makusuo City. It is estimated that Makusuo City will not need the wood in the near future. So you can definitely transport some other things. The city wall of Root is also somewhat modeled. The traces left by the war two years ago are still there today, Malakom said. There are many pastures in the Belan Plain, and cattle and sheep are the specialties of Wilkes. Serdek glanced at him and said casually, Last year I drove 200,000 yellow sheep and 20,000 cattle from Milan. Do you think Makusuo City will be short of beef and mutton? 
Malakom thought carefully again, and then said, The southern area of the Abalan Plain is rich in some tree fruits. I will go back this time to collect some special products and try to transport them all here. Serdak pointed to his forehead and said to Malakom, Malakom, it's time to change your thinking here. Many things can be profitably transported from Wilkes to Benna City and resold. Why do they have to be transported from Balan to Ganbu? After those goods are successfully sold from Benna City, we will purchase some goods from Benna City and bring them here. After all, some things are still very cheap in Benna City. Serdak continued. Bakuso City is currently expanding its urban area. Currently, all infrastructure materials are in large demand. In addition to large quantities of wood, other commodities, such as bronze lamps, ironware, ceramics, and lacquerware, should be have requests. Actually, the portal pass in your hand is a fortune in itself. You can bring in other business owners and let them run the projects you don't want to touch. And you can also charge them a customs clearance and transportation fee. Sewer Dark and Malakom said as they walked. I understand. Only then did the businessman Malakom understand what Serdak was thinking. He also heard a lot of information about Makuso City along the way. At this time, Malakom finally had some thoughts. And he took the initiative to say to Soldak, Sir, I want to go to Makuso City to visit. Serdak took out the water bottle from his magic waste bag and took a sip of water. Speaking of dry mouth, Malakom came up with the idea of visiting Makuso City. I didn't expect that attracting investment would be so difficult. Malakom was also impatient and would do what he said. After walking down the city wall, he immediately took the two deputies around him and rushed directly to the portal leading to Makuso City from the central square. When Soldak took the magic caravan back to the city hall, he made a special trip around the steel workshop. Hanlon and the craftsmen in the steel workshop moved quickly. At this moment, they have begun to dismantle the number four steel furnace. Since the number one and two steel furnaces have been shipped out of Root City, a large section of the steel workshop wall has also been demolished. Now, the area where the furnace was dismantled has left a large emptiness. According to Serdak's request, the land vacated after the relocation of the number one and two furnaces has been completely separated from the steel workshop. Only some stone foundations remain in this area and are being demolished. Serdak walked out of the carriage of the magic caravan. Sia, holding half of the sheepskin booklet, quickly followed Serdak. The two stepped on the ruins and rocks in the empty field and climbed to the highest building. Stone platform. Hamlin didn't know where he heard that Soldak rushed to the steel workshop and immediately led several supervisors from the steel workshop to rush to this ruin-like site. These supervisors in the steel workshop were promoted by Hamlin from among the civilian craftsmen. Seeing a nobleman like Soldak standing on the stone platform with his waist bent almost level with the ground, he would not dare to do so under any circumstances. Lift your head up. Serdak stood on the high platform, pointed at the steel furnaces that had not been completely dismantled, and asked Hamlin, Hamlin, how long will it take for your place to be completely demolished? Can you and the craftsmen leave for the Bellan Plain at the end of this month? As the director of this relocation project, Hamlin has lost a lot of weight compared to half a month ago. He looks like a layer of skin and bones. But he is very energetic and his eyes are still very bright. Bright. I probably spent all day at the construction site. And my skin was tanned to a weak color. Sir, time is running out. Please give me one more month. I can dismantle this place until there is not even a screw left, Hamlin said to Soldak. Serdak shook his head in denial without hesitation, and then said, Then I'll give you twenty more days. No more. After twenty days, you immediately take these craftsmen on a magic airship to Benna City, and then enter the Bellan Plain through the portal of Benna City. In the middle of next month, I hope to see you and these craftsmen standing on the construction site in the north of Duodan Canyon directing the indigenous people there to start building the first furnace. Hamlin heard that the craftsmen in the workshop here could go to the Belan Plain and continue to install the furnace. It seemed that these craftsmen would not be unemployed for the time being. So he immediately agreed. Yes, Mr. Soldak Consul. The news that Serdak came to the steel workshop spread quickly. And some businessmen came here in magic caravans. During this period, Many businessmen were inquiring about the use of this land between the workshop area and the slum area after the steel workshop was relocated. Many businessmen wanted to rent this land, even if it was converted into a warehouse. There are currently many merchants in Makusuo City. After they transport their goods into Root City, the trucks can only park on the street at night. The inner city of Root City has a small space. And in the slum area, 
several families are crowded into the same small building at the same time. If you want to rent a cheap warehouse in Ruth City, it is very difficult to find it. At least in the inner city area. Businessmen want to buy some land here. But the Bureau of Land Management says that the steel workshop belongs to the private property of Consul Soldak. If businessmen want to buy the land here, they must obtain permission from Consul Soldak. A consent. They did not dare to enter the empty space of the steel workshop rashly because it was considered private land. Entering rashly would constitute an infringement of private land and would result in a whipping penalty if pursued. So a group of people could only wait quietly on the street. When Soldak walked out of the steel workshop, they found that many people had gathered outside. At the beginning, Serdak didn't pay too much attention. He just lowered his head and walked outside. When he passed the crowd, these businessmen boldly asked Serdak loudly, Lord Consul, is the land here for sale? Lord Archon, we want to buy land in Ruth City. Is there anything we need to pay attention to? Serdak stopped and looked at the group of people crowded on the street. He thought for a while and then said, First of all, I don't agree with you buying their houses from the poor. Although several poor people can get a sum of money from selling the house. It also means that they have become homeless in Ruth City. This not what I wanted to see. Rather than buying up houses in slums, I would rather you build warehouses outside the city. Now Ruth City is only this big. Due to its unique geographical location, it is impossible for it to expand outwards. So I still hope that the city can accommodate more residents. In addition, talking about the land of this steel workshop, I have no idea of dividing and selling it for the time being. And it will not be a warehouse in the future. I will build a warehouse area on a piece of land outside the planning office of Reuter. My suggestion is that you can consider choosing a warehouse there. After saying this, he nodded to the onlookers around him very gentlemanly, then turned around and got into a magic caravan on the side of the road as Thea boarded the magic caravan and closed the door, blocking the sight of the merchants. The magic caravan then slowly left. Cernak looked out the window. This was the lower town of Ritz City. Many streets were very narrow. In order to add some rooms, some houses added wooden houses like pigeon cages to the walls. Almost all of these wooden houses were suspended on the second floor. On the first or third floor, the eaves protruding from the wooden roof are almost connected to the eaves of the opposite roof. Almost all the pedestrians on the street are civilians in simple clothes. This group of people were walking in a hurry, and it was obvious that they were working hard to survive. Some women were sitting on the steps in front of their homes. Some women were still holding children in their arms. And some women were holding wooden basins, picking out the rotten food inside. Leaf vegetables. This is almost the poorest street in Root. Soldak walked through the streets along the edge blocks and could clearly see the lives of the poor sitting here. On the streets where sewage flows, you can still see some vendors pushing carts and walking on these streets. Serdak was surprised to see that in a stall selling headband jewelry, he could actually see a bunch of strings strung together with Cerberus teeth, hanging casually on the stall. Chapter 12 16 Slums Serdak stopped the magic caravan and asked the coachman to wait by the roadside. He pulled Thea into a street filled with sewage. It had just rained yesterday, and water was still dripping down from the eaves. The water in the culvert next to the street was almost overflowing, with various debris floating on it, and the sewage flowed into the moat at the end of the street. The stone slabs paved on this street have been exposed to wind, sun, and trampling for countless years. Many of the stone slabs have cracked. The weeds in the cracks have been cleared away, but some stone cracks and depressions are covered with moss. The whole street smelled of rotten musty smell. Sia was wearing a long skirt with a white lace skirt. In order to prevent the skirt from getting stained, she could only hold it with both hands, exposing a section of her white calves. On her feet were a pair of glass slippers. This skirt must have cost her a lot of money. It actually has a mini version of the mist circle inside the skirt, which can keep her legs moisturized by the water mist, thus avoiding dryness and cracking caused by being out of the water for a long time. She didn't like this environment very much, but she didn't want to wait alone in the carriage. So she bit her soft lips and followed Soldak. A drop of rain falls from the eaves. Serdak was walking in the alley, stretched out his hand to catch the water droplets in his palm, and the cold water droplets exploded with a pop sound. The wonderful feeling was very zen. It is a perfect control of space after the spiritual power spreads outward. Recently, he will try to enter that door every night and take an exhausting winter swim. When he wakes up in the morning, his whole body and mind will become empty. And then, you will feel that your limbs and bones are constantly being infused with spiritual power. Just like countless streams converging into a large river. 
and finally returning to the sea of spirituality. The torrent formed in the sea of spiritual consciousness made Serdak feel that his body became stronger under the wash of this spiritual torrent. And the sea of spiritual consciousness was also growing. Walking into the alley, Serdak didn't want to comprehend anything. But he wanted to see the real life of the people here. This kind of pigeon cage-like house takes up almost every inch of available space. It has been raining recently, and the air is full of water vapor, making the inside of the house even more humid. The buildings here are very dense, so there is no good ventilation at all. And there are many window sills. These blankets and beddings were all hung up to dry. Some women are sitting in front of their homes with their children. They may be knitting a sweater in their hands, or they may be holding some hard leather corners, using a template in the shape of a shoe sole to draw an outline on it, and then using a sharp scraper to cut the hard leather. The carapace scrapes out the shape of the sole little by little. They carried the younger children on their backs and let the older children play in the street. When the children saw Serdak and Sia walking side by side from the street, some of them did not dare to come forward. They hid in the musty smelling rooms, only sticking their heads out, revealing their dirty little faces. The houses here are all shared by several families. Soldak walked into a yard. There was a well in the yard. A group of women were washing clothes around the well, looking at the piles of clothes beside them. Dirty clothes? Obviously these women are some washer ladies. A few younger girls were drying their clean clothes in the rope-lined yard, while the two older girls stood by the well and kept fetching water. Although it's not summer yet, the clothes they wear are very cool. Serdak wanted to exit the courtyard, but when he turned around, he discovered that there was a small, dark wooden house in the corner of the courtyard entrance. It looked like a toilet, and a series of rapid squeaks came from inside. And then a man who looked like a hard worker came out with his trousers, hung his withered money bag on his belt again, and walked out of the yard without looking back. A young woman walked out of the house immediately, adjusting her shoulder straps as she walked. She squatted next to the well holding a wooden basin, washing clothes alone. There were piles of dirty clothes around her. The women around her seemed reluctant to talk to her. Although the women did not say anything bad to her, there was a hint of contempt in their eyes. When Serdak walked out of the yard, he saw an old woman sitting on the steps at the door, squinting in the sun. Her eyes were squinted, and her pupils looked a little cloudy. In addition to wrinkles, there were some aged spots on her face. It can be seen that she is very old. Maybe she will never be able to open her eyes again tomorrow and look at the sun above her head. Serdak sat down next to the old woman. It was probably because Serdak had blocked the sun when he passed by just now. The old woman squinted her eyes slightly, but her eyes fell on him. Maybe it's because the aristocratic dress he's wearing is a little too exquisite to be dazzling. How long have you lived here? Serdak asked curiously. I have been working as a washer here for many years when I was a child. When there was an iron mine in the past, the living conditions of the craftsmen here were very good. There were at least dozens of laundries here. Later, the mine finally could no longer be dug. After the iron mines were mined, the steel workshops here were in decline, and there weren't even that many people coming here to wash clothes. The old woman would take a breath after saying a few words, but she was very talkative. Only then did Serdak realize that the courtyard he had just entered was actually a laundry. At this time, a man pushing a wooden cart walked in from the alley. The cart was almost full of dirty clothes. He came to the door of the workshop and carried bundles of dirty clothes into the yard. After doing this, he's sitting at the door with a tired face and drinking water, seeing Serdak sitting next to him in a noble dress. Chatting with the old woman, he stood up and respectfully said to Serdak, My lord, what can I do for you? Soldak paused and asked the man, Are you the owner of this laundry? The man showed a simple smile and said, There is no boss here. I am just the one who goes out to collect clothes. All the clothes I collect have to be sent here to be starched. How's the business here usually? Soldak looked at the two-wheeled cart with almost worn-out tires and asked like a man. The man thought seriously for a moment and said with a bitter smile on his dark face, Usually there are only two cars, but the situation is much better these days. Sometimes we can receive four cars. Each car can hold about 50 pieces of clothing. You a reporter from the Times newspaper? Only at the end did the man finally remember to ask about Soldak's identity. Soldak shook his head and said, No, I'm just curious about this and want to know more. How much do you charge for washing each piece of clothing? The work clothes I collected are difficult to wash. The washing fee for each piece is about two copper coins. If I pay them for settlement, it is one copper coin per piece. Basically, the settlement is based on the number of pieces. 
In winter, it will cost more. In summer, it will be cheaper. But you have to pay extra for ironing. The laundry is cleaner in this laundry. We have a cooperative relationship. The man smiled and glanced at the old woman sitting at the door. And then said to Soldek, My father used to collect clothes. And now that he is old, he handed over this stall to me. Although he is not very prosperous this year. Good. But at least it's better than last year. Then he took Sia and left from this alley. It wasn't until she reached the wider main street that Sia finally let go of her hand holding the skirt. And then let out a long breath. Is this the slum area of Ruth City? In fact, there is also a place like this in the city of the seven worlds in the seven seas. Sia said while standing in Serdak. Serdak walked out of the alley, feeling somewhat relieved. In fact, after all, the people here are not as miserable as the refugees in the deserted land. After boarding the magic caravan, Serdak said to Thea, This is a group of people living at the bottom of the city, and there may be even more miserable people. For them, life is always full of misfortune. Thea, look at the city of Lut. At least half of the people in this city are crowded in this dirty and messy area. Also nearly one-third of the residents live in urban areas. The remaining people are businessmen and nobles. But many of the nobles' families are gradually declining. It is estimated that it is very difficult for them to maintain even the most basic dignity. So there are very few aristocrats who can enjoy a luxurious life. Look at the top-notch mansions in the highest parts of the city. There are only more than 70 mansions in the aristocratic area of the huge city. But the land area they occupy is almost the same as this slum area. Do you know the population of Red City? 330,000 people. I'm not going to seek more benefits for the nobles who are already living very wealthy lives. I want to raise the living standard of the residents of Ritz City so that their lives can be slightly better. Serdak looked out the window. The smell of fried food and the strong bitterness of oil smoke came from the street. What is this? A sense of social responsibility? Shi Yahoo's blue eyes became extremely bright, with a look of admiration in his eyes. Serdak smiled and spread his hands and said, How can I be so noble? Only when the entire city becomes rich will the overall value of Ruder City continue to increase. Marquis Luther took over more than just Ruder the management rights of the city, as well as a large number of McDonald family properties. Although most of these properties have gone bankrupt, the manors and large tracts of land are still there. If you want to increase the value of these assets, you cannot do without the prosperity of Ruth City. Sia followed Soldak's gaze and looked out the car window at the crowds of people on the street. She held the sheepskin book to her heart with one hand and asked, Dak, what are you going to do next? I'm going to reinvent this ghetto, Soldek said. He pointed to the area in front of him that was almost closely connected to the steel workshop and said, If conditions permit, I will demolish all the pigeon cages inside. Although these houses are extremely compact, their layout is very poor. Look at the small townhouses in Duodan Town. If this place is renovated in the future, I plan to design it into a living area with complete facilities. Not only must there be a market around, but there must also be a war college open to civilians. Chapter 1217 Change Baron Martino came to Ruth City for the first time after becoming the director of the Urban Construction Bureau of Makuso City. The carriage of this magic caravan bore the emblem of Makuso City. After the carriage driver showed his pass to the portal guard, he drove the carriage through the portal in the central square. Although Ruth City also experienced the devastation of the Battle of Talapagan, the entire city still retained its original appearance. Today, after a year-long renovation, many buildings in Makuso City have been renovated, giving people the impression that it is a brand new city. Compared with Makuso City, the modeled squares and streets here seem to have a bit more culture. Connotation. There are still long queues of caravans on the square. Makuso City is about to end its one-year tax holiday. Almost all businessmen are taking advantage of the last two months to conduct bulk commodity transactions. Some transactions have already been completed. Make advance payments for autumn orders just to legally avoid taxes. Countless goods are pouring into the Ganbu Plain at this time. As the gateway to the Ganbu Plain, Root City also has a large number of business groups gathered here. This also made Root City appear more prosperous than before. The young assistant next to Baron Martino seemed a little excited. He looked at the gorgeous street shops outside the window and said to Baron Martino excitedly, Director, I have long wanted to come to Root City to have a look. But speaking of it, there really isn't much to see here. These street shops are all so old. So Makuso City is cleaner and tidier. Baron Martino looked outside through the car window. He could see some businessmen casually on the street. 
Then a three-story semicircular building appeared in his field of vision. If he could look down from the sky, he could see it. Found out that this building looks like the letter D. Dozens of nearly 30-meter-high marble columns are erected outside the building, which looks magnificent. When the magic caravan drove into the courtyard of the city hall, he saw Thea in a beautiful long dress waiting on the steps. He and Thea had not seen each other for at least half a year. Now Thea seems to have lost the innocence and childishness on her face. And her whole person has become extremely bright. Especially when she is dressed as a public official in the city hall. Showing a trace of intellectual beauty. Thea! How long have we not seen each other? Baron Martino walked a few steps quickly. Climbed up the steps and smiled at Thea. Thea stepped forward. Saluted Baron Martino face to face. And responded with a smile. Baron Martino! Welcome to Ruth City. The Earl is waiting for you in the office. Among the people around Soldek. Apart from Zigna and Nika, Thea and Baron Martino are the most familiar. After all, when Martino was responsible for building the temple of the two goddesses, Thea visited them almost every day. Take a swim in the extended pool in the back garden. Although Baron Martino didn't know Thea existed at that time. At least for Thea, Baron Martino was one of the people she was most familiar with. When a group of public officials passing by the door of the city hall saw the scene, they all looked sideways, curious about the identity of this middle-aged man who seemed to have a somewhat melancholy temperament. After all, no one in the city hall could compare with this man. Miss Thea spoke so kindly. Baron Martino followed Thea into the city hall. The public officials who were walking towards him almost moved aside when they saw Thea. Climbing to the third floor of the city hall, Thea led Baron Martino into Soldak's office. Serdak was standing in front of the sand table, looking intently at the sand model of Ruth City. There was also a flat map of Ruth City on the side. In addition, there are several simple paintings sketched by Serdak on the small table. Although those pictures look very simple, they are very three-dimensional. Martino stepped forward, bowed and saluted. See your majesty Count Soldak. Baron Martino. We haven't seen each other for half a year. Soldak walked up quickly, put his arm around Baron Martino's shoulders asked him to sit down in the rest area, and said to him with a smile, What if I'm not very satisfied with the works designed by the planners from the Urban Land Management Bureau here? I'm afraid we won't be able to meet at least next month. You should actually go to Makuso City and take a look. It has changed a lot now, Baron Martino said to Soldak, looking at the Golden Earl medal on his chest. Baron Martino was really moved. He remembered that when he first heard Soldak's name, he was just a baron. In just two years, Serdak was successfully promoted to a count. It only took him two years to overcome the hurdle that many nobles could not overcome in their lifetime. Soldak sat down opposite Baron Martino, and then said, The reason I invite you here this time is to help me design the buildings in this area. I plan to design this place into a restaurant plaza. Serdak pointed to the area of the steel workshop and continued to explain. This is not a restaurant in the traditional sense, and it's not a huge building. Strictly speaking, it is more like a market. All storefronts are neatly arranged. This should be a leisure place filled with restaurants of various styles. Baron Martino first took a look at the sandbox model in front of Soldek. The entire steel workshop was located on the edge of the workshop area. According to the map, this area covers an area of more than 20 acres. Markets and some leisure places flashed through his mind. But he couldn't combine the two. Baron Martino stared at the messy hand-drawn drawings by Soldek. Those three-dimensional outlines were clearly in a corner of this illegally built restaurant plaza. The neat plaques. All storefronts had large floor to ceiling glass windows. And there were tables and chairs inside. They are all outlined with simple lines. The images in my mind suddenly burst out. These are some of my ideas. And I plan to add them to the design of the square. Soldek said aside. In fact, although these drawings were all sketched by Soldek, the elements in them are mixed with Serdak's memories of his previous life. Hathaway and Beatrice's vision for the restaurant plaza. Western Yuz's descriptions of some classic buildings in the Seven Seas are now drawn on several pieces of parchment. Although the lines are a bit rough and simple, they are full of creativity. Your Majesty, I want to take a look at the scene. Baron Martino sorted out the drawings and put them in his folder. Soldak immediately ordered to Thea. Thea, you go make arrangements. Thea replied. Okay. Nowadays, no matter what Thea does in the city hall, everything will go smoothly. These public officials work very efficiently in front of Sia. After the news about the restaurant plaza spread, the businessmen in Ritz City were the most upset. Of course, this also includes many restaurant owners in Ritz City. They are more worried that once a restaurant plaza is formed here, 
it will have a huge impact on their current business. However, since May, as more caravans have poured into the Ganbu Plain, the restaurant business in Rith City has begun to gradually improve. Just after the restaurant owners enjoyed the beauty for a moment, they heard that the city was going to renovate the restaurant plaza. Some restaurant owners were watching on the spot. While some restaurant owners were wondering if they could get a piece of the pie in the restaurant plaza, the land of the steel workshop is completely in the hands of the Soldat governor, and the Bureau of Land Management has made it clear that this land will not be sold to the outside world. Many people have set their sights on the land around the steel workshop. It is not entirely correct to say that it is land. It should be a desolate slum building. These buildings are filled with poor people. But all the land and houses are it's extremely cheap. Although the news of the food plaza was announced, and the land in the surrounding area doubled overnight. For businessmen and restaurant owners, the price of the land here is still extremely low. But usually no one will take it even if it is given away for free. The slums have now become the fat in everyone's eyes. Many businessmen began to look for various means to buy a house in this area first. But what everyone didn't expect was the next series of actions of the city hall. The city hall actually sent some public officials to summon the residents of these slums and established a semi-official residence committee, mainly targeting single-minded people like businessmen. A house was purchased, and an urban reconstruction plan was announced. The slums near the steel workshops are currently included in the first phase of urban reconstruction planning. This means that these old houses will soon be pushed to reconstruction. As for the resettlement issue in slums, the city hall also has some answers. That is, the city hall will build new living quarters to resettle the people in the city. In addition to providing a new place to live, the poor will also be given some compensation in gold coins. The night this news was released from the officials of the city hall, the number of low-income people in the entire slum area doubled again. Even so, no one was willing to sell their houses to those businessmen. In fact, the people who were most surprised were the people at the lowest level in the slums. They couldn't understand that just the demolition of the steel workshop had directly affected the lives of people like them. Not only has the value of the house he lives in increased exponentially, it is said that he will be able to live in a new house soon and receive a resettlement fee. What the poor people cannot understand the most is, when did the nobles' occupation of land become so humane? In the past, there was always a notice posted at the entrance of the alley, stating that people should move out within a time limit, and no reason was given. The reason is simple because the land in the slums does not have any land use certificates. They live here. It is more like a lease without paying land use fees. And the original owner of the land in this area was Lord MacDonald. Now, naturally, it is the territory of Earl Soldak, the consul of Ruth City. Unexpectedly, the city hall actually proposed new housing arrangements. Within a few days, Lord Soldak's name spread throughout the slums of Ruth City. Chapter 12 18 Value Hathaway works in the Bureau of Foreign Affairs for half a day every Monday, Wednesday and Thursday morning. Basically, she signs the final decision on some foreign affairs. She has no decision-making power. But she has the right to know. And there are some things that must be known to her before they can be implemented. This is part of her life. Except for these three days, the wife of the consul of Ruth City will basically stay in the castle. She doesn't like to listen to opera very much nor does she like to attend the balls of nobles. Even the afternoon tea between noble ladies will only agree to invitations on Tuesdays and Fridays. She has to leave it to Soldak on the weekends. Although Soldak has been so busy recently that he doesn't come home until very late every day, Hathaway still insists on doing so. As the weather gradually became hotter, Hathaway, Beatrice, and Thea all changed into cool skirts in the castle. Sometimes everyone was in the back garden, and there were no restrictions in the gauze skirts. The huge swimming pool in the back garden has basically become Sia's territory. Looking at a thin line passing quickly on the clear water, you can tell that it is Sia speeding in the swimming pool. Her fastest swimming speed is faster than that of Harrier. The sky passes even faster. Every time you swim, your body will be covered with this layer of light blue scales. When the three-color fish tail sways in the water, it looks more like a burning flame in the water. Hathaway sometimes brings home documents that she can't finish signing. At this time, she would lie on the wicker chair by the swimming pool, holding the document and pondering it word by word. When she was unclear about something, she would also ask the people around her. Beatrice and Thea didn't understand these things, so she would occasionally ask the housekeeper to get some information from the side. Sometimes, I will ask Serdak when I encounter important matters that are difficult to decide. Often the opinions given by Serdak will be more pertinent. Of course, Hathaway's current life is not so perfect. 
She also had her own troubles. She stretched out her hand to cover her flat and smooth belly, and her green eyes revealed a slight hint of sadness. No matter how busy the city hall was, Soldak would not stay out on weekend nights. He needs to spend some time with his family. Soldak was sitting on a wicker chair in the back garden, still thinking about the design drawings one after another. Those were set by Baron Martino. Many parts were already in line with his inner thoughts. But there were still some if the details are not done well. It is either too complicated or not refined enough. He rubbed his forehead and looked at Thea, who had drawn a huge whirlpool in the swimming pool, and asked casually, Thea, have Charlie and Luke and their craftsmen arrived? Sia's body completed a beautiful leap in the pool, got into the water again, and then poked her head out from the edge of the pool at Soldek's feet, put her arms on the stone platform of the pool, and let her shoulders rest the above person came out of the water, shook the water stains on his head vigorously, and said, The first batch of craftsmen arrived yesterday, but they are currently dismantling the fence over the slave market. I heard that the first batch of resettlement houses will be built over there. Serdak patted his forehead picked up the juice on the small wooden table, took a big sip, and said, I almost forgot about it if you didn't mention it. Remember to remind me tomorrow morning to go to the slave pen to take a look. I know, but I'm afraid it won't work tomorrow morning. Tomorrow morning you have to go to the steel workshop to host an investment meeting. Sia said. Sia rushed from the swimming pool to the shore. A maid put a bath towel on her body. The beautiful fish tail full of streamlines slowly transformed into two white legs in the water stains. Serdak asked Sia. Do the poor people who moved out early have any complaints? It's not bad. Especially when I heard that the city hall promised to compensate them with new houses in the slave pen. Yesterday, many people went to the slave market to watch the demolition of the fence. I heard that the scene was very lively. Sia raised her hand to tie her wet hair on her head. She formed a ball, and her delicate and pure pretty face was covered with crystal water drops, glowing with a faint golden light under the setting sun. At this time, the butler walked up to Soldak and whispered, The Molly family has sent an invitation to the ball. The ball will be held tomorrow night. If you refuse for me, just find any reason. It's a little more natural. Serdak waved his hand impatiently and said, Serdak rarely attended the noble dances of Ruth City. He preferred to sit in his study in red, or practice slashing and paring in the back garden. Although these basic moves are already a second-level powerhouse for him, the practice of swinging and slashing with a sword seems to be engraved in his bones just like brushing his teeth every day. If he doesn't brush his mouth every day, he will feel uncomfortable. Occasionally Beatrice would have a duel with Serdak in the back garden with a wooden sword. In terms of skills alone, Serdak, a knight who was born as a shield warrior, was not much better than Beatrice, who graduated from the Bena Advanced Swordsman Academy. However, Serdak has recently learned Commander Felix's white heat. As long as the sword shines with the white holy light, five sword rays will be shot out when he swings the sword even though he knows the angle of Serdak's attack. And speed. The moves are also very clear in Beatrice's eyes. But she can't stop him every time. In an instant, the long sword in Beatrice's hand will be knocked away. And it works every time. However, for the two-headed ogre Gilidim, he is very disdainful of those fancy sword skills. He believes that these fancy sword skills will only lead a knight astray. The battle on the battlefield will always only last a few rounds. In between, so only perfect suppression in terms of strength is the way to win. Every time the contest fails, it will be the beginning of another battle for Beatrice. Just as the city hall announced that the demolition work in the slums will be supervised and implemented by the residence committee. In fact the demolition work in the Ruth city slums has already begun with great vigor. Almost all the poor families around the steel workshops have received evacuation notices from the residence committees. And their temporary residence is in the arena on the edge of the business district. Almost all the poor families who have moved out from around the steel workshops have to live there. In that simple room, the more than 100 rooms under the arena's auditorium are enough to serve as temporary residences for the poor. Under the leadership of Luke, the first Makuso construction engineering team entered Leite City in late May. The first team of craftsmen did not enter the open space of the steel workshop, but directly came to the gradually prosperous slave market with the advanced cooperation of the security battalion. The slave market in Ruth City was sealed by a notice issued by the House of Representatives, declaring that it was an illegal building and would be demolished within a time limit. The demolition team brought over by Luke had already been waiting beside a group of knights from the guard camp. After Chief Nathaniel read aloud, the entire transaction in the slave market was terminated. All slave owners, 
and their slaves were driven out of the slave market. Luke led a group of craftsmen to push all the fences around the slave market. The surrounding citizens swarmed in, and everyone collectively looted the walls, wooden cages, etc. in the slave market, according to Soldak's request. A resettlement house will be built here as quickly as possible. For the Makuso No. 1 construction engineering team, this task is not difficult. If it is a masonry building, it may take more than half a year to build. But Luke followed Baron Martino's suggestion that these resettlement houses use half brick and half timber buildings. So the construction period will be reduced by two-thirds. Luke is confident that the first batch of poor people will be able to complete the construction before the end of next month. Into their new home. Charlie brought the second group of craftsmen to root for Makuso City two days later than Luke's construction team. They came to the clearing cleared by the steel workshop and immediately built a wooden frame on the slightly flat land. Twenty carpenters from Wall Village also spent two days under the leadership of Baron Martino. A model of the food court was built in a day. Now it is placed on the roadside of the steel workshop. The entire food court model is more than three meters long and is completely covered by a huge square magic protective cover. It is said that the rune board of this magic shield alone is worth 15 magic crystals. It is customized from Ruth's largest magic rune board business. If this magic rune board operates normally every day, it will burn two magic crystals. It takes a magic crystal fragment to maintain the mask effect. However, such a novel thing also attracted the attention of many citizens. Many people came to this empty field to see this huge wooden model. The purpose of Serdax doing this is just to attract the attention of citizens. The food court designed by Martino has many design elements of garden architecture. The restaurants are almost one next to the other. Almost all of these restaurants have huge floor-to-ceiling glass windows. Some of the tables and chairs are even designed in these models. The pedestrian street of the square is paved with flat stone slabs. There are some benches at intervals in the center of the street. And statues and fountains can be seen everywhere. Many citizens gathered around the sand table. And they immediately became dizzy. Someone said in the crowd. Is this how this place is going to be built in the future? Probably. What are these shops? They look a bit like restaurants. It must be a restaurant. Look at the pictures of barbecue and fried fish on the plaques. Oh, this should be a cold drink shop. It would be great to have a red bean smoothie shop here. But someone is really willing to open it here. A restaurant? This is a slum area. Do the poor people who don't even have enough to eat really have the spare money to patronize these restaurants? Haven't you ever heard that the poor people around you have moved to the slave market? I heard that this will become another commercial area of Ritz City. Specially used to receive business groups who come to Ritz City from outside. Will so many business groups come to our place in the future? Actually, there are many now. But most business groups will not stop in Ritz City because Makuso City is tax-free. There were some businessmen among the citizens. And everyone was talking about it. They immediately talked about the prospects of this restaurant square. It is close to the root gate. With such a favorable geographical location, even ordinary residents can see the commercial value and market potential here. Chapter 1219 Deposit In the morning, the sun shines into the carriage through the car window, which immediately reminds people of how hot it will be at noon. Serdak sat in the carriage, flipping through the speech he was about to read to the nobles and businessmen, and threw the speech aside. On the street, there were many magic caravans converging in the direction of the steel workshop, which immediately caused a traffic jam in Ritz City. Although the knights of the guard camp were well prepared, and under their command, Serdak's magic caravan moved forward slowly in the traffic. The main streets of the entire city were almost in chaos. Sia held up the speech and thought about what Soldak was dissatisfied with. It seemed that the three clerks who specially wrote the speech for Soldak needed to change their positions immediately. After such a long time, they seem to have I still don't understand Serdak's thoughts. Although Serdak planned to sacrifice the interests of the nobles and improve the lives of the bottom residents in the slums. But Serdak didn't want to say that on the podium. The title of this speech should be Everything Must Be Based on the Interests of the Nobles. And he did these things to seek a better life for the nobles. Only by changing the city can he change the living environment of the nobles. Seattle stuck out his tongue and put the speech into the parchment book. According to Serdak's request, the first batch of slum residents have gradually moved away from the steel workshop. And they are temporarily living in the arena that is currently idle. The construction of their resettlement community has already begun. The construction engineering team building this community is Luke's craftsman team. They are building very quickly. In just a few days, the foundations of the first row of townhouses have been completely completed. After pouring, you only need to use some foundation stones 
and hollow bricks to build the building to a height of 1.5 meters. And the upper part will be completely wooden structure. The oak wood from Aranza City has arrived in Rift City. These oak wood will become the load-bearing columns and main beams of the townhouses. Serdak has very strict requirements on Luke's construction period. In fact, what Serdak doesn't know is that these poor people prefer to extend their stay. Because if they stay in the arena for one more day, they will get one more day of compensation. The daily compensation is almost half a day's salary. With this compensation, even if the man in the family occasionally gets sick and misses work, it will not affect his life. In the eyes of these poor people, the Archon of Rith City was willing to give a compensation to all the poor who had no place to live. This Archon was simply crazy. And they hope that this kind of days will never end. Serdak stepped out of the carriage and found that the steel workshop was crowded with people. The officials of the city hall noticed his carriage and rushed towards it. The knights from the guard camp had already cleared a path. When Serdak and Sia stepped out of the carriage, they were surrounded by a group of nobles and businessmen. Soldak saw Baron Martino, dressed in formal attire, standing next to the wooden sand table and reciting a speech. He looked a little nervous. For the officials in the city hall, there have been a lot of changes in the Ritz City Hall in recent times. Many things that seemed very normal before have become impossible to do now. Everyone in the city hall is trying to figure out the new appointment. The Lord Archon's preference. After several days of contact, everyone has become clear about the extent of the Archon's control over the city hall. Everyone's ears are still ringing with the sound of him pointing at the head of logistics minister Alan Benton and yelling. If you can do it, do it. If you can't do it, get out of here. I'll find someone with the ability to come here. Although the Minister of Logistics, Earl Benton, wanted to turn around and leave. He knew better that there were countless nobles in Red City eyeing his position. As long as he sits in this position, the family will get better resources in many aspects. So even when Serdak pointed his nose at him and scolded him, he did not submit his resignation. Instead, he restrained himself a lot and began to understand that as long as he prepared logistics materials efficiently, he would basically not be scolded. Kurt Lady really hoped that Soldak could shout to him, like this, so that he could give up the challenge directly. The gold coins currently kept in the treasury, in the city hall, are not even enough to pay the salaries of Ritz City's public officials next month. All the reserves that could be mobilized have been withdrawn by Soldak to develop the restaurant plaza converted from the steel workshop. In addition, the Department of Finance currently still has some debts owed before, and there is currently no excess funds to cover them. What Consul Soldak said to Finance Officer Kurt Ladier was, you can leave. But before you leave, plug up the holes that I don't have to repay. I don't care if you use the money from the finance department. Still use your own money. What Serdak did was very barbaric. But it was very effective. Count Kurt Ladier could only pinch his nose and continue to deal with the affairs of the Department of Finance. Without daring to relax at all. Now, the guard camp and city defense and security brigade of Ritz City have long been controlled by Serdak. The one with the strongest fist in the entire Ritz City is the Consul Soldak. After Vice Speaker Glennis was sent to Benna City, currently no noble family in Ritz City dares to challenge Serdak. Go ahead and do it. Serdak, surrounded by these nobles, walked onto the high platform next to the sand table. Everyone, Serdak said loudly. The scene instantly became quiet, and everyone who was chatting and talking closed their mouths and focused their attention on Soldak. Welcome to the construction side here at the Steel Workshop and participate in the exhibition in the catering plaza. Serdak reached out and patted the wooden model with a magic light shield. And then said, I am holding this public exhibition here because many people cannot understand how many benefits it can bring to everyone if it is transformed into a dining plaza. So I need to explain it to everyone. His eyes fell on Baron Martino beside him. And he asked, Baron Martino, can you introduce us to this square? Baron Martino was naturally prepared and immediately stood up to salute Soldak and said, it's an honor, Lord Archon. Baron Martino also held a baton in his hand, pointed at the model of the square in front of everyone, and said loudly to a group of nobles and businessmen at the front, As we see it, the model on this stage is what our restaurant plaza will look like when it is finally completed. In the future, its main function will be to provide a dining place for city residents and foreign businessmen. At the same time, there will be some hotels built here. Caravans who want to go to Makusuo in the future do not necessarily have to go through the portal and enter Makusuo at the first time. There is also a good hotel in Luyite City. Choose. This is a diversified dining plaza. And the Archon hopes that the restaurants opened here will have their own characteristics. 
So our design concept is also that each restaurant has a consistent architectural style from the outside. So that the dining plaza will look like a whole. But from the inside, it has its own characteristics. And different tastes of food from different places will be present. With different decorations. The first thing I need to emphasize is that the main customers of this restaurant plaza are not the poor people nearby. But the businessmen who come here from outside. Also, there are ordinary citizens from the third and fourth blocks. We accept customized restaurant interior design in advance. Which means that when we build this restaurant plaza, if you are willing to sign a lease agreement with us and pay a deposit, we will design the interior according to your ideas during the construction process. Layout. It is worth everyone's attention that this dining plaza has some regulations that were not released in time. One of them is quite harsh. There will never be more than three restaurants of the same style. This means that when renting a restaurant here, you need to think about the future of the restaurant in advance. Once you decide what to do, you cannot change it at will. So those owners who want to open restaurants in this dining plaza, you can come here in advance to make a reservation. As long as there are three restaurants of the same style of food, we will not accept the fourth restaurant to enter the plaza. It's also worth mentioning that the shop fronts in this square are only for rent and not for sale. Now if you have any questions, you can ask me in person. After Baron Martino said this, he looked at the nobles and businessmen around him. Many businessmen listened to Baron Martino's explanation and were about to discuss it. Soldak stood on the high platform in the center and continued. As we all know, starting from June this year, Makuso City's one-year tax-free system will come to a successful end. Next, bulk commodity transactions, whether in Ruth City or Makuso City, will continue in this period. In these days, I believe all businessmen have already made their choices. Before Soldak finished speaking, a businessman in the audience shouted, Lord Archon, does the restaurant in this square accept reservations in advance? Serdak immediately admitted, Of course, the one at the top is priority. Then I want to make a reservation. I'll make a reservation too. For a while, businessmen kept shouting out in the crowd. Those who want to sign a rental agreement can make an appointment with Baron Martino individually after the exhibition. Serdak shouted to the excited businessmen around him. But there was one thing he didn't say. That is, those who want to book a rental restaurant, please prepare a deposit. Chapter 1220 Plane Travel Soldak positioned the consumer groups of the restaurant plaza as foreign business groups and urban civilians. This does not mean that nobility is not entertained here. But these restaurants are not high-end restaurants. Unexpectedly, those who responded most positively and prepared to rent stores were actually some tavern owners. Since the catering plaza restricts similar business projects and can only have a maximum of three pubs at the same time, Baron Martino signed three pubs on the spot, and the pub owner readily agreed to pay one year's rent in advance as a deposit. In Ruth City, everything from street girls to bar girls are legal professions. Businessmen who come from afar, as well as those who come with the business group, are all consumer groups who often visit the tavern. Ruth City restaurateurs prefer to go about their business because they are richer than common people and are willing to pay for good food. But they are not as particular as nobles. Sometimes, it is really annoying for nobles to eat in restaurants. Many nobles are decent people who would rather go hungry than save face. Regardless of eating or not, every procedure must be completed. The whole process is not enough for common people. How many tables have been turned over? The emergence of the catering square will probably avoid these nobles to a large extent. And there will probably be large hotels here which will at least allow some business group carriages to park in the surrounding areas outside the catering square. Otherwise, Serdak will not return if the steel workshop is not completely demolished. The poor people living around it will have to be relocated in a hurry. The exhibition scene in the catering square was very lively, with many businessmen rushing to the front and carefully staring at the models on the sand table. Everyone was discussing the direction of the city gate. The closer they were to the city gate, the more priority they could have to contact foreign merchants. At the same time, they should pay attention to the architectural pattern of the square, hoping to take into account the civilians in the city. These people are no different from those grocery shopping ladies in the free market. They pick and choose and say a bunch of useless things, and finally put down their hands and go to other stores. The more people choose or grab them, the more they feel that's the best. Baron Martino, who was standing in front of the sand table, was actually a little confused. There were obviously many restaurateurs who wanted to pre-rent restaurants in the catering plaza. But Soldak only let go of a quarter of the house, which was announced to the public as catering. The first phase of the plaza can only accommodate so many stores. 
Many merchants who were slower to start failed to grab these stores that should have been in short supply. What Baron Martino didn't expect was that many restaurant owners who had not had time to grab a house to rent, as well as businessmen who were originally not very enthusiastic about opening a new restaurant in this square, saw the storefronts in the square. They were quickly sold out. And instead, they tried every possible means to get their spots back from other businessmen who had gotten them. The scene was so lively that many bosses who got the lease agreement made a small profit by selling the agreement on the spot. There was a row of magic caravans parked on the street outside the steel workshop. Solda could see that the exhibition here was almost in progress. So he asked Baron Martino to call the businessmen who had signed store lease agreements to board the magic caravans on the roadside. Ruder City Hall actually has follow-up activities. It was Baron Martino who wanted to take these businessmen to visit Makuso City to let them understand the current situation of Makuso City. So as to build the businessmen's confidence in the subsequent operation of the restaurant plaza. In fact, not only the businessmen who had obtained the lease agreement decided to visit Makuso City, but also many restaurant owners who had not signed the lease agreement actually took their own magic caravans and slowly follow the convoy and head to the central square of Ruth City. A row of magic caravans crossed the portal in the central square, and the scene was very spectacular. Merchants came to the central square of Makuso. At least half of these merchants had never been to Makuso City after the demon army captured the Ganbu Plain. And they usually came here after hearing about it. The businessmen who came introduced the new city Makuso. But they always listened to other people's discussions. Now, under the leadership of Serdek, the nobles and businessmen of Ruth City collectively came to Makuso City to visit. Only to find that the changes in this city are really extraordinary. The orderly streets are lined with newly planted street trees. There are wooden benches in each small section next to the low shrub tree wall. Trash cans and street lights also appear on both sides of the street. From time to time, two guards will be seen. The knights of the battalion pass by on horseback. The shops on both sides of the street were rebuilt. The brand new shops were next to each other, almost all with large glass windows. The merchants finally looked at the streets of Makuso City, arrived at the shadow of the dining plaza. The street market is crowded with shops. It is obvious that the one-year tax holiday has attracted a large number of merchants to settle in Makuso City. The remaining low-level H, L demons in the Ganbu Plain have become the wild resources that adventure groups and mercenary groups rely on for their survival. And they have also become the goods operated by many business groups. You can buy supplies in Makusuo City. And you can also easily sell the materials of the hunted monsters. It is said that some time ago, an adventure group picked up the remains of a construct knight in Grovet Mountain Ridge. The magic pattern construct was only damaged in three places. Such a large amount of income immediately made everyone in that adventure group, they all got a lot of money. The adventure group began to realize that there might be treasures left behind by Lord MacDonald's army in the mountains, where they finally fell. After a series of searches, the treasure was not found. But the H, L dogs hidden in Grove Ridge were cleared out. The luckiest adventure group even found a three-headed H, L dog that had completed its second evolution. The Warcraft materials on this H, L dog alone were worth dozens of magic crystals. Baron Martino took the motorcade around the busiest street in Makuso City. Serdek also saw the restored scene of Makusuo City for the first time in more than half a year. It looked really clean and tidy, and full of life everywhere. The convoy circled around the main street in Makuso City, and then returned to the central square where the teleportation gate stood. The hourly bell rang from the distant bell tower. After the central square was embroidered, a huge curtain wall was erected not far in front of the portal, and the entire stone wall was covered with a cloth curtain. The shape of the entire dry cloth plane is drawn on the huge curtain in a somewhat exaggerated manner. From a distance, it looks like a high-heeled dance shoe under a woman's feet. However, it also drew extremely detailed mountains and rivers. In addition to these, there were also detailed explanations of many places in the Ganbu Plain. Serdak could tell at a glance that this curtain wall was the Ganbu Plain he proposed half a year ago. A guide map of the entire cloth plain. Unexpectedly, the Minister of Logistics, Erlian, actually made it. Although it is somewhat different from the sand table panoramic model he imagined. It can at least allow people who have just entered the Ganbu Plain to understand what this plain is at the first glance. What does it look like? Soldak took Sia out of the carriage. And under the leadership of Baron Martino. Walked to the high platform with the tour guide's picture in the background. At this time, the central square was almost packed to the brim with the nobles and businessmen from Ritz City and a large number of citizens from Makuso City joining in the fun. 
There is only a passage left at the teleportation door. Serdak strode onto the high platform. Many ordinary citizens of Makusuo City know Serdak. When he captured Makusuo City from the demon army, many people had seen this young city lord. Later, he renovated and expanded the city. Serdak also took Charlie and looped through the streets and alleys of Ruth City. Now when he walked onto the stage, people below immediately cheered. The enthusiastic cheers continued to spread outward, like a huge ocean tide, waiting for people to express their excitement. Soldek raised his hand high, and the central square where thousands of people gathered quickly fell silent. Serdak glanced at the dark crowd at his feet and said on the podium, I hope more people can come to Makuso and take a look around. It's really a beautiful city. Going north, you can go to the Saruoman Plateau and take a look at the beautiful Bella Norma Lake there. If you have the conditions, you can also go all the way north along the Norma River to see the river water formed by melting glaciers. Several waterfalls are formed. Go south and see the collapsed mountains at the end of the world in the Ganbu Plain. If you are lucky enough to encounter a rocky mountain, don't let it run away. Just sell the information to the local adventure group. All the expenses for this trip will be paid. Even if it's settled. When Serdak said this, the crowd below burst into happy laughter. Serdak waited for the laughter to stop before saying again. There is also a vast tropical rainforest to the southwest. If someone can pass through the entire rainforest, they will arrive at Canyon Town, the most beautiful town in the Ganbu Plain. I believe that your trip will be worthwhile. At this time, a loud voice in the audience shouted loudly in the crowd. Lord Consul, after listening to your introduction, even I, a native of Makuso, want to go out for a walk. Serdek pointed at him from a distance and said loudly, Then I want to remind you to pay attention to safety when traveling, no matter at any small town in the Ganbu Plain. Whenever you encounter trouble, you can go to the local guard camp. If any guard camp knight is unwilling to help you, you can all come to me in Ruth City. Of course, I may be very busy and cannot summon everyone who visits me, but you can throw your complaint letters into the mailbox at the door of the city hall. I guarantee that my assistants and I will read every letter. A lecture turned into a question and answer session. Serdak only answered a few questions. Sia, who was standing in the audience, signaled to Serdak that time was almost up. Baron Martino quickly stood up and said to the crowd in the square, Due to time constraints, Lord Consul Soldak's speech ends here. At this time, a fat man who looked like a businessman squeezed forward and asked loudly, Lord Consul, the tax exemption period here is coming soon. What will we businessmen do in the future? Soldak had already walked off the stage. At this moment, he could only stop, gazed at his fat face, and replied, Don't you think you can't do business if there is no tax exemption? The square burst into laughter again. Chapter 1221 Midsummer Soldak stood on the podium. He was about to leave. But after being interrupted like this, he felt that he should say a few words to the citizens of Makuso in the audience. He looked at the fat businessman who was blushing from a distance. When everyone's laughter gradually stopped, he said, In the northern town on the Ganbu Plain, I heard that there is a place rich in gold mines, and on the plateau further north, there will soon be blue-scaled horses, cattle and sheep for sale. I heard that there are also some demon hunters. I went deep into the snowy mountains and collected some precious magical herbs. I think these are precious resources in the dry cloth plain. The Ganbu Plain is about to resume taxation. I know this will affect the income of many people present. But this is something that cannot be ignored. The post-war recovery of Makuso City requires a large amount of continuous investment. This money can basically be raised through taxes. And the operation of the entire city also requires a large sum of money. Huge expense. In this year, I believe everyone has a clear understanding of the trade in Makusuo City. Later, the city hall will implement some new measures for urban development. Since we are talking about urban development, I have to talk about some of the problems that hinder urban development. In order to occupy the Ganbu Plain, the magicians of the Black Magic Monastery opened the Demon Gate at great cost and brought the H.L. Demons here, causing the entire Ganbu Plain to experience a catastrophe. Some people, many relatives died in this disaster, and some people's homes were reduced to rubble in this catastrophe. So, Makuso City Hall will be offering a reward for any information about the Priory of Dark Arts. As long as the information is verified to be true and is something we don't know about, the whistleblower will receive a reward. The Black Magic Hermitage and Black Magicians are not welcome in the Ganbu Plain. Whether you abide by the law or not, please leave here as soon as possible before we discover it. Otherwise, I won't mind nailing you to the stake. 
in the next three months. The Makuso City Guard Battalion will conduct a comprehensive investigation into the remnants of the Black Magic Hermitage in the city. After Serdak finished speaking, the whole square was whispering. Everyone began to discuss whether there are black magicians around them. Soldak raised his hand to signal everyone to quiet down, and then began to say, I saw that main members of the adventure group came to the scene, so I will take this opportunity to formally inform you that the adventure group is welcome to legally hunt monsters in the Ganbu Plain, but slave hunting is prohibited. Once discovered, I will punish you for the rest of your life. Can't live without the dry cloth plain. The square immediately became solemn. Although there has always been a ban on slave hunting in Makuso City, few big figures have publicly expressed their opposition in public. The adventure group had to consider how true and how much of Serdak's words were for show. But then when they heard that the slave market in Rith City had been taken away, it was obvious that Serdak had made up his mind on this matter. After saying this, Serdak walked down from the podium and then boarded the magic caravan. Under the escort of a group of guard camp knights, the magic caravan quickly passed through the portal and returned to Ruth City. The restaurant owners who failed to grab the store in the dining plaza felt a little regretful. The businessmen also felt that this place was worth investing in. The entire city of Ruth was talking about it. When people's attention is focused on the steel workshop area, the land prices here begin to increase rapidly. In addition, land prices in the area surrounding the restaurant plaza are also increasing steadily. Those areas that are not worth mentioning in people's eyes now have basic prices. The residences in the slum surrounding the steel workshops have suddenly become targets for businessmen to purchase. The finance department of Reuter. City received the deposit for leasing the store. And finally collected the salaries that need to be issued to the city hall civil servants next month. Thanks to the rapid construction of the first batch of resettlement houses at the slave market. The first batch of resettlement houses in Makusu were completed in outline in just one week. The biggest advantage of these townhouses is that two households share a load-bearing wall which means that each resident saves a quarter of the wall construction materials. This kind of small building with architectural style appeared in Ruth City. It was the first time for these citizens to see it. Everyone felt that the design of the townhouse was very unique. The most exciting thing for the poor people was that it finally no longer required several households to share the same building. Crowded into one house. Everyone has a separate apartment. And because this type of townhouse is basically two floors with an attic, it actually has three floors of usable area even for the smallest house type. The area of such a house will not exceed 25 square meters. This type of house is basically 3 meters wide and 6 meters long, with a living room and kitchen on the first floor, two bedrooms on the second floor, and a loft on the third floor. The terrace is obviously very spacious for a family of three living in such a house. And there is a 6 square meter private courtyard in front of each small building. The craftsmen led by Luke have already built countless small foreign-style buildings with this layout. The first model room appeared in people's sight in just 10 days. It was built at the entrance of the slave market, with tables, chairs, kitchen supplies, beds, etc. A warm and simple home appeared in front of the poor people. Finally, some people began to marvel. It turns out that a home can be decorated like this. It doesn't cost much, but it looks very warm. With the joint efforts of Luke and Charlie, the construction process of this small townhouse has been optimized and improved several times, and the star of speed has been reduced to almost one month. The poor people living in the small dark rooms of the arena finally began to think about how to decorate their new homes. On the other side, Charlie led a construction team of more than 200 people stationed at the restaurant square. The progress of the project here was also very fast. Finance officer Kurt Ladier was surprised to find that for the renovation of the restaurant plaza, the city hall actually spent a sum of money when demolishing the steel workshop. Almost all the expenses were first advanced by the construction engineering team. And then, the money will be returned to the Makuso first construction engineering team in installments from the rent of the store. Some time ago, the funds in the treasury department's treasury were completely drained. And almost all of them were invested in the slave market resettlement housing project. As the land around the restaurant plaza continues to appreciate in value. As long as the land is sold, the profits will be doubled immediately. However, Soldek is not in a hurry to sell these lands. He also divides the surrounding land into several areas. Businessmen, if you want to buy it, you have to build some buildings according to the requirements of the city hall. At the beginning, Kurt Lady did not think that Soldak could carry out any decent urban projects based on the poor financial situation of Ruth City. However, the prototype of the restaurant plaza has already taken shape, and it has even formed a trend. 
making businessmen feel that as long as they can get a store in the restaurant plaza, they will definitely make money. Moreover, the city hall also holds a large amount of land that is constantly increasing in value. This series of dizzying operations has made the financial officer Kurt Lady a little confused. He was a bit puzzled, although there was still not much money in the treasury of the finance department. And they still had to repay the money for the Makuso, first construction engineering team in installments. How could he still feel that the city hall had made a huge profit this time? Earl Lake Cushing has been having a headache recently. Many nobles have come to see him. Most of these people who come to visit him come to ask him to intercede in front of the consul of Surdek. Everyone wants to do this in the dining plaza. Take a share of the pie. In fact, when the steel workshop was first demolished, this group of people watched the show. He also said that although Archon Serdak was good at fighting, he was a country bumpkin who came from the countryside. Not only did he take a fancy to this pile of scrap metal, but he actually wanted to transport it across dimensions to another territory of his. What's going on now? The land of the steel workshop has been turned into a treasure becoming a piece of meat that many people can't get. In the study, the black tea brought by the maid had lost its temperature. Count Bachkamp frowned, with an impatient look on his face, and shouted to Count Lake Cushing. Old Lake, just say something cheerfully. Do you want to help or not? Earl Lake Cushing frowned, thinking of Earl Bachkamp's support for him in the past, and how he led the members of the House of Representatives to support him countless times despite pressure from all parties. How could I say no to such a little thing now? I will go talk to Lord Consul Soldak about this. Earl Lake Cushing paused and asked, What is the current market value of that land? Now one square meter has probably increased to about one gold coin. If half a month ago, one gold coin could buy ten square meters. Count Bot Camp sighed and said, The nephew of the family voluntarily gave up the inheritance rights. But he wanted to we need to build a hotel on a plot of land next to the steel workshop. So, the land you are encircling costs more than a thousand gold? Earl Lake Cushing's eyes widened. There are no first-level swordsmen among the younger generation. So I plan to sell a set of elementary magic pattern structures. I guess I can just buy such a piece of land. When the old Count Botkamp said this, he felt a little melancholy. I know. There will probably be some restrictions. But I will try my best. Earl Lake Cushing gave an affirmative answer. Old Count Botkamp left with satisfaction. Earl Lake Cushing sighed softly. Once no one in the family fights on the battlefield no matter how deep the foundation is. It will be slowly exhausted after several generations. He glanced at the pile of letters on the desk, and then said to the butler, Prepare the magic caravan. I want to go back to Cilici Town. Having said this, he paused, immediately changed his attention, and said, No, you go buy the ticket for the nearest flight out of Ruth City. I'm going to Benna City to see my daughter. Before I leave, I have to write a letter to Dak. Earl Lake Cushing was sitting in his study. The sun was shining brightly outside the window, and the yard was full of greenery. Now in midsummer, it is a good time for everything to grow wildly. Chapter 1222 Farewell The number 7 furnace has been dismantled, and all the parts that need to be shipped to Doden Town have been packed into large wooden boxes, with detailed details with numbers written on the outside of the wooden boxes. Hamlin was worried that all the parts would become extremely confusing when transported to the installation site in Doden Town. So each wooden box had a unique number and these numbers were carried out in a specific order. Each box part interfaces also have specific combination symbols. Although there are no drawings for the disassembly and assembly of these furnaces, these sequence numbers are their best construction drawings. However, these serial numbers can only be understood by Hamlin and his group of craftsmen. He did all this work himself. Therefore, he needed to personally lead the team to Duo Dan Town in the Belan Plain for assembly. The night before leaving, Hamlin called together the craftsmen of the steel workshop. Not all craftsmen were willing to leave their hometown. This time Hamlin only took with him 43 craftsmen of the steel workshop. These craftsmen were willing to leave their homes. He rushed to buy Lynn's plane purely to solve his embarrassing family situation. With this generous income, at least for a short time, there is no need to worry about life. Tonight is a practice for Hamlin and the craftsmen who are about to go to the Belen plane. So the Uncle Sam's tavern in the slum area is full of craftsmen from the steel workshop. The pub seems very lively. Everyone is drinking ale and chatting. Touching the sky. Hamlin, don't forget to write to us when you get there. Several craftsmen who did not participate in this trip came over. Hooked Hamlin's shoulders. And knocked the foamy ale cup over. The wooden wine glass made a dull sound. Hamlin took a sip of the ale that was slightly mixed with wheat grains. It was obvious that the ale was not filtered that well. I know. 
I've settled down there. And I'll ask you to take my family with you and rush to Milan. Now! We people will go to the front station and bring you good news. Hamlin said to a figure, said the strong craftsman. The craftsman's face was somewhat tangled, but there was nothing he could do about it. He had four children at home waiting to be fed. Although this trip can bring him a lot of income, he is worried that it will be his last income in this life. Then the small family he worked so hard to build was shattered like a soap bubble. His wife became someone else's wife. His children became someone else's children. And the house and savings he worked so hard to save became someone else's property. He didn't dare to gamble. So in the face of favorable conditions, the strong craftsman with good craftsmanship retreated. An old craftsman next to him was very open-minded. And under the influence of alcohol, he said to the craftsman who had given up and rushed to buy Lynn's plane. Last time when those thunder rhino caravans came to our place, I inquired that although it was a small town, there was a large forest that belonged to Archon Soldak, and there were indeed mines there. And how can I say it is better than our living standard? He took another sip of ale and then said, I earn a lot, and my daily expenses are very small. In daily life, wealth is not important. It is said that ordinary families basically have no expenses there. They always buy baked wheat cakes from the bakery for two copper coins each. A piece of wheat cake is enough for an adult to eat for a whole day. And their sheep only cost four silver coins. So life there is very comfortable. Hearing what the old craftsman said, the craftsman who chose to give up the trip to buy Lynn all felt a little regretful. The old craftsman was stared at by so many eyes, and his drunkenness suddenly dissipated. His face turned red, and he said with some embarrassment, But there are also disadvantages. A beast tide breaks out in that place every ten years. It is said that the beast tide just broke out last year. The army of Archon Soldak was stationed there. They resisted the beast tide. Listen, said a lot of people died in the town. The craftsman immediately became frightened. But then one craftsman added at the end. There were also many people who made a lot of money from that beast wave. Hamlin continued. We will help them assemble the furnace. And we will also conduct subsequent debugging and trial operation. When the furnace can operate normally, we can choose to leave or stay there. Uncle Sam, the tavern owner, asked Hamlin. Have you bought all the tickets? Hamlin added a piece of ice and two pieces of pineapple to the glass. Took a big sip. And then said, Tomorrow. We will go to the airport terminal to take the magic airship. A craftsman crowded around Hamlin said expectantly, To be honest, this is the first time in my life to take an airship. I would be reluctant to buy a ticket for two gold coins. The craftsman who had given up going to buy Lynn's plane gathered around, raised their wine glasses to Hamlin and his group and said, Have a nice trip. Everyone. Hamlin also raised his glass with everyone and said loudly, Wait for the good news when we arrive successfully. Um, on a summer night, the cheers in the tavern spread far away. Before Earl Lake Cushing left, he left a letter to Soldak. Dear Duck, I'm very sorry, but I have to leave without saying goodbye this time. The old Count Bot Camp asked me to be his lobbyist. He helped me a lot before, so I can't refuse. If the conditions are the same, please let the scales of Lady Luck tilt slightly to the side. He tilted. He wanted his nephew and the family to run a hotel and needed to find a piece of land around the steel workshop. There are only so many words to intercede. In order to prevent others from continuing to talk to me about these things, I decided to go to Benna City for a vacation temporarily. When everything calms down, I will return to Root. When you are free, remember to help me pay attention to the residents over the mining area. I have been trying to move them out of that dangerous area for the past two years. Unfortunately, due to the poor financial situation of Root City, this idea has never been realized. Handwritten by Earl Lake Cushing. Soldak knew that the nobles would be enthusiastic about the restaurant plaza project. But he did not expect that Earl Lake Cushing would also be involved. But he never expected that Earl Lake Cushing would actually decide to run to Benes City in order to avoid causing trouble for him. Looking at the street scene speeding backward outside the window, Soldak stopped the magic caravan and decided not to see off the craftsman in the steel workshop. Otherwise, seeing Count Lake Cushing on the airport terminal would make everyone very upset. Awkward. The magic caravan was parked on the street, not too far from the airport terminal. At this time, he opened the door and jumped out of the car and turned to a back alley with almost no people on the busy street. After taking a few steps, Serdak jumped up to the roof nimbly. This building was the highest in the vicinity. He stood on the tallest building a few hundred meters away from the airport terminal. He waited for a short while before waving to the slowly rising magic airship. On the magic airship, 
Hamlin, and a group of craftsmen stood excitedly on the deck. They were very curious about everything on the magic airship, and very eagerly hoped that some of the parts on it were made by the steel workshop. In this case, it would definitely be make them very proud. So everyone was looking around, and they even looked for places where there was only metal. But it is very regrettable that the magic airship is a high-end magic product. So even a screw on the airship is not made by Benna. Although no one found the parts produced by the steel workshop. Some people saw Archon Suldak standing on the roof. So the excited craftsmen began to approach the edge of the ship's side. Everyone leaned their upper bodies out of the ship and waved goodbye to Archon Suldak. The people on the magic airship shouted, It's the Archon! It's the Archon Suldak who is waving to us over there! There was a burst of joy on the deck. The deck of the magic airship was so noisy that Count Lake Cushing, who was standing on the ship's observation deck, followed the direction they were looking at and saw Suldak at a glance. Earl Lake Cushing was a little sad, but also a little happy. What was sad was that he left Ruth City in a hurry this time, and no one from his family came to the airport terminal to say goodbye. What was gratifying was that Suldak came in a hurry after seeing the letter. Earl Lake Cushing waved towards Suldak with a faint smile on his face. After Earl Lake Cushing left, Suldak returned to the city hall and specifically asked Thea to find maps and related information about the iron ore area. There are many problems left in the iron ore area, which has also been a concern of Earl Lake Cushing in recent years. The only contribution he wanted to make to Ruth City was due to the embarrassment of the Department of Finance, which has not been able to remove the residents of the mining area from the abandoned areas received from the outside in the mine. There were originally 32 villages and three small towns in the mining area, but those were all when the iron ore mine was operating at its best. Later, the iron ore mines on the outskirts of Ruth were gradually hollowed out, and these dense villages and small towns disappeared little by little. As of now, there are still six villages and one small town in the abandoned iron or area, and other villages and small towns. The towns have become deserted ghost villages and ghost towns. Some collapse events occur every year in the iron or mine area. Every time it rains, it is common for the mining area to subside and crack. Occasionally, people are missing. The old people living in the village often say that this is hollowing out the ground. And this land is a punishment for the residents here. Regarding this kind of thing, Serdak also felt a little helpless, because the abandoned mine was worthless, and the current financial situation of Ruth City was really extremely tight, and it was impossible to spend money to help these villagers relocate, exit the iron ore area. This is not to say that building a house is expensive, but moving them out of the iron ore area will face a series of troubles. For example, if they are allowed to live outside the city, we need to help them buy a piece of land. If they are allowed to live in Ruth City, we need to help them find a simple job that can support their family, as well as a house to live in. At this stage, food etc. Soldek held the dossier and rubbed his forehead in pain. Chapter 1223 Investigation Soldek planned to handle the steel workshop project, and then deal with the remaining issues in the iron mining area, and strive to relocate all the residents there. In order to settle them, they must also consider their future lives. Unexpectedly, there were almost only a few elderly people left in the villages near the iron mine. Almost all the young people came out of the mining area and went to work in the city. Serdak opened a file sent from the guard camp. He just casually looked through the missing people in the mining area in the past two years. He found that the missing people this year had obviously become somewhat abnormal. In the past years, people disappeared in the abandoned mining area, with an average of three to five people missing every year. After all, it was in a special area. The abandoned mining area was full of hidden pits and cracks in the ground. It was normal for one or two villagers to disappear occasionally. But this year, Celia Village, located in the deepest part of the mining area, has lost 12 villagers in a row. In the past two months, the knights from the guard battalion have been to Celia Village six times in a row, and even conducted a large-scale search on the outskirts of Celia Village. Unfortunately, they could not find these 12 villagers. They seemed to be quietly he left the village silently, leaving no trace behind. What makes Serdak even more unacceptable is that there are only two households left in Celia village. One of them is the old Avi and his wife. It is said that the children of the old Avi live in the slums of the city. A few years ago, they also brought old Avi and his wife to Ruth city. Unfortunately, old Avi did not adapt to the life in the city. After the couple barely lived for half a year, they returned to the village again. The other family is a family of five named Crake. 
Crick worked as a miner when he was young and has experienced the period from the glory of the iron mine to its decline. However, the young Crick could still shoot arrows at first. But after the iron or mine closed down, he became a hunter. He hunts wild beasts in the mines all year round. And his income is pretty good. Celia Village is located in the deepest part of the mining area. And Craig still insists on living here. Mainly because he can still hunt valuable prey here. At this time last year, there were still 31 villagers in Celia Village. In the past three months, 12 villagers in Celia Village had disappeared one after another. It was precisely because of this incident that Celia Village was included in the guard camp files. Ordinarily, under such circumstances, the remaining seven villagers should not continue to live in Celia Village. The Knights of the Guard Camp also issued a notice to Celia Village that wild beasts were raging nearby, so that several villagers disappeared in succession. They define all missing villagers as being eaten by predatory beasts in the surrounding mines. But although the announcement has been issued for nearly a week, these two families still live in Celia Village. Moreover, when no one complained at the Guard Camp, the investigation of the missing case was declared over. The culprits were predators in the mining area, and the bones of the missing persons had been turned into the feces of those carnivorous animals. It's really perfunctory. Soldak tapped his fingers on the table, thinking angrily. Sia, who was sitting outside, stopped what she was doing and raised her head to look at Soldak. At this time, Serdak remembered that both Andrew and Samira had now stayed in Doden Town on the Belan Plain. There were no outstanding investigators around them. The knights of the guard camp failed to do anything about this. He was not satisfied with the results of such a perfunctory investigation without finding any useful information. If Samira was here, it might not take long to investigate this matter. At this moment, Soldak suddenly thought of someone who might be able to help. He gestured to Thea and walked into the lounge inside. Just as he stepped into the void gate in the light of the magic pattern array, the next second, Serdak appeared in the lava mine of Pussy Mountain. Serdak walked out of the void gate and happened to see Aphrodite squatting on the edge of the lava pool. She seemed to be using magic to throw something into the lava pool for washing. When she saw Serdak coming out, immediately stood up from the edge of the lava pool, smiled at Serdak and said, I thought you had forgotten this most inconspicuous territory. During this period of time, Serdak did not come here much to visit Israel in the treasure chamber. Well, I just recently took over Rith City and am getting familiar with the affairs there, Serdak explained. Aphrodite turned around, revealing her delicate face. The succubus's face was a mixture of innocence and coquettishness. Her smile was somewhat intriguing and she said, I know. And I've been sleeping very late every day lately. It's really tiring and tiring. Serdak felt even more embarrassed. He couldn't help scratching his head and said, Ahem, I'm here to ask for your help. Aphrodite stimulated Serdak without any pain. And then said, Tell me, is there anything you need me to do? Serdak hurriedly approached and said, Help me investigate a case of serial missing persons in the mining area of Ruth City. Afterwards, Serdak told the general situation of the matter, and he hoped that Aphrodite would come forward to investigate. Well, yes, but what's the benefit of me helping you finish this? Aphrodite asked very simply. Say it, as long as I can do it. Soldak spread his hands and said very generously. Aphrodite's dark purple eyes turned slightly and said casually, I still can't think of what kind of request I want to make. But when I make a request, you can't refuse. Serdak hesitated for a moment, then immediately added an additional condition, on the premise that it doesn't go against my will. Afterwards, the two high-fived. A black halo of magic surged out from the palms of the two men. Aphrodite didn't have any preparations to do. After Serdak took the magic crystal, he went to the treasure chamber to visit Israel over there, and then returned to Ruth City with Aphrodite. The two of them crossed the void gate at the same time, and returned to the office of Ritz City City Hall. Thea greeted Aphrodite cordially, because she needed to go out. Aphrodite wore a magic robe without an emblem, a magic cone hat on her head, and a mithril mask on her face. She looked like a very mysterious person. The alchemist, especially the mithril mask she wore without car facial features, made the mysterious flavor of her body even more intense. Not long after, Aphrodite followed Thea and left Serdek's office. Sia took her to register personal information at the Leite City Guard Camp, and also helped him get a war horse. So Aphrodite's magic robe had a temporary identity badge from the Lut City Guard Camp. She didn't even stop in Lut City, and rushed directly to the abandoned iron mines on the eastern outskirts of Lut City. Chapter 1224 Abandoned Mine At dusk the next day after Aphrodite left, 
Zerdek was having dinner in the dining room of the castle. Today is the day of divine revelation. A very special festival in Rith City. It is said that a great swordsman who lived in Rith City received God's revelation and finally successfully passed through the shackles of the peak stage of the third transformation and became a, a sword master who can travel across the star field. The name of this sword master is Gumbu McDonald. This sword master has been wandering in the outside world for many years, constantly finding several planes, and left the coordinates of one of the planes in Rith City. That plane later became, it is called the Dry Cloth Plane. The people of Rith City were dedicated to the sword Saint Gumbu. So the day when he received divine enlightenment became a special festival in Rith City. Serdak didn't know until he returned to the castle that today was a festival unique to Ruder City. Since it's a holiday, of course you can't just eat on the tea table in the bedroom. And Hathaway also made some careful preparations in advance. Not only was there a huge flower basket on the dining table, but she also bought a piece of plesiosaur neck in the magic shop. Meat. I made Warcraft barbecue for Serdak. As a second level immigrant strongman, Consuming some World of Warcraft ingredients on a daily basis has many benefits in maintaining physical condition. Many nobles also like fresh Warcraft ingredients. Plesius or neck meat is one of the more expensive Warcraft ingredients. I didn't expect that Serdak would see it on his dining table. Hathaway forked almost half of the Plesius or meat onto Soldak's plate. This main course was followed by a chowder made with blue ice deer whip. This is a dish that Hathaway ordered half a month ago in order to make Soldak more effective in the evening. Even the chef, who cooked this chowder was brought back from a high-end restaurant in Ritz City. Of a chef, Serdak was already very full after eating a large plate of plesius or meat. When he saw a bowl of broth with light oily flowers brought to him by the maid, he felt that the soup tasted really good and was just right. It relieves the greasiness of the plesius or barbecue. And there is no cloying milky taste in this soup, which is more in line with Soldak's taste. When Soldak saw Hathaway and Beatrice looking at him intently, he lowered his head to see if there was anything wrong with him, and then asked with a surprised look on his face, Why are you all doing this? Looking at me? What's wrong with me? It's nothing. Duck. Hathaway's pretty face blushed slightly, and she quickly took a sip of sweet wine to cover it up. Beatrice asked without hesitation, Dak, you don't have any other entertainment tonight. Right? No. Sir Dak replied, raising his head to look at Beatrice. Beatrice smiled very happily took out a bottle of golden cider from the basket on the dining table and said to Soldak, I prepared a nice bottle of golden cider. We can destroy it tonight. Before Beatrice could finish her words, she saw a lavender magic circle spreading out from under Soldak's feet. The lines of the magic circle continued to spread outward, forming a huge and complicated pattern in the restaurant. Hathaway ordered to the maids on the side, please step back first. A line of maids immediately walked out of the restaurant. At this time, a door to the void appeared behind Serdak. He hesitated for a moment and then put down the knife in his hand, stood up from the table, wiped the corners of his mouth with a napkin, and said apologetically, Aphrodite must have encountered some trouble. Sorry, I'm afraid I have to go out. One trip. Hathaway and Beatrice didn't have time to tell Serdak. We must come back as soon as possible. Serdak waved towards them and stepped into the void gate. Serdak walked out of the ruins. The ground was full of waste ore, and the cracks in the rocks were filled with grass. A dark mine entrance appeared in front of Serdak. Aphrodite and a middle-aged man dressed as a hunter stood guard in front of the entrance. The hunter did not expect that someone would come out from behind, but he didn't feel anything at all. When he saw Serdak, he was startled. The hunter looked at the badge on Serdak's chest, and his pupils shrank inward inexplicably. Where is this? Serdak stepped forward and asked Aphrodite. Aphrodite motioned to the hunters to guard the entrance of the cave. Pulling Soldak farther away, he said to him, The abandoned mine outside Celia village. This is the last mine in the iron mine. Serdak raised his head and looked at the barren mountainous land above his head. There were two rusted railroad tracks among the weeds in the valley. The hunter stared at the entrance of the mine very carefully, glancing this way from time to time. Serdak looked at the deserted mine entrance and asked Aphrodite, How's the situation here? Aphrodite spread her hands and said helplessly, As you can see now, the current situation is a bit complicated and I can't handle it alone. So I called you over. Serdak looked around in surprise. He knew that Aphrodite's strength must be very difficult to do things that Aphrodite couldn't handle. When I rushed to the village, the two old couples had disappeared. Aphrodite said standing next to Serdak. Although he had had a premonition, Soldak couldn't help but complain when he heard the news. 
if the Ritz City Guard camp hadn't hastily closed the case. Even if they were ordered to leave Celia Village, maybe they would have had a chance to avoid disappearing. Aphrodite pointed to the hunter guarding the entrance of the mine in the distance and introduced to Serdak. This is Crake. He was trying to leave here with his two daughters. His wife and eldest son disappeared the night before yesterday. He was preparing to leave the village with his two daughters last night. He, my second daughter, is about 12 years old. And my youngest daughter is only 7 or 8 years old. I just happened to arrive at Celia Village at that time. And I got to old Avi's house first to make a mistake. I found that they were also missing. So I followed him secretly to see if the murderer would show up again. What did you find? Soldak couldn't help but ask. Skeleton warrior. Aphrodite lowered her voice and said, I saw a skeleton warrior with a rusty sword in his hand running out of the woods and stopped the father and daughter. I'll take action to get rid of that skeleton warrior. She told Serdak what happened last night. Craig sat and stared at Aphrodite with an uncertain expression. His two daughters hugged each other, or rather supported each other, and hid behind the hunter Craig. In the forest, the eyes of the two skeleton warriors had lost their soul fire and their bodies were shattered into white bones on the ground. The two rusty iron knives looked like kitchen knives stolen from a kitchen. Aphrodite had just used psychic whip and directly used her spiritual power to kill a skeleton warrior. For succubi, the method of dealing with undead warriors is relatively simple. Many magics have almost no effect on these undead warriors, such as charm, hypnosis, seduce, psychedelic and so on. These low-level skeleton warriors only act with this instinctive soul fire. Aphrodite stared at Crake without speaking or leaving. She was waiting for Crake to speak on his own initiative. When facing humans, succubi have more methods. It was pitch dark in the forest, and Aphrodite was wearing a mithril mask. Crake was only stared at by Aphrodite for a short while, and his mental defense was completely defeated under Aphrodite's gaze. Are you the magician sent from above to investigate this matter? I know some things, but I need you to send my two daughters to a safe place. After hesitating for a long time, Craig finally said. Aphrodite said readily, Okay, I promise you. She then followed the hunter Craig. Under the protection of Aphrodite, the hunter Craig took his two daughters through the mountains. After walking for most of the night, they finally arrived at a small town. This is one of the only two small towns left in the abandoned mining area. The town has a population of nearly a few thousand and is not a very big town. There are actually grocery stores hotels, and pubs on the streets in the center of the town. Crake was very familiar with this place. Even the tavern was closed at midnight. He knocked on the door of the hotel, settled his two daughters in the hotel, and took Aphrodite back to the village of Celia without stopping at all. Looking at the frowning Crake, Aphrodite remained silent the whole time. It wasn't until he settled his two daughters that Crake showed any signs of anxiety. Crake took Aphrodite directly to the ruins of a mine that had been dug up. Aphrodite stepped on a piece of waste or in stopped. As the sky gradually grew brighter, she asked Crake, Do you know what's going on? Crake lowered his head, and it could be seen that he was struggling in his heart and did not want to tell the answer. Aphrodite said casually, I know you need help. If I don't help you, your wife and eldest son will probably die. Before Aphrodite could finish speaking, the hunter Crake spoke. She has lived here for a long time. I guess she may be a magician. She usually lives in an abandoned mine. She is very thin and never contacts people. The first time I saw her, she she happened to fall on the cliff outside the mine and was injured. So I took her back to her residence. From then on, I would send her some daily necessities every month. And she would pay me a sum of money. Oh, by the way, she is very rich. I never saw her doing anything for a living. But her leather bag is always full of silver coins. Sometimes she would ask me to buy some weird things. Some of them can be bought from the magic grocery store. And some don't need to be bought at all. I would go hunting in the mountains. And if I caught them, I would send them directly. If I couldn't catch them, I would go hunting. Then I went to Red City to buy the things I got. But this job only lasted for a while. And then it became increasingly difficult to find the things she wanted. So I was only responsible for some daily necessities. It wasn't until one time that I saw some bones in the cave. Various animal bones. And many human ones. That I was a little scared. I was very scared. But I was also worried about being discovered by her. One day. I and I my family will be part of those bones. Chapter 1225 Skeleton Where is she? Aphrodite stared at the hunter Crake and asked him. Crake pointed his finger to the valley opposite the grass and said in a deep voice. 
I have been living in a mine cave in an abandoned iron mine. After that, continue to lead the way. The grass here is very dense. And the grass is covered with thorns. Many of the thorns will stick to his clothes when he passes by. But he still chooses to move forward among the grass. There were also some bare gentle slopes on the mountains on both sides. But Hunter Craig didn't choose that side. The magic robe Aphrodite wore was made of very good material. And the thorns could not penetrate the fabric at all. Do you think the disappearance of the villagers in the village is related to her? Aphrodite asked tentatively. Craig nodded and replied. Well, there are many skeletons hidden in her mine. Aphrodite continued. But before this, you have never told the knights of the guard camp. Craig stopped, looked back and glanced at Aphrodite. And then said, I don't dare to expect those knights to do anything. In fact, the most they do in Celia Village is to post announcements. And then right away, seeing Hunter Craig stop, Aphrodite immediately urged. Okay, take me to find her quickly. Craig walked forward without hesitation. Aphrodite reached out and patted his shoulder and said to him, This time, you may die. There was no fluctuation in Craig's eyes, but he said with the last trace of determination. I know. But how can I save my wife and children if I don't do this? I want to try. Aphrodite's eyes glowed red. This was the succubus bloodline's innate ability charm. A magic that could be activated without the need for spells or magic patterns. Have you ever thought about how your other two children will live after you die? Aphrodite asked Craig using her charm. At this moment, Hunter Craig's body immediately stiffened. And he replied as if he was talking in his sleep. Although they are still very young, they can already face their own lives alone. I am not worried about this. The red light in Aphrodite's eyes gradually dissipated, and Craig's body trembled violently, and then he came back to his senses, seemingly unaware of Aphrodite's charm just now. Craig walked in front and passed through a patch of grass. A bare mine appeared in front of him. Only the valley was covered with grass and bushes. The entire stone mountain seemed to have been turned over. All the stones on the mountain they were all pried up artificially, and the abandoned or was scattered all over the mountain. These are poor iron ores. Although they contain some iron, they are not worth throwing into the furnace. Craig explained to Aphrodite in a low voice. This is the last mine in the iron mine. This mine when the cave was abandoned. I also lost my job. So you became a hunter? Aphrodite asked curiously from behind. Craig pointed to the bush-covered mountains behind and said, There are many small animals in this mountain range. The most common ones being pangolins and yellow-tailed lynxes. The nobles living near here like to eat these small mountain animals very much. I happen to know their habits very well. And I know where to place traps. Catching them. That's what I've been living on since I left the mines. Is this why you haven't left Celia Village? Aphrodite continued to ask. Hunter Craig nodded and replied calmly. Yes. Their shadows can only be found in the mountains deep in the mines. And Celia Village is the closest place to these mountains. And I am used to the life here. Although the transportation with the outside world is not very convenient, it is very easy to live here, except for the necessary daily necessities. There is almost no expense here. When he reached the grass in front of him, Craig stopped and did not continue to walk out of the grass. Instead, he pushed aside the thorny grass in front of him that blocked his view. A man-made mountain wall appeared on the side of Bald Rock Mountain not far away. At the bottom of the wall is an old mine. Here we are. That's the entrance. Hunter Craig said nervously. After saying that, Hunter Craig walked cautiously at the front. He carefully pushed aside the grass. It could be seen that he was extremely flustered, but he still gritted his teeth and moved forward. Aphrodite knew that he was not moving forward under his own pressure, but wanted to go in and find his family. It was driven by this motivation that he approached the cave step by step. What I didn't expect was that a woman with a thin face was leaning against the entrance of the rock wall. She was so thin that she almost lost her human shape. If her eyes weren't able to move, she looked more like a mummy. Next to her is a war beast made of bones, which looks more like her mount. There is a chair on the back of the war beast. The woman's face was indifferent. Her eyes showed deep hatred and resentment. Her voice was more like a piece of sandpaper rubbing the bottom of a pot. And there was a weird metallic sound in her voice. Crack, I knew you were unreliable. One day you will bring people from outside here. I have given you a warning, but you still persist in going your own way. You will be punished by me. Right now. Hunter Craig finally couldn't bear it anymore at this moment. He almost collapsed and rushed forward, but was grabbed by a bone hand protruding from the gravel. He couldn't react in time and fell hard to the ground. On the gravel ground, his forehead hit a piece of gravel, and blood suddenly came out. 
Craig wanted to struggle to get up. But two more skeletal hands reached out from the ground and grabbed Craig's body fiercely. Hunter Craig shouted to the woman in despair. Where are my wife and children? Release them quickly. Otherwise, once I get out of trouble, I will go outside to look for those adventure groups and mercenary groups. And I will spare no effort to find a way to get rid of you. Ha! Are you threatening me? The woman let out a shrill and hoarse laugh. She looked at Craig, but she was always on guard against Aphrodite. She heard her say, No one has used it for a long time. He spoke to me in this tone, and I really miss this feeling. At this time, Aphrodite also walked out of the grass. She held a whip in her hand and remained silent the whole time. The woman stared at Aphrodite and saw the magic robe she was wearing. Her pupils narrowed slightly, and she asked coldly, Are you the helper that Craig found from outside? Aphrodite slowly shook her head and said frankly, I am here on behalf of Ritz City to investigate the case of missing people in Celia Village. The skinny woman looked at Aphrodite with a half-smile, and then said, Then you came to me. Do you suspect that I did it? Yes. That's it. So I'm going to take you back to the Leite City Guard Camp for review. Aphrodite said unhurriedly. Ha! Just you? The woman's tone was full of disdain. Aphrodite didn't even see any movement from her. Suddenly, there was a wave of movement behind her. Two pale skeleton warriors emerged from under the stone, stretched out their skeletal hands, and tried to hug Aphrodite tightly. Aphrodite seemed to have a pair of eyes behind her. She didn't even look back. She took half a step forward, tilted her body a little to the left, avoided the grasp of the skeleton warrior on the back right, and threw out the long whip with her backhand. The whip is like a spiritual snake pointing back towards the soul fire in the eye socket of another skeleton. The skeleton warrior instinctively raised his hands, trying to block the whip. Unexpectedly, the long whip seemed to be a living spiritual snake. It actually changed its path midway, turned a little, and tied the hands of the skeleton warrior tightly. Aphrodite did not hesitate at all. She quickly drew a magic circle with her left hand in front of her chest. A dark shadow arrow shot out from Aphrodite's hand and instantly pierced the skeleton warrior's eye socket. The skeleton warrior's eye socket the fire of the soul suddenly went out. Without the soul fire, these bones immediately scattered all over the place. At this time, another skeleton warrior quickly rushed towards Aphrodite, trying to hold Aphrodite in his arms. But unexpectedly Aphrodite suddenly turned around, lifted off the mask with one hand, and unfolded her sex. Lips. A stream of black flame spurted out from her mouth. A strong flame immediately burned on the skeleton warrior's body. And in the black flames, the skeleton warrior's bones immediately began to break. You are not human, the skinny woman exclaimed. Several strong zombie hyenas immediately rushed out from her side. Those zombie hyenas exuded a faint odor, and their fur seemed to be eaten by insects. They were in tatters, and could make people easily you can see the skeleton inside. The eye sockets of these zombie hyenas are also filled with light blue soul fire. At the same time, around the mine, even in the grass outside the mine, there were chirping sounds, and some skeletal hands pushed aside the grass and walked out slowly from inside. On the gravel-covered ground, more skeletal hands stretched out. These skeletal hands seemed to have no vision and were just scratching at the sky. In an instant, the entrance to the mine turned into a ghostly place. Hunter Craig was pushed to the ground hard by those bones hands. Some of the bones hands even scratched his body. And blood flowed out. Chapter 12 26 Battle at the Cave Entrance The charming power released in Aphrodite's red eyes has no effect on zombie hyenas and skeleton warriors. The whip Umi in her hand is also a spiritual weapon that can make people fear. Use it to deal with these undead spirits. It has absolutely no effect. She could only throw a shadow arrow from time to time to knock the zombie hyena to the ground. Just when several zombie hyenas surrounded Aphrodite at the same time, Aphrodite finally untied the buckle on the back of the magic robe, and a pair of transparent insect wings came out. In the buzzing, Aphrodite Frodi's body was suspended in midair, and the zombie hyenas rushing towards him from all sides rushed towards him. Aphrodite swung the Umi wrapped in a layer of black flames, and rolled the whip towards the zombie hyenas. Of course, these undead undead at the lowest level could not withstand the power of the epic weapon. When the whip fell on the zombie hyenas, there was an aura of destruction on the whip, and black scorch marks that were as deep as the bones appeared on the zombie hyena's body. Every time the whip falls, the soul fire in the zombie hyena's eyes will weaken a little. The skeleton soldiers crawling out of the grass are like headless flies that can't find their target. They are crowded together and attracted by Aphrodite's breath. 
they raise their heads and follow Aphrodite flying back and forth in the sky. The ground twists. Aphrodite knew that. So she simply dropped the zombie hyenas and flew towards the woman controlling the undead. The woman's eyes widened. She gathered two balls of light blue soul fire with her hands and recited a spell. The jerky spell carried the aura of death. She inserted her dry and thin hands into her left ribs and inserted them into her left ribs. As she let out a shrill wail, her withered hand pulled out a blood-stained rib from her side. The rib continued to extend in her hand. The one-foot-long rib instantly transformed into a sharp bone spear more than one meter long in her hand. The bone spear followed the woman's gaze and flew towards Aphrodite. The bone spear while flying. It is like passing through layers of space. With white halos rippling, Aphrodite looked at the bone spear in horror. She had no time to dodge. So she could only raise her hand to open a lavender void crack in front of her. She vibrated the transparent insect wings and quickly got in. The next second, Aphrodite was in the air. Right in front of D. A purple space crack suddenly appeared. And Aphrodite emerged from it in embarrassment. The bone spear that flew out also flew into the crack in the void at that moment and disappeared without a trace. The woman covered the blood flowing out of her abdomen and looked at Aphrodite emerging from the void in surprise. She wanted to pull out another rib from her left rib. But Aphrodite wrapped her arm with the long whip she threw out. Aphrodite used the whip to close the distance between the two and drew a magic dagger with her other hand. The woman let out a shrill scream again and several skeleton warriors swarmed around, surrounding Aphrodite. Aphrodite's dagger stabbed the iron knives struck by several skeleton warriors, although it cut off two long knives in succession. It failed to hurt the woman. Aphrodite once again approached and closed the distance between the two of them. Several rusty axes and kitchen knives had already struck the barbed whip. The mantra recited by the woman suddenly became clear, and a white bone armor protected her body. The woman was holding a withered head in her hand, and a staff in her other hand. The fire of the soul has spread to the entire upper body. Aphrodite struggled out from the siege of the skeleton warriors and stabbed the woman with a dagger in her hand, but was tightly locked by the white bone armor wrapped around the woman's body like a vine. Aphrodite had no choice but to stop and take advantage of the bones. Instead of locking the magic dagger, he forcibly pulled the magic dagger back. At this time, skeletal arms appeared again under the woman's feet, grabbing at Aphrodite's floating legs. Aphrodite did not dare to float at low altitude, so she flapped her wings and rushed into the sky again throwing out a shadow arrow. The woman's body was not flexible enough. And the shadow arrow pierced through the bone armor on her body, leaving a bloody hole in her shoulder. The face of the woman with two more wounds on her body looked like a layer of white dust without any blood. And even a trace of blood flowed from the corner of her mouth. The woman looked at Aphrodite angrily, with a ferocious face, and turned around and ran towards the mine without hesitation. Like a female ghost, Aphrodite wanted to flap her wings and chase after her. But she saw her huge bone beast like a mount blocking the entrance of the cave. When she saw Aphrodite flying over, she opened her big mouth like a formidable enemy and attacked her. Aphrodite blocked the outside. Aphrodite stopped quickly. She had no intention of flying into the cave. After spinning around in the air, he found that the skeleton warriors lurking in the grass had disappeared. Aphrodite then landed next to the hunter Craig and cut off the lock with the magic dagger in his hand. Crake's three skeletal arms rescued the scarred Crake from the ground. The woman took the opportunity to escape back to the mine. Aphrodite didn't rush into it. She didn't know how many zombies were hidden in the mine that were not affected by any negative magic. She didn't want to risk it rashly. So she called Serdak, who was having dinner. Serdak learned from Aphrodite that the matter of the abandoned mine was not as simple as imagined. He quickly returned to the castle of Ruth City through the void gate and ran to the back garden to find the two-headed food. The human demon Gulitum asked him to find a familiar guide in Ruth City and lead him to the abandoned mine. He also asked Sia to rush to Makusuo, gather a heavy armored infantry force from the military camp there, and rush to the abandoned mine on the outskirts of Lut as quickly as possible. Then he stepped into the void gate again and reunited with Aphrodite, who was guarding outside the mine entrance. Aphrodite asked the hunter Krek to guard the outside. Soldak held the gothic shield in his right hand and a broad sword in his left hand. He walked carefully into this eerie mine with his waist bent. There was a faint halo of power under his feet, and the broadsword in his hand exuded a faint sacred aura. This sacred power would also emit a faint light in the cave. As soon as he entered the mine, a skeleton warrior hiding in the dark corner of the mine rushed up and cut the skeleton warrior into two pieces with a broad sword. The power of the holy light on the blade almost completely purified the soul fire in the skeleton warrior's eyes. 
The soulless white skeletons were scattered on the ground. Serdak kicked away the pile of bones on the ground with one foot. Open. And continue walking inside this time. Aphrodite followed closely behind Serdak. It seems that this woman is a necromancer. The magic guild is looking for such heretics everywhere. Maybe we can reveal the clues here to the magicians in the magic guild. Serdak walked towards Aphrodite. Said. If I had known that you were going to deal with a group of undead warriors, I wouldn't have bothered to come here. Aphrodite whispered from behind. Chapter 12 27 Necromancer Naomi You don't like the undead? Serdak blocked a skeleton warrior with his shield, waved the holy light torch in his hand, and broke its arm directly. And the rusty kitchen knife also fell to the ground with a clang. The soul fire in the skeleton warrior's eyes was a little weaker, but the remaining arm still grabbed at Serdak. The sharp bone fingers were blocked by Serdak's shield, and a holy light burst out from the shield immediately caused the soul fire in the skeleton warrior's eyes to dissipate. And then the skeleton warrior turned into broken bones. Serdak looked back at Aphrodite. And the succubus was still following where the holy light could not reach. To our succubus clan. These guys are indeed very annoying. Fortunately, they usually live in the underworld and don't always want to run out. Aphrodite followed and said casually, The necromancers are in the green empire. It's considered a pagan to the magic guild. But in fact you should bring a magician here. I suspect that the disappearance of the people in Celia village is related to this necromancer. Aphrodite added after him. Serdak walked in front without saying a word. The mine was long and deep. There were huge decayed wooden arches every not far away to support the mine. The mine extended downwards with some arcs. From the door to the entrance. After walking a few dozen meters into the mine. It became pitch black inside. Serdak held the holy light torch in his hand. And the holy light fire was lit on the torch. He rarely uses this thing. But when he enters the mine, this holy light torch becomes very practical. The warm holy light not only drives away the darkness, but also dispels the coldness and evil thoughts in the mine. Aphrodite also felt a little uncomfortable with the warm light emitted by Serdak's holy light torch. She tried to keep herself as far away from Serdak as possible, and she retreated to the edge of the holy light and darkness. Serdak then saw several zombie hyenas in the mine, but these zombie hyenas and skeleton warriors possessed the holy light in front of the powerful Serdak. He was as fragile as paper. Aphrodite followed behind and remained silent. After a while, she said to Soldak, I have an intuition as if someone led us here. The mine was very messy, with broken bones scattered everywhere on the ground. Going deeper, you can also see some graffiti on the walls. These patterns look like they are recording something. Continuing to walk inside, I finally saw an open mine in front of me and the giant beast made of bones blocked its body tightly in the mine. It was completely sewn together with some white bones and some messy things. The zombie monsters standing together have extremely blazing soul fire in their eyes, and a huge head is filled with fangs made of white bones. Through this giant white bone beast, Serdak happened to see the undead warlock sitting on the edge of the mine. She seemed to be dealing with the wounds on her body. Serdak raised the gothic shield in his hand and approached the giant white bone beast. The giant white bone beast raised its head, as if letting out a silent roar, and then rushed toward Serdak without hesitation. Serdak's shield lit up with a holy light, and the magic pattern structure on his body also lit up with a magical glow. With the power bonus of the magic pattern structure, Serdak waved the holy light in his hand. The torch was smashed down, and a glow of magic patterns emerged in front of him. White hot. The holy light torch in his hand brought up five after images and hit the head of the giant bone beast almost simultaneously. The giant white bone beast didn't seem to be afraid of pain at all, and its head hit Gerda's shield hard. Serdak felt as if a bull had hit him, and the shield slammed into his shoulder. Serdak in pain, he actually took a step back. The giant white bone beast looked much more embarrassed. The bones on its head were smashed by the holy light torch and were shattered. The shield in Serdak's hand even had its teeth shattered on the ground. In front of a second level knight, this giant white bone beast was restrained by Serdak. Aphrodite also took the opportunity to release two shadow arrows. The shadow arrows with black demonic energy hit the head of the white bone beast, and its soul fire suddenly became weaker again. At this time, Serdak injected the power of holy light into the torch. The moment the torch fell, the soul fire in the eyes of the white bone beast dispersed, and the entire beast turned into a mountain of bones, which was instantly scattered on the ground. The woman was leaning next to the mine her eyes full of resentment toward Serdak, and she looked at the mountain of bones with a look of despair, as if she were looking at her own child. There were some skeleton warriors around the mine. These undead souls were all summoned by her, 
The skeleton warrior slowly approached Serdek, with stiff steps. The thin woman also put her hand into her ribs again. Serdek held a sword and shield, blocking the skeleton warrior in front of him, and strode to the face of the necromancer. These daily items were arranged in the cave, and it looked like they should be where she lives, although the environment was a bit dark and messy. What surprised Serdak was that there was no smell of decay or blood around him. Serdak changed the torch in his right hand, and held the broadsword in his left hand, and placed it on the woman's throat. Those skeleton warriors' eyes were filled with soul fire, and they did not dare to approach Serdak again. At this time, Serdak began to carefully look at this mine, which was only a few tens of square meters square, except for the vertical mine shaft in the middle that looked bottomless. The surrounding stone walls were actually filled with some magic. The symbol looks like a blackboard for studying the undead magic matrix. And it looks like there is a wooden house built on the other side. Many bottles, cans, and magic materials were placed on the wooden shelves outside the wooden house. And they looked quite mixed. Serdak stood in front of the woman, looking at her face that was covered with corpse spots. The skin was almost wrapped around the bones and her shoulders and left ribs had some injuries. Her right hand was not covering them. Wound, but wanted to pull out a rib from the body again. Soldak handed the long sword forward, forcing the woman not to move. Before he could ask, he saw two old men suddenly rushing out of the wooden house in the dark corner and looking at them. Wearing patched clothes, he looks like he is a nearby villager. You can't hurt her. She hasn't done anything bad. She's just a poor child. Please let her go. A hunched-over old woman threw herself at Soldak's feet and fell to the ground. Holding Serdak's shoes, she pressed her forehead against the upper of his shoes, her tone full of pleading. Serdak was a little stunned, looking at the white-haired old man still holding a fork in his hand, but his body seemed to be restrained by something. No matter how red his face was, he could not move. Are you old Avi's family? Soldak asked subconsciously. The old woman and the woman both looked at Soldak with doubts on their faces, and raised their wrinkled faces. She was even too old to open her eyes. But she asked tremblingly, Do you know us? I came from Ruth City to investigate the missing persons case in Celia Village. Before I arrived, your family and the Craig family were the only ones left in Celia Village. So I just made a casual guess, Serdak said. You said she didn't do anything bad. Didn't she do the disappearance of people in Celia Village? I swear, it was definitely not Naomi who did it. She would never do such a cruel thing to the people in the village. The old woman said while crying. Serdak did not relax his vigilance. But looked back at Aphrodite behind him. He felt that he was a little thirsty. Maybe the barbecue at night was a little salty. So he picked up the kettle and took a drink of water. Then he looked at the woman whom the old woman called Naomi. And asked, What's going on with the disappearances in the village? You must know better to bring old Abby and the others here. The old woman looked at the skinny woman with pleading eyes and said, Naomi, tell them. What do you want to know? The woman's throat felt like a piece of live coal had been stuffed into her throat. Her voice was hoarse and had a metallic texture. She continued to ask aggressively, Or can you let me go if I tell you? Can I trust you? Why not? I am not one of the law enforcement officers in the Magic Union. I will not be hostile to you until you are sure that you have violated the laws of Ritz City. Now you are just hostile to the population of Celia Village. There is a certain amount of suspicion in the disappearance case. But now, I am afraid that only you can help you clear the suspicion. After speaking, Soldak raised the broadsword in his hand and let the woman lean against the side of the mine so that she could sit more comfortably. Naomi closed her eyes and leaned against the well without saying a word. Naomi. The old woman begged again from the side. Naomi finally opened her eyes. And when she looked at Soldak, her eyes were full of distrust. Okay but you can't reveal it to others. I said this. I can't offend you. And I can't offend them either. Naomi raised her proud neck, although her face looked a little scary. But she was very calm. She continued to say to Soldak, Also, keep your holy light away from me. They are scholars from the Institute of Black Magic Hermitage, a group of fanatical black magicians. I thought your companion was one of those black magicians. So we had a fight at the entrance of the mine. Nah, Omi said weakly, and after speaking, he picked up a bottle of light green potion and drank it for himself. Serdak didn't expect that there was a research institute of the Black Magic Monastery around Ruth City. So he couldn't help but said, I didn't know there was a stronghold of black magicians near Ruth City. Do you know where they are hiding? Naomi nodded slightly. She stood up from the well with difficulty, helped the old woman lying on the ground and said, 
Well, but before you have enough strength, I advise you not to provoke them. And since I have revealed their information, I think it's time for me to leave here. You will let me go. Right. Of course. But there is a prerequisite. That is, it must be verified that what you said is true. Serdak smiled very gentlemanly and said to Naomi, Chapter 12 28 Angels and Demons How do you want to prove it? Naomi raised a somewhat arrogant face. Although her face was covered with corpse spots and even covered with bones, which made her two eyeballs look very abrupt. She didn't care about it at all. Maybe she hasn't looked in the mirror for too long. Or maybe she can't even remember what she looks like. Of course, if you find those members of the Black Magic Monastery, everything will come to light, Soldek said directly, and then asked Naomi. I don't understand why you want to intercept Craig in the middle of the road. I didn't, Naomi replied calmly, seeing that she didn't want to admit it. Soldek said, It's useless even if you don't want to admit it. My people saw it with their own eyes. Naomi looked at Soldak indifferently, her eyes full of paranoia, and asked back, Summoning skeletons is just a low-level summoning technique. Do you think I am the only one in the world who can do it? It's possible that they want to blame this on you. So they divert our attention and direct all the clues to you. Just to want us to have a conflict. Soldak analyzed. Just when Naomi was thinking seriously about Soldak's speculation, Serdak suddenly said, Hey, Naomi. Do you want to join us? I think this matter must be resolved no matter what. And your neighbors don't seem to be very friendly to you. You should at least say something back to them. Serdak added. Think about it. Of course you can also stay in my military camp and wait patiently. Naomi rolled her eyes. Although she was seriously injured. She still held up her withered chest and said to Serdak. I choose to join you. Serdak waved his fist and said excitedly. What a wise choice. By the way. How did you become a necromancer? Naomi leaned down, looked at the mine extending straight down beside her, and explained to Soldek. Probably because of this mine. It's hard for me to explain the specific situation clearly. I met a resentful spirit near this mine. It asked me to help him collect his bones and rebury them according to his ideas. Probably in exchange of benefits. He left me some books. I practiced according to the steps recorded in the books and learned these undead magics. The only troublesome part as you may have seen, is that my body is gradually being transformed into undead. Due to the assimilation of the undead, I have now become half human and half corpse. I don't know how long this state will last. Maybe I will slowly transform into a zombie in the future. She pointed at the corpse spots on her body and then pulled at the thin skin on her body. She seemed to have lost the feeling of pain. Serdak hesitated for a moment before saying, Well, I have a friend who is a ghost lord. I can tell him about your situation. I hope he can help you. Naomi didn't expect that Serdak would say this. And she didn't expect that he would have an undead friend. Thanks. Now that Naomi has decided to join. Soldak thinks there is nothing worth staying here. During this period, Aphrodite had already visited the front and back of the mine. And even inspected the mine. As Naomi said. In addition to some bones buried in the waste or the shaft. And nothing else was found at all. While Naomi was packing her bags, Serdak sat aside and performed a physical examination on old Avi's father, and even used the power of holy light to help the two old men comb their bodies. Naomi, why do you want to live in the mine? Soldek asked. The wound on Naomi's waist had been wrapped with linen strips like a shroud. She put some of the magic materials she could use into her bag, and then she raised her head and said to Soldek, Except there, what do you think about me? Where else can I live? Soldak came closer to her and asked in a low voice, Old Abby, what is their relationship with you? They are my husband's parents. Naomi replied candidly, Where's your husband? Naomi pointed to the shaft and said calmly, In the mine just now. Many people were buried there. I wanted to find his bones and bury them properly. But it's a pity that it took so long to find them. Couldn't find it. When the group of people walked into the mine tunnel and saw the mountain of bones, Serdak said with some embarrassment. Sorry for breaking your big dog. Naomi shook her head helplessly and said casually, You have no idea how much I paid to summon it. Serdak, Aphrodite, Naomi and old Avi walked out of the mine together. Craig saw Soldak carrying old Avi's wife on his back. And old Avi and Naomi were following behind. He couldn't wait to look behind them and found that there were only five people in the team. There was hope on his face. He immediately turned into despair. Ran over to grab Naomi who was seriously injured, and asked eagerly, Why are you the only ones out? 
Where are my wife and children? Naomi knew that Suldak was brought here by Craig. And at this time, she also said sarcastically to Craig. Don't you think about it with your ass? If I did it, why didn't you keep Arlene instead of you? Is it just to let you bring the Bena City Guard Camp to where am I? It turned out that Naomi knew Craig's wife Suldak. And then she remembered that they were from the same village. So it was not surprising that they knew each other. Craig stared at Naomi with wide eyes. Craig, you should really try to be smarter. Naomi patted Craig on the shoulder and refused to talk to him anymore. Serdak and his party returned to the empty Celia village. This village among the grass was about to be abandoned. Many houses had either collapsed or were overgrown with grass. There were only a few sheep intestines on the roads in the village. If he hadn't known that there were still people living here and saw so much weeds, Suldak would never have thought that anyone would still want to live here. Craig's house and Old Avi's house were right next to each other. Old Avi's house is made of stone. The wooden boards and roof tiles on the house have become extremely decayed. But the stone house is very strong. In contrast, Craig's house is made of spliced wooden boards and is covered with a new layer of wooden boards. And the wooden boards are also painted with varnish. So the wooden house looks very good. Serdak sent Old Avi home to rest and was waiting for the heavy armored infantry regiment from Makuso City to join here. Serdak was sitting in the tent and had already drank two bottles of cold water, but he still couldn't suppress the heat in his heart. When he looked at Aphrodite, his eyes could not help but fall on her swollen breasts, and he would look away with willpower. When Thea appears in front of him, it will remind him of the time when he hugged Thea tightly and swam with her in the lake on Bella Norma Lake. It seemed that he had been lurking in the water for too long and could not endure it. When she couldn't help but want to breathe, she even kissed Sia's sweet little mouth. He simply poured all the water in the water bag on his head. But unfortunately it still couldn't relieve the heat in his heart. It is a kind of heat that even the power of holy light cannot purify. Serdak felt that he must have been poisoned by some kind of chronic toxin. In the evening, the heavy armored infantry regiment had been trekking all day and they needed a good rest. Soldak asked the bearded Edgar to arrange for the heavy armored infantry regiment to be stationed. It has been nearly two days since Aphrodite's summons. Although after becoming a second level powerhouse, this summons can last longer. But in any case, this is also a burden for Serdek. So Aphrodite de passed through the void gate and returned to the lava mine. Unexpectedly, Serdek then crossed the void gate and followed Aphrodite back to the lava mine. He told Aphrodite his suspicions. Aphrodite asked him to sit by the lava pool and tried to check him with magic. But the black devil energy in her body and the power of holy light in Serdek's body were like ice and fire. When they come together they melt into each other. Aphrodite's fingers were even burned by the power of holy light. She couldn't help shouting and retracted her hand. The innate ability of the succubus family is charm. So her voice naturally contained a touch of charm. Hearing that voice, Soldak's mind buzzed. Aphrodite's face expands infinitely in his spiritual sea. The almost exquisite face with a hint of charm, and the concave and convex figure are like some kind of fatal curse. Serdak threw Aphrodite down on a wicker chair. Aphrodite was startled by Serdak's rude action. And then she saw the burning desire in Serdak's eyes. And then she turned the fright into a faint smile. And then she stretched her body as much as she could. His hands wrapped around Serdak's neck. When Serdak tried to struggle, his soft lips were like the most delicate rose petals. Imprinted on Serdak's face. The two cobalt slaves guarding the entrance of the lava mine heard strange noises in the lava mine and peeked inside from the entrance. Serdak didn't expect that he would break through the last level of relationship with Aphrodite. But that realization also gave him a feeling of knowing the taste by eating the marrow. He was almost exhausted. But the heat in his body had completely dissipated. On the other hand, Aphrodite was still sitting by the lava pool, with a victor's attitude on her face, and a kind of pride that could not be concealed on her face. What do we think? Soldak said a little embarrassedly. Aphrodite put her petticoat on, turned around and lay comfortably next to Soldak and said nonchalantly, It's not like there has never been love across races before. Inaris and His Highness Lilith had isn't love recorded on a historical monument? Seeing that Serdak was a little confused, he explained, Inaris is a high-level 12-winged holy angel. He met His Highness Lilith on the battlefield. The two soon fell in love. It is said that many Nephilim among humans are their descendants. In fact, this this theory is not so absolute. They may really be the first couple where angels and demons fall in love. But they will definitely not be the last couple. Then Serdak asked worriedly, Are your succubi clan monogamous? What do you want to do? Aphrodite stared at Soldak and asked with a strange look. 
Serdak didn't want to accidentally cause a murder or something. He tried to wrap his arms around Aphrodite's soft and slender waist from behind and said drowsily on the wicker chair, Why don't you just sleep? If you sleep for a while, it will be dawn. Chapter 1229 Entering the Mountain By the time Gulitam arrived at Celia village according to the map, it was already the next morning. The low thunder in the sky keeps roaring, and the dark clouds cover the sun. Although the wind is not that cold in this season, in the mountains of this mine, the cold and wet wind blowing on the face will make people feel uncomfortable. A sticky feeling. It is estimated that the two-headed ogre brothers had to run all the way and spent a whole night to get here. But they seem to be in good spirits. Especially since they happened to be in time for breakfast. Serdak brought some canned lunch and meat, and almost half of the pot of porridge cooked together with military rations went into the two-headed ogre's belly. Hunter Craig ate this cereal-like military ration for the first time. Because it was mixed with some lunch and meat, he thought it tasted pretty good. He ate it with gusto while holding a wooden bowl. He was probably worried about his wife and eldest son. Who would eat it? Started packing after breakfast. Naomi didn't eat the breakfast prepared by Suldak at all. She ate something like dry moss. Which she just stuffed into her mouth in a hurry. Suldak didn't see what it was. However, the injuries on her body healed quickly. Although her ribs and shoulders were still wrapped with shroud-like bandages. At least these injuries did not seem to affect her movement. When Naomi saw a two-headed ogre approaching in the morning, her cold, dead eyes almost narrowed into a thin line. Serdak did not rush into the unfamiliar mountains, but waited in the village of Celia until noon that day, when Sia and the bearded Edgar led a heavy armored infantry regiment of 1,500 people. When we arrived at the abandoned mining area, we began to plan how to enter the mountains, looking at the mighty heavy armored infantry soldiers. Even Crake was too frightened to move casually. Under Soldak's arrangement, the bearded Edgar left a scout team. This scout team would send the old Abby and his wife to the nearest town. So that the old couple could meet with Craig. The two daughters stayed temporarily in that hotel. After arranging everything, Soldak followed Naomi and Craig to the mountains at the back of the mining area and rushed to the research institute built by the Black Magic Hermitage in the mountains. Craig was familiar with this area. The heavy armored infantry soldiers walked all the way along the mountain road and could always find a relatively easy road in the barren ridge. Naomi summons a zombie hyena and uses a certain smell to find the Priory Institute of Dark Arts. It was already afternoon when the team set off, and they continued until dark. According to Craig, it was still at least half a day's journey from the Research Institute of the Black Magic Monastery. It was difficult to walk on the mountain road at night. Serdak knew that the heavy armored infantry regiment came here overnight. These infantry soldiers basically didn't get much rest all day and night. So they looked for a suitable place to camp early. The infantry regiment was stationed here. But at night, Naomi became more energetic again. Aphrodite walked out of Serdak's tent, glanced at Serdak first, and then said H, low to Gulitam and Thea very casually. When Thea saw Aphrodite, although she didn't notice any changes in her, the feeling Aphrodite gave her was indeed somewhat different. Although she wears a black magic robe and a mithril mask, which makes her look mysterious and sexy, she seems to be less frivolous and exaggerated now. Thea knew that this succubus, who had been staying in her hometown for a long time had won the trust of Serdak. She rarely appeared in front of outsiders. This time, Serdak called her over because he had no helpers around. She knew that after the two signed a magic contract, they were able to cross the void with each other. This was what Thea envied the most. After the bearded Edgar assigned the night duty, he came over and reported to Soldak on the situation of the heavy armored infantry regiment. Serdak gathered everyone around the campfire. Serdak asked Craig. Craig, how far are we from the monastery's research institute? Hunter Craig pulled out a burnt stick from the fire, stamped out the open flame with his shoe, knocked out the coals, and then drew a few strokes on the ground. His face was completely covered with worry. His eyes were bloodshot, and he looked a little tired and anxious. If our current location is here, then this is a mountain ridge. We need to climb over here tomorrow morning to see the hiding place of the scholars of the Priory. In terms of distance, at least we have to walk up the mountain. It's half a day's journey. And these heavy armored infantry aren't crossing the mountains very fast. So they probably won't arrive until tomorrow night. Hunter Craig said. He seemed to have thought about this path countless times and spoke it fluently without thinking. Serdak nodded and then said to Gulitam, You stay here in the camp tonight and deal with emergencies with Thea here. I plan to go to their hiding place with Aphrodite to inquire about the situation. I know. Boss. You have to be careful, the two-headed ogre reminded Serdak. Don't worry, 
with Aphrodite here, there won't be any problems. Serdek first said to Gulinum, and then said to the hunter Crake, Crake, this time you act with us, and if conditions permit, I will try to rescue your wife and son, but the prerequisite is that they are still alive. When Crake heard what Serdek said, the hand holding the fire stick shook suddenly, and the fire stick fell to the ground, causing some sparks to fly from the completely extinguished stick. Soldak wanted to say something to comfort him, but unfortunately, he was brewing silently in his heart for a long time, and didn't know what to say to him. Aphrodite glanced at Naomi with a calm expression. Naomi looked a little weak in front of the bonfire. At this time, she took the initiative to say to Soldak, I will go with you too. I can keep up with you. Soldak asked again, Are you sure your injuries are okay? Well, don't worry. I won't hold on. Naomi felt a little warm in her heart inexplicably. Even if the old Abby and his wife seldom said anything to her about this kind of concern. Most of the time, she faced the pain and loneliness alone. Living alone with skeletons and zombies. Now she has become neither human nor ghost. However, she was a woman with a strong character. And even so, she never thought about dying. Okay, let's set off now. Soldak decided immediately. Chapter 12 30 Skeleton Resurrection When Soldak stood up, a faint holy light actually emitted from his body. Although Naomi hated that kind of blazing light, she still pursed her lips and followed. Later, she discovered that the black magician wearing magic robes in the team also disliked it. But she chose to stay away from those lights. Naomi followed her example and stood on the edge of light and darkness. As expected, that kind of the faint burning sensation is gone. In just two days, her injuries had completely healed. This is also one of her abilities to become a necromancer by eating a kind of moss. Cemetery moss, which can only be found in cemeteries she can speed up the healing of her semi-undead body. Seeing the woman wearing a mithril mask in front of me, it immediately reminded her of the undead magic skill of Bone Spear that she had learned in the Book of the Dead. This Bone Spear is very powerful and is almost her strongest weapon. The only drawback is that the casting conditions are very harsh. It requires the caster to intercept a bone from his own body, pull it out abruptly, and then attach it with magic to form a powerful Bone Spear to deliver a fatal blow to the enemy. It's just that no one can do it. Cut out a bone from one's own body and pull it out. The pain of peeling off the bones and flesh will make people faint countless times. But this is undead magic. For the skeleton warriors or zombies of the undead clan, it is relatively simple to peel off a bone from their own body. Naomi learned the bone spear only after the essence of her body changed. After she became half-human and half-corpse, her body lost its basic sense of pain. And her rigid body became stronger. The flesh flesh and bones of her body were no longer so closely connected. She could barely pull out six ribs from her abdomen. She thought she could easily defeat the black magician wearing a mithril mask with the bone spear. But what Naomi didn't expect was that this black magician could actually cut through the void and make a short distance void jump. The bone spear flew into the void along the gap, lost contact with her, and easily cracked her bone spear. This was what Naomi was most afraid of. She looked down at her limbs that had become extremely stiff. Although she was a little uncoordinated when walking, she could feel the power contained in her body. Aphrodite! Naomi! The two shook hands. Naomi even imagined that when the two shook hands, there would be a new round of competition. But there was none. Although the touch of her hand had been reduced to the point where it was like wearing thick cotton gloves, she could still feel the softness of that hand. The only thing that made Naomi a little dissatisfied was that she felt that Aphrodite's attitude was a bit condescending, which made her a little disgusted. But at the same time, she could also feel the kindness conveyed by this black magician. And those beautiful purple pupils seemed to be able to speak. Her eyes must be very good at talking. She just used them to communicate with herself. Naomi thought for sure. And then looked at Aphrodite very warily. Crake walked at the front of the team. Under the dark night, his face was a little uncertain. The complicated and tangled thoughts made his face look a little ferocious. He felt that the three people standing behind him were like three powerful monsters that chose to devour anyone. And the dark mountains in front of him were more like a giant kun with a huge mouth, waiting for him to crash into them. If he hadn't wanted to take a look at his wife and son, the best choice would have been to dive into the dark bushes and sneak away while he had the chance. He stared blankly at the dark mountain road in front of him, not wanting to take another step forward. He was also a little eager to see his wife and son being detained so he could only fumble forward based on his memory. This mountain was extremely familiar to him. Even every tree and stone is imprinted in his mind. 
That's why he could walk quickly on the mountain road. But no matter how fast he stepped, the group of people behind him could keep up without making a sound. He wanted to get rid of the three people behind him and throw out the magic signal in his hand. Then he could be regarded as completing the task assigned to him by those people. Craig felt an inexplicable fear in his heart. He felt that he might not survive this time. Although he didn't want to die at all. What could he do? I thought that since I chose this path in the first place, I knew that sooner or later such a day would come. He had already seen the sentry post hidden in the dark ahead. But unfortunately, he had no chance to secretly release the signal in his hand. He thought that his two daughters were still in the hotel in the town. So he did not dare to act rashly. But when he thought of his wife and son, he couldn't help but reach out and touch the magic flare in his arms. This kind of magic flare can form a bright fireworks in the night sky. Once launched, he is destined to be completely exposed. Walking forward quickly, he tried to throw away the three people following him on the rugged mountain road. But it was of no use. No matter how fast he walked, the three people could follow him almost effortlessly. Finally, Craig saw him again at the fork in the road ahead. He reached a sentry post. But he still failed to send a signal to the magic sentry post. It's not too far from the Institute of the Black Magic Monastery. If it hadn't been at night, you might have been able to see the stone buildings halfway up the mountain. Craig quickened his pace and quickly approached the area. As he kept getting closer, he was still thinking about how to give the other party a warning and maybe see his wife and son this time. At this moment, a shadow arrow penetrated the dark night, like a bright ray, directly passing through Craig's body. He saw black fire igniting on his body and a black hole the size of a fist was burned through his chest. The severe pain spread throughout his body instantly. He let out a hysterical wail and knelt down on the rugged mountain road. When he raised his head, Craig saw several black magicians standing on the top of the tree in front of him. Although they were far apart, and it was a dark night, it was impossible to see their specific appearance. He covered his throat with his hands, whimpering from his mouth, devoured by the black flames. He could no longer make any sound. His eyes widened, feeling the fear at the moment of death. Black flames had spread all over his body. Although his clothes showed no signs of burning, he could feel his soul drifting away little by little. He wanted to extinguish the black fire on his body, but found that his consciousness could not control his body. Then, he saw his body throwing forward and falling firmly on the mountain road, and the last ray of his soul drifted away like smoke. Aphrodite! Serdak, who was following Craig, shouted, at the same time as Serdek warned, the magic robe behind Aphrodite had broken open. Under the violent vibration of a pair of insect wings, she easily flew into the night sky, completely hiding her body under the night sky. The holy light torch in Serdek's hand whirred and was lit by the power of holy light. He held the shield in his hand and rushed towards the black magicians on the opposite side. The black magician standing on the top of the tree seemed to have been prepared, and shadow arrows fell one after another. Serdek raised his shield to meet him. A flash of silver light burst out from the shield, and all the shadow arrows dissipated under the holy light. Naomi drew the magic pattern circle, and a skeleton warrior stood up from the burning black flames, holding the bow and arrow carried by Crake in his hand, and his eyes were burning with dim soul fire. At this time, the skeleton archer opened the forest bow and shot toward the treetops under the cover of night. The black magicians from the monastery actually refused to fight, and immediately rode on their magic harpoons and slipped away from the tree. When Suldak and Naomi caught up with them, Aphrodite was already waiting there, without the hunter Krek, who was familiar with the terrain here, to lead the way. Even if he could see a knight, Serdak had no intention of moving forward. They discovered it, and this infiltration plan failed. Since they don't want to fight with us, and are so eager for us to catch up, that I can't do what they want anyway. Let's withdraw now. Serdak put the shield back on his back, and said to the other two people, Aphrodite landed firmly on the ground, glanced at the burnt meat, frowned and asked, What should he do? Do we want to take him back? Those black magicians seem to know that it is Craig who is leading us. So that means they know each other. Serdak walked to the body of Craig, which had been blown to pieces, covered his mouth and nose and said, Craig's bones have been extracted by Naomi and turned into a skeleton archer. Then let's take his bones back. It should be able to walk back on its own anyway. Naomi said coldly, and then issued an order to the skeleton archer, who stood firmly beside Naomi. I always felt that something was wrong. Now I think about it. Craig should be connected with the black magicians of the Black Magic Monastery. Or he was originally an outsider of the monastery. 
This time he took us to sneak in here. They must have been misunderstood by those magicians. So those magicians killed Crake immediately, and then left quickly. Aphrodite stood next to Serdak and whispered. Serdak glanced at the brand new skeleton archer and said nothing more. He just felt that Naomi's fighting method was really scary. Chapter 1231 Manor This night attack plan failed. Not to mention that he failed to infiltrate the research institute of the Black Magic Monastery. Hunter Crake was still alive when he left. When everyone returned to the camp, he had become a skeleton archer, standing obscenely on now behind me. The weak soul fire looked like it might extinguish at any time. Thea's eyes widened, staring at the skeleton archer with almost no trace of flesh on his body. The white bones were even covered with some black rune marks. Why did he suddenly turn into a skeleton? She asked. She had a good impression of the hunter who looked worried when he set off. But she didn't expect that he had turned into a skeleton archer in the blink of an eye. After Serdak explained to Sia, the mermaid girl sighed softly, like Aphrodite. She didn't expect that the hunter Crake was actually an outside line of the Black Magic Priory Research Institute, specializing in providing them with outside intelligence. And his wife and son were taken away by the Black Magic Priory. The Black Magic Priory is conducting a series of recent operations. This approach of using family members as hostages can better ensure the loyalty of these outsiders. However, it was due to Serdak's reconnaissance operation that Craig failed to pass on the information in time, but was discovered by the investigators of the Black Magic Hermitage, who intercepted Craig halfway. After daybreak, Soldak led the heavy armored infantry regiment to continue marching deeper into the mountains, this time without Craig leading the way. Although the mountain road became less easy to walk, they headed directly towards the Black Magic Priory Research Institute. There are two magicians, Thea and Aphrodite, in the team. Although one is a Naga and the other is a Succubus. Both of them have magic handles and can fly in the air on magic handles. In fact, Serdak has always wanted to ask Sia what it feels like to fly in the sky. After all, she is a Naga. Flying in the sky has always been something that birds can do. Now she can also take a short flight on a magic harpoon. Compared with the wider sky, how different is the sea where she used to live? Now that the team has magicians who can detect in the sky, and the heavy armored infantry regiment enters the mountains. Serdak doesn't have too many worries, and the army goes straight into the depths of the mountains. This time, the bearded Edgar came from Makuso with the most elite heavy armored infantry regiment. The logistics regiment didn't even have time to organize. But for Soldak, this was nothing. After all, in Pudu Mountain in the sulfur mine camp, all kinds of supplies are fully prepared, and they are enough for temporary emergencies. The heavy armored infantry regiment walked in the mountains for more than half a day. From a distance, they saw a green wall built on the top of the mountain opposite, and watchtowers were built around the wall, in order to confirm whether this building complex was the research institute of the Black Magic Monastery. Thea and Aphrodite flew over at the same time to investigate. The two of them circled around the castle built on blue rocks, but found no signs of magician activity. Instead, they found a large number of archers on the castle watchtower. Moreover, there are a large number of infantry soldiers in this castle with few high-rise buildings. It looks like it should be a lord's private domain. Sure enough, at the foot of this mountain ridge, the scout team of the heavy armored infantry regiment discovered a neat row of boundary markers in the forest. Almost every 500 meters, there was a block marked Count Petunia's private domain. In addition, the boundary monument still bears the inscription that this territory has existed for more than 300 years and a group of cavalry was waiting next to the boundary monument. Seeing Soldak approaching with a heavy armored infantry regiment, an officer on a horse lifted the visor on his helmet and faced Sue Erdak and his party shouted from a distance. You can't go any further. The front is Lord Petunia's territory. Serdak turned back and asked Sia. How come I haven't heard the name of this earl in Ritz City? This earl Penny should not be a noble from Ritz City. Thea frowned and thought for a moment before saying to Soldak. You mean we have arrived at the boundary of Ritz City? Serdak turned his head and looked at the boundary markers between the woods and said, That seems to be it. Thea jumped down from the handle of the magic pot and said to Soldak. Serdak rode forward and said casually to the officer, My people found traces of the black magic hermitage nearby. So they kept following the clues. We didn't I found any residents nearby. And when I saw a group of buildings here, I wanted to come over and check it out. We don't know anything about the black magic monastery. But if your army wants to step into our place, it must get permission from Lady Petunia. Otherwise, we will think that you are invading us, and we will have the power to fight back. Power. 
the officer didn't want to talk to Soldek at all, and directly handed over a string of official language. Serdak nodded and waved to the army behind him. Bearded Edgar immediately asked the infantry soldiers of the heavy armored infantry regiment to camp in this woodland without taking another step forward. Do you know what kind of punishment the lords of the Terrapagan area will face if they have an affair with the Black Magic Hermitage? Once verified, they will be punished for rebelling against the Legion. Serdak faced that person, said the Lord Officer standing next to the Boundary Monument. The officer said without fear, We have not received any notification from the military here. While talking, another group of swordsmen came from the opposite castle in the woods. The army on the opposite side increased to 700 people, 500 cavalry and swordsmen and more than 200 archers. Now the two sides were at the Boundary Monument. There was a confrontation nearby, with no intention of retreating. Serdak did not forcefully rush into Count Penny's territory, but led everyone back to the camp to rest. Back in the camp tent, someone had already boiled a pot of boiling water outside. At this time, someone actually helped Serdak make a pot of black tea. Serdak held a cup of hot tea before asking Thea and Aphrodite, How about it? Did you notice anything unusual about that castle in the sky? Aphrodite shook her head and said, No, that castle looks normal from the outside. There are nearly a thousand troops stationed in the castle. Most of the troops in the castle are currently deployed next to the Boundary Monument, as well as some civilians. There is a large valley on the other side of the mountain. Wheat fields. There are many farmers in this castle. At least several hundred. Serdak glanced at Thea, and she also agreed with Aphrodite's statement. But Serdak soon discovered a problem. You mean there are nearly a thousand troops stationed here? Serdak asked Aphrodite. Thea and Aphrodite nodded at the same time. Soldak turned to the bearded man and asked, Edgar, what do you think is a reasonable number of troops stationed in a manor with hundreds of farmers? Bearded Edgar was once a high-ranking officer of the rebels in the Ganbu Plain. He once managed five camps of the rebels. Regarding Serdak's problem, he could immediately find the problem. No more than 200 people so that the estate can be affordable. Edgar replied without thinking. Serdak nodded and concluded. They don't seem to have any problems. But they block us here and don't let us go to investigate. That's the biggest problem. He glanced at Aphrodite and said. The officer who came forward was just a first-turn swordsman. In order to confirm my guess, I plan to go to the castle with Aphrodite tonight to investigate. Sia, who was sitting aside, immediately said. Duck. Take me with you this time. Thea's eyes widened, and she acted like I was very useful. Serdak thought for a moment, and then agreed. You can go if you want, but you must always stay with me, and you can't act without permission. After hearing what Soldek said, Sia hurriedly agreed. Okay, I agree. Serdak had to wait until dark before he could act. Before that, while there was still some time, in order to avoid Rith City from worrying about his safety, he asked Aphrodite to cancel the summoning spell. In a lavender glow, Serdak passed through the void gate and returned to the castle in Lut City. Returning to the castle restaurant, the entire room seemed empty. The long indigo wood dining table was decorated with exquisite tablecloths and flowers. But it seemed that no one was eating here. When Serdak walked out of the void gate, he happened to see four maids carrying dinner plates and chatting in low voices along the way. He walked out of the kitchen, past the main dining room, and went upstairs along the outer corridor. It seems that it should be sent to the bedroom. Hathaway and Beatrice usually dine in the living room, outside the bedroom. The coffee table there is very suitable for two or three people to dine together. Soldak chased after him, took the silver plate from a maid, and asked them a few questions in a low voice. As he suspected, these delicacies were prepared to be delivered to Hathaway and B. in Triss' room. So Serdak followed the four maids, carrying the dinner plate into the bedroom with dignity like a waiter. Hathaway and Beatrice were in the living room, outside the bedroom. The former was sitting on the sofa and looking at a stack of documents, while the latter was reading a biography of the ranger. The two were even chatting without a word. Hathaway asked the maid to put the dinner on the coffee table without raising her head. When Soldak came over, Hathaway realized that something was wrong. The sense of oppression was not something that a maid could have at all. She raised her head suddenly, only to find that Soldak was placing the dinner plate on the coffee table without saying a word. Duck, you're back. Hathaway stared at Soldak with surprise and said. Soldak quickly stood up straight, opened his arms, and gave Hathaway a big hug. Beatrice also cheered, jumped up from the sofa with bare feet, and threw herself into Soldak's arms. I just took the time to come back to report that I am safe. So as not to worry you, I will have to return to the abandoned mining area later. 
We found a hiding place of the Black Magic Hermitage there. But it has not been confirmed yet. It must be there. The stronghold of the Priory of Dark Arts. Soldak told Hathaway what was happening in the mining area. The three of them sat on the sofa, enjoying dinner and chatting about the situation in the abandoned mining area. Serdak originally planned to recruit a group of knights from the guard camp in Rith City to support the scene. But after having a dinner, it was too late to go to the guard camp to mobilize the knights. He could only write a few notes with his own hand, stamped his seal on them, and asked the steward to send someone to the city hall of Rith City. After all, the Archon of Rith City disappeared inexplicably for a day, and the city hall must have been in chaos. Soldak had a dinner carefully prepared by Hathaway in the castle, and then returned to the camp before it became completely dark. Under the night, Soldak led Thea and Aphrodite through the dense forest, bypassed Lord Penny's army guarding the boundary monument, and sneaked into the forest here. As for why he brought Sia with him, Serdak actually had a very simple idea. Once they encounter irresistible danger, both Thea and Aphrodite can easily escape from danger under the cover of night by riding on magic harpoons. This is the reason why he is willing to bring Thea out. For himself, as long as Aphrodite can leave safely and immediately revoke the summons to him, he will return to Red City through the Void Gate. The biggest advantage of this kind of battlefield call is that once in danger, you can quickly evacuate the battlefield. It is actually not too difficult for the second level powerhouses and succubi to walk through this forest. Sia is following behind Serdak. Sometimes when encountering difficult mountain roads, Serdak will carry him on his back. A short walk from Sia. Because the three of them had extremely clear goals, they didn't stop to rest much along the way. After Soldak successfully climbed a mountain rock, he saw the green wall of the manor. Perhaps it was because there were no two tall buildings in the entire manor at the top of the mountain. This time Aphrodite relied on her wings to fly quietly to the top of the watchtower. On the watchtower, there were originally four soldiers keeping vigil. These four people were discussing in a low voice tonight's monotonous dinner on the top platform of the tower. Aphrodite flew up silently, with a huge eyeball floating above her head. The eyeball looked at the night watch warriors one by one. The warriors hardly made any struggle before plopping down on the watchtower. Serdak climbed up the watchtower along the outer wall, carrying Sia on his back. The three of them squatted on the watchtower, observing the manor in the night. Both Serdak and Thea were blessed with insight, and Aphrodite could see at night. Day or night had almost no effect on them. As expected, more than half of the manor's space was occupied by legions. Inside the exceptionally neatly built dormitories, there were still some soldiers coming in and out. Opposite the military camp is the residential area of farmers. And their houses are much simpler. But these are also houses built of bluestone. At night, the atmosphere in the entire manor seemed a little tense. Everyone walks very quickly. At this time, Aphrodite had already selected one of the four night warriors. After waking him up from hypnosis, he charmed him and then started asking questions one by one on the watchtower. The Situation Inside Chapter 1232 Exploration The warrior wore a set of light armor and leaned against the bluestone wall. His eyes were slightly open, but his pupils were dilated. He looked very young, with a thick layer of down just growing on his chin and lips. He looked like a young man serving in the military here. Many lords will recruit young people over the age of 16 in their territories to join their private armies. According to the laws of the Green Empire, all male citizens over the age of 16 are obliged to serve in the military for four years. However, this rule does not say that it is not allowed. Young citizens join the Lord's private army for military service. So many lords will have such a group of young warriors. In order to ensure the effect of the charm, Aphrodite took off the mithril mask, stared into the warrior's eyes, and asked him, Who are you? There was a mysterious aura in his voice and the soldier replied with a confused look on his face. Andy Jenner. Aphrodite asked again in an unusually smooth voice. Where is this? The soldier answered immediately without any hesitation. This is Eusebius Manor. Who is the owner of this manor? Aphrodite continued to ask. The soldier also replied calmly. Lord Petunia. This is almost identical to the information obtained during the day. How many troops are there here? Aphrodite asked again. Five hundred swordsmen. Three hundred cavalry and two hundred archers. The young warrior showed struggle and pain on his face. And after a while, he said slowly. Aphrodite asked him, Have you seen a black magician here? There was a struggling expression on the young warrior's face, as if he was about to wake up from a deep sleep. However, after struggling for a while, he could not open his heavy eyelids, and finally fell into a deep sleep. No, 
The sleeping warrior replied quietly. The huge eyeball floating on Aphrodite's head also dissipated at this time. Aphrodite stood up and put the mask on her face again. He only knows so much, Aphrodite whispered. Serdak nodded, and the three of them walked down the stairs inside the watchtower. There was also a lounge inside the watchtower. The three of them carefully passed by the doorless lounge and found that someone was sleeping inside. While playing cards, almost no one noticed them. Walking into the manor along the watchtower, there was a flat street in front of them. The three of them walked close to the shadow of the street for 200 meters. There were almost ordinary houses on both sides of the street. And there were no shops. When they walked out on this street, I discovered that I had actually arrived at the gate of the garrison camp. There were two guards guarding the gate. Opposite the military camp, there is a stretch of dilapidated houses. Although those low houses are built of bluestone, their roofs, doors and windows are all made of wood. And they are very rough. There are even some wooden doors with some bark on them. And the roofs are also just lay some branches and thatch. Only a few rooms could still see some light. The three of them walked into this residential house and could occasionally hear chatter coming from the house. Aphrodite randomly picked a farmer's residence, opened the courtyard door, and walked in. As a magic pattern appeared under her feet. After a lengthy spell, a cloud of mist spread from around her body. Sleeping cloud? When the surroundings were completely quiet, Aphrodite gently opened the wooden door and walked into the house as if she were walking into her own home. The furnishings in the room are very simple. And there is no distinction between a living room, a bedroom, and a kitchen. There is a set of wooden tables and chairs at the door. And tableware and black iron pots are placed on the shelves next to them. There are two beds at the end. And one bed is lying on it. There are two adults who seem to be the master and the hostess of the house. The other bed has two floors. The lower one is an older boy, and the upper one is a smaller girl. They all slept soundly and breathed evenly. The boy was snoring slightly, perhaps because he was tired from playing during the day. Aphrodite sat casually by the bed, woke up the male host in the room, and charmed him in an instant. After some questioning, the tan farmer gave an answer that was unexpectedly. It's exactly the same with young warriors. Looking at the sleeping farmer, Thea, who was sitting on a back chair in the room, whispered to Soldak. It seems that there should be no black magician in this manner. Soldak also thinks there is nothing wrong with this manner. Aphrodite persisted and said, Ask someone else. Maybe they, the lower class people, don't even know what's going on in the manor. With that said, Aphrodite walked out of the low hut and set her sights on the buildings that looked like villas next to the military camp. The sound of horse hooves gradually disappeared, and Soldak and his party quickly walked into a villa from the shadow of the corner. Through the glass window, you can still see the soft light emitted by the wall lamp in the room of the villa. An officer is taking a bath in the bathroom. The bathtub is a bit small for him. He is half sitting in the bathtub washing his hair. Full of soap bubbles. The woman was in another room. Holding a book and telling a story to a blonde boy. The boy was lying on the bed very obediently. And occasionally asked the woman a tricky question. They had no idea that just outside the window. Serdak, Aphrodite and Thea had been standing in the yard for a long time until the officer finished taking a shower, changed into pajamas, and lay in the bedroom, wiping the long sword on the bedside with a clean handkerchief. The woman finally coaxed the boy to sleep, then walked out of the boy's room, untied the tie holding up his long hair, letting it hang down like a waterfall, and went to clean up the bathtub in the bathroom, and then walking into the bedroom carrying two cups of hot milk tea. At the moment when their spiritual consciousness was completely relaxed, Aphrodite released the sleeping cloud. After all, the other party was a mid-level officer. Once his spiritual consciousness was a little stronger, he might not be affected by the sleeping cloud. So Aphrodite waited patiently until his spirit was completely relaxed before using this group magic. The three of them walked in from the front door, passed through the very clean living room, and came to the officer's bedroom. The two hugged each other tightly, still maintaining the same awkward position before falling asleep. Aphrodite walked to the bed, used her charm again in front of the officer, and asked him some questions. The answers she got were exactly the same. The owner of this manor was Count Petunia, and the officer was a swordsman. A squadron leader in the regiment has the strength of a peak swordsman. Sure enough, he still has some strength, letting the swordsman lie on the bed again. Aphrodite even covered them with a blanket before walking out of the bedroom. The three of them were not in a hurry to leave, so they sat on the sofa in the living room. There was still warm milk tea on the coffee table, although Sia didn't drink it herself. She thoughtfully poured a cup for Soldak, 
There should be nothing wrong with this manor. Next, I will expand the search scope, Soldek said. Aphrodite took off the mithril mask, shook her head and said, I always feel like something is wrong. Let me try again. She walked towards the boy's room. Thea chased after Aphrodite and asked, What are you going to do? Aphrodite said bluntly, I want to ask that child again. Thea was probably worried that Aphrodite's charm would cause incurable psychological trauma to boys. After all, charm is about transfiguring the most feared or most coveted things in dreams, directly attacking the weak points of the soul. So Thea said, Let me go this time. Serdek asked doubtfully, Chia, can you ask me too? Don't forget, I am a spell weaver of the Naga tribe. In addition to water magic, I can also sing the songs of the sirens. Sia smiled at Serdak and whispered. Serdak found that he really didn't know enough about the little assistant who was following him. Sia pushed open the wooden door of the children's room. The room was very warmly decorated, with thick carpets on the floor. There was a wooden horse next to the window sill. In addition, the shelves next to the desk were also filled with various dolls. Some wooden swords and shields are available. Thea walked to the bed and sat on the leather stool where women usually sit. The boy was already lying on the bed and fast asleep. He was a little dishonest. Maybe his pajamas were too hot. He kicked off the quilt and rolled half of it around him. Sia stretched out a hand, picked up the handkerchief beside the bed and wiped the sweat from the boy's forehead, and then sang a lullaby softly. It was a very simple lullaby. She sat tenderly by the bed and sang softly. The singing voice was like a melodious beauty. Although the voice was very soft, it was very expressive. She sang a lullaby as if it were a beautiful song, like a small boat floating alone on the sea. And the boy seemed to be lying on a small wooden boat, waking up leisurely under the moonlight. At this time, the room also woke up with the boy. The ceiling transformed into a starry sky. The wooden bed turned into a small wooden boat. And the room turned into an endless sea. Sia also changed back to her mermaid appearance at this time, lying on the edge of the bed with her hands, staring at the boy with eyes as blue as lake water. Thea's method is completely different from Aphrodite's. Aphrodite makes people fall into a dream, and then uses charm to guide them little by little. It feels like hypnosis is patrolling the other person's inner world. Sia, on the other hand, wakes people up in dreams, and then uses illusions to change the surrounding environment into the scenery in the dream making people mistakenly think that they are still in a dream. But in fact, they are already awake. Oh my god! I saw a mermaid sister. Am I dreaming? The boy said exaggeratedly. He looked around. The sea shrouded in darkness was quiet and vast. He quickly grabbed the side of the boat. Yes, I am in your dream, Sia said with a smile. Then he stretched out a finger and drew a colorful rainbow quickly in the dark night, which looked very cool. Chapter 1233 Invasion What's your name? Sia asked, blinking. Pedro. The boy replied without thinking, although his eyes were a little timid. He looked at the surroundings with great curiosity, especially the black sea surface that made him extremely afraid. Sia continued to ask. It's a nice name. Where do you live? She tossed her long hair casually, deliberately exposing the scales on her neck and collarbone. Yet Scipio's manner. My father is a swordsman and a squadron leader there. The boy's eyes were immediately attracted by Thea's silver scales. Sia asked him again. Can you usually play around in the manor? Yes. I have been to every place in this manor. The boy said very proudly. Then let me ask you. Is there any place where you live that you children are prohibited from going to? Sia asked with some disbelief. There are many. Such as Lord Petunia's room. Captain Galt's office. And the basement in the manor. I heard that there was a ghost there a long time ago. So Lord Petunia had it sealed. The child then said, speaking of ghosts, the boy looked a little intimidated. Is your place still haunted recently? Occasionally, you can still hear the wails of evil spirits, the boy said. At this time, he touched his arm doubtfully and felt the temperature. Just when he was about to ask, Sia sang a lullaby again. The song was soothing and melodious. The boy's eyelids closed together under the singing. Thea helped the boy lie down on the bed, then lifted the illusion turned around and nodded to Soldak. After walking out of the boy's room and returning to the living room, the three of them sat back on the sofa without lighting the lights. The dark night had no effect on them at all. It seems we have to look for that basement. Maybe we can find something, Soldak said. Aphrodite also said at this time, I can feel the breath of black magic. It seems that there is something here that is constantly absorbing the power of souls around me. But that breath is very weak and very vague. 
easily ignored. She asked. If the Black Magic Research Institute is really hiding in this manner, and they have never been discovered by the garrison and farmers, where do you think they will hide? Soldak thought for a while and guessed. Their residence is most likely Earl Penny's yard, or the basement under the manor, which is a very large underground building. Actually, when I walked into this manor, I discovered a unique place here. The more I think about it, the more I think it's worth exploring. Sia looked at the excuse outside the window and said firmly, That's it. Sia stood in the shadows of the street, pointing to the fountain in the middle of the square. It was a very ordinary-looking fountain. In the center of the intersection, there were some rockeries piled up in the center of the fountain. There was even a human sculpture on it. It was a girl holding a water bottle on her shoulders. A stream of clear water flowed from the water bottle. It gushes out, soaking half of the girl's statue. The clear water hits the rockery and finally flows into the pool. This kind of stone statue of a girl holding a water bottle in her hand is often seen in small towns or manors in the Green Empire. So Serdak didn't even take a second look when he entered the manor. Thea said to Serdak and Aphrodite, Have you seen that no matter how much water flows out of the fountain, it does not overflow. And the water spout is clearly the magic pattern formation of water gathering. Which means that this pool must have an overflow. And the waterway is either an underground well or an underground river. Since this pool is connected to the underground river, then this underground river is likely to be connected to the basement. Of course, the prerequisite is that the basement is large enough. She turned to Soldak and said, Dak, I want to go look for it in the underground river. Then you should be careful yourself. Soldak patted Sia's round shoulder. He now couldn't understand why Sia was so eager to express herself. Sia nodded and quickly ran out of the shadows while there was no one at the intersection. Her steps were very light when she ran, as if she were dancing. Then he jumped into the pool with a perfect leap. His body became lighter and lighter, and gradually merged into the water. He didn't even transform into a mermaid, and there wasn't even the slightest splash of water. Seeing Thea sneaking into the manor's waterway system, Soldak and Aphrodite also decided to sneak into Count Petunia's house to investigate. Aphrodite had previously concluded that there was no life in this house. The two of them sneaked into the courtyard. As expected, the rooms inside were empty. Many rooms did not even have basic furniture. It seemed that no one had lived here for a long time. The ground was covered with litter. There was dust. And it seemed that no one had cleaned the house in a long time. After exiting Count Petunia's house, Soldak and Aphrodite returned to the fountain opposite the square at the street corner, where they had agreed to meet Thea. An alarm bell sounded in the manor. And Serdak and Aphrodite looked at each other. It seemed that the sleeping night warrior in the watchtower had been discovered. The lights in the entire garrison camp gradually lit up. And not long after, groups of cavalry lined up from the military camp. These cavalrymen held rosin torches in their hands and began to search everywhere in the manor. Serdak and Aphrodite were sitting in the shadow of a roof opposite the fountain square. The cavalry passed back and forth on the street below the house. No one noticed that there were two pairs of eyes on the roof watching the street below. After waiting for a while, Sia emerged from the fountain. While a group of cavalry ran past the street, she quickly passed through the street and got into the shadow, leaving only a trail of water on the stone floor. Stained footprints. She quickly climbed up to the roof and hid in the shadows next to Serdak, twirling her wet hair and panting softly. Have you found any clues? Soldak asked Sia. Um... He blinked his big blue eyes and smiled. Then he said, There's a secret room down there. Serdak asked, How many people are there? Thea shook her head and said, A lot. But I don't know the specific number. I can't explore all the places. Soldak asked again, Then have you found the exit from the basement? Sia nodded quickly and said, It's not in this manner. It's on the cliff at the back. Next to it is dense bushes and valleys. It's very hidden. Serdak said to Thea and Aphrodite, you two wait for me at the exit, and I will bring the heavy armored infantry regiment over. Are we going to go to war with Count Penny? Thea asked curiously. Soldak shook his head and led the two of them outside the manor, saying as they walked, Since the garrison here doesn't know the existence of these black magicians, let's wake them all up and let them know that there is a good neighbor hiding under their military camp. The three of them walked around to the secret exit of the Black Magic Priory Research Institute. There is a gurgling stream at the exit of the cave and it seems to be surrounded by barbed wire, according to the sign outside the fence. This is Earl Petunia's private hunting ground. Some ferocious beasts are usually raised in the hunting ground, which is considered to be the area around the manor, a restricted area. 
he had pointed at a rock at the entrance. Even though Serdak had the inside skill, he had to look carefully for a long time before he discovered that there was a magician lurking there. The magic robe on his body seemed to have a layer of disguise, and it could actually blend in with the environment. Become one. This stream is the source of water upstream, and part of it comes to the fountain of the manor. I followed the stream all the way down to here. Thea hid behind Soldak and whispered to him. Serdak glanced at Aphrodite. Aphrodite nodded to him. The meaning in her eyes was clearly, Don't worry. I will take good care of her. Serdak then ducked into the bushes and quickly ran towards the camp on the other side of the mountain. Serdak returned to the camp, where the bearded Edgar was still sleeping soundly in the tent. However, the night warriors at the edge of the camp were very alert and keenly spotted Serdak trying to get closer. Edgar crawled out of the tent and immediately called all the infantry soldiers to assemble. These soldiers were almost all the remaining elite troops of the Ganbu Plain rebels. They followed the bearded Edgar as they walked out of the canyon town and experienced after the Battle of Bansk, the defensive Battle of Makuso, and chasing the Hell Legion into the Seruomen Plateau. It was the Iron Army that had gone through countless battles. When Soldak led the heavy armored infantry regiment to bypass the blockade of the opposite Lord's private army and broke into Count Penny's private hunting ground that had been set as a restricted area, the sky had already turned bright. The heavy armored infantry regiment surrounded almost all the woodlands valleys, and rivers under the mountain cliffs. Only then did the Lord's private soldiers guarding the boundary markers realize that this heavy armored infantry regiment had quietly broke into their homes. Territory. The cavalry were the first to return from the boundary marker. When they heard that Soldak's heavy armored infantry regiment had entered the restricted area of the hunting ground, they pursued them this way. Just when this group of cavalry arrived at the edge of the hunting area, they were blocked from the hunting ground by a two-headed ogre covered in heavy black armor. Almost all of the dozen or so knights who rushed at the front fell off their horses. These knights lay on the ground and howled. Their horses were knocked down by Gulitum with great force. And almost all of their organs were smashed. He fell to the ground with blood spurting from his mouth and nose. The ogre had already squatted on the edge of the hunting ground to start a fire, preparing to set up a large iron pot to cook horse meat. Facing the disparity in strength, a group of cavalry did not dare to act rashly. On the other side, Serdak had already led the heavy armored infantry regiment soldiers into the Priory Research Institute hidden under the mountain wall. Since this place is extremely secretive, the garrison and farmers in the manor have no idea that there is such a hidden place under their feet. So there are actually not many black magicians and magic apprentices in this institute. Under Aphrodite's charm, the magician guarding the entrance didn't even have time to issue a warning and turned into a string puppet. Serdak led a group of soldiers to rush into the cave first. Chapter 1234 The Tree on the Altar Naomi followed Aphrodite. They stood at the entrance of the cave and watched a large group of heavy armored infantry soldiers rushing into the cave following Serdak. Just when she was about to summon several skeleton warriors to protect her and rush into the cave together, Aphrodite unexpectedly grabbed her. Naomi was wearing a thick cloak and the hood covered her entire face. She turned her head and raised her face slightly revealing pinprick-like pupils in her pale eyes, and she stared in confusion. Aphrodite, we can stand behind him and help him, but not now, unless you don't care about your image and tell everyone who you are. Aphrodite stood aside and whispered, and then she pulled Naomi's skin to loosen up, arm and continued, let's go, let's go in and see what's hidden in this institute. When Naomi saw Aphrodite like this, she dispersed the gathering magic aura and followed these heavy armored infantry soldiers into the cave together. When entering the cave, almost every heavy armored infantry soldier lit a pine oil torch in his hand. They inserted these torches on the cave wall one by one. As the team continued to deepen, they would insert torches on the cave wall every ten meters. A torch illuminated the dark cave. Serdak rushed to the front of the team with his sword and shield in hand. The black magicians in the cave did not even expect that the other party would rush in from the outside so directly. The black magicians crowded in the cave rush towards magic is released at the entrance of the cave. Shadow arrows shot out from the depths of the cave. It was a kind of magic with strong corrosive power. However, Serdak, who was walking in the front, raised his shield to greet him. And layers of holy light burst out from the shield. A shadow arrow exploded on the shield. And a layer of holy light suddenly flashed on the shield. The impact of the shadow arrow was not great. And the main corrosive attribute was completely restrained by the holy light. The shadow arrow could not stop Serdak at all. Footsteps. An aura of power shone beneath his feet. And he held a broadsword in his hand. 
the black magicians immediately changed their magic skills. Water bullets, fireballs, wind blades, and rocks flew densely in the narrow cave. A group of shield warriors followed Serdak, followed by a group of archers, arrows flying randomly in the spell. Serdak's body shone with the power of the holy light. Moving forward, the black magicians cast another series of black magic, such as death coil, shadow arrow, sleepiness, and weakness, but they all quickly disintegrated in the holy light. Thea and Edgar followed Serdak. Thea continuously blessed Serdak's body with water shields. Edgar held up a large copper shield and led a team of shield warriors to resist the magic in the cave. The bombs charged forward, and from time to time some shield warriors were injured by exploding fireballs or fainted under the impact of water bombs. But as Serdak gradually approached, the black magician camp issued a great panic until Serdak finally caught up with the black magician who was at the back while holding up his shield. The chase in the cave tunnel officially began. There was no threat to the magicians who were entangled by the warriors at close range. Their spell needs time to brew. And during this time, the warrior only needs to wave the weapon in his hand to kill the enemy in front of him. The black magicians who were chased by the shield warriors all held up magic shields on their bodies. The long swords in the hands of the shield warriors cannot cut through these light yellow and light blue magic shields. When the weapons come into contact with the magic shield, circles of halo will always burst out and then be bounced away by the light shield. At this time, the black magicians threw out the magic in their hands, causing these shield warriors to suffer a big loss. Only Serdak stood in the front, having killed three first-turn black magicians in succession. Aphrodite hid behind the team and secretly cast spells to pierce the magic shields of these black magicians. Once the magic shields of these magicians were broken, they would be immediately chopped down in a pool of blood by the shield warriors. There were actually not many black magicians in this cave. After Serdak defeated the first wave of resistors, the shield warriors did not encounter any magicians who resisted. Chase along the cave all the way to the inside of the cave. Before dark is not in danger. Let's follow them secretly. Aphrodite stood in the corner of the cave and whispered to Naomi. Naomi discovered that Aphrodite had just cast the spell very covertly, and the surrounding shield warriors had no idea who had helped them just now. In short, he rushed into the heart of the mountain in a daze. Seeing that Aphrodite didn't care about her at all, Naomi asked curiously, You really don't reject a necromancer? Aphrodite stopped and pulled Naomi aside. Let the shield warriors blocking the back pass smoothly. Then he whispered to Naomi, I am a succubus myself. What qualifications do I have to reject the necromancer? And I told you, except for an indigenous berserker and a heavy gunner, there were almost no normal people in his battle team. The two-headed ogre, half-elf, and the Naga mermaid can only be regarded as backup members. Aphrodite secretly complained about Serdak to Naomi. Naomi didn't know what to say at this moment. Aphrodite moved with the main force, keeping Serdak within her sight. Aphrodite continued to Naomi. Don't you think that with the power you have now, you can completely change your lifestyle and live a more casual life? I have never thought about this. I just want to end the rest of my life quietly. Naomi thought carefully before answering. Aphrodite continued to move forward with Naomi and some injured shield warriors were carried out from the front. Thea had already begun rapid treatment at the back, and she was too busy to lift her head. Naomi looked at the chaotic scene and asked Aphrodite, Aren't you going to help him? Aphrodite curled her lips and said with great disdain, If the opponent does not have an opponent of the same level as him, those black magicians will have no chance of winning even if they sacrifice themselves, especially if he is a second-turn knight with the power of the holy light. Naomi stared at Soldak's back with curiosity, then looked at Aphrodite. Aphrodite raised her face slightly, feeling confident in front of this undead warlock. Serdak went through the cave to the interior of the mountain, which is already at the foot of the Atipia's Manor. Sure enough, there is an underground building complex here, and the Academic Institute of the Black Magic Hermitage happens to be built here. Serdak took the lead and broke into a cave hall, where there were many magic experimental benches, Many magic notes and magic parchments scattered everywhere. Some glass bottles and jars were overturned to the ground. And many magic potions pungent smoke was emitted on the ground. And most of the test benches were filled with all kinds of strange materials. When Suldak broke in, some magic apprentices were still rushing to pack up the information on the test bench. And there were also many precious magic materials, which they quickly collected into their magic pockets. Serdak rushed forward, and the group of archers following him squatted down and began to cover the middle of the mountain, which was not that big, with rain of arrows. 
some persistent magic apprentices fell in front of the test stand. And some magic apprentices saw that something was not going well, and slipped into the cave, just before Soldek rushed in. Edgar's group of infantry soldiers quickly occupied the first cave in the heart of the mountain. After walking a short distance inside, Serdak found an underground courtyard in front of him. Here, Serdak's pursuing army once again encountered stubborn resistance from a group of black magicians. These magicians are obviously more powerful than the magicians in the cave just now. But just when Serdak felt that there would be a hard fight, the counterattacks of the black magicians gradually weakened. Serdak found an opening, held up his shield, and rushed into the underground courtyard. What he saw in front of him shocked Serdak. But he was also a little dumbfounded. The roof of this cave is even inlaid with many luminous stones. And the entire cave is brightly lit. In the center of this underground courtyard is an 8 meter square altar. There is a statue of a gargoyle in each of the four corners of the altar. The reliefs on the base are also countless demons gathered together, seemingly worshipping something. In the middle of the altar is a dead tree without any leaves. But this big tree seems to be breathing. And the branches are covered with various blood tumors. Which looks extremely scary. All the black magicians stood together on this altar. And the big tree covered with blood tumors was surrounded by them. There are huge blood pools on the left and right sides of the altar. There is a lot of blood condensed in these blood pools. Several tree roots extend into the blood pool. And all the tree roots are stained with blood. A mage stood on the altar with a ferocious face. His hair was messy. Holding a magic wand in his hand. And a very fanatical look on his face. This kind of person is like a fanatical believer. He forced these magic apprentices to commit suicide under the big tree. Sacrifice your souls quickly. Before you die. Sacrifice your souls to the great tree of desire. The magician waved the wand in his hand and forced a magic apprentice. Seeing that the magic apprentice was unwilling to commit suicide at all, the magician walked up and stabbed the magic apprentice into the body with a dagger in his hand. The magic apprentice let out a terrified cry. He looked at the big tree in disbelief. Countless roots stretched out from the trunk and wrapped around the magic apprentice. Not only were they rapidly sucking the magic apprentice's flesh and blood, but also the magic apprentices the souls were forcibly detained into the big tree. As the magic apprentice let out a roar of relief, the withered body fell down. The crazy magician continued to say to the big tree, Please resurrect yourself in the infinite blood and soul. On that big tree without any leaves, strange faces appeared on each of the hemorrhagic tumors hanging on the branches. They howled in despair and struggled in pain. But the roots were still growing. It grew stronger and was still flying freely in midair. Chapter 1235 Battle Chapter 1235-1222 Battle A group of black magicians standing on the altar gathered on the altar. They were entangled by these infinitely growing roots. The black magicians were suddenly frightened. They began to struggle. They held staffs in their hands and kept shouting. The crazy-looking black magician's eyes became even more fanatical at this time and he rushed towards the big tree without hesitation. The flesh, blood and souls of the black magicians are constantly injected into this tree of desire. It also seemed to feel the crisis, frantically absorbing nutrients from all around. And the hematoma with a human face hanging on the branches of this big tree was also constantly squirming. And the face inside seemed to be trying to break free from the hematoma. As for the magicians on the altar, many of their bodies have been sucked into mummies by the giant tree. However, their lives did not end. And their flesh and blood became the nourishment of the giant tree. And their souls were also absorbed by the giant tree. Inside the body, new blood tumors condensed on the branches. And the faces that appeared on those blood tumors were exactly what these mages looked like before they died. The crazy black magician's body was completely wrapped by the giant tree. And his entire body would continue to blend into the giant tree. The fervor in the black magician's eyes was covered by two completely opposite expressions of pain and pleasure. Sometimes he struggles. Sometimes he enjoys. The giant tree still penetrated its roots into the blood pools on the left and right sides. It was desperately sucking nutrients from the blood pools. It seemed that the power injected was not enough for the tree to fully recover. After the mad magician merged into the big tree, his face appeared on the trunk of the dead tree. It gradually became clear from blur, and the face suddenly opened its blood-red eyes. The pair of scarlet eyes stared at the approaching Serdek. The face of the giant tree showed a ferocious and world-weary expression and shouted at Serdek. Knight, come and plunge into the darkness. I will give you the power of darkness and you can regain eternal life in the darkness. Saying that, without even waiting for Serdek to react, several soft and extremely tough tree vines stretched out towards Serdek and black flames were burning on these tree vines. 
Serdak also felt the powerful pressure released by the big tree on the altar at this moment. He did not expect that the magicians of the Black Magic Monastery would cultivate such a strange giant tree here. The magic pattern structure on his body emits a strong magical glow, and the broad sword in his hand cuts on the entangled tree vines. But the tree vines are very tough, and the broad sword in Serdak's hand is stained with black fire. And suddenly there was a corrosive force rushing toward Serdak along the black flames. Serdak released a strong force of holy light, trying to disperse the black flames. It's just that these black flames are not the corrosive atmosphere on the shadow arrows. They stick to Serdak's broad sword and actually make Serdak's arms feel the heat. Serdak wanted to draw the broad sword back, but it was tightly entangled by a tree vine. Several shield warriors following behind were tied up by giant tree vines. Under the black flames, these dozen shield warriors were melted into a pile of ashes by the flames of the giant tree before they even had time to shout. Their souls were quickly pulled out of their bodies and turned into giant trees. A part of, at this time, the water shield covering Serdak's body quickly melted and the flames began to spread on her arms. Facing such a giant tree that could absorb souls, Serdak did not dare to be careless. While he released a power of holy light from his body, he also released the sacred power suspended above the door of the spiritual sea. Armor activates. With the mental power Serdak currently possesses, he could only last for less than half a minute after wearing this set of sacred armor. An angel shadow appeared behind Soldak. The angel had his hands folded in front of his chest. As if praying, at this time, countless holy lights surrounded the angel shadow. The next second, a beam of sacred light fell from the sky, actually passed through the thick rock wall, and poured into Serdak's body. Pray. Serdak's body was filled with this strong holy light, and a layer of armor shimmering with holy light appeared on his body. The black flames that had spread to his arms faded instantly, and countless tree vines burned with black fire and wrapped around him, quickly wither and wither in front of the sacred armor. But as the vines continue to wither, the vines of this giant tree continue to grow, becoming more and more numerous. The face on the tree trunk stared at Serdek, no longer continuing to say those seductive words, but as if staring at a mortal enemy, frantically pulling out tree vines from the body. Those hematomas also began to open pairs of blood-red eyes, open their mouths, revealing sharp teeth, and even some dead branches turned into claws, gathering toward Serdak from all directions and quickly completely entangled his body stand up. When Aphrodite, who was following behind, saw the big tree, her expression became very solemn. When she saw the giant tree pulling out countless vines, Serdak, who was exuding strong power of holy light and wearing sacred protective gear, was entangled into a huge wooden ball. The shield warriors around him were dead and injured, and there was no way they could do it. As he approached the giant tree, he immediately said to Naomi beside him, we have to go help him. She didn't even wait for Naomi to respond and rushed out from the back corner as a huge magic circle appeared under her feet. Aphrodite used her fingers to condense a huge black magic circle on her chest. The magic sword came and as Aphrodite's spell ended, the black magic sword with countless death auras fell on the giant tree. At the same time, the necromancer Naomi also controlled the magic of necromancy. Under Naomi's control, the mummies that fell on the altar suddenly burned the soul fire in the eye sockets of each mummy. These skeletons fell from under the dry paper. They struggled to get up and surrounded the big tree. These magicians did not have swords on them, but they all carried daggers with them. These skeleton warriors grabbed their daggers and stabbed the face on the tree trunk with all their might. The Tree of Desire concentrated all its power to suppress the power of holy light on Serdek, but was cut to pieces by Aphrodite's summoned black magic sword. Now it is surrounded by more than 20 skeleton warriors. The dagger stabbed the tree trunk, and streams of bright red blood flowed out. The power that had been gathered was gradually disintegrating, and the Tree of Desire could only let out a crazy roar in helplessness. Who betrayed a Mazdan? You will not end well if you join forces with the undead. Aphrodite did not cast the second magic. She also pulled Naomi away. Before running away, Naomi took out a bottle of corruption potion and poured it into a pool of blood. Bearded Edgar had already rushed in with the second echelon of shield warriors. Everyone rushed towards the big tree and first rescued Serdek, who was trapped in the wooden ball. At this time, the Tree of Desire was still growing vines, and seemed to want to absorb the lives and souls of the surrounding shield warriors. But the warriors cut off the tentacles with their long swords. The skeleton warrior stabbed the human face on the tree trunk completely from the altar. The entire Tree of Desire was dyed red with blood. Serdak broke free from the entanglement of the tree vines. 
the sacred armor on his body had completely disappeared due to the large amount of mental power consumed. He was in a trance. Everything in the front looks a bit blurry. He wiped the blood that flowed into his eyes vigorously. His nostrils and mouth seemed to be filled with fishy salty liquid. And his ears were constantly buzzing. He was helped by a shield warrior to climb out of the tree vine. And saw the tree of desire wailing continuously under the siege of a group of skeletons. A huge wound was opened on the crown of the tree of desire. And countless blood tumors were shattered. Serdak stood up firmly and strode towards the tree of desire. Holding a broadsword shining with the power of the holy light. He took the opportunity to chop down the big tree. With one strike of the sword, the tree bark flew away. With two swords, a gap appeared in the trunk of this big tree. Three swords. Until the giant tree on the altar completely fell into a pool of blood. Soldak was in a trance. He pointed to the giant tree stained with blood and said, Burn it. After saying this, Serdak felt his eyes glowing with white light. And then completely lost consciousness. When Thea rushed over, she checked the injuries of Soldak, who was in a coma. And then said calmly, let him lie down for a while. He is mentally exhausted. And he can recover after taking a rest. When Serdak woke up, he found himself lying on the bed in a wooden house. The furnishings in the wooden house were relatively simple. With only a bed, a table and a chair, he lifted off the thin blanket covering himself. When he sat up, he felt his head was still dizzy. But there was no pain in his body. Several external injuries were also carefully bandaged. He saw the broadsword placed at the head of the bed and the shield beside the bed. Sat on the chair and drank a glass of water. Memories flooded in. Serdak then heard the noise outside. When he opened the door of the wooden house, he realized that he was still in the Black Magician's Research Institute. However, at this time, the heavy armored infantry soldiers were about to clean up. This battlefield is over. The noise came from the entrance of the cave. When I walked over, I discovered that it was a group of Count Petunia's private troops who wanted to break in but they were stopped by the bearded Edgar. Serdak strode forward, and the bearded Edgar quickly saluted Serdak. What are the casualties? Soldak tried to keep his tone calm. The bearded Edgar said, Thirty-five brothers died. Not many brothers were injured this time. Mystia has already treated them, and the conditions are not serious. It's just that we failed to capture the prisoners this time. Those black magic all the teachers died on the altar. And there is a dungeon over there. And the situation of the people inside is not very good. Serdak sighed. If Andrew and Samira were here, so many people wouldn't have died this time. How many people did you find in the dungeon? He asked casually. Sixteen, said Edgar. Serdak just nodded, indicating that he understood, but did not ask. His eyes fell on the pair of knights at the entrance of the cave, and Serdak asked, What happened to them? Edgar immediately replied. They said they were Lord Penny's soldiers, so they wanted to come in to investigate the situation here. But we stopped them. At this time, the night officer also took the opportunity to step forward and protested loudly to Soldek. Sir, this is Earl Petunia's territory. We have the right to inspect all places on this land. Serdak slowly turned around, stared at the night officer with sharp eyes, and said coldly with a straight face, It's almost gone! Chapter 12 36 Harvest and Evidence The night officer's face instantly turned livid, and he stared at Serdak for a few seconds. When he left, he even forgot that he should give a military salute to Serdak before leaving. Those corpses of black magicians and valuable magic robes, they were all hung on wooden crosses outside the cave. The night officers looked at them carefully before leading their men into the cave. For these magicians, although they have turned into mummies, the people in the Atipia's manor still have some impressions of their faces. It's just that everyone never knew that they were hiding underground in this manor and had lived there for so long. They thought they were a group of outsiders who regularly purchased daily necessities at Yuzipia's manor every month. Serdak ignored the night officer and gave Edgar a wink, asking him to drive the night officer away. Now it is the army of Ruth City that takes over the research institute of the Black Magic Monastery. He will not allow other forces to come and intervene at this time. Or to put it more bluntly, share the credit. The heavy armored infantry regiment lost its lives, and the death pension that Serdak set for the troops in the Ganbu Plain was not a small sum. He first rushed to the place where the corpses of the fallen soldiers were kept and took a look. The corpses of these soldiers were all put into black coffins and parked neatly in the cave. It was cool enough here. And these corpses should not be so fast. Just stink. It is hard to imagine that the Black Magic Monastery actually has so many coffins in reserve. It is probably the magicians who prepared them for themselves in advance. At least that's what Serdek thought. 
When will the logistics team arrive? Serdak asked Captain Edgar behind him. We should be here by tomorrow night at the latest. Commander Edgar replied. He was worried that Soldak would criticize the Heavy Infantry Regiment Logistics Department for the slow movement of these convoys. So he quickly added, Convoy preparations, the supplies have to go through the portal again, and we have to find out where we are going in Ruth City. He did not continue to say the next words, because he wanted Serdak to think for himself. Serdak nodded slightly and walked out of the cave. The Heavy Armored Infantry Regiment set up a new camp outside the cave. The wounded soldier's camp was in a tent close to the foot of the mountain. Thea was treating the injured soldiers when she saw Serdak walking in quickly with a group of men, then raised his head to greet Soldak and said, Dak, are you awake? Soldak nodded, moved closer to Thea, took her place and asked, How is the situation? Shiyan knew that Serdak was asking about the wounded person in front of her, and she quickly replied seriously, The injury is not serious, but the blood is infected by putrefactive toxins. Now I can only control the toxins from spreading further but I cannot eradicate them. How many such wounded are there? Serdak asked while using the holy light technique on the wounded. A beam of white light fell on the wounded person, and the wound with cyan bruises immediately turned into a normal color. Everyone is gathered here, just waiting for you to come. Sia took a long breath and said easily. Serdak couldn't help but raise his head and asked, What if I can't wake up in time? How should these wounded be treated? Sia answered without any hesitation. I can't dissolve these toxins but I can concentrate them on an unimportant area of the wounded's body, and then cut off that part of the body with a click. Serdak had nothing to say, because he really had no better way to refute. After seeing these injured warriors, Serdak returned to the cave with the altar to check out the Tree of Desire. This kind of magic tree is a rare plant-like monster even in the H. L. world, and has a very high growth rate. Once this Tree of Desire reaches maturity, it will definitely become a lord. It has the ability to control all life forms within a few hundred radius to become its slaves or blood food. The black magician apparently summoned a seed of the Tree of Desire from the H. L. Realm this time and successfully induced it to germinate. This Tree of Desire is no longer in the seedling stage and the main nutrient for its growth is fresh blood food and souls. The Tree of Desire needs to absorb enough souls to successfully advance. And this Tree of Desire is a plant-type monster at the peak of the fourth level. If it can break through the last shackles and become a fifth level monster, it is estimated that Serdak can't defeat it so easily. This tree was cut down by Serdak himself. Now he returned to the altar and looked at the tree of desire again. The main trunk of the giant tree was already as thick as a water tank, and there were some very tough things inside. With strong meridians, that tree still accepted the souls of more than 20 black magicians at the last moment, and it also completely fused with a black magician. And even a face was born on the trunk. This already means that the final stage of the Tree of Desire has given birth to primary wisdom. The crown of this big tree is covered with blood tumors. Now the entire tree has been chopped down on the altar. The blood tumors on the crown have condensed hundreds of blood stones, which are a very rare magic material. The dry trunk it is not as dense as other trees and can be used to build furniture. The inside of the Tree of Desire is more like some pipes stuck together. Not only is it empty, there is also some coagulated blood in many of the pipes because the specific value of this part of the material was not known. The entire tree had been lying on the altar. Now, those blood essence stones have been collected by Aphrodite. Seeing Serdak coming over, Aphrodite discussed with Serdak how to saw off the tree and take it away. According to Aphrodite's idea, even the roots of the altar must be cut. Poach them all. The tree of desire is the main material for making hallucinogenic potions. Aphrodite gave a brief introduction to Serdak. With just these words, Serdak made up his mind to pack up and take away the entire tree of desire, even digging out all the roots deep in the soil. Aphrodite, are you saying that the entire tree is a magic herb? Although Soldak is already rich, he still cannot remain calm. The succubus nodded slightly and said, If you understand it this way, it's not impossible. She proudly pointed to the wall aside, where the entire wall was blocked by black curtains, and then said casually, Oh, by the way, in addition to this precious tree of desire, the black magicians here have really collected a lot of good things. With that said, Aphrodite walked to a cave wall and suddenly opened the curtain in front of the shelves. Inside were bottles of various potions and plant-based magic materials. These materials were placed all over the wall, and there was even a square tray on the shelf filled with magic crystals. Serdak was not dazzled by these gains. He glanced at Naomi and asked Aphrodite, 
Have you found any evidence that they arrested the villagers of Celia Village? This is also the main reason why Naomi came here. The necromancer wanted to clear his name. Yes, there is a row of prisons over there. And Naomi also found the place where they buried the bones. Aphrodite was still the first to answer. Soldak looked at Naomi with some surprise. Seemingly understanding Serdak's surprised look, the necromancer shrugged his shoulders and explained. As a necromancer, he has an extremely keen sense of smell for any corpse. Take me to see it, Serdak said. Aphrodite walked at the front and passed through the cave. The location of the prison was deeper in the mountain. Here, some prisons as big as toilets were dug on both sides of the original cave, except for the rock walls. Apart from a row of iron gates, each cell is only two or three square meters, just enough for one person to lie down inside. There was some filth left in these prisons, and there was even some blood stains on the iron doors and cave walls. There are only 16 villagers who can survive in the prison. Among these people, we found Craig's wife and son, Aphrodite continued. Serdak was startled for a moment, then asked again, Does Craig's wife know Craig's true identity? I didn't ask this, but judging from her sad expression, she probably didn't know, Aphrodite replied. Then don't tell anyone about Craig. Just say that he was killed by a black magician while leading the army. The people who were responsible for the crime are all dead. We can't let the living continue to bear that crime. Let this end with Craig, Serdak said to Aphrodite. You have the final say on this. Aphrodite did not refute Soldak, nor did she agree. Are the remaining prisoners from Celia Village? Serdak asked again. Ten are villagers from Celia Village, and the other six are from other places. Aphrodite replied. Have you figured out why they secretly arrested so many civilians here? Serdak asked. Aphrodite walked in front. She stopped and said without thinking. Of course, it is to nourish the Tree of Desire. That tree not only needs blood food, but also needs to absorb souls. Serdak slapped his forehead, remembering that Aphrodite had already explained it before. Continuing to walk deeper into the cave, there was a cliff-like place in front of him, looking at the deep and dark space below. Soldak dropped the pine branch torch in his hand, with a light that was not too bright. Su Erdak saw that the pit should be more than ten meters deep, and indeed, there were a large number of bones piled inside. Naomi stood next to Soldak and asked cautiously, Lord Earl, would you like me to wake up all these skeletons and have them line up so that we can more easily find out the specific number? Serdak glanced at Naomi speechlessly and said quickly, This is not necessary. Chapter 1237 Harvest The logistics supply team from Makuso City successfully arrived at Celia Village. And the first batch of logistics supplies was also transported to the Azipia's Manor. The carriage could only travel along the dilapidated mountain road to the village of Celia. The rest of the journey relied entirely on the transportation of the logistics department personnel before it arrived at the Azipia's Manor. In fact, even without these supplies, the soldiers of the heavy armored infantry regiment, you won't starve either. The manor has abundant food and material reserves, and they have not refused to provide them to the heavy armored infantry regiment. Gulitam placed a yellow sheep that was dripping oil on the bonfire. The bearded Egger squatted beside the bonfire and asked Serdek, What should we do next? The heavy armored infantry soldiers in the camp seemed very relaxed. Their dinner was white bread and broth, and everyone was celebrating the victory. Soldak scratched his head. He thought for a moment before saying to Edgar, The heavy armored infantry regiment still needs to be stationed here for a while. This stronghold of the Black Magic Hermitage will have to wait for further investigation by the Magic Union Law Enforcement Group. Check. You stay and guard the scene here. I have to go back early to handle official business in Rith City, and will leave tonight. Edgar didn't expect that Serdak would rush back to Rith City at night. Hearing Serdak's arrangement, he could only order, as the commander of the Heavy Armored Infantry Regiment, Edgar the Bearded must stay here. Sitting in front of the bonfire, Serdak glanced at Aphrodite sitting in the shadow not far away and said to her, Aphrodite, you have to stay this time too. His main purpose of leaving Aphrodite here is so that he can rush here through the void gate at any time. After all, there are still many uncertainties here. In the past few days, Root City has accumulated a lot of official business waiting for him to handle. As the city's governor, Serdak cannot stay here any longer. This time when he returns to Ruder City, he will also take away a large amount of precious materials captured. In addition to seizing magic materials and the Tree of Desire, Serdak also found some magic books in the cave of the Black Magic Monastery Research Institute. Among these books, Serdak selected some basic magic books to take back. However, None of the books on black magic were touched. 
There were also some books on religious beliefs. These books were all left on the bookshelves because there were still more to come. There will be magicians from the Magic Guild Law Enforcement Group coming to take over. And everything cannot be emptied. Thea, you come back with me this time, Saldak said. Thea rolled her eyes. Although she was reluctant, she had no reason to refute. Although the two of them are traveling together in name, Sardak actually only needs to let Aphrodite in the summoning circle before he can return to Ruth City through the Void Gate, while Sia can return to Ruth City the fastest. The way is to ride a magic harpoon over the mountains in the abandoned mining area. Thinking about riding a magic harpoon and flying all night against the night wind, the Naga Mermaid would not be very happy. Although he was reluctant, he had no other choice but to bite the bullet and agree. Aphrodite wears a mithril mask and behaves like an alchemist with a very weird temper. In the camp, almost no one dared to talk to her. She walked back to her tent, and Naomi was sitting quietly at the door of the tent. She was wrapped in a thick cloak and had a hood on her head to cover her face. Hiding in the shadows. If you hadn't gotten closer, it would have been hard to spot someone sitting in the dark shadow. Aphrodite sat down next to Naomi, and they sat side by side. Naomi smelled faintly of antiseptic potion. Aphrodite turned to Naomi and asked, Have you thought about whether you want to join us? In fact, I think you should join us. At least life will not be as embarrassing as it is now. Naomi remained silent for a long time before saying in a metallic voice, I want to stay here. Celia Village is a place I am familiar with. I don't want to go anywhere except there. Since you insist, I respect your decision. Aphrodite said. Naomi lifted the hood covering her head a little, revealing a skinny face almost covered with bones and stared at Aphrodite in surprise. Soldak has told you before. We are not a magic union, and we have no discrimination against people like you. As long as you do not violate local laws, you can always live here, but no matter what, you will beware of the ordinary people around you. These people have been too brainwashed by the Statue of Liberty. Even if they are abandoned by the Statue of Liberty, they still don't repent. This is my personal advice to you. When Aphrodite spoke, she did not look at Naomi's uncertain face. Actually, it's good to go back to Celia Village. After all, it's relatively remote there, and you basically won't come into contact with strangers. Naomi pursed her dry lips. She did not say in the end that she wanted to stay to take care of old Abby and his wife. Although the other children of the two old men lived in Ruth City, they hoped that they could go. They live in the city, but the two old people stubbornly do not want to leave Celia Village. Looking at Aphrodite's glowing mithril mask, Naomi pursed her lips again. She felt that her face had gradually become numb recently. The degree of corpse transformation in her body further intensified. And she felt that she might not have much time left. In the last few days, she hoped to hide at home and wait silently for death. She hoped that her body would fall into the mine after her death. In a corner of the camp not far away, Craig's body was lying in a coffin. His eyelids were covered with two copper plates. And his hands were crossed on his chest. It is said that these two copper coins were the Cross River money given to the ferryman when his soul passed through the river Styx. Although Craig's wife and son had been in prison for a period of time, they were still frightened. The boy looked very thin, with some fear on his thin face. The woman sat at the door of the tent, leaning against the coffin with a numb face, as if she had completely despaired of her future life. Craig's death was a huge blow to their family. They had three children to support, and the little savings she had in hand couldn't hold on for long. Her son would go to the military after he was 16. The two daughters have to be raised for many years. And two dowries have to be prepared for them. Otherwise once they are arranged to marry a homeless man in the town. The future will make people feel even more desperate. In this day and age. How can you get married without a dowry? Once news of Craig's death spreads. The woman will be arranged by the town census officer to remarry. And there is no telling what the new family will be like. She felt a little chilly and pulled the blanket tighter around her body. She looked at her son beside her and stretched out her arms to hold him in her arms. The two of them just cuddled each other. And the night in the mountains seemed very cold. Chapter 1238 returned to the city. Hunter Craig will be sent to Celia Village. And the woman will then return to the town. She will also pick up her two daughters who are temporarily staying in the hotel. Serdak did not tell the truth and did not tell them that Craig was an outsider at the Priory Institute of Dark Arts. This time Naomi will return to Celia Village with their mother and son. So there seems to be nothing to worry about in terms of safety. Gulitam will also follow the supply team back to Ritz City. The Ezipia's Manor has been frightened by the Black Magic Hermitage. Everyone is very worried because there is a research institute hidden under the castle. 
and the great nobles of the Bena province will anger the people here. Serdak returned to the castle of Rith City through the void gate. He dismissed the two maids and walked into the bathroom alone to take a simple bath. Then he dragged his tired body into the bedroom and walked quietly, lying next to Hathaway and falling asleep. When Serdak opened his eyes again, he found that it was already bright. With the help of Beatrice and the maid, Hathaway was sitting in front of the dressing table, tying up her long blonde hair. She was wearing low-cut pajamas, and not only her chest was exposed, but her delicate shoulders set off her slender neck, making her very beautiful in front of the bronze mirror. Soldek sat up from the bed. Hathaway turned to him and greeted him with a smile. You're awake! Dark! A maid quickly brought a set of pajamas and a magic pattern structure that had been wiped clean overnight, and put the armor on Serdak's body. Have the matters over at the abandoned mining area finally been settled? Beatrice asked casually. Serdak turned around and spread his arms. The two maids put the breastplate made of magic patterns on Serdak's body. Then he said, Well, it's come to an end, but I still need to write a letter to the Speaker of the House of Representatives, Mr. Fred Dunstan later. It is estimated that this matter is very involved, and it may also involve some noble lords. Now these lords are getting more and more bold, and they dare to provide shelter to the magicians of the Black Magic Monastery. Do they really think that the Tower Rebellion in Lapican area... By the way, is Thea back? Beatrice snorted, covered her mouth with a smile, and said to Soldak, I just came back in the morning and laid down in the swimming pool to rest as soon as I came back. Soldak walked to the terrace while pulling the buckle of his cuffs further in, holding one hand on the railing and looking towards the pool in the back garden. I saw a Naga mermaid with a three-color tail fin floating in the pool. The calm pool had no waves, and she was fast asleep in the middle of the pool. It seemed that flying among the mountains in the abandoned mining area for a whole night was not a pleasant experience. Serdak ordered the maid beside him. I need a carriage, and I have to rush to the town hall in two quarters of an hour to get them ready. Yes! The maid quickly passed on Serdak's order. By the time Soldak got dressed and walked out of the bedroom into the outer hall, Hathaway and Beatrice were already sitting at the square table, with breakfast spread all over the table. After breakfast, Soldak hurriedly sat in the carriage. The magic caravan drove all the way out of the castle. Serdak opened the window and felt the morning breeze blowing through the car. The magic caravan drove very smoothly. In the carriage, Soldak wrote a letter to the Marquis of Dunstan in the House of Representatives of the Bena Province, and then wrote a letter to the Marquis of Dickens, the consul of the Terra Pagan region, exposing Count Penny's secret hide, the evil deeds of members of the Priory of Dark Arts. At the same time, Serdak also sent someone to notify the Magic Union. After all, tracking down the members of the Black Magic Monastery has always been a matter for the Magic Union law enforcement team. The Magic Caravan stopped in front of the steps of the City Hall. Soldak stepped down from the magic caravan and happened to see the financial officer, Count Kurt Laddie, also walking down from the magic caravan behind. The financial officer was about to leave. After a few steps, he caught up from behind. Lord Consul Soldak, everyone has been speculating on where you are these days, financial officer Kurt Ladier said to Soldak with a smile. Soldak stopped and waited for him to come up, and the two of them climbed the steps in front of the city hall door side by side. What happened at the city hall? Soldak asked doubtfully. Everything is running normally at the city hall. Finance officer Kurt Latte narrowed his shrewd eyes and said flatteringly to Soldak. Judging from his demeanor, he doesn't look like a noble lord at all. He is more like a shrewd businessman. Now the land prices in the slums of Red City have risen sharply. Many people have come to ask for the city hall to liberalize the policy of purchasing real estate in the slums. Do you think the city hall can consider it? Let go of some idle land as appropriate. Finance officer Kurt Lady said to Soldak. Soldak still remembered that Earl Lake Cushing took a magic airship to Bena City overnight because he did not want to participate in this matter. We can discuss this collectively at the next meeting, Soldak said noncommittally, and then asked, Is the financial situation at the Department of Finance a little tight again? Finance officer Kurt Ladier waved his hands quickly and said, That's not true. Moreover, the first payment from the sale of the steel workshop has been put into the treasury. The current financial situation of the finance department is relatively stable. Serdak thought for a moment and then said, In this case, there is no rush to sell the hoarded land. Everything must be in accordance with urban planning. While they were talking, the two of them had already walked into the city hall. Soldak's office was on the third floor of the city hall, which was on a different road from the financial officer Kurt Lear. So the two separated at the door of the city hall. During the time that Serdak left, 
nothing major happened in Ruth City. He sat in the office and spent the entire morning hurriedly processing the documents that required his signature. When he looked up again, he realized that it was already noon. At this time, Seattle was already sitting in the assistant seat at the door of the office. And Soldak didn't even notice when she came. At noon, Soldak had a simple meal in the canteen of the city hall. Just after noon, Sia, who was sitting at the door of the room, walked quickly to Soldak, leaned into his ear and whispered, President Sisi of the Root City Magic Union is here. Do you want to see him? Soldak was sitting in the office meeting, waiting for the union president of Root City. When Sia said that he was already waiting outside, he quickly ordered, Invite him in quickly. Not long after, an old magician wearing a dark green Kalinian magic robe walked in from the door. When he saw Serdak, he said, Lord Archon Soldak, I heard from the messenger you sent that your army encircled and suppressed a stronghold of the Black Magic Monastery in the abandoned mining area. Soldak said calmly, It is true that at this time, the situation over there has been controlled by us in time. Now we are just waiting for the magicians from the Magic Union Law Enforcement Group to go and check. President Sisi's eyes suddenly lit up, and he said, I can send the magicians from the law enforcement team to investigate the situation over there now. Chapter 1239 Meeting President Sisi also knew that the Archon could not give such a great contribution to the Lut Magic Guild in vain. And investigating and eradicating the Black Magic Hermitage happened to be the responsibility of the Magic Guild law enforcement team. Once it was announced that there was a stronghold of the Black Magic Monastery in the Ruth City area, the Magic Union knew nothing about it. After he ended his term as the president of the Ruth City Magic Union, all evaluations you will be ruined by this. President Sisi took off the magic cone hat on his head. His gray hair was meticulously taken care of. The fingers of his hands were slender, and the nails were neatly trimmed. He held a short fur staff in his hand, and was very humble to Serdak. Said, Master Preter Serdak, Thank you very much for notifying us in time this time. Serdak bowed slightly and said, This is what we should do. At this time, Sia was wearing a dress, with an unconcealable sleepiness on her face, and came over with black tea. President Sisi waited for Sia to leave and then said seriously to Soldek, This matter is very important to our magic guild. I will follow up on the follow-up processing throughout the entire process. Soldek smiled and said to President Sisi, I very much hope that we can do more communication on handling these matters in the future and get the support of the magic union. President Sisi laughed, stretched out a hand to Soldek, and said, Of course, this is our responsibility. I also hope to have more cooperation with Ruder City Hall in other aspects. If you have any requests regarding this matter, I hope you can put them forward and I will try my best to satisfy you. I didn't expect that President Shishi of the Ruth City Magic Union would be so easy to deal with. Serdak hurriedly said, I also look forward to our further cooperation. President Sisi, it would be rude of us not to have time to say H, low in advance. Before leaving, President Shishi of the Magic Union received a map of the abandoned mine area and an access voucher provided by Soldak. With this access voucher, you can freely enter and leave the Black Magic Priory Research Institute occupied by the Heavy Armored Infantry Regiment. Otherwise, the Heavy Armored Infantry soldiers will not allow anyone to enter the Black Magic Priory Research Institute. After seeing off President Shishi, Soldek asked Thea to catch up on her sleep in the lounge next to the office. He is going to hold a meeting in the city hall and does not need Thea to accompany him for the time being. Soldek walked into the third conference hall of the city hall on time. The meeting room, that was still busy with discussions immediately fell silent. The financial officer, the logistics director, the chief of security, and the commander of the city defense and security brigade were all present. In these city halls, when the powerful people looked at Soldek, they were extremely careful to hide the negative emotions in their hearts. The city hall officials sitting at the end of the conference table touched their chins with their hands to wipe the expressions off their faces. There was silence in the conference hall for a while and Soldak sat down at the head of the conference table. Serdak habitually knocked on the table, attracting the attention of everyone in the conference room. He then said, In the past two days, I have been dealing with some problems in the abandoned mining area. These problems should be left over from the time of Lord MacDonald. The progress is going very smoothly, so I can return to Ruth City early. The officials in the conference hall suddenly realized that during the past few days, when Consul Soldak disappeared for no reason, he actually went to the mountains in the abandoned mining area. Serdak looked around and then said, The first thing to do when convening this meeting today is to see if there are any problems that cannot be dealt with in Ruth City in the past few days. He set his sights on Nathaniel. 
the commander of the security battalion. The commander of the security battalion immediately stood up and said, Lord Consul, the security in Red City has been normal recently. Soldak then looked at Mickey Mind. The commander of the city defense security brigade also quickly stood up and said, Everything is normal in the city defense. Soldak nodded, motioned for the two of them to sit down, and then said, The number of foreign caravans is increasing. We need to be careful of them getting drunk and making trouble. Therefore, the guard camp has to send more patrols every night. In addition, I don't want to hear local officials extorting foreign merchants. Once something like this happens, regardless of whether it is true or not, the reported official will be temporarily relieved of all duties until his innocence is proven. In addition, Count Kurt Laddie came to me and told me that some young and promising nobles in the city are optimistic about the future development trend of the restaurant square area. So they want to acquire some land in the surrounding areas and operate some it's a family business, and I hope I can open the land around the steel workshop to the outside world and allow trading. Regarding this matter, after some consideration, in principle, I have no objection to noble young people doing business in slum areas, but I need them to make a promise that they will not exploit civilians as nobles. Doing business in civilian areas is follow the laws of the common people. When Soldak said this, the officials in the conference hall questioned in low voices. But Serdak ignored these voices and continued. I don't want to see aristocratic status due to some disputes over interests. And for the land around the restaurant square, I will set up a new institutional property management office in the city hall. For these houses that have not been renovated, the city hall this place is only for rent, not for sale. However, when nobles engage in business activities, there will be tax exemption policies. Of course, nobles will not always enjoy this benefit. In order to encourage new people to start their own businesses, the tax exemption period is one year. The specific amount of tax exemption depends on the specific industry. If it is a trading firm, the tax exemption will be tax exemption. It has been initially set at 30%. In addition, I do not want to see malicious competition. Any monopoly that uses its power and status to excessively suppress its peers will be severely punished. I hope that the business district of the restaurant district will be a hotbed of business in Red City. And I hope that some qualified businessmen can be cultivated there. I also hope that it can become a beacon for the economic development of Red City. Everyone here, if anyone's relatives and friends want to know about this matter, please repeat what I said to them. After Soldak finished speaking, he stopped and took a sip of the slightly bitter black tea. The officials in the city hall had different expressions and asked Soldak for details and Soldak told them in detail. When the topic came to an end, Mickey Mend, the commander of the City Defense Security Brigade, coughed twice, and then said to Soldak, Lord Consul, regarding the repair of the city walls of Ritz City, I hope that the city hall can increase some funding. In the past two years, the aging problem of the city walls has become more and more serious, and some places have collapsed and... Chapter 1240 Meeting 2 Commander Mickey Mend stood up, and said to Soldak in a nonchalant manner. In previous years, the allocation for this area was 5,000 gold coins, but this year some sections of the city wall were more seriously damaged. So our city defense and security brigade applied for a slightly larger amount of money for repairs. Count Kurt Radier, the finance officer of the city hall, who was sitting opposite him, immediately responded. Men, did you pay a little more? You just doubled the maintenance and repair funds. The grant application you submitted to the Department of Finance this year said 10,000 gold coins. I think with this amount with money, there is no need for time-consuming and laborious repairs. You can knock down a section of the city wall and build a brand new section. In this way, you only need to spend another five years, and you can complete the entire city wall of Ritz City before the end of your term. Renovation completed. Do the walls of Ritz City need to be repaired every year? Serdak asked the officials around him. Logistics Minister Alan Benton immediately replied. That's true. The City Hall has an allocation amount every year. This year's application for the Security Brigade is higher than in previous years. Finance Officer Count Kurt Radier smiled at Logistics Minister Alan Benton and said immediately. But everyone knows that after so many years, the walls of Ritz City have become old and worn. Now they only repair them if they are damaged. The officials also discussed Ritz City Wall in a flurry. Serdak did not express his opinion at first. He just sat aside and listened quietly to everyone's discussion. When he finally understood what was going on, the general situation inside. Well, I don't care where you use the funds for repairing the city wall in the past. I can forget about the past. Soldak stood up from his seat. 
stared at Mickey Mend and said, Starting from this year, city wall repairs will be openly tendered. The specific form is that the City Defense and Security Brigade will list the sections of the city wall that need to be repaired to the Logistics Department. The Logistics Department will put all the city walls that need to be repaired out to bid. And finally, the construction team that wins the bid will carry out the system. To maintain these city wall sections, the Department of Finance will allocate funds after everything is inspected and accepted. After Soldak finished speaking, he cast his gaze on the faces of Financial Officer Kurt and City Defense and Security Brigade Commander Mickey Mind. Mickey Mind looked at Soldak in surprise. The expression on his face was a little unnatural, and he couldn't express the pain in his heart. Originally, this repair money went through the accounts of the City Defense and Security Brigade, and some part of it would flow into his hands. This time he applied for double the repair money, hoping that Serdak would not randomly check all the funds. And the most important thing is that there is money in the Treasury now, in Commander Mickey Min's view. As long as he convinced the young financial officer in front of him, he could obtain a large financial allocation. Moreover, the city walls of Ruth City were indeed very dilapidated and needed to be repaired. Unfortunately, he submitted the application at the wrong time. Soldak happened to be away these days. So the application went to finance officer Kurt Ladier first. So there is this scene in front of me. No one expected that Soldak would make a decision directly in the conference room and change the process of applying for funding for repairs. Now this allocation will not be delivered to the City Defense Brigade at all. And even the original money will not be allocated. Mickey Mend was a little regretful. If he had known this, he would never have said these words. According to the practice in previous years, even if there was only an allocation of 5,000 gold coins, he could still get at least one-tenth of it. But now probably not even a hair could be caught. When Soldak looked towards him, Mickey Min forced a smile to show his support for Soldak's decision. His slightly stiff face was full of wrinkles when he smiled. But the matter had already been decided. He glanced at Kurt Laddie with some disgust. The conflict between him and the financial officer was more than that. Soldak knocked on the table again and said to the officials at the back of the conference hall who had begun to whisper, Now the slums are being renovated. I hope that the environment in Ritz City will always be kept clean and tidy. Who is in charge of the health bureau? Please come forward and let me know. A nobleman sitting at the back of the conference hall stood up hastily. Serdak quickly gestured and asked him to sit down. Serdak then continued. As a large number of caravans pass through Ritz City and enter the Ganbu Plain, the passenger flow in Ritz City will also increase day by day. Therefore, out of consideration for the safety of these business groups, I hope that the security issues in the city can be improved. All potential dangers must be eliminated quickly including those young nobles. And we must not kill people in the city. Once I find out, I will definitely punish them severely. Although Soldak spoke not too fast, the officials in the conference hall found that no one dared to make any objections. Serdak wants to attract foreign caravans to settle in Leite City and Makuso City. Now Makuso City no longer has the advantage of tax exemption. So whether these merchants will open their shops in Makuso or Luyite, this requires businessmen to make their own choices. In the past, some foreign merchants came here to do trade. But now, some young nobles in Red City want to do business. I hope that foreign merchants can get equal competition in Red City. By doing this, Serdak changed the trade pattern of Red City. He also knew that this would touch the interests of some noble lords. But if the city wanted to change and develop, it had to take this step. Serdak is no ordinary consul. His previous identity was the commander of the Heavy Armored Infantry Corps. In Makuso City, he controlled a large number of troops. Therefore, any noble lord who dares to resist and oppose him will eventually succumb to force. Now, the entire Ganbu plain is in Serdak's hands. Moreover, there is Marquis Luther standing behind him. It is estimated that even the chief executive of Terra Pagan District would not dare to mess with him easily. After the meeting, Soldak walked out first. Then other officials attending the meeting gathered together in twos and threes, obviously discussing what was said at the meeting. Now that Ruth City is on the right track, Serdak needs to make it more prosperous. Immediately afterwards, Ruth City ushered in a huge caravan, and businessman Malakom's Thunder Rhino caravan finally arrived in Ruth City again. This time, Malakom plans to move the remaining half of the dismantled furnaces of the steel workshop to Doden Town. Following Malakom to Ruth City, there was also the business group from Doden Town. 